The following program is made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. Welcome to Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening. Welcome to another Area 2000. I'm Mark Bell. And as usual, we've got a full plate this morning. We've got uh, our roving journalist, George Knapp. And way back in Philadelphia, this time at the airport, Linda Howe just arriving back home with her glimpses of other realities. And then it'll be Dr. Michael D. Swords. And this morning's major subject, I guess, is going to be UFOs. But uh, his, uh, his um, education, his uh, uh, interest goes into the parasciences as well. So we're going to be just moving all over the place this morning, uh, this evening. <laughs> You're never going to be able to get that straight, maybe in uh, four or five years. At any rate, uh, good evening, everybody. We'll try and start it on the uh, right note. Let's find out what's new in the world of UFOs this week and what's coming up. And for that, of course, our roving journalist, George Knapp. George, good evening. Welcome to the program. Uh, well, this week we begin our UFO newscast with things that did not happen, which is sort of, uh, as you know, the bane of what news is supposed to be, sure. but which is all too appropriate in this crazy field. The, the, the first thing that did not happen is communication with the Mars Observer. NASA says the craft is either orbiting Mars, spinning toward deep space, or blown up. Take your pick. It really doesn't matter much to those who were waiting for information from that probe. Is it now declared an absolute lost cause? I don't think so. I think you've got people who are still hanging on that think that uh, something might slap, snap to life and that they still may get some information. I think, you know, realistically, that's a pretty long shot. However, NASA has now appointed a, a team of experts to evaluate the possibility of another probe to the red planet, what it will take, what the objective should be, and the ubiquitous Carl Sagan is on this panel, so we can almost rest assured, I think, that investigation of the Sedonia region, which is uh, of primary interest, I think, to people interested in UFO and alien research, will not be a high priority on that next probe mission, assuming it ever happens at all. Uh, the second thing that did not happen is the big UFO event in New Mexico. As we have mentioned on previous programs, former government psychics had predicted a major event in New Mexico in the month of August. They stake their professional reputations on this prediction, and unless you and I are to have missed something on the news wire, their prediction was wrong. George, you didn't say government psychics, did you? Oh, yeah, they, they did. They worked for the government, yes. I, did you elaborate on that? <laughs> I have no idea. We had government psychics. Oh, we do. I, I think your your first the, the first guest on your first program was probably uh, more knowledgeable on the subject than I. Uh, psychics is not uh, perhaps the best term, but remote viewers. It is the term I think that's used oh. in, in defense circles. All right, that's what caught me. So they don't they don't want to uh, publicize it a great deal because that would be the sort of thing that would attract uh, budget cutters looking for headlines. But uh, yeah, they take it pretty seriously. Anyway, these folks uh, had left government service and formed their own company in New Mexico, and had uh, staked their professional reputations on this prediction of a, a big UFO event. But uh, there's been no no UFO landing, no mass abductions, no. No spaceships, zapping cacti, nothing. As we warned our listeners long ago, these, these types of UFO predictions come and go, and almost none of them amount to anything over the years. The real question in the wake of this is, why do these folks stick their necks out so far on such a prediction? Uh, what it means for the credibility of the ongoing remote viewer program run by the Department of Defense, and, and could this be another example of disinformation orchestrated by certain intelligence authorities to discredit or otherwise belittle UFO research, research in general. Uh, I'd be curious on, on Linda Howell's views on this stuff uh, when you talk to her a little bit later. Uh, Art, we apparently have some pretty avid listeners in Clear Lake, California, and we'd like to say hello to them tonight. As we reported last week, Clear Lake is experiencing another wave of UFO sightings at present. It's nothing new, we're told. Residents say the same sort of weird lights and crafts have been seen there for almost 40 years. 
it's kind of comparable to Spice, Alabama, which has had these periodic UFO episodes for as long as anyone can remember in that area. Well, are there more of them lately, George? Why is Clear Lake suddenly in the news? Oh, uh, only because the uh, the uh, uh, very efficient uh, Angela Thompson has been uh, following up the story and is uh, passing along the information to me. I think uh, they have flapped every couple of years or so, and they're in, in the middle of uh, one right now. Uh, the newspaper in Clear Lake has mentioned the program, Area 2000, in connection with its coverage of the UFO flap. And, uh, hey, Clear Lake, give us a call and let us know what's going on up there. An update on the situation in Russia. As we have reported previously, we managed to obtain some material uh, from alleged Russian UFO landing sites during our journey there earlier this year. Uh, the material, which consists of some strange uh, glycerin-looking nodules, uh, we, we got it from two so-called landing sites, UFO landing sites, in the middle of nowhere. Russian scientists we talked to were unable to figure out what the stuff was. We, we managed to, uh, to put it subtly, retrieve some of this, get it out of the country. We sent it to a very respected university-connected lab here in the U.S. for analysis. I've not yet received the final written report, but did speak to the research team leader. The bottom line is they don't know what it is either. This, this Russian doctor uh, that we had spoken with had speculated he thought it might be some sort of cosmic seeding operation. And if you'll, if you'll pardon the expression, some kind of like outer space firm. Uh, yeah. However, the, the lab told us that whatever this stuff is, it does not appear to be biological. It's, it's not a seed as we know seeds. The mystery persists because the experts were unable to tell us what it is, where it came from, why it was found in two separate sites, hundreds of miles apart. Will you get a, a, a chemical breakdown eventually? I, I, I still hope so. Uh, 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 when we get the final lab report on the material, we certainly will share it with our listeners. You don't want to tell us how you got it out of Russia? Uh, n no, because oh. I'm going to have to go back there. All righty. Uh, stories about a UFO movie uh, centered on Las Vegas scientist Bob Lazar are true. There had been considerable speculation about whether this matter is uh, just going to come to the big screen uh, in UFO circles anyway. Lazar has reached an agreement with New Line Cinema. Uh, no word yet on when the cameras will roll. A side note for Lazar's many critics, he did not initiate this year. The movie is a friend of him. In fact, it's not a to be composed concerning a story. Already, it, it has become apparent that some people out there don't want the movie to be made. Some junior UFO investigators have been scouring the country looking for, in their words, dirt on Lazar with the intention of sending that dirt on to the movie people and scuttling the project. Uh, best of luck to those folks, but it isn't going to happen. The movie will. Finally, uh, the initial reports from last week were true. The Clark County Library series of UFO lectures and films is sold out. In fact, all the tickets for two months' worth of programs were gone in two days. Wow. Uh, this happens despite, the, as you know, Art, the continued ridicule from other media here in Las Vegas, uh, blind skepticism from science, uh, Concerning UFOs, I think there is an appreciation that, that uh, regular people uh, feel this topic is important. Regular people want to know what's going on, and I, I think your program really fills an important niche in that area. And clearly, interest in it is growing quickly. Uh, it's, it's exactly right. Uh, I had a chance to talk to Dr. John Mack at Harvard uh, a couple of uh, months ago, and he, he feels there is a, a quickening of the interest in this. And, Maybe even feels that the visitors, call them aliens or whatever, they may be responsible for picking up the from it. For our sake, it's only for Well, that's excellent. And um, that really does please me. Uh, I was actually in the case of where that thing with the more legitimate uh, researchers will begin to look into all of this, and maybe we have a chance of really getting somewhere shortly. Sure hope so. All right, George, wonderful hearing from you as always. Thank you. That's George Knapp uh, with a lot to say this morning and a uh, particular interest those materials that he got uh, out of Russia. And uh, on another note that he mentioned, uh, when we do get a little further into the program and get to a telephone segment, I, too, would like to ask that anybody in Clear Lake who can catch us up on what's uh, going on over there uh, would give us a call. I'm glad to know they're listening. Nice to hear they mentioned us uh, in the Clear Lake newspaper. All right. Uh, time for a glimpse into another reality. That would be our Linda Howe.
who uh, I understand is at the airport or near the airport at an airport inn or something of that order and uh, is doing a lot of traveling. So I guess we'll find out what she's been up to right now. Glimpses of other realities. It comes from Linda Howe, now back in Philadelphia. Good evening, Linda. Hi, Art. Hi. I spent the day in Rye, New Hampshire, which is up near Portsmouth and Exeter. For those uh, listening who are familiar with the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, it was up in that area that that famous first abduction occurred. This was the annual New Hampshire MUFON conference. It occurs on a day, on a Sunday, has for the last three years, and this day there were nearly 600 people in the audience. It was one of the best attended, which uh, several people, including John Mass, one of the speakers, uh, he and I at lunch were talking about the fact that the grassroots interest in the phenomena seems to be growing conference to conference. The general uh, audience is getting larger. And today, the people who did speak were John Mack and Richard Hoagland, and I'll talk a little bit about what he had to say about Mars in a second. Um, myself, Colin Andrews, and Klopp Therpels, and David Jacobs. Uh, most of these people you've had on the program in the last couple of months. Uh, but I will start with a recap of what I think were some very important points that Dr. Mass made to set the day off in what everyone agreed was the focus of the conference and will continue to be probably the focus of much of our work in the coming years. And Dr. Mass put it in those ways, other realities glimpses of other realities is where we are headed with all of this phenomenon because it is not just simply the extraterrestrial biological entity that we're dealing with. There appears to be other dimensional aspects of it. And in that context, he said that he's now studied 76 UFO abduction cases and has found an interesting evolution that he has been surprised in terms of the, the nature and complexity of the evolution of abductees themselves if they hang in there with him as a psychiatrist. Uh, that's his background as a psychiatrist at Harvard and working with hypnosis and has seen them go through terrific fear, terrific anger. Many people feel like that they have been raped by some kind of a physical entity or being or taken against their will for all kinds of physical violations that manifest in terrible trauma. As he said, he has never in his years as a, as a psychiatrist seen the kind of trauma that he has seen when he has worked with uh, the abductees in hypnosis. And yet, he said that in many cases now, if they hang in there and they continue to work together, they seem to come to a point, some kind of a breakthrough, and they pass the fear, they pass the trauma, they end up with a new sense that the abduction experience is concerned with the evolution of their spiritual life in some way. And in that context, he has found, and this has shocked him as a psychiatrist, he said it was very difficult for him in the beginning when these episodes began coming out, and that would be an abductee who, under hypnosis, trying to deal with the abduction experience, is being taken back to their birth, trying to find out where these experiences begin, and he's suddenly, apparently, in another life. And in another life, the same beings or beings that look like the ones that were involved in the abduction in this life are in what appears to be another life. And so Dr. Mack himself, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, who four years ago did not, as he said, know what he was getting into and has been... Uh, finding his own curiosity provoked to the point he has, uh, has studied and worked with 76 people, is now finding that the whole idea of reincarnated cycles, life to life, is becoming part of his research, and that the same alien beings are in these other lives too, that there's some connection between the alien beings and a particular abductee's uh, current life. Now, what that is headed toward in terms of understanding the implications of all this uh, for the human-alien uh, interaction in the past, present, and future is a huge unknown, and I think that there will probably be more and more reports over the next year or two or three 
uh, in this particular area, and I hope to be bringing uh, more uh, information about this uh, this kind of other aspect of a reality that also touches perhaps into the near-death experiences. That's something we don't know yet, but uh, Ken Ring's work certainly suggests that there are parallels between what happens to abductees and what happens at the moment of death. Boy, that is really fascinating, Linda. Do you think the two areas of study will uh, uh, somehow merge at some point? Is it, it sounds like it's possible. Well, in my own research, I am exploring both all the time and uh, Dr. Mack and I and others, we see each other on a somewhat regular basis at conferences, and I think what will continue to happen is we will keep sharing our own research and our insights about all of this, and as we see something that seems to be another insight, I will certainly report it on Area 2000. And so uh, the radio listeners and you and I and George and all of us, I feel like we're all learning together as we move along each week. And uh, we really are bringing glimpses of other realities because none of us know the answers, and every week something new happens. Um, the next speaker was Richard Hoagland. And the, there were uh, two hours of his particular focus of research about Mars and his, uh, I guess you would say, almost 10-year mission to convince the world that there is an artificially constructed face up there it's a mile long and 1,500 feet high, and that it was placed there, according to his estimates, based on a whole variety of research they've been doing, um, way before uh, the current cycle of Homo sapien here, let's say in the last 25 or 50,000 years. He's placing it back much further than that. And um, he explained that this work that he's been doing on the face on Mars and other structures has now been awarded a major scientific honor in Sweden just in the past week or two because uh, Sweden believes that the mathematical work that people like uh, uh, Torin in, uh, it's in Washington, D.C., Errol Torin, who works for the Defense Mapping Agency, has been involved with research on the mathematical relationships on Mars. Uh, Mark Carlotto at the Analytical Sciences Corporation in Reading, Massachusetts, has been using, using computer enhancement to look at this space, to look at other objects that are within about 10 miles of this space uh, in a region called Cydonia that appear to be at least pyramidal looking. They look sort of like pyramids in these computer enhanced uh, photographs. And because the mass, the angles and the relationships between the face and these pyramid-like structures appear to have consistencies, patterns that repeat over and over and over again, it is reinforcing the uh, idea that Hoagland introduced 10 years ago or so in his uh, book work, The Monuments on Mars, it is artificially constructed uh, and that it is very ancient, uh, that it was something that was there once upon a time and left these huge, gigantic markers on the surface of Mars. And the big question is why? Now, he personally stated at the conference today that he has sources that are suggesting, as George has talked about, that the orbiter is actually not in a failure mode, but has continued to function on some kind of classified channel because they wanted to get pictures of this region and other regions of Mars secretly. All right, Linda, I've got to stop you here because somebody faxed me something that I'm sitting on, it, and, and I don't know what to make of it. It appeared in a publication called the Weekly World News, September 14th edition. It purports to be... Um, a rather high-resolution picture of the face on Mars, and it is absolutely startling. Uh, and I guess I'm going to have to figure a way to fax it to you or get it to you. It comes with a story. Uh, it, it says that this was taken on August 20th, this August 20th. Well, if it were anything else but the World Weekly News... You'd be ready. Yeah, I, I hear, hear what you're saying. Seriously, what's even saying? They, we always can get leaks here and there, and Hoagland is saying that he's had what he considers to be firmer uh, leaks than uh, just speculation or the Weekly World News, that something actually is still functioning on Mars, but that the government does not want us to know anything yet until they've had a chance to analyze 
uh, what's up there. Now, I suppose there are two possibilities. Uh, one is that it is not functioning and we'll never know and they're going to have to relaunch something. Or they are getting some kind of data and then somebody's going to have to come up with a scenario of how they would reintroduce this lost satellite orbiting around Mars so that they might reintroduce some data from a planet uh, that we haven't been to since 1976. Well, Linda, they have been right along suggesting that, you know, they may regain contact, so they're leaving the door open. Yeah, and that may actually reinforce what uh, Richard Hoagland had to say today in New Hampshire about this new information that it actually is functioning. He also suggested that in December that there will be a NASA mission to repair the Hubble telescope. Right. And he was indicating that he believed that the mission, the repair mission itself, is also a type of cover-up, that they actually are going to be using that telescope to focus on some kind of multiple asteroid-like objects that are supposed to be coming into the solar system right now and that they want to track on Hubble. Mm. But what we now have, since this is in September, it's not very long until we get to December, we've only got two or three months to see how is information about Mars, the Hubble telescope, asteroids, how is it going to be handled, and is there something uh, that is going to come out of all of this that will culminate maybe in the government finally telling us something straight about the whole alien connection. That's what I'm hoping will happen. Wow. Well, I, I'll hope along with you. And Let me th just give you one quick update, and then uh, I'll pass it on uh, to you. All right. And that is, I got a call uh, Friday uh, before I left for New Hampshire from Dr. Lovingood, and uh, he had had a chance to look at that black tissue around the wheat seeds from that enormous 445-foot uh, formation in Churchill that uh, I talked uh, with you all about about now three or four weeks ago when I was in England. That first night I got to Alton Barnes and this big, enormous, beautiful formation was laid out in that wheat field. And he's had a chance to look at what's called the electrical conductivity across the brass tissue on those seeds from inside the formation and says they line up right down the line with a very unusual pattern of electric conductivity and oscillation of this tissue that he has found in the Utica, New York formation, the Kennewick, Kennewick, Washington formation, and others in Canada, the United States, Australia, and England that fall into another pattern of other anomalous changes in the plants that Dr. Levengood, a biophysicist, says cannot be hoped. So for those caught up in the politics of cynicism out there that are convinced that Doug and Dave, Jim Schnabel and Robert Irving must be making all of these, they are going to have to show Dr. Levengood and the scientists how they are actually changing the fundamental microfibril structure of seeds and wings. Well, that's absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. I, I would like to understand a little more of what that means. In other words, uh, is there any other way, uh, naturally, or w with what these hoaxers were doing, that this this change... Uh, it's hard to even know what to ask, Linda, and, and what, in his opinion, could have produced this change in the, in the structure, molecular structure? Yeah. He did this experiment, devised it, because last year, actually going back 18 months ago, he had seen enough changes in the plant that included... Uh, bending of nodes, plants, wheat should be growing straight, and in the formations, and this has been repeated now in many uh, countries for two years, uh, in formations, the node will be bent on the ground without cracking at the surface of the earth, but six or eight inches out to, the, let's say, the first or second growth node, all of a sudden, the wheat is taking a 45 or 90 degree angle. It is something that cannot be hoaxed. It means that there's an actual change in the cell structure of the uh, plant stem and the growth node for the stem to actually take off suddenly into a bend and to have many of those inside of a formation and none of those in the control heat outside. That's one particular demonstration of a dramatic change in the formation. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, and this is very consistent with his hypothesis was that was one of many changes that he said 
there's an intense, tense energy that is interacting with the plants in the formation that is affecting the fundamental biochemistry and biophysics of the plants. And so he hypothesized if it was as intense as he was seeing in these other changes, he guessed that it was actually changing the microfibril level of the plant, which would mean down getting close to the cellular level. And that's where electrical conductivity would take place across this particular black tissue. I see. So now, and this, so this experiment was to say he knew how the electro, electrical conductivity would work in control plants, so he said, what would I find out if I did this experiment on plants from the formations? Would I see a change? And he has seen a consistent change. Well, there's some hot information. Linda Howe, where are you going to be next uh, next week? You're going to still I'm be... going to be moving around in the mid uh, part of the country going west. And by next Sunday, I will be in Denver. And I will give you a number there where I will be. And by then, I'll also have some new information. Wonderful, Linda. Okay, you guys. As always, thank you. Uh, Linda Howe and her glimpses of other realities. And in a moment, Dr. Michael D. Swords. Stay right where you are. You're listening to Area 2000. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. This is Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. Michael D. Swords is a professor of natural science at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 1962 with a B.S. degree in chemistry. Also holds an M.S. degree from Iowa State University in biochemistry. A B.H.D. from Case Western Reserve University. His major professional involvements are teaching and writing in the areas of general sciences and anomalous phenomena. His teaching centers about human biology, the history and philosophy of science, scientific methodology, and the parasciences, of which ufology or ufology is uh, a member. His writings have concentrated mainly on topics in ufology, parapsychology, and cryptozoology, which we'll ask about, and several have been published in the MUFON UFO Journal. He has won his university's Teaching Excellence Award in 1978. Dr. Swords is a member of several professional and parascientific societies, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Association of University Professors, the Society for Scientific Exploration, and, of course, the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON. He serves as a MUFON consultant, and was in the same capacity for the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization. The International of, of 14 Organization, we'll ask about that too, and is a member of the advisory panel for the Society for the Inve Investigation of the Unexplained. He is a board member of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies and is the editor of Ufology's academic journal, the Journal of UFO Studies. Dr. Swords originally spoke at the MUFON 1986 UFO Symposium in East Lansing, Michigan, a talk for which the current presentation will be an extension. He has recently presented materials uh, at the Abductions Conference of Treat 2, uh, as well as the National Science Teachers Association. Dr. Swords may be contacted at the Department of General Studies, Western Michigan University at Kalamazoo. And now, Dr. Swords. Dr. Swords, good evening. Hello. How are you? All the way to Michigan. I am fine, and I hope you are as well. Yes, it's been interesting listening so far. Uh, well, one of the things that caught my eye about you, Doctor, was uh, I know that you mainly do uh, research into other people's uh, research as opposed to um, conducting your own. Yeah, I'm not a case researcher. Right. And one of the things that you said and I'm going to enjoy this, is that you are not a yes man for anybody's theory. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if uh, if I was given the job of critiquing most of the things that had been talked about on the show so far tonight, I just have to catch a little bit on almost everything, if not quite a bit. Okay, good. Well, that's a good, uh, healthy attitude. Uh, w what did you happen to think of uh, what Linda said about the molecular changes in the wheat? What, what doubt would you cast on uh, 
that offered uh, information. Well, one of the one of the things that is a problem in all UFO research, and it is locked on over into crop circles research, is that there are not many people actually doing tests. So that you have a fellow like Dr. Levengood, and I have no reason to suspect that Dr. Levengood is not a very good scientist, but you have him do a piece of research. He's not actually on the site himself. He doesn't do his own uh, sampling. Somebody else does that for him over there and then sends it back to Michigan. And then no one else except Dr. Levengood, who to some degree is working at very long range, uh, rechecks the information. So... Something like Dr. Levengood's work could be brilliantly correct, but from the point of view of the academic community, since it's such an extraordinary thing, you'd want to have a researcher right on the site doing this stuff and then following uh, in kind of a team research mode all the way through to the data, because it's a matter of trust, after all, as to whether everything was done properly all the way down the line. I don't really have that much um, negative to say about Levengood's work. I think it's I think it's pretty interesting stuff. It just needs to be repeated. Well, as you've looked into what all these other researchers uh, have been doing, and I try to ask every guest I have this same question: uh, Are you personally convinced, or do you lean toward the uh, uh, the um, the theory that, or or the fact that we are indeed being visited. In other words, is something really going on? Uh, in your view, have you come to that personal conclusion? I don't think there's any question that uh, that the UFO phenomena uh, entails some very major mysteries, which could very well be extraterrestrial produced. But uh, the UFO phenomena, at large, I think composed of, of mostly errors, and so when you, I, in other words, I don't think it's as robust a phenomena as people tend to uh, want to make it, who kind of want to keep the excitement going in almost like a Saturday morning cartoon style. In the United States, the folks are impatient, and we want a miracle on the street corner every second. I think that the UFO phenomenon has a lot of great cases in it that, for which the most prominent hypothesis would be an extraterrestrial hypothesis. I think the abduction phenomena also has some great cases in it, but the vast majority of these things are very unconvincing, and a lot of the stuff that has accreted to the UFO phenomena is, um, I think, erroneously stuck in there. Uh, well, I'm wondering, as you look at the various researchers' work, for example, abductions you mentioned, how do you uh, sift through, or what methodology do you use for trying to determine what has some credibility and 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 conversely what does not. Well, the abduction thing is is a very difficult thing to uh, understand. But you have two kinds of researchers basically. You have researchers who become uh, very personally involved with their clients, and God bless them for that because these people are hurting. But at the same time that they do that, they don't really. Um, gain any information that you could uh, count on as uh, objectively gained in some way. In other words, they're more like uh, client counselors than they are researchers. And you have other individuals who proceed according to sort of old-fashioned UFO research that go to the trouble of checking the people's backgrounds out and uh, talking to other people who know them, trying to get some feeling for the uh, observer credibility. So I, the first thing I do is I look at the research methodology of the person who is making the, of the researcher who's making the claims. And when a researcher who seems to be very thorough and also has done a good job of, of checking observer credibility comes out with a, a statement that these are the uh, various facts that need to be presented by the reporter, then I say, well, now that. That's uh, probably a true anomaly, especially when it matches up with what other researchers are reporting. But for the people who... Uh, well, all right, how much of that do you find versus the other? I find, uh, unfortunately nowadays, I find rather small amounts of true old-time UFO research on abduction cases. Almost everybody uh, wants to 
have sympathy and a rapport for very good reasons with the people who have come to them and they can't bring themselves to really do the uh, in-depth character background uh, check so that you could really say that you knew whether this was a true case or a wannabe case or a case that's asking something else. So then uh, probably the, the best way to determine is to look into the uh, alleged victim's uh, background. And uh, if their background is solid, then you would lean toward concluding their story, maybe. Yes, I would, I would at least lean toward concluding that they absolutely believe what they're saying to be true. If then the pattern in what they're saying seems to match other things that they would have no good reason for knowing and matching, then I would uh, say this is very likely a good case. Doctor, how much regard do you have for regressive hypnosis in these cases? I think regressive hypnosis is capable of being a very good tool. We've had uh, some individuals who've used that, uh, like Dick Haynes has a method of using that that I think is perfectly good. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of hypnotists that have used the thing with different sorts of methods, and they seem to come out with the same basic pattern, so I see no reason to suspect that hypnosis is still in the works of mm. Um in some of your uh, publications, you've written about something called the wow signal, and that intrigued me. I'm very much a radio person. What is the wow signal? Wow signal was a uh, was something that came in during a very early search for extraterrestrial intelligence by the Ohio State University radio telescope. I've forgotten whether it was in the 60s or when, but it was pretty far back in time. Mm -hmm. And one, and they were just doing automated sky scans. And uh, one evening, uh, as the thing passed across the sky, it got a tremendous burst of energy from a certain place in space, which was not noticed until the next morning when a graduate student came in and looked at the readout and was so blown away, he wrote, wow, next to the thing. That's how it got it. I see. Of course, they went back and they rescanned the sky in that area to try to find out what it was that gave the signal. They were never able to pick it up again. Do you know what the nature of the signal was? Uh, was it just a pure white noise energy? Was there any... Uh, the, the wow must have been because there was some pattern or something. It was energy at, at a certain specific wavelength in the spectrum. I don't recall what the, what the wavelength was right now, but it was... But the, machine was scanning just a certain narrow band of the spectrum. This is not too much unlike what they've reason, uh, recently claimed for uh, the big search that's gone on with uh, Jill Carter and Carl Sagan and Frank Drake, where they think that they've picked up maybe 50 or 60 different of these one-time only signals out there and never been able to relocate them again, all in different parts of the sky, so no repeatability. Um. And, and again, uh, with the current search going on, uh, which they've renamed, I, I can't recall the new name for it, uh, but I think it's funded to the tune of about $100 million, uh, the report from those folks so far would be basically negative or nothing n nothing that would earn a wow. So we'll, uh, we'll have to see how much uh, kind of a, of a thing that they want to run on the politicians who they're trying to get more money from. Uh, it doesn't see what spin they put on it, but uh, I think intellectually, honestly, you'd have to say that their results are negative, but they're going to feature, I'm sure, the fact that they've got these one-time glitches or whatever it was in the signals from these various points in space to hold out as a carrot that the thing is probably worth continuing. I see. That's what I predict. Sure. Um, let, let me try this one with you. Linda, um, Linda Howe was mentioning something we frequently talk about in this program, uh, the possibility of parallel universes, and I was particularly intrigued with her mention of the possible tie-in uh, between uh, reincarnation, um, parallel universes, and this business with UFOs and abductions. Is there any possibility, uh, or is it much too much of a reach to imagine that one day uh, there will be a kind of a, a merge that will occur where there is some sort of connection. What are your feelings? Well, if, if one assumes that the so-called abduction phenomenon is not just one phenomenon, but it's in fact a lot of different things that are causing something that sort of looks the same on the surface, then you might be able to say, well, there's one part of this thing that looks like it's uh, EP-based, and there's one part of this thing that looks like it's, say, some kind of a peculiar human mental carnival, and that there's maybe some other kind of thing that's, that's much more paranormal. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see at this stage of our investigations, of our knowledge, how one would want to be too uh, confident in, in making any claims in one of those areas. But I would say 
simply this, that uh, you could certainly imagine a cosmos that has uh, reincarnation in it that has nothing to do with uh, parallel realities uh, in any sense other than kind of a, a, a loop through a disembodied spiritual existence. You don't have to have a Jacques Vallée and Madonian type parallel reality or something like that. And I would say that if you're going to try to speculate about ET people being involved in past lives, well, uh, there better be a lot more evidence for this than, uh, uh, than what we've heard so far from Dr. Max. All right. Let us return uh, to an earlier time, maybe the beginning of the modern UFO uh, phenomenon, and that, of course, is the 1947 and uh, the Roswell business. Uh, I take it that there's been so much done on that since you study what others have done that you've looked at Roswell and uh, uh, the studies done on it very carefully. What have you concluded about that incident? I think that Roswell is the one other thing in UFO research other than abduction research that's really worth doing right now. From what I can tell from the Roswell research that's done by uh, Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt, uh, that case just continues to look stronger and stronger through time. It has fought off the challenges of maybe 20 different alternative hypotheses that people keep throwing out. The more witnesses that are dug up, instead of having the, uh, the idea dissipate and fragment into a lot of nonsense, the story just seems to grow tighter. So I went into that Roswell thing thinking that it just couldn't possibly be true because it would change the whole nature of the space program and everything else. And, and I've been disabused of all that stuff uh, by this stage. I, I think the Roswell case, uh, along with the better abduction cases, are, are by far and away the most important thing we're doing. Right all right, well, then let's stick with Roswell for a moment. What Can you run us through it a little bit? Uh, what is it that is that you find so convincing, as you've studied it, about Roswell? Well, the first thing is the, the fact that the initial witness who cracked the story was a man of such importance in the uh, armed forces, a, a, a high-level uh, intelligence major who, uh, almost no matter what kind of a game you try to think up, uh, would be serving no good intelligence purpose in, in breaking the Roswell story the way he broke it. The second thing is, is that at this time, there are probably between one and two dozen different first-hand witnesses to the metal pieces that were scattered around the Brazel Ranch, and their descriptions of the metal pieces and also some of the other de uh, debris, uh, they match perfectly, and uh, the characteristics of this metal, of two different kinds of it especially, uh, the one that was the unbendable, unburnable kind, and the other that was the clumpable, but then it then it would refold into its own shape. These are metal alloys that uh, you look back as, as to what our metallurgy was in 1947. We couldn't do that stuff. So it gets to be pretty difficult to just wave off, uh, say, 15 to 20 first-hand witnesses who are describing a couple of different metal forms that we couldn't make at the time. Well, of course, um, after Roswell, uh, there were some initial reports uh, that seemed quite clear, early reports. Then all of a sudden, we, got, we began to get the uh, government involved, uh, the weather balloon story and so forth. Uh, you must have looked at all that very carefully as well. Now, those, uh, those alternative reports... Uh, they have been tracked down with amazing efficiency by Don Schmidt and Kevin Randall uh, to the point of first-hand records for launching the balloon types and of different sorts of missiles and all of these things. And not, not only do none of them match any of the described characteristics of the material, but uh, all the known launches of anything have been accounted for. So uh, I, I, just, uh, I, I think that's just all smokescreen. All right. Um, what about the part of the story that suggests there were alien beings there, that they were picked up and taken, I think, to Wright-Patterson Wright Air Force Base? Uh, all of that hold up? The alien beings part of the story is not as strong as the uh, debris part of the story, but once you get the debris part of the story sort of established in your mind, it's a lot easier to buy into the uh, sure. craft occupants, especially since on one or two... Uh, rare occasions, it'll 
a witness will talk some about both. And so if that person was credible on the metals, that person is probably credible on the beings. Still, in terms of uh, the so-called body site, because there are two different locations, a debris field in uh, one area and then a body site much closer to the town of Roswell, uh, th that body site is still pretty much a work in progress research-wise. There, there are prime witnesses for that. Uh, I've uh, been in the presence of a couple of these people. Uh, they are still holding on to their anonymity. Uh, I think one of them is about to be willing to come out and be quoted all over the place. But uh, that's still a work in progress, and that needs to be uh, firmed up uh, before too much, too much is claimed. All right. Well, all this works very easily then into the government cover-up aspect of this. And there have been all kinds of uh, documents over the years that have come out purporting to be uh, government documents, um, briefing papers for Eisenhower, and all sorts of things, as you know, have come out. What 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 have you concluded as you've looked at this aspect of it, the government cover-up aspect? Well, as far as the government cover-up of Roswell, I haven't been impressed with any of the uh, documents that specifically claim to relate to that. But as far as government cover-up is concerned, that that's just obvious. Uh, that's been obvious ever since David Jacobs wrote his history of the UFO phenomena way back in the 70s. Uh, as soon as people got inside the... Uh, Robertson panel uh, information and also into the Condon Report information. These are the two uh, major government uh, elements that existed. One uh, uh, which ended up with the idea of completely debunking the UFO field forever uh, because of national security reasons, and the other one that was a so-called scientific study that was a debunking study from the beginning. As soon as those internal documents were revealed, it was obvious that you had nothing going on except the big cover-up, and, and, we've, and we've done nothing but to indicate more of the same with all the FOIA documents and things. And as a, a matter of national security, from what perspective? Well, there's a lot of reasons that it can be a matter of national security, but I'll give you the main one that the Robertson panel suggests. The Robertson panel was a CIA panel for listeners who haven't heard about this in 1952, very late in the year, actually early 1953, that uh, was composed of five major scientists, and they recommended uh, actually a downplaying UFO phenomena because mainly during the previous summer, the uh, which was a big flap, uh, probably the second biggest of all time, the communication channels within the military were so clogged by citizens calling in that they considered it as having weakened the uh, uh, country's ability to respond to a real attack from the Soviet Union. Mm. And so they felt that if so-called UFO hysteria or enthusiasm or whatever you want to call it was allowed to just go unchecked, that they would continuously be vulnerable from, say, the Soviet Union messing with us and, uh, and doing some stimulate uh, a lot of calling in and swapping the phone lines and then maybe be able to have a more successful attack come in after, say, a fake UFO wave of some kind. Uh, isn't that something? Well, um, you know, there are so many governments in the world, and if we have decided to uh, cover it all up or for, for the reasons you just suggested or even others, um, what about all the other governments in the world? Uh, it, it, it would be my opinion that uh, that our government was the only one fortunate enough to have a crash come down and ended up with something really amazing that it had to cover up for, for more reasons of concern for various social and economic institutions in the country, and that would be the Roswell thing, and the other countries wouldn't have to be uh, bothered with something like that. Now, some people say that Back in those days, in 1947, that would have been such a big thing that we would have had to have gone to the other major powers in the world and informed them at least somewhat and, and gotten a gentleman's agreement to keep the lid on the crash saucer case. But as far as other governments were concerned, uh, I don't know what their thinking process would have been. Certainly the Soviets would have had a somewhat similar concern to ours with the voice in the Robertson panel. Sure. Sure, I'm sure they would have. Um, we're now beginning, of course, with uh, with the Soviet Union breaking up and uh, with Russia being so much more open. Uh, as you may have heard, uh, 
you know, George was actually able to get some materials out. That never could have been done uh, previously. There should be a lot of new information coming from Russia and the other republics. Uh, are we getting much? I don't think so. You keep hearing uh, rumors of this, but uh, I, I would uh, caution listeners to remember that the Soviet Union, for a very long time, has had a record of having isolated researchers who were pretty much uh, unchecked by anything but their own imagination to claim almost anything out in the boondocks. And so uh, this, it, unless we get some extremely good, trustworthy information from research institutes that are backed by known scientists, I would not just automatically swallow any stuff that comes from the Soviet Union. Mm. Now, the other thing to say about that is, though, that uh, Dr. Haynes from uh, NASA Ames, which is someone that you may get on your program sometime, he's a very good scientist, uh, he has made a uh, link with Soviet uh, scientists who are interested in UFOs, and it's hoped that as this uh, liaison becomes more firm, that we will get some genuinely good case research out of them. But to my knowledge, that has not yet happened. All right. One popular theory and one of my favorite subjects is time travel, and I noticed that you'd written something uh, on UFOs as time travelers with a question mark after it. Um, it is at least as possible a, a theory, uh, when we're left with nothing but theories, to imagine as any other. Um, could it be that what we regard as UFOs from elsewhere actually are from our future. Is that possible? Well, I, for Walt Andrus in the MUFON Journal some time ago, I wrote actually a pair of papers uh, separated by a couple of years uh, to try to analyze whether that theory could make any sense or not. When you take a look at the shape of the typical uh, euphonaut, uh, it turns out kind of amusingly, to me at least, that that... Uh, critter does look like something that you might expect due to what's called a neotenic shift or a, or a gene rate growth shift so that uh, uh, our own human species might tend to look a little bit more like our own fetuses grown up, to say. Hmm. And so uh, I thought, well, that, that's kind of amazing that the biological part of this thing could actually make some sense that it would be the same species just in a future mode. Is there anybody, Doctor, doing any work on uh, computer projections, one might imagine, of how we might continue to evolve? No, and the reason why is that it, when you look at the thing in terms of the, of the theory of evolution, it doesn't make any sense. We basically have stopped our evolution now. We're not going to change on the basis of just natural activity. Now, we might to genetically, genetically re-engineer ourselves, but, and that, and that would have to do with this neon. Oh, that's fascinating. You're, you're concluding we have stopped our, our evolution. Yep. Then, then what, uh, well, I, now I'm pushed on time. I've got to do a newscast at the top of the hour. I would like to come back and continue this with you. So relax for about five minutes. We'll do some news and come back to you, Doctor. Okay. All right, Dr. Michael D. Swords from Michigan with us. More Area 2000. Coming up, I'm Art Bell. From Jackie Gong's Pleasure. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. I'd like to remind you if you have uh, information on something involving UFOs. Our psychology, life after death. We would like to have you, encourage you, in fact, to contact the Bigelow Foundation. Uh, they are the mentors for this program and a great deal of research that is done generally in the UFOs, life after death. You can contact the Bigelow Foundation at area code 702-456-1670. Your contact there, Angela Thompson. Area code 702-456-1606. Back now, in, we're in just a moment, to Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Swords, uh, who is somebody who looks into other people's uh, work and investigation. 
And I've got a couple of questions continuing on evolution here. Uh, in the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, you're welcome to get on the phone lines and uh, uh, line up to ask the doctor a question if you'd like. The local number, of course, is 383-8255. 383-8255. Toll free from outside the state of Nevada. Our number is 1-800-338-8255. Take these down, please. 1-800-338-8255. The wildcard direct dial lines are area code 702-385-7214-7214. And finally... If you have never called at all, you're welcome, of course, on the first-time caller line, which is area code 702-385-7213 or 7213. With that, back now to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Dr. Swartz. Good evening again, Doctor. Oh, uh, we were on the... So you really stopped me when you said that our evolution has stopped. Um, how, how do you conclude that? Now, that's actually something that biologists have known ever since the uh, theory of natural selection has got so much evidence and support it, because the way biological evolution proceeds is it only works when the offending characteristic, a characteristic that you don't want to have, is a characteristic that will kill you prior to you being able to mate and pass on the genes that create that characteristic, mm -hmm. or it's a characteristic that makes you so sexually unattractive that nobody wants to mate with you. So it is determined then by environmental considerations which are now stable? Well, the, the thing that stabilizes the thing is the fact that we have brains, and we don't wait around anymore to die. Instead, uh, the person with an appendix that gets ill has the appendix simply taken out. There's no evolutionary pressure for people with appendices to die anymore. Uh, the person who uh, uh, has a huge wart on his nose, nobody likes him, could have that wart removed if he wanted to. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Our intelligence allows us to adapt to negative conditions immediately rather than waiting around for the next generation to get lucky genetically. Suppose uh, there are stark environmental changes. The ozone dries up and blows away. The planet begins to heat. One of the things suggested by, uh, some of the things suggested by the environmentalists, would that then trigger uh, some evolutionary modification in human beings? Only if the catastrophe was so large that it destroyed our ability to technologically react to it. As long as we still have technology that would allow us to react to whatever this thing you're talking about is and preserve the life until it has a chance to mate, then it would have no effect. The catastrophe is big enough that it downs our technology again and we'll be back into the game of life then. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, there are a lot of people who uh, suggest that one of the motivations uh, for the intervention by extraterrestrials would be connected to genetics. And uh, I'm sure you've looked into that aspect. What are your comments? Now, I have tried for years to get David Jacobs and Bud Hopkins off of that because it, doesn't, it does not make any sense whatsoever. And finally, I think I've succeeded in getting uh, Dr. Jacobs to uh, change the way he talks about uh, what he's found. Uh, and he's talking now more about hybrids in the sense of changing uh, human genes rather than trying to mate alien genes to human genes, which is a, a, a theory that, that just doesn't make any sense at all. So if aliens are messing around with our genetics, they're simply messing around with our genetics to change us in some way, not to mate us with them. And uh, it, uh, that becomes very mysterious as to why they would be bothering. All right. Uh, since you, again, look into uh, everybody else's work, and that's what you do, uh, this question would be a good one. Uh, I've been looking into all this and interviewing people uh, for years now, and I have noticed that ufologists uh, seem to eat each other alive. Yes. And um, I would like your comments on that and how damaging it is to the overall credibility of, of the investigators. I think that uh, 
that your observation about uh, this being a mean street as far as uh, research is concerned is, is unfortunately more than accurate. Uh, there are some people who do not engage in that kind of uh, personality bashing who, who somehow manage to stay above it, but almost everybody manages to get down into this. The reason why I think that happens is that UFOs are something that the majority of people in the country seem so anxious to want to ignore or to ridicule or get rid of in some sort of way that the researchers in the field think that they have to be perfect. And as they try to be perfect, they end up taking some kind of extremist positions that will never allow themselves to admit that even some little part of what they've done is wrong. This ends up then when somebody comes back and tries to mention, perhaps even in a nice way, that some part of what they have done is wrong, it becomes very personal with them. I think the other reason why it happens all the time is that most of the folks who are doing research in did UFOs are amateurs. And I don't use that word in any pejorative sense. I'm using it in the old English word of people who love what they're doing, but they're not doing the thing it's an academic style, and uh, because of that, it just creates an environment that uh, that maximizes all the tiniest little errors to the worst possible end, and it really hurts the field getting any kind of credibility. Well, and maybe adding to it all is disinformation. Is there, or is there not, in your opinion, an active disinformation campaign by the government or any other agency or peoples? Is there a lot of disinformation, intentional disinformation out there? Well, that's a tougher one to know because the people doing the disinformation, if they are, are professionals and they're very good at it. But there are uh, known cases of UFO researchers themselves who have created disinformation for whatever crazy reasons they had going on in their head. Also, when you look at the Roswell investigation, there are hints in various places up and down the line that there's been some disinformation and some research blocking going on there. But if, if you're talking about the, the big guys in the Pentagon-shaped building and, and that outfit, that, that's harder to document because those people are good at what they do. Uh, I've got to ask, what is cryptozoology? Cryptozoology is, uh, that means hidden animal forms. And so that's the uh, group of people who's headed by Richard Greenwell in Tucson, Arizona, and Bill Bacrantz of Washington State, and Roy Mackle in Chicago, and that they look for the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot and the Bombal Snowman and dinosaurs in Africa, etc. All right. I, I just wanted to know, and uh, then just down below it is something that really piques my interest. Um, it was simply, it's simply entitled Disappearing Stars. And I have a man who calls me on my syndicated radio show and is doing research into precisely that, disappearing stars. He claims that um, uh, stars at, at different moments actually do, for varying periods of time, disappear. Um, what, do you, what do you know about that? Well, uh, the, for one thing, there is a known astronomical phenomenon which causes the star to seem to dim out to us. Uh, these are extreme variable stars, and that they go from a very high magnitude to a very low one as part of a cycle that probably signals the end of their life. But uh, that's, that's probably not the most interesting kind of disappearing star. No, this man is referring to ones that disappear and then uh, at the same intensity later reappear, and he has a th certain theory about that. Oscillating stars would in fact do that, and it would be a known phenomenon that would be occurring uh, probably near the end of a star's life as a variable. But uh, the, the, more, the things that have, are more puzzling for standard science, anyway, are cases where you have a very accurate adventure to everything else on his map looks like it couldn't be better, and yet here will be a rather prominent star sitting there, and we can't find it anymore. So uh, that there seems to be a case of a star that really did just disappear, and what in the world could be going on there, no one knows. All right. I, I would like uh, to get to the telephones, uh, if I could. We have a lot of people who would like to talk to you, Doctor. Oh, yeah. running the show. It's fine by me. All right, good. 
Uh, let's get to a few questions. Wild card line three. Good evening. You're on the air in Las Vegas with Michael Swords, Dr. Michael Swords. Oh, uh, Art and uh, Michael Swords. I've got uh, kind of a two-part question. Uh, first, with, with the so-called technology that these aliens have, uh, how come they're crashing on, uh, you know, like Roswell? And uh, the second part of the question is, uh, are these people forcibly being uh, told to keep quiet? Uh, maybe, you know, due to threat of uh, personal injury or uh, scandal or that type of thing, or right now, oh, it's an off the air. Uh, I'm not sure I have your second, the second part of what people are you referring to, sir? Oh, the, the uh, people of uh, Roswell. Oh, I see. The uh, witnesses and all that. You know? All right, all right, That's a, that is a good question. Uh, thank you. First of all, doctor, his question, if they have all this technology, why are they crashing? Well, uh, from what... I can tell from looking at the literature of crashes, there's probably only been one crash. Uh, the second thing I would say is that uh, uh, we've got a lot of pretty clever technology, too, and we make all kinds of foul-ups. I would assume that Murphy will continue to live in outer space for time immemorial. The third thing is it's suggested that the Roswell event occurred uh, during a uh, rather large um, high-voltage thunderstorm it could possibly be that this thing merged into that without really knowing that it could get electronic glitches in it by a direct strike. But the fourth thing to really say is, well, why sit around and speculate when we don't know what their technology is? Let's just go with the empirical evidence as we find it. Empirical evidence seems to indicate something very strange crash. Now, as far as that other question was concerned about the people being threatened or shut up. Threatened uh, or not, there's a lot of evidence that people were threatened in Roswell. And uh, especially the civilians, very uh, severely threatened, kind of embarrassingly threatened from your and my viewpoint as an American, like we wouldn't do that to the citizens. But uh, they, of course, are now just angry at this stage in life. But... Uh, well, you say there's a lot of evidence. Uh, can you give an example uh, when you say there's evidence they were threatened? For example, what? Well, uh, let's say you, you could go to perhaps six or eight people down in the Roswell area right now and ask them what had happened with their father and mother or themselves, if they're very much of an old still around, that caused them uh, to have all this nervousness after this event was over, and they will tell you, uh, all, even though they don't know one another necessarily, that they got these similar messages from the government telling them that they were not supposed to talk to them or there was going to be harm done to their family and, and in the case of the parents to the children or the people who were going to be taken away and never see them again. I mean, that outrageous sounding stuff. As far as the military people are concerned, the military people more mostly don't feel threatened. They just simply feel that, it, that they have made a, a personal duty vow and that they're not going to break it. And so that, uh, since their commanding officer is now dead, why uh, they, they can't find someone who will uh, be able to relieve them of their vow. Presume for a moment uh, all of this is true. The government is covering it up. They know. Um, if you personally had all of the evidence you needed, and you could have a news conference, and you could, beyond any shadow of a doubt, announce to the world that, oh, yes, it's real, oh, yes, they've been here. Here's the proof. Would you release it? Uh, I might give... <laughs> I, that question has gone through my mind quite a bit, because there's about 12 or 15 different reasons why you might not want to release it. Exactly. And, uh, and all these things are involved in pretty serious stuff about... Uh, government reaction, per people reaction, economic reaction, et cetera, to these things. And uh, I might possibly give the government one last chance to explain to me why I should release it, try to get in contact with them and say, this is something I've got. Of course, I'd protect myself on that, but I might give them one last shot to try to explain to me why I shouldn't be doing that. And if they w were to produce studies that showed you that the American people would react very poorly, that it would be disruptive of the entire social structure, that religion would be in danger of collapse and so forth, would that be enough? If they could prove that to me, I think I'd swallow it. But it's my belief that they can't prove that to me. Uh, Richard Hall has recently asked a bunch of us to write 
some essays on this exact topic, and I've gone down through the whole list of things, and, and I could see their reasoning for not wanting to release the information. I think right now we're at a stage where probably releasing the information would be the better thing to do. Have we been in a period of time uh, with all of these motion pictures and all the rest of it, uh, and even this type of show, where we are in essence preparing the American people to receive that information without going off the deep end? No, less than yes and no on that. Uh, shows like yours probably yes for most of the speakers on the show, but uh, the, the no part is the abduction part. And unless people like John Mack are correct, and this is some kind of a benign thing, the Bud Hopkins David Jacobs scenario, this thing being kind of horrible, is precisely the thing that would not want you to release information that this is real and it's going on and you can get plucked at any time and they'll be able to defend against it. All right. Um, then that brings up another good question. Uh, with everything you've looked at, would you say this is in all likelihood something that is, as far as we're concerned, horrible if we knew about it, or uh, is it uh, basically benign? It's my guess that, uh, and this is just a guess, and for goodness sakes, uh, don't, don't rate this as anything more important than one person's opinion, but the guess is that because human beings do not seem to have been deliberately harmed in some physical way, uh, now admittedly there are some possible exceptions to that in some of the claimed cases, but I still think that some of that stuff is pretty loose as far as the claims. But, I would say that the worst case scenario that I see so far would be of some um, self-centered group of individuals, ETs or whatever, that were using human emotions in some kind of a way, but uh, uh, did not uh, intend any uh, kind of a permanent harm to the host. And, uh, and so because we have been able to live with the shadow of the atomic bomb hanging over our head, I'm not clear to so sure that we could live with the shadow of this hanging over our head, knowing that we're going to get up in the morning and we're going to get up in the morning and we're going to get up in the morning well, yeah, plus I suppose the conjecture that uh, if they have this technology and met us harm, we'd be harmed. Yeah, and unless for some reason they are, they they want some other kind of thing out of us first and then still would be looking for harm afterwards. Mm. It's always a possibility. All right. Line one, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Swords, who is in Michigan. Well, good evening. Good evening. Um, I heard it's very interesting that you brought that particular part up that wasn't exactly what I called about, but I had a chance to talk to my grandmother a while back who remembers the night of the War of the Worlds uh, radio show. Yes. And uh, I, think th I think the biggest answer to your question about why they don't tell anybody is look at the reaction of that. I, I mentioned that to you once before, but the interesting part that I, the interesting information that I didn't have on that at that time was that people were killing themselves and killing their children because they really thought that... Uh, you know, that these uh, beings were visiting Earth as well. Well, of course, uh, if you ever heard that radio show, it, it was awful. I mean, they were zapping people, eating people, you know, people. It was not a benign visit. To, uh, so that was then, and it, that is an interesting uh, subject. Well, I'll ask uh, the doctor about it in a moment. Uh, the thing on that, though, that I want to elaborate on, Art, is that, yeah, maybe the times have changed and our technology has gotten a little bit better. But human nature is human nature. I mean, if I were out in the, and if I, and it seems really funny to me that the only people that really get a chance to experience this kind of stuff is Billy Joe Bob, who lives, you know, out in Bufu land. The thing, the thing that really uh, gets me about is uh, they, human nature is human nature. He's going to feel, uh, I need to protect myself. I've got a gun. Bang. Or, you know, Whatever else, uh, no, but I can't really tell you of very many people who are going to sit back with open arms and say, come on in, have some tea, tell me about where you're from, uh, and that sort of thing. All I right. think people are going to be really uh, on the defensive. And as far as, you know, all the movies coming out in this radio show, I really don't, I, I really think that these kind of things can desensitize people on a lot of issues, but I don't think this is one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, it's a, it's all right, do you, have, do you have a specific question or... Well, I would like him to, to, to comment on that. I... All right. All right. We will do that. Thank you. 
Doctor, I guess he's saying that uh, he, he, you can't be desensitized really on this issue, uh, nor can you be prepared, and he points to that radio broadcast. Indeed, that was a big disaster. And I wonder if uh, uh, a decision, for example, in, in Washington to keep all this silent might be based on a, that catastrophe, which is probably one of the best studies of what human beings would think. The government, the government uh, was perfectly aware of the Orson Welles broadcast situation, and in fact, it right. appears in a couple of uh, studies that were made by them to ask the questions about the response to uh, just the general question of the meaning of extraterrestrials. I think, with all due respect, that the young gentleman's uh, uh, facts on what went on in New Jersey were wrong. Uh, the, uh, the extent of the damage there were basically um, automobile accidents and things like that. Uh, people Not a lot of suicide, people killing their children, sort of thing. My reading of the situation, there, there was, uh, uh, I would say, none of that, but let's be open and say little or none of that. Uh, I don't believe that any of that went on. Um, in terms of uh, uh, what kind of people uh, are... Done. It isn't all, always Billy Joe Bob out in Podunk. Yeah. Uh, we know of, of people all up and down the uh, socioeconomic spectrum and through all the races, and uh, it's a wide mix of people who are coming in and talking about this. But one of the guys who makes the rounds is uh, Dr. John Salter from, uh, I believe, South Dakota State University. And um, here, here's a guy who took a, a, a totally intellectual approach to the experience all the way through. Um, I do think it's true that there are, is going to be a significant segment of the American people who are very anxiety-prone, and that you can't desensitize them to that. And that, I think, I think is right. But I think, on the other hand, we have been, as I mentioned before, living under a threat that is at least as horrifying as this, namely the hydrogen bomb, for a couple of decades now. And somehow or other, although it, it scarred us, uh, we managed to go about our business. So I think that the jury's out as to, uh, as to what the impact of this would be. All right, Doctor. Uh, hold on just one second while I do a station ID, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Area 2000. My guest this week is Michael D. Swords, Dr. Michael D. Swords. He looks into other people's research in these areas and is a fascinating individual, which you should know by now. If you would like to... Uh, Make a comment. The only line I have open is one local line that we just cleared at 383-8255 or 8255. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, this is Area 2000 on the air every Sunday evening from 8 until 10 o'clock. Happy to be with you. Uh, back in a moment to Dr. Swords. Well, no, back right now to Dr. Swords. Doctor, you're back on the air again. And there are a bunch of people that want to speak with you, so uh, let's keep moving through these calls. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Swords, who is in Michigan. Where are you calling from, please? Good evening. This is Fritz from Los Angeles. Los Angeles. All right. Okay. Uh, just correction. Uh, the previous caller said there was mass panic. Yes, it was a disaster in 1938 with the Orson Show, but there was nobody killed. Like Dr. Swords said, there were a few car accidents and a few handful of strokes. Some people got excited, but it was not a mass panic like everybody said. But it is true that the government and the Air Force way back in the Dr. Menfolk's uh, uh, time used this as a barometer to said, well, there was this incident in New York and then there was an other copycat somewhere in Europe in, in a Latin country where they had also Orson Welles war, a copycat type where people really went berserk. And so they used this as a barometer uh, and they said, hey, the people are not ready, etc., etc. All right. Do you have a specific question? Well, there's a film coming out now from Russia called Cosmic Dark Secret. Uh, by a producer, I think, his name is Avinsky, where the Russian scientists and ufologists exchanging information with our ufologists, and a major is interviewed there where he will claim that uh, alleged 
two Russian soldiers standing guard were abducted, and that also a UFO was shooting at an antenna on a radar station. I don't know if that the source is aware of it, but this film should come out very soon here and make the signals. Are you aware of that film, Doctor? I'm not. I'm sorry. All right. Well, he's not. Uh... Well, I will make the circles eventually, but uh, the Russians are catching on now and trying to have the freedom of speech. In some way, they're behind the UFO research, but they're more open-minded than we are. Uh, they really are hungry for knowledge, and they have less fear than we are. We have sort of, a, sort of yeah, we have a, a coverage on here, an umbrella of fear, because we've been so conditioned that the ETs above somehow Russian people embrace the ET contact. Mm -hmm. uh, they need just more information. They're hungry for the information. All right, thanks, Fritz. Uh, and that is a good subject. Linda Howe was in Europe uh, a few weeks ago, Doctor, and there is, or there does seem to be, a very distinctly different attitude through Europe and, and I suppose in Russia and elsewhere than there is in this country. How do you account for the, uh, I, I don't want to say unnatural interest, but greater interest uh, in, in America in, in this subject? Uh, I, I think that uh, we're not getting a, a very uh, correct view of what the Europeans and the Russians uh, have really have in terms of interest. After all, what do you have? You have a few UFO, U.S. researchers going over there. Naturally, the people they're meeting with are the people who are most interested in UFOs. They're going to put on their most positive views on the thing, especially the Russians do that, because the Russians not only want to make linkages with the U.S. researchers, but they also want us to uh, help support their research, because Russia is so destitute for money. The major institutions uh, over there for the Soviet Union for UFO research uh, ends up uh, every time, and I understand this, and don't hold it against them, but they end up every time asking you for money uh, at the end of their letters. And uh, Hard currency, please. Yes, indeed. And I don't think that... Uh, uh, I would say that, if anything, in, in Europe, that there's much less interest in UFOs. Uh, the, the tendency of the people who study UFOs in in several of those countries is to view the thing as a psychosociological phenomenon. In fact, that's the heartland of that particular theory about UFOs. Uh, I don't think, I would say that if there is a, an unusual interest in the Soviet Union, it might be because they've just gone through so many decades of atheistic materialism and that this is a uh, kind of a living substitute to them. But uh, other than that, uh, First time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Swartz. Hello there. Line two, you're on the air with Dr. Swartz. Good evening. Well, hello. Yeah, Art, I uh, just want to tell you, I really like your show, Wentz. I've been listening for years. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I got a couple questions for the doctor. First, uh, one is on abductions. And the question I have is, uh, what does your research uh, show as far as abductions through tangible items as far as uh, walls, canvas, tents, etc. And the second is, if you've done any research as far as in Area 51 in Nevada, I've done some of my, uh, my own research up in that area, and it's uh, been very, uh, I can't really say the word for it, but uh, I've seen a lot of weird things up there. All right, Doctor, um, uh, let's go to Area uh, uh, 51, uh, if you would. It's just to the north of us here, and uh, I wonder what sort of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, documentation and research uh, about this area. Some people speculate there are discs up there uh, and so forth and so on. What have you learned about that? Now, the, as far as the more spectacular kinds of claims are concerned, I, I haven't yet been very impressed with those because of the, uh, of the very fragmentary nature of the information and to some degree the uh, aspersions that have been cast on, on some of the people delivering it, but in terms of there being a lot of weird stuff in the air over there, I, I don't think anybody doubts that. Uh, Aviation Geek and Space Technology Magazine uh, is constantly documenting uh, uh, very high-performance envelope vehicles that are flying over Nevada. And uh, to me, if I take that as the baseline of my information and I look back through time, uh, I think that what they're flying out there is spectacular, but I don't think it's beyond the direction of the technology that you see uh, just prior to that, that real good old-fashioned 
U.S. technical magic rather than extraterrestrial technical magic. So I haven't uh, I haven't seen anything yet in the uh, Area 15 idea that would lead me to believe that we have to have uh, uh, UFOs and back engineered alien technology out there. Although I sure have heard the rumors, like everyone else has. And it certainly might be the place to take it if you had it. Caller, what was your first question, please? Uh, this question was on far as abductions through tangible items such as uh, houses and walls or uh, tents, that kind of thing, in remote areas. But, uh, getting back on far as Area 51, um, I want to ask Dr. Fires if you had any uh, observations as far as uh, anything as far as pulses in the area, as far as uh, like uh, laser-type items. I've seen whole mountain ranges lighted up in that area. We're talking uh, magnitude of you know 10 miles across in depth. All right. Uh, doctor? Well, I've heard uh, from some of the people on the air tech side of the thing that uh, the, the engines of the, of the so-called pulsar craft yeah, are, are so great that when they turn on, that they light up the whole area around. So, again, I think that, that it's not just something like it's a laser effect. It's something like it's a big engine of a big engine. All right. I'm going to tell you about two weeks ago. I'm 48 years old, Doctor. I've never seen a UFO. Two weeks ago, I saw something I absolutely could not explain, um, though I think it might have been an experimental aircraft. On my way home, uh, a large triangular craft passed about 150 feet above me. Uh, it was it was actually lit up. It had what appeared to be anti-collision lights, two white lights, one red light at each point of the triangle, and that's what it was, Doctor. It was a perfect triangle, and uh, at about an altitude of, I'd estimate, 150 feet, passed above me, making not even a sound. I had my automobile stop. You could hear crickets a quarter mile away. I mean, there was no sound at all, and it just passed above me. Now, I live in a valley just adjacent to uh, uh, Area 51, and my presumption is I saw some sort of incredible experimental aircraft. Uh, I, I have no idea what it was, but it was low enough and slow enough, I would describe it almost as floating, uh, that it absolutely simply is, is nothing that I know that we have. It, it was remarkable, Dr. Remarkable. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm impressed with that kind of a thing because, uh, first of all, if you're a, uh, a credible witness seeing something fairly close, uh, it's a good close encounter of the first kind report, and it matches the pattern of the so-called Belgian triangles that uh, were researched so well by the Belgian government um, uh, a few years back, it's almost precisely the same description that was given for the objects that appeared uh, quite often over a several month period in Belgium. Well, I, I don't know what I saw. If I was pressed to the wall, doctor, I would say that I saw some sort of experimental aircraft. Uh, but people, most people feel that they have to, uh, the, the, the crooks of the thing is that if what you saw was the same kind of an object that was in Belgium, then the, the key thing is the, the Belgian uh, radar reports, which show uh, an extremely rapid direction and upward acceleration that should have produced more G-forces than a pilot could have taken, and do seem to be a little out of the performance envelope that we would expect from a current technology. A little out is putting it mildly, uh, and I'm still thinking very hard about that encounter. I just thought I would take that moment to discuss. Okay, uh, line three, you're on the air with Dr. Swords in Michigan. Good evening. Good, good evening. I think is, everything is made is more one point to make believe people that they will be alive after death. And this is not true. All those people who believe in the UFO, those are the same people who talk all the time about Jesus and, and his mother. Who, who they see those people, they see the, uh, Jesus and his mother and, uh, in different kind of places, like in Sigoria, like in Poland, like in different... And this is absolutely not true. Maybe you need children to tell them those kind of stupid stories about life after death and about Jesus alive and his mother alive and you of all. And you make it, it's a propaganda now, like it, it, they grow like mushrooms after the rain, after the collapse by the Soviet, the, the Soviet Union. So they try to make people believe in more stupid ideas and more stupid lies. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, now, in that man, Doctor, I just left him on because I wanted to hear it, and I wanted you to hear it. There are a lot of people who react just like that man does to this information. They may make the best case for never releasing it. There's anger, hostility, and, uh, and I have this feeling that if the information ever came out, that man would be on the warpath. Yeah, I, I, that was a very quiet uh, sound coming to me, and so I, all I could get from that is that uh, this is a gentleman who was something for people to complain about uh, UFO things like legendary virgin things or precisely like that. Yeah, but what, what I would say is that we've always had a element in society that, um, that needed some very simplistic or, or they become somewhat uh, unhinged, and uh, uh, things are going to happen. When we walked on the moon, uh, uh, this kind of a person is either going to go into a state of denial that it never happened, or it's going to have some kind of a, of a life crisis. Uh, the same thing is going to be true if uh, Carl Sagan gets any extraterrestrial signals, if uh, the Darwinian theory of evolution sounds like it's better, or, or whatever. So we can't protect that element of the population against new things happening, and, and I still don't think that it's a, it's a useful uh, uh, reason to deny full information. Well, nevertheless, um, uh, perhaps not. I, you know, is there any way of estimating what percentage of people uh, in the population would react as that, that man seemed to be? Uh, there probably is if you were talking to a, uh, a psychologist that uh, looked at statistical data allow me to uh, to reflect on something that might uh, might cast some light on that, but it wouldn't do exactly the same thing. When you look at the way in which human nervous systems are geared, uh, you find that about 1% of the human species is geared at such a high level that they can't even get their thought processes to go straight, and we end up calling them things like schizophrenia. If you boil that down to the next stage in the curve, you might say that there's uh, between, uh, say, 5 or 6 percent or so of the population that might be so highly wired that they're anxiety prone. No, well, that adds up to a lot of people these days. It does add up to a lot of people, but there's no way to, uh, there's no way to protect that group of people from the fact that life goes on. Hmm. And uh, so I would say that... Uh, you, you let life go on, and you don't uh, uh, try to uh, cushion things and hide them because if things get worse and then they do break, you've just made a bigger problem. Indeed. All right, Doctor. Good evening. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Swords on Area 2000. Hello, Doctor. Hello. I have a question for you, and, uh, well, the question is, have you noticed or is there any research being done on what seems to have changed the uh, physiognomy of the women of mainly Western Europe and North and South America. And I have some examples. Uh, well, go ahead with your example. Well, for instance, uh, the arms of women since uh, roughly the mid-70s have become very long, and their hands are either very narrow with long fingers or large hands, thick fingers, the facial structure seems to have stabilized in a very angular uh, dimension, and the mouth has widened. The features are becoming very close set, and the length of the leg is becoming long, and also its size is becoming very narrow, very uh, slender. Where does this information come from? Yeah, I, I've got the same question. <laughs> Where'd you get this, sir? Uh, this is just observation. Oh, I see. Now, this seems to be the uh, type of uh, female, which seems to be mainly in the U, like I said, in uh, North and South America and, the, and Western Europe, this seems to be becoming a very dominant feature, especially the legs and the arms. All right. Thank you. Um, doctor, uh, do you uh, concur with any of those observations? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to get Dr. Sword back. Um, all right, caller, um, I appreciate it. We're going to have to... Uh, uh, find out if he concurs with any of that. Take a look at the beach. Take a look at the beach? Now, the next time you uh, look, well, say, at movies from, say, roughly 1960 to date when they show uh, 
crowd scenes or women at the beach, etc. Not the actresses, but just general women, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's becoming real striking. I, I've never even heard such a thing suggested before. Try it. Try it and see, and you'll begin to notice certain features are becoming standard. Well, do you think that's just something you're noticing, or do you think it's actually some sort of, you know, real change that's going on? Well, from what I've seen, it, it seems to be a genuine genetic change. It's not, I'm not talking surgical alteration either. Because who in their right mind would have, for instance, the uh, muscles in their calves reduced? And how would you narrow someone's hand without uh, cutting away so much musculature that you couldn't close your hand? That's a very good point, caller. Very good point. And, Doctor, we've got you back now. Um, the, I still have this caller, same caller on the line. Okay. And uh, he's, again, he's saying that he's noticing all of these changes uh, in women. Do you concur with any of that at all? Thank you, caller. No, I, uh, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, well, well uh, I was saying before the gremlins got into the works of the phone company here, uh, uh, I don't know what you make of that because uh, I, I watch uh, women just as much as anyone else, I suppose, and I haven't noticed except perhaps if he's sitting around watching the shapes of actresses and models, which could possibly be changing to the fashion of some sort. <laughs> Line two, uh, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Swords, who's in Michigan. Start? Yes. Yeah, this is Sam against Las Vegas. Okay, we're only allowed uh, to make one call. Sir. I understand that. Right? All right, well, thank you then for the call. And good evening out of state. You're on the air with Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Swords, who's in Michigan. Yes. Uh, when do you think the government will reveal to the American people that there are actually UFOs? Uh, That's a good question. Dear brother. Um, Doctor, any, any comment on that? When might they reveal it, or what might provoke them to reveal it? Or, or can they be pushed into it? Well, of course, uh, all of us that are interested in the Roswell case are constantly trying to think of something productive along those lines all the time. I certainly don't believe that marching with tickets out in front of the White House asking for Bill Clinton to come clean is going to do it. I think, in fact, if anything, that's a negative way of going about things because that that is it, it, it puts it into an, kind of an on-serious light i think in most people's mind and actually causes negative pressure um, if there were a, another couple of uh, major breaks of the security people then perhaps the combination of what's already known on roswell and uh say a current guardian of the black box that contains this stuff would uh would come through with something, but if, if you don't have a, a, a major leak of some kind, I don't see any incentive for the government to make a leak. And there may be more uh, on social side that dictates you wouldn't uh, reveal it unless you had to. I suppose. And it's been stated by some experts in the past that if you've got a situation that has essentially nothing on the positive side except solving Absolutely, and that's what it would seem to add up to. Line three, you're on the air with Dr. Swords. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh, is that me? That's you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was on my way home, and I, and I heard this discussion, and it must have been at least 20 years ago. It might have been a little longer than that. I remember my husband came home with a book, and it was called Chariots of the Gods. Has the doctor ever heard of this book? Oh, I suspect so. Th uh, thank you. Uh, doctor, what about that, Chariots of the Gods? Well, oh, he's talking about the uh, thing that made Eric Von Daniken a multimillionaire, of course. Uh, Eric Von Daniken actually did uh, the concept of ancient astronauts a disservice. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea that you could have had extraterrestrial visitations at ancient times and that these particular visitations would have affected the cultures in terms of the making of their buildings or more likely the uh, sculpting of their mythology. But but since Eric Von Daniken played so fast and loose with the facts and made such uh, horrendous errors and howling zingers uh, throughout his book, he took what was a potentially respectable uh, theory and uh, it, it completely ran the entire scholarly community off of it. At one time, even Carl Sagan, prior to Von Daniken's input, even Carl Sagan had broached a 
series of the God's type hypothesis in a uh, famous search for extraterrestrial intelligence textbook that he wrote. And, of course, Carl Sagan wouldn't be caught dead of saying anything about that now. Big flap going on now about Mars, about the Explorer, the loss of the Explorer. Um, what feedback are you getting on that, Doctor? Uh, the feedback that I'm getting is that, uh, that NASA just screwed up and that uh, we're, we, we set back a couple of years ago and, and yucked it up and called the Soviets a bunch of, of goons for pushing the wrong button on their Phobos probe. And uh, now we've apparently made a, not a computer error, but a mechanical error, and that there's some sort of a, of a transistor that has been known to have failed in a couple of other spacecraft before that was also put back into this thing, and that if it failed again, like it has failed before, we would have lost contact. So that, that though, it, it seems so unlikely. If you had a transistor that had failed in one craft, Surely you would put it through its paces. Uh, you'd already experienced a large financial loss as a result of it. Why would you put it in yet another uh, craft? It started failing the rings on the shuttle before we let one blow up, too. Good point. We're, we're capable of any amount of stupidity because the organization is so big that it doesn't keep good track of our people. All right. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Michael Swords, who is in Michigan. Where are you, please? Hello? Apparently not. Line two, you're on the air with Dr. Swords. Good evening. Yeah, uh, uh, about that the world news thing, those are hoaxes, those pictures on there. They just want to sell, you know, one shot out of it. Most of those years ago, but they're all hoaxes. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. I'm very well aware of their reputation. Do you have a question for the doctor? I'm a fellow from America. I'm a All right, I understand. Thank you. Good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Michael B. Swords, who is in Michigan. Where are you calling from, please? I'm down in California. Santa Ana. Go ahead. Um, yes. I just wanted to say that um, I really think they should disclose any information that they they have on UFOs. I feel like I should have a right to know, and I want to know. And I feel like, I don't know, maybe it would do some good uh, for a lot of people if they knew that there was something more than, or something bigger than us, than this, beyond this planet. Something to strive for, I guess. Well, I guess that has to be balanced against what the doctor said about what the reaction would be among, say, 5% uh, of the population or so. Uh, but it sounds as though you're looking forward to it. Yeah, and I think that uh, 95% should outweigh that 5%. I, I think most people would welcome it, and it would do wonders for, I don't know, I guess just our whole outlook on things. All right, very good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just a comment, Doctor. She thinks the 95% would benefit far more than the 5% that would go around the corner. Of course, we don't know about 95% or 5%. We don't know what people are thinking, but the government has already tried to play that mind game, too, and see how that came out. And what the Brookings Institute said in their report to NASA was that when a, a superior culture and an inferior culture intimately meet, and so that there's a genuine sharing of information between them, the inferior culture almost always dies in terms of a self-ordaining kind of a culture and becomes just a appendix sucking in whatever it gets from its now big brother and doesn't any further develop on its own. So that as uh, Carl Jung, the famous Swedish or Swiss psychologist, uh, uh, supposed to have gotten this information about talking to an Amazonian shaman. The Amazonian shaman said, back to Jung, you have stolen all our dreams. And so the, the happy thought of us having this wonderful new possibility out there might, might well be very negative as far as independent development of the human race. All right. Uh, line three, you're on the air with... How are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. Uh, we need more time for these I know. shows, but anyway, real quick, uh, I'm just curious that I've been trying to get that shuttle off the ground. Is that? It is now off the ground. Well, it, 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 yes, it did successfully oh. launch. Oh, finally, yeah. I was just curious if that was, had anything to do with that screw-ups or they were just pressured by people from the unknown that they didn't want it to launch or something. No, it's up, sir. Ah, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, out of state very quickly as we run out of time for Dr. Michael Swords in Michigan. Good evening. Line one, good evening. 
Good evening, Art and Doctor. I'll try to make this fast because I know time is running out. First of all, Doctor, have you ever heard of Noah Fredericks, who is a biblical and UFO researcher? And then I have a second part to the question. I have not. Okay. He basically believes that uh, UFOs have been around even before biblical uh, time in history. And my question is to do with the finger formation of alien descriptions. If you ran every description on a computer, do you know how many or if many came up with six fingers? And the reason I'm asking, the other day when I was doing my own biblical research, I found that in First Chronicles 20th chapter, verse 6, they mention a being with six fingers and six toes, that he's of large stature. Sorry, I'm sorry, time just about gone. Uh, doctor, any response? Well, the uh, UFO humanoids are almost always described as having either four or five fingers and not six. Hmm. Dr. Thorne, we really could use a whole lot more time for this subject. We only get, however, two hours. And as I do with most of my guests, uh, particularly you, since you have to everybody else's research, I would like to have you back sometime. Oh, that's a possibility. Well, it has been a distinct pleasure, and you're an easy interview, and I thank you. Well, you're welcome. Well, you, have be a pleasure. you have a good evening, sir. Uh, Dr. Michael G. Smith, and I'm afraid that's it, everybody. We operate as close as we can. Uh, to um, uh, to what's going on here to the pack, and so that's going to do it. Remember, if you have any information at all uh, that you would like checked out, anything you would like to look into, the Bigelow Foundation has the ability and has the resources to accomplish that, and I urge you to call them. Their number is coming up now, and we'll see you again next week at 8 o'clock. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-166. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. Welcome to Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening, and welcome to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. And my guest this evening, right after our report from George Knapp, is going to be Stanton Friedman, all the way from Canada, a nuclear physicist, a lecturer, and a big name in UFO circles. And uh, we will get to uh, Mr. Friedman in just a very few moments. First, I want to tell you, Linda Howe is on her way back at this hour to Philadelphia. And uh, so she's not going to be with us this morning. And we'll catch up with her next week. There's uh, no way, apparently, to do it uh, in the air or in flight, I guess. So we'll not hear from Linda this evening. But our roving journalist, George Knapp, is here, and he'll catch us up with uh, uh, what happened with the lectures that went on and the meetings that went on, what's new in the world of UFOs, and so let's do it. George, good evening. Good to talk to you. I'm here to tell you about the glamorous life of the UFO journalist. (laughs) All right. So contrary to popular opinion, it's not just all well-aged airport hot dogs, you know. 
I just walked in the door minus my lost luggage. Oh, boy. After a weekend trip to Springfield, Missouri, for the annual Midwest UFO Conference, which, in my opinion, is just about the best-run conference in this business. Uh, there's so much going on in the field of research, it's difficult to keep up with all of it. Uh, the day when UFOs merely meant elusive lights in the sky is long gone, and the phenomenon is sprouting off in several intriguing directions. Highlights from the conference include a rare occurrence by Dr. Jesse Marcel, Jr. Uh, Marcel's father, as you know, Art, was the military intelligence officer who discovered the wreckage of an alleged alien craft near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Marcel, Jr. remembers the night his father brought pieces of this wreckage home. He described how light but tough the metal was, and he clearly remembers the odd writings and inscriptions on the metal, some sort of language that he had never seen before. It was a very persuasive statement from an unassuming man who actually held this material in his hands, and I know that this is something your guest tonight is certainly qualified to discuss. Uh, abduction researcher Bud Hopkins, who was a guest on this program a few weeks ago, shared some of his latest findings as well, including the case of a missing seven-month-old fetus. Uh, one day this lady is pregnant, the next day the fetus is gone, seven months into the term. Uh, attempts to fully document this case are underway, and Bud says he will keep us posted. I had a chance to have an extended personal conversation with Bud concerning the Linda Cortile abduction case, which occurred in New York City, has been getting a lot of attention, and which was uh, witnessed by several people, including an important political figure. Uh, Bud's been hit with everything but the bathroom fixture by his detractors in the past couple of months, and, and I think uh, the bathroom is exactly where a lot of this criticism belongs. They have been uh, vicious, unfair, and personal attacks on him, probably, I think, because the debunkers, which Stan Friedman certainly knows intimately, uh, realize the importance of this case. That Hopkins is confident, though, he says, when all the evidence comes out, that he will prevail. Uh, also on the abduction topic, a panel of abductees ably guided by the conference organizer, John Carpenter. They shared some very moving insights into their experiences. You know, it's difficult to hear these, these gut-wrenching stories and not be affected by them, uh, at least on, on one kind of an emotional level. Some major crop formation news was unveiled this weekend. Linda Howe, who, who certainly sends her regrets about being unable to join us tonight, reported on some scientific tests conducted on seeds of plants found inside these crop formations in England. Uh, there are apparently clear, scientifically measurable differences in how these seeds grow in comparison with seeds found just outside the formations. They grow slower, at least that's my understanding, and they exhibit several genetic changes. We also know that significant changes in the soil have been measured there, as if the soil had been bombarded by high-energy physics, some sort of particles. That kind of evidence sort of rules out hoaxers. Premier crop researcher Colin Andrews also had some bad news for people who think the formations are all hoaxes. Andrew says that recent formations turned up on land owned by both Prince Charles and the British Prime Minister. Uh, because of uh, people, the people that they are, their land is patrolled and is even monitored by security cameras. However, no one saw anything about the formation of these crop uh, circles. If it is hoaxers, they're awfully clever and awfully brave to go on land that is patrolled and, and uh, is fairly secure. Andrews also reported on a first-ever type crop formation in England a Star of David appeared in a field on the same day that Israel and the PLO signed their historic peace agreement. It's a weird coincidence. It gets really far out there, but then you have to ask yourself, yeah, could someone be trying to tell us something? I don't know. Wow. <laughs> That's my comment. Wow. Okay, George, can I take you back one second? You were talking about New Mexico and the crash in New Mexico and the pieces. Um, George, is there anybody who claims to have, or do you have any knowledge that anybody still has any of these pieces? Uh, not to my knowledge. You really should put that question to Stan, because I got a feeling from uh, my conversations with him that uh, that he may be on on uh, online to try to find some people who may have picked this stuff up. Of course, the military came in and uh, and tried to scoop up all of the material, according to the, the witness reports. There are even reports that uh, some of the material was recovered by uh, some people who lived in the area, and the military found out that they had squirreled it away, and they came and got it even even days or weeks after the crash. But there could still be some in somebody's basement or attic somewhere. I guess it's possible, sure. And I think, uh, I think actually, Stan, uh, I hope I'm not giving away too much, is, is on the trail of that. I certainly will ask. Thank you for that tip. Back to the conference. Between five and 600 people attended this event, and, and they certainly went away with plenty to think about. Most surprising to me 
uh, of all was that the media response. Uh, on the first day of this conference, the Springfield newspaper had a front-page story about it, and some of its speakers, all three local TV stations ran stories on it. Fox TV out of L.A. was also there taping interviews. They were even interested in talking to your roving reporter here. Uh, no jokes about saucer nuts or Elvis sightings or Bigfoot or any of that sort of thing, just straight stories about, about the material that was being presented. It was a nice change from some of the, the snide and childish things that we've been reading here in the Las Vegas media. Yeah, but you know, George, before you finally make that comment, that is that they treated it well, you almost need to see the final aired report, because a lot of times right at the end of something that looks serious, from your perspective, having done the interview, will engender some sort of flippant little remark at the end. Sure, the little happy talk uh, from the, uh, the anchor people, but that didn't yeah. happen in this case. And, oh, okay. Uh, it was a real pleasant surprise. You know, the, the Las Vegas newspapers might want to uh, take a, a message from this, you know, and get in touch with the interests of their own readers one of these days. This Las Vegas Library lecture series that your guest tonight is coming out here for, uh, you know, it's sold out in a couple of days. Linda Howe is also coming to, to town. There's a great deal of interest in this topic. People take it seriously on some sort of an innate sense, and uh, you would think that the media would, would uh, pay attention to what, uh, what their readers and listeners are, are saying to them. Uh, Southwest Missouri was not only the site for this conference, it, it's also something of a UFO hotbed. Since the beginning of this year, there have been 70 UFO sightings reported in that area of Brown Springfield, including 17 disc shapes. 27 of those incidents involved multiple witnesses. Abduction reports in the area have virtually exploded, and there have been a few dozen reported cattle mutilations as well. It's almost like you can say, the gang's all here. Uh, I put the question to John Carpenter, why such activity is so prevalent there, he admits a lot of it has to do with awareness. In other words, when the public becomes educated uh, to look for such things, and he, as he and his team have done, they find them. And in that sense, it, it may be that there's a lot more of this sort of activity in the hometowns of our listeners all over the West here, just waiting to be uncovered. We add this caveat, of course, j just because someone sees lights in the sky doesn't mean it's an alien spaceship. Ninety percent of all sightings are misidentifications, and just about anyone would agree with that. And just because someone says they've been abducted doesn't make it so. And not every cow that's killed is killed by someone from Alpha Centauri or the Ninth Dimension. Now, people interested in these types of phenomena certainly need to keep an open mind, tempered, though, with a healthy dose, dose of skepticism. Right. And by skepticism, I don't mean the distorted version of the word, uh, which has come to mean, basically, it can't be true, therefore it isn't, no matter what evidence you have. Uh, one final comment, Art, regarding your guest last week, Dr. Michael Swords. Uh, we were certainly glad to have a man with his credentials on the show, but, but I can't let some of this just pass without comment. As you noted, noted several times in last week's program, Dr. Swords is not really a researcher. He reviews the work of other researchers. Right. He said two things which directly affect the work that I've been doing, which, which I take strong exception to. Number one, he said, we've heard nothing out of Russia about UFOs except rumors, rumors about what their government knows, and that simply is not true. As we have mentioned before briefly on this program, we were in Russia a few months ago. Uh, we obtained uh, several hundred pages of official government and military documents. We interviewed government, military, and scientific people, people who have a great deal of inside information about what Russia knew about UFOs and knows about UFOs, solid information, not rumors. They take it very seriously, and they say we take it seriously, too. Uh, the second thing is, Dr. Sword says there isn't much to this Area 51 stuff. It's all conventional aircraft, although it may be top-secret U.S. planes that people have been seeing. Right. Uh, I think that may be true now, but I think there is a lot of testimony and other evidence to suggest that this was not always the case. And we're not merely talking about the Bob Lazar uh, testimony. There's a lot of people who have uh, given testimony about what they've seen out there. And, uh, and while it may be planes or flares or whatever now, I'm not sure that was always the case. To my knowledge, though, in the four years I've been working on this story, Dr. Swords has never spoken to any of the witnesses or investigators. He's never been to Area 51. He has done no investigation whatsoever. And I think it's certainly okay to have an opinion on this or anything else. But if you're going to make the kind of definitive statement that he made last week, I think the audience deserves to know whether you know what you're talking about. Uh, it was still an interesting program. I hope you invite Dr. Swords back again sometime. Uh, your guest tonight is a really interesting man. He and I, um, as you may have guessed, Art, have had some very distinct disagreements about a lot of issues, but it's generally been kind of a healthy disagreement, which is the way it should be, as long as both sides are doing some honest research. Well, give me a couple of healthy directions to look then, George. Where, uh, if I might, uh, where are your disagreements? Uh, Lazar, basically. 
Um, Those are. Stan, uh, Stan has had, uh, has had uh, significant doubts about Lazar all the way along. He has done, I think in fairness to him, he has done a lot more research than just about any of the other people who have uh, who've been down on Lazar in the Area 51 story. In fact, I'm certain that he's done more. Uh, a lot of people have taken shots at this area, uh, but have based it on nothing more than gut hunches or uh, scuttlebutt or whatever. Stan has actually tried to do some work. We still have uh, disagreements about the, the nature of his research and his findings, but as I said, I think that's really a, a fairly healthy thing for this kind of a field. He knows a lot about UFOs as, as much as anyone in the world, I think. No one has worked harder to add credibility to the field. I look forward to hearing him tonight, and I look forward to hearing him here in Las Vegas. Good enough, George. I really appreciate it. Okay. And uh, filling in a little bit uh, on the other side for Linda as well, in a way. We'll be back. All right. We'll see you next week, George. Thanks. Take care. That's George Knapp, our roving reporter who just managed to rove back barely in time uh, from the Midwest to get on the show this morning. Linda did not. She's in the air, and she'll be with us next week. And now, from Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, all the way to Canada, we're going to speak with Stanton T. Friedman. He is a nuclear physicist and lecturer. He received an MS degree in physics from the University of Chicago in 1956 and has had three distinct careers since then. For 14 years, he worked on the development of a wide variety of classified, advanced nuclear and space systems for such companies as General Electric, Westinghouse, General Motors. Uh, from 1970 to 1982, he lectured about and researched UFOs full time. Since 1982, he has combined lecturing, industrial consulting, and various research and communications activities. Overall, he's spoken at more than 600 colleges and to many dozens of professional groups in all 50 states, nine Canadian provinces, Germany, Finland, and England. He's appeared on hundreds of radio and TV shows across North America to include Night Run, Sally Josie Raphael, Unsolved Mysteries, A Closer Lit, UFO Report, Sightings, Ron Reagan Jr., Canada AM, and many more. He's published more than 60 articles about UFOs and co-authored the August 1992 book, Crash at Corona, now in its third printing. Here is Stanton Friedman. Mr. Friedman, good evening. It's a pleasure to be on. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and we do have a remarkably good connection for this great distance. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's a better connection than I've had with some people a, a time zone or two away, so I'm, I'm thankful. Um, Mr. Friedman, I'm going to stay here right where we left here with George. Uh, of course, as you know, uh, the place in which we're broadcasting is very much adjacent to the south of Area 51, and there was a big deal with Bird before. I'm sure you well know the story. And uh, George indicated uh, the two of you had some disagreement on the credibility of the Lazar story. Uh, what are your comments? Well, I think you have to separate the story into two parts. One is, is Bob Lazard telling the truth about himself? And the other is, are there underground bases with uh, alien vehicles uh, there, or bases at least, where vehicles are being researched? Right. And my focus uh, has been on Lazard right from the, the word go, uh, mainly because he was people were referring to him as a nuclear physicist, and since I am one, I constantly get asked, you know, what do you think about Lazard? Now, I don't like to express an opinion until I have done some research. And as I had told uh, George uh, back four years ago in 1989, when I first uh, found out about Lazar and uh, had agreed to meet with him, although he didn't show up when I came to uh, Las Vegas for a mutual UFO network symposium in the summer of uh, 89, as I told him then, I've had enough cases where people have misrepresented their credentials that if they're going to make extraordinary claims, we better check on the people. Uh, and that's what I did once I heard about Lazar and saw him on uh, television. He certainly comes across very well. He does, and he seems, I am not a nuclear physicist, but to the layman, he seems very conversant with physics. Yeah, and so uh, there wasn't anything that he said that obviously said, oh, this guy is, is throwing baloney here. So... What I did was what I've done with a number of other uh, people is try to check their credentials. Uh, scientists leave trails. They get degrees. They belong to professional groups. They publish papers. They have uh, resumes. 
uh, there's a whole long list of things. And uh, this is the kind of checking I've done. Uh, it has been claimed that Bob has uh, master's degrees from MIT in physics and from Caltech in electronics, mm -hmm. uh, that he worked as a scientist for uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, okay, that's three good places to start. Now, two other institutions of higher learning have been mentioned. He, to me, in the one phone conversation we had where he promised to send me a resume, but uh, incidentally never did, uh, resumes are useful because they tell you where, who did he work for. You know, you can check that way. What groups does he belong to? All sure. that thing. Anyway, he mentioned California State University, Northridge, where, ironically, I will be speaking a few days after I'm in Vegas, uh, and also Pierce Junior College, which is a junior college out in the San Fernando Valley, uh, just northwest of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I checked all four schools. MIT, I checked both the alumni and the uh, registrar's office, people who keep track of your college records. Now, the alumni office would only matter if you've got a degree, otherwise you're not an alumnus. But the registrar's office keeps track of everybody who ever went there at any time for any length of time. Neither one ever heard of him. Uh, Caltech, they never heard of him. In both schools, incidentally, I asked them, I said, well, do you get calls about people claiming to have uh, attended and who never did? They said at least once a week. That's not an uncommon phenomenon. Well, the, the, the aspect of this, though, that I'd like to bring up now is that uh, he claims that all of his records of this sort, the ones you're mentioning, somehow have been erased along with uh, most of the records of his work at some of the facilities he claims he was at. There's no question that the government can refuse to speak about what you did when you worked for them. But people have actually checked yearbooks from these institutions. And incidentally, I did find a record for him, but not at either one of those places or at Cal State Northridge. I found that he had indeed taken courses at Pierce Junior College. Now, uh, the chance of winding up at MIT starting at Pierce are essentially nil, but I've gone a step farther than that. I've checked with the high school that he attended. Uh, he took one science course, chemistry. He ranked in the bottom third of his high school class. Again, you don't go to MIT with that background. When he was up at the Alien, I don't know how Ross Vegans uh, pronounced that. <laughs> no, that you did uh, just right. The little alien, I think they call it. Okay. Uh, when he was up there, two significant things, and I've got the, a tape of uh, his uh, presentation, or really he was responding to questions. When he was asked what year he got his degree, he hesitated and said, well, um, 1982, I think. Well, nobody who's gotten a master's degree from MIT uh, is going to hesitate about what year he got it in. Second, somebody asked him, and this is questions, the kind of questions that I've asked of his uh, supporters there in Vegas, not only for a resume, but I'm more than 20 years older than Bob, and I can tell you who a lot of my professors were and what my textbooks were and sure. their classmates. Um, he gave the name of a professor of physics from Caltech, who he was sure would remember him. While I tracked down that professor, he never taught at Caltech. He did teach at Pierce, and Bob apparently took some courses under him. But at the same time, when he was supposedly at MIT. Now, I also... So there's no evidence that he went to any of those places except Pierce. Now, beyond that, I checked with Los Alamos. I talked to the personnel office. Mm -hmm. uh, I gave them two names. One, I knew of a guy who worked there. I had professional dealings with Los Alamos on the nuclear rocket program. And uh, they found my guy. They couldn't find Bob. But as I think George would agree, uh, the phone book listing, which is put forth as proving that he worked there, it does just the reverse. It proves he works for Kirk Mayer, which is a, a consulting outfit, a, sort of a, a job shop outfit. You work for them, and you get seconded, as we say here in Canada, to uh, the lab. It says K slash M next to his name. Uh, we found two people in Los Alamos who say that he was a technician out there, and I can buy that. The newspaper article about him in the jet car, uh, and I don't doubt that he drove a jet car. I've got the people who verified that as well as the newspaper article. But the newspaper article said he worked out at the Clinton D. Anderson, and it's probably a longer name than this, Maison Research Facility. It's slightly different from that. I checked out there. Uh, they didn't remember him, but that's not too surprising. It's a user facility. At least 
where often a thousand people a year go through there. Groups from all over the world come to use their rather special accelerator. Mm -hmm. You set up equipment, and eventually you get time on the machine. Uh, that would certainly put your name in the phone book if you were there long enough. So uh, he doesn't belong to any professional groups, uh, as far as we can tell, and I've checked the American Physical Society, the American Nuclear Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and uh, there were a couple of others. But anyway, uh, so there's no evidence at all from anybody that Bob ever attended MIT or Caltech or Cal State Northridge. Uh, the government wiping out his records, well, again, they don't go running and pick up all the yearbooks. Where are his copies of his diplomas? Where is a resume? Uh, you know, there's just no indication that he is a scientist. What I find intriguing, uh, Mr. Friedman, is that you was an obviously very thorough researcher. You just documented that. And George Knapp, also a very thorough researcher. Um, both come to separate conclusions on this. It's quite remarkable. Well, the, the kicker here is that uh, it's like uh, I'm more accustomed, I guess, to dealing with people who misrepresent themselves than George is uh, to some extent, uh, because I go back to a dozen years at finding fraudulent people whose claims included some truth. Uh, there was a guy who claimed to be an aerospace engineer and suddenly shows up with a degree in physics, and I checked uh, his employer, I checked the school that he supposedly got it from, and uh, mm -hmm. make a long story short, I found that he wasn't telling the truth. But you at least have to hold out the possibility, I suppose, that his claim uh, would be would be accurate and somehow was erased, virtually I, erased. I don't see how they could erase him outside of the government enclave. But they would lie, uh, that governments can keep secrets about what he might have done for them anywhere at any time. Sure. Do you hold out, uh, Mr. Friedman, that the government is covering up the UFO reality? Well, there's, you see, there's no question about that. And in every lecture, and the one that I'll give there in Vegas on, uh, what is it, uh, October the 2nd at the uh, West Charleston branch of the library, and I gather the tickets are all gone. All gone, long gone. Yeah. Uh, I will prove that there's a cosmic water gate. There's no, you see... All right, hold, hold the cosmic water gate thought. We've got to take a quick station identification. We'll be right back. Stanton Friedman, uh, my guest from Canada. We'll get back to it in just a moment. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. This is Area 2000. My guest is Stanton T. Friedman, author, lecturer, nuclear physicist, here all the way from, uh, actually it's Fredericton, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, so <laughs> now back to him, uh, Mr. Friedman, you still there? I'm still here. Good. Um, so you'll be uh, here in Las Vegas lecturing then. Yes, that's at the beginning of a tour that's going to last five weeks, uh, 16 talks. Uh, I hope I'm up to it. I'm not as young as I used to be for this sort of thing. Lots of colleges, mm -hmm. management clubs, even the two planetarium lectures and uh, a library uh, conference or two. Um, it's going to be a busy time. But sounds, sounds fascinating. My point was that uh, with your belief that the government is covering up all of this with regard to UFOs, that in itself is so incredible that they could keep successfully such a secret that I just wonder why you're uh, so hesitant to believe that a, a more minor matter like Bob Lazar couldn't be taken care of. Well, uh, the kicker is, again, I have nothing I've said means that there aren't any saucers being held at Area 51. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if Bob isn't telling the truth about himself, and, you know, he's a very convincing kind of guy. He is, he's yeah. He's across well, but let's face it, uh, he went into a major bankruptcy, like $300,000 that other people loaned him. That's how convincing he is. Yeah, but that, that too... Uh that was back in 1986, I guess, and he talked a lot of people out of a lot of money. Uh, every con man is sincere, comes across well. That's the stock in trade. That isn't enough. Right, but that, uh, the fact that you had a bankruptcy doesn't necessarily mean that it was through some sort of, or that it was a result of some sort of con or anything else. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about the cosmic water gate. Whatever, what is that, first of all? Well, it's a neat phrase. It uh, shows you how old I am. I actually remember water gate. <laughs> uh, I've been to 15 different archives, the president, various presidential libraries and the National Archives and the Library of Congress and a lot of other places where government documents are stored. I worked on classified programs for 14 years. I visited many facilities other than the ones at which I directly was employed. And so I have a pretty good handle. I wrote a lot of classified reports, as a matter of fact, uh, nuclear, on nuclear airplanes and nuclear rockets and nuclear power plants for space and even did some looking at Soviet capabilities on what might be called intelligence work. Um, I've got a pretty good handle on how security works. Uh, I had to help keep secrets. Uh, what I do in my lectures is prove that there is a cover-up by going through this little routine. A group of us called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy went after the CIA for their UFO information back in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. They said they didn't have any. You do, too. We do not. We went to court eventually when they denied having any, and the judge asked them to do a search. And they came back with 900 pages of UFO material. <laughs> now, it was clearly only the tip of the iceberg, and they have a long history of throw you a bone and hope you'll go away. The mind control work, for example, first release was 400 pages. Uh, they, John Marks, the lawyer who went after that stuff, wound up with 40,000 pages. The first release was 1% of what he eventually got. Anyway. In the 900 pages, there was nothing above secret. Now, I've seen loads of formerly top-secret material at almost all the archives, so that alone makes one suspicious. There were internal references to another 200 documents. They weren't there, which certainly makes one suspicious. But of most interest was the fact that they gave us a list of 57 UFO documents originating with other agencies and therefore releasable only by those other agencies. Mm -hmm. Army, Navy, Air Force, Defense Intelligence Agency, Department of State, everybody's brother was collecting data on flying saucers. But the most interesting, at least on the surface, appeared to be a list of 18 documents from the National Security Agency, the NSA. Right. Now, I found that half the people in my American lecture audiences have never heard of the NSA, but its annual black budget, it's the biggest of the intelligence agency. A black budget is one not under congressional control. Its annual black budget has been seriously estimated as $10 billion. Now, that's the Washington Post. And Tim Weiner, who has got two Pulitzer Prizes for investigative journalism. So these aren't top-of-the-head comments. Washington Post says they employ 160,000 people. Anyway... 18 UFO documents from the NSA. We naturally filed a Freedom of Information request for those. We get back a page and a half letter saying we can't tell you anything under public law. We can't release any information about sources and methods of intelligence work. We don't want those. We just want the UFO stuff. We can't give you anything. All right, Mr. Friedman, while we're on that subject, um, the Justice Department apparently has just successfully sealed the records away from public view and away from the Freedom of Information Act with regard to Waco. If they can do that with regard to Waco, it seems to me on a secret basis they can put anything they want away, and I, I just refuse to believe that this Freedom of Information Act accomplishes anything serious. It gives you access to peripheral material. There's a list of exclusions that is a, a page-long list for each of the agencies, uh, certainly the CIA and the FBI, because I have those lists. Uh, which include National Security and Privacy Act and all kinds of other things. Freedom of information is not the magic key, but it does give you some stuff that proves there's a cover-up. Uh, that, that was the point of my story, which I haven't finished yet. N namely, we then go after the 18 NSA UFO documents. They refuse to release them. We appeal. They deny. We go to court. Judge says do a search. This is first federal uh, Judge Gerhard Giselle was later Oliver North judge at, right. not too long ago. Anyway, ask them to do a search. They come back to court. We know about 18 NSA UFO documents. How many UFO documents did you find, gentlemen? 239, Your Honor. Wow. 79 originate with other agencies, including 23 from the dear old CIA. Hmm. That leaves 160. They got rid of four as being not really appropriate. Fine, we'll take the 156. Uh, gentlemen, you're not hearing us. National security, we can't give you anything. We're going around in crazy circles here, so we try a legal ploy. It's been done before. 
We ask that they submit the 156 NSA UFO documents to Judge Giselle so he can determine whether they are properly invoking national security. <laughs> yeah. He absolutely refused to show any, not one, of those 156 NSA UFO documents to Judge Giselle. But they do provide him with a 21-page top-secret plus affidavit in chambers, in camera, as they say. Our lawyer doesn't get to see this document, justifying the withholding of the 156 NSA UFO documents. Wow. The judge was so impressed that he found in their favor they should not release the document, saying that the public interest in disclosure is far outweighed by the potential danger to the security of the United States. That is incredible. Should this information be released? Now, did he, put that on, did, uh, did he put that on paper? Oh, yes, yes. He not only put it on paper, but we even went a step farther. We appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals. Three-judge tribunal normally takes two months. They got to look at the same darn affidavit, and they agreed with the lower court that they sh information should not be released. We tried to go to the Supreme Court. They wouldn't hear the case. We filed a Freedom of Information Act request for the affidavit. We got it. And at every lecture, I turn the pages so people can see that it's 75% blacked out. Uh, there's no question about NSA withholding 156 UFO documents, even from a federal court judge who, mind you, had to get a special clearance to see the affidavit, which is top secret plus. Now, we don't know what the plus is because that's blacked out. <laughs> but there's a footnote to the story, which is kind of amusing. Naturally, I went after the CIA 23 UFO documents that the NSA found. Uh, they're supposed to respond within 10 working days to a Freedom of Information request. Uh, it took them 35 months to respond. I think that means they work 15 minutes a day or something. But anyway, <laughs> uh, they agreed to release the first nine, which got me very excited until I looked at them. They were press abstracts, believe it or not, of Eastern European newspaper articles about flying saucers, which the Russians had the day they were published. Their own 14 documents on this small group that the NSA found, they refused to release. They tried to discourage me from appealing. I appealed anyway. Two years later, a total of five years, they agreed to release tiny portions of three of the 14 documents. On a couple of those pages, you can read eight words. The security markings are blacked out. Exciting words like doc reference, date, USSR. That's it. And there are some pages, it's kind of funny, these guys got a sense of humor, it says deny in toto. They couldn't even find eight words to release. <laughs> so anybody who says that there are no agencies of the United States government withholding any information about foreign censors, as the noisy negative of their craft has said many times, is something they have during the show. The best they can do is sit through a request of foreign censors and withholding which is not good. Right. So the freedom of information, I mean, that's after all it's routine, so people get for the crime. But when it does give you something, the state does not give you access, and the government treats it, uh, I won't say as a joke, but the average time, for example, for mandatory classification review of documents at the Truman and Eisenhower Library by the National Security Council, the average time is running three years, and sometimes it takes six years to get a response. And you don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> that's, that's one of the funny things here is that you get a box of documents that say the uh, Eisenhower Library, and there'll be three withdrawal sheets in it, on each of which are listed 12 different documents which have been withheld for reasons of national security. And the listing is so brief. Memo, Joe Smith, Tom Jones, July 29th, uh, two pages, top secret. Now, that doesn't tell you much. Well, it seems to me, though, you have proven something very important, and that is that there is an overriding stated national security reason enough for a judge or a couple of few judges to agree not to let this information out, and that is significant. Yeah, I think it's very significant, and I think for those people who are naive enough to think that governments can't uh, keep secrets, that total black budget that I mentioned, and the book that I was talking about by the Pulitzer Prize-winning author is Blank Check by Tim Wiener, now working for the New York Times, I guess, in the Washington, uh, as a Washington reporter, investigative journalist. He documents a total annual black budget of $34 billion. 
Uh, that's an awful lot of money every year for projects that Congress doesn't control, about half for technology and half for intelligence. The stealth fighter, for example, was developed in a black program. They built, uh, was it, 56 before they admitted the program even existed, having spent several billion dollars. And I stress this because I've found that many Americans are terribly naive about secrecy. They forget that the uh, Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb uh, involved well over 50,000 people in one aspect or another. And it was held. And it was held. I uh, have talked to loads of old-timers, former military guys, and there's no question, especially from World War II era people, that secrets could be kept, that there are projects about which we will never hear. The people who tell you that there are no secrets are people who aren't familiar with how the system operates. Or there's one thing that's taken advantage of, especially around Washington, ego. That is to say, if that was happening in this town, I would know about it, say some of these guys. And the government takes full advantage of the need-to-know concept. Well, I'm told presidents are only told uh, what they need to know with regard to this. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. We talked to a man who was responsible for the morning briefings of uh, President Eisenhower for a considerable period of time at the beginning of his term in uh, early 1953. And he said that I didn't have access to everything, especially when he took office. Uh, Part of that is, is for an obvious reason. Presidents are subjected to uh, questions by journalists. They go to press conferences. There are times when if they knew something, they might might not be able to lie uh, appropriately. I mean, I'm not saying politicians can't lie. (laughs) You know, it's a funny thing. Of all the presidents we've had, probably one of the most open presidents, uh, no matter how you think of him politically, without a doubt, was Ronald Reagan. He's the kind of guy who'd say whatever came to his mind, it would just, boom, come out. And he made some references to UFOs during his administration, uh, as did Jimmy Carter in the beginning, which, of course, then it didn't go anywhere. But Ronald Reagan made a a number of interesting references with regard to an invasion and SDI and all the rest of it. Five different times he made comments about uh, if there were alien intruders, we and the Russians would work together. And the, the press was mystified by this. And one of the strange things was that Each one was treated out of context. Nobody bothered to point out the fifth time that he'd already said this four times. He said it at the United Nations, for example. He said it to Gorbachev. said it at a conference in Chicago. said it at a high school in Maryland, Houston, or Boston, whatever it is, Maryland. Uh, Now, Reagan had his own sighting. I talked to the pilot while he was a governor in California. Uh, His pilot, who has, believe it or not, 30,000 hours as a pilot, which is an awful lot of hours. That's a huge number of hours of flying. Uh, saw it, other guys on board the plane saw it, including Reagan. It was at night, a big object that was station keeping with them, and then took off uh, at a very high speed. Uh, Reagan, on the other hand, don't be fooled. The black budget increased more during his time in office than during any other president's time. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure uh, so that. he was in favor of secrecy, and there are loads, that's another thing, there are loads of executive orders that are classified. Uh, a guy with the Congressional Research Service even wrote an article about the, the secret government complaining because uh, these highly classified orders, which set national policy, and things like Vietnam and other such things, uh, involving tens of billions of dollars eventually, uh, were still classified. So... Uh, Anybody who's listening, and of course people around Vegas are plenty of people there who've worked on classified programs and know about secrecy. Mm -hmm. So to get back to Bob Lazar for a moment, uh, the question isn't can the government keep secret all kinds of strange activities uh, at Area 51. I don't have any qualms at all. I mean, I know that they can. Uh, That doesn't make his story legitimate. Well, I was told, I've been told by a number of people that uh, they pick a certain type of person uh, to work on these things uh, so that if there ever is a problem they can in effect either make them disappear or uh, give out information about them that would be uh, that that would be damaging uh, damaging to them and damage therefore the rest of whatever they might have to say. Let me give you a parallel for Bob's story that the government wipes his records clean. One of the things that concerns me over the last year is I've seen more 
phony baloney stuff, and I I'm even exclude uh, Bob, go out around than I have in many years. One of the perpetrators, if you will, of some of the phony baloney stuff is a guy who has gone by at least four different names. The one he was on the movie with was Guy Kirkwood. Supposedly, he's a handsome looking, looks like a fighter pilot. Uh, he's close on to 60 now, I guess. And that guy supposedly was an Air Force captain flying jets, F-86s, chasing UFOs, taking pictures of them in the early 1950s. That was his job. And he comes across, he goes to conferences, and he's been at this since the 60s, mate, telling the story. Uh, and he was on the, the Fox Network, first show of the season. Uh, George and I were both on the same show. Uh, Kirkwood uh, was never an Air Force pilot. He admitted that in the late 60s when confronted. We got a recent letter from the Air Force. Uh, his story was total baloney. He was not a captain in the Air Force, and he wasn't a pilot in the Air Force. And he elaborated, uh, Linda Howe was with me at the time with eight other people, that he flew DC 8 for United. And uh, he'd get us a copy of his DD-214, discharge paper, that is. Right. And he also would uh, get us a copy of his Airline Pilot Association uh, a certificate. Well, okay, uh, he couldn't provide the DD-214 because in a, it was in a box of papers which fell off a truck when they moved. As any veteran will tell you, that's a crucial paper, and you can always get another copy. Absolutely. No. So... Uh, that was a phony baloney story, but I checked a lot farther. I checked with the Airline Pilots Association. They have a united office. It's a union airline. You've got to belong to the union to fly for them. Under all four names, they found no record of him. Uh, we have a tape of a show that he did in the late 60s when he was supposedly flying DC-8 uh, for United when he says he was only rated for single-engine aircraft. We checked his FAA license. They have different levels of medical examination if you're a commercial pilot versus mm -hmm. just a private pilot. He didn't have the right one, you know, where you get tested every six months or whatever it is instead of every year. Sure. Uh, the Air Force didn't have any people with no college background. He admitted publicly he hadn't been to college at all, who became captains. They had some warrant officer pilots. You could get by with two years maybe. He said he attended. He graduated from some rather prestigious academy back east. He attended there for three months. Uh, and it goes on and on. But he's still taking people for rides. That is... Well, maybe. you know, that, that brings up, I guess, then the whole subject of the, um, the, the, the terrible fights that are going on in, in the UFO. Yeah, community. you're right. Uh, and researchers ripping at each other and ripping at each other. And if the central goal is to flush out the real information, it seems awfully damaging. Oh, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but you see, there are no qualifications to be, quote, a UFO researcher. You read two books, carry your briefcase, and it makes you an instant expert. That's why, at least George and my disagreement, we've had letters back and forth. I think we're both in it to find the truth. We share our information. Right. That's why I found your uh, disagreement, uh, again, on um, Bob Lazar to be so remarkable, because you're both very thorough, careful researchers. All right, uh, Ms. Friedman, I want to ask you about the crash at Corona, uh, briefly, if I might, because you may have heard George reference, uh, sort of a tantalizing reference to the possibility you might be on to a piece of that. Uh, what can you tell us? Well, uh, let me back up and say I was the first to start investigating the so-called Roswell incident. Our, my book is Crash at Corona because the town closest, and there's no place right there. People have said, well, what street do I take? Well, there's no street out in the boonies there. There's a little town called Corona, like the Cigar or the Toyota Corona or whatever. Uh, I started that investigation in 1978. Uh, we're always, of course, looking for pieces, for new witnesses. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got a, a new story today. Uh, no indication of a piece. There have been all kinds of claims made uh, that various and sundry people do have pieces or know where they are. I am aware of one situation where there is a possibility that the guy is telling the truth. He's temporarily relocated. I know where he is, but so I haven't been unable to truly verify that, but we have made plans just in case of what kind of testing would be done. And people think it's easy. Uh, to determine that something is of extraterrestrial origin. That isn't necessarily true at all. I mean, my
college classmate Carl Sagan in a terrible article in Parade Magazine back uh, March 7th talked about finding some element that doesn't occur here. Well, that's nonsense. It's how it's made. It's what its properties are that may very well be different, and our analytical skills may not be that good. So you've got to plan to do a lot of different things and hope that you get lucky and find the characteristics which are outside the envelope, so to speak, of things we can make, maybe strength at temperature, for example, uh, certain kinds of electrical or magnetic properties. Uh, Mr. Friedman, how likely is it that the, uh, the physics of some other planet would be so different that, that some piece of anything that we would find would be unrecognizable in terms of the, the element table that we, we know? Not, well, we, we expect physics to be the same everywhere, but if you go back 100 years on our planet, we didn't know about radioactivity, we didn't know about the nuclear world at all, and a whole bunch of other things. We could not, if you'd given somebody, smartest people in the world, even 50 years ago, a chip from one of today's best computers, they couldn't have analyzed what was in it. Our analytical capabilities were simply inadequate to the task. Uh, if you took a, a cheap Timex wristwatch back uh, 50 years, mm -hmm. people had used it. They'd know it was telling time and that it worked by a battery, but could they have built another one? No way. Not at that time. So the physics is going to be the same, but there will be more of it and stuff we don't know. I mean, Friedman's Law, as immodestly proclaimed, uh, Technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. You can know all about light bulbs. You'll never come up with a laser. It involves very different physics. Right. So you didn't know. That doesn't mean that it's impossible kind of thing. So uh, the whole technological side. Now, one good reason for thinking that there are samples of wreckage around. Uh, when Unsolved Mysteries did their first program on crash saucers, and it's been repeated uh, since. Um, they had a woman on named Sappho Henderson. Her husband was a pilot based at Roswell, which was the home of the only atomic bombing group in the entire world, 509. Something not usually mentioned by the critics, you see, that just a bunch of soldiers with nothing better to do. Baloney. <laughs> they dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and out the Pacific. It was a front line of offense, if you will. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, the, the guys from the 509th were hand-picked, very special kind of people. And the wreckage, uh, I started to say about Pappy Henderson, one of those people. Uh, Pappy didn't tell his wife, Sappho. He, he's dead when we came into the picture. That's why I'm talking about his wife. Uh, she was on the show because he died in the mid-'80s. Anyway, he told her in 1982 when he saw a newspaper article about this, the first book, The Roswell Incident, came out in 1980. I was a major contributor to that. Bill Moore and I did 95% uh, of the research. Uh, anyway, Pappy said, after seeing this article in the paper, that he'd always wanted to tell her, but he couldn't. It was classified, but if it's in the newspaper, now we can tell her. He flew some of that wreckage to Wright Field in Ohio, and he saw the body. Now, I had that story. I located Sappho because the guy who had the story wouldn't tell me where she was. Four Unsolved Mysteries. The show ran. After the show ran, a friend of hers told her that a mutual friend, a dentist named Chrome Schroeder, old friend of Pappy's, not only had been told the story in the late 70s, and I talked to John about this from him, but in 1979, and this was done on his honor as a former naval officer never to talk about it, 1979, Pappy pulled a piece of the wreckage out of his pocket <laughs> and handed it to John. Unfortunately, he took it back, but what I'm saying is G.I.s pick up souvenirs. And we know that the government sort of vacuums the desert with that phrase that one of the neighbors used. Uh, I expect there are pieces out there. I would very much like to know about them. As I say, we've got a plan in place what kind of tech the land would have been with. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'd like to give out my phone number on a box and would have anybody want to uh, tell me uh, about some wreckage, uh, I'd be happy to hear it. Or who knows anything about what happened? We know that there are hundreds of people involved. There are actually two crashes, one near Corona, one out in the plains of St. Augustine, which is roughly 150 miles west, out in the middle of nowhere, frankly. Uh, if anybody wants to reach me, 
Uh, they can call me, and I'm not, people say, what do you give out your number for? I don't you know there are a lot of nuts out there. I don't give them for lots of nuts. I get long numbers occasionally. All right, well, at your own risk, go right ahead. Uh, it's area code 506 457 0232, and I should stress that I'm four hours ahead of Vegas. Uh, we're in the Atlantic time zone east of Maine, and a mailing address. And this is for two purposes. If you have a story for me, it's easier for Americans to write to the U.S. Post Office box. I live in Canada. I'm not hiding, and my number's a Canadian number. But <laughs> if you want uh, to contact me by mail to tell me your story, give me some clues, and if you want free information, send a self-addressed stamped envelope. You'll get a 990-word article on the Cosmic Watergate, among other things. Uh, send it to uh, Stan Friedman. Post Office Box 958, Holton, H-O-U-L-T-O-N, Maine, and that's M-E, not M-A, 04730. Self-addressed stamped envelope for free information. What was the zip code again, please? 04730. All right. But you won't find me by calling information in Holton because I don't live in Maine. <laughs> Oh, and I suppose people do that occasionally and say, look, he's hiding. Yeah, yeah, and I've also people have told me that, that they heard that the CIA chased me out of the country. Oh, I see. The FBI. And All right, uh, Stanton Friedman, stand by while we do the news here at the top of the hour, and uh, we will come back, and perhaps you'll be willing to take some phone calls. Sure. All right, good. Stay right there. My guest is Stanton Friedman. This is Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell, and there'll be more right after the 9 o'clock news. Guns Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good morning again. Good evening. Let's make it. <laughs> I'm never going to get that right. This is Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Stanton Friedman. He's uh, with us all the way from Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. Subject UFOs, of course. And uh, we're going to get to the telephone lines here in just a moment. If you have a question for Mr. Friedman, here are the ways to contact us. In the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, the number is 383-8255 or 8255. Toll free outside the state, 1-800-338-8255. The wild card direct lines are area code 702-385-7214. And uh, if you have never called the program at all, we have a first-time caller line, which is area code 702-385-7213 or 7213, and we'll get to the phones in just a moment. Uh, Ms. Friedman, are you still there? Yep. Good. Um, there are a couple of other questions uh I, I certainly have for you. Um, there's a, a, a lot of researchers now that are talking about the possibility of other dimensions uh, as a source of these visits uh, as opposed to uh, uh, travel from another planet, and I wonder how you feel about those theories. Well, having worked on nuclear fusion and nuclear fission propulsion systems, uh, and I recognize that one possible means of coming here, although I haven't the faintest idea of how to do it, is to warp space and time. Mm -hmm. It isn't necessary, though, of uh, fusion propulsion. Fusion is what goes on in the sun. is capable of getting us to the stars uh, with a little help from some cosmic freeloading, such as we use in all our planetary probe, you know, using the, the gravitational field of one planet to take the Earth to the next one. Reticulum, we've got to go, go below the equator to see them. They're only 37 light years away, which is 
just down the street, and they're only about a twentieth of a light year apart, which is like a hundred times closer to each other than our star, the sun, is to the next star over. And they're big and they're big on the sun. So it's kind of like the early years of the star and the other one. But I think they're coming from that. Whether they work space and time or use a fusion or some totally unknown, which is the most likely propulsion system, it doesn't really change the fact that they're is a kind of cop-out, uh, and a lot of astronomers fall into that box or into that trap. They don't know how to get here from there, That's nothing about which they have any professional knowledge at all. Uh, so if there were such things, they'd have to go to another dimension, and I don't buy it yet. Okay. Um, on another subject, very quickly, and then we'll get the phone lines open. Uh, the recent Mars Observer mission, boy, there's an awful lot of... Uh, rumor going on about it, and I wonder what, what manner of it has reached you or what you can tell us about it. Well, I got called by a Seattle radio station uh, saying that charges had been made by Richard Hoagland and others mm -hmm. uh, that uh, NASA, you know, destroyed it to avoid showing the pictures of Mars, and I think that's hogwash. I think one has to recognize, if you look back over the history of a space project, there have been loads of failures, things that didn't work. Uh, you go back to the Roswell days, loads of the 60 or so V-2 rockets that were brought over from Germany didn't work when they were fired. They fizzled. Our first uh, right. attempt to put a satellite up went dead on the pad. I mean, that, that's putting it very kindly. So you're buying the explanation as given? Well, you know, I'm not sure that they know what has happened, but I see no reason to say that it wasn't a, a, a foul up, a mistake, uh, something went wrong. What I'm saying is I don't know whether the thing blew up or just went out of uh, commission. All right, but you think, in other words, natural causes. Yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> natural causes is a strange way to put it if it's a bad transistor. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think so. And I think it's utterly nonsensical to suggest that NASA would sabotage the whole program to avoid doing something which wasn't going to be done for many months. It would take three months to circularize the orbit and they do the low-resolution photos first, then the high-resolution. Uh, I'm not saying that NASA doesn't keep secrets. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I see no evidence whatsoever... That this is one of them. Yeah. All right. Um, one last question. I can't help this, since you're a nuclear physicist. Um, the prospect of time travel, uh, Mr. Friedman... Um, oh. You know, we use those words kind of glibly, time travel, but mm -hmm. one of the craziest things about the world as it is is that, uh, as part of what Einstein uh, suggested and has been verified many times since, part of relativity, is that as you get close to the speed of light, which is only 670 million miles an hour to give you something to compare it to, as you get close to the speed of light, time slows down for the things moving that fast. So if you want to go to Zeta Reticuli, uh, 37 light years away, at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, it would only take 20 months pilot time. Now, if you crank up the engine and go, you know, put her in sixth gear and go 99.99% .99 of the speed of light, uh, it would only take six months pilot time. Now, does that, does that include acceleration and deceleration? No, that, uh, it takes only a year at 1G to get to the speed of light. Okay. Uh, at 2G is half a year, I mean, you know. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is that's effectively many times faster than the speed of light. You go out and come back and marry your granddaughter's best friend and repeat the process. It's the gift of immortality. For those biblically inclined, uh, that's probably how Methuselah lived 900 years, you know. That's good physics. It may be Rafi. <laughs> uh, All right. There are a lot of people who would like to ask you questions. Our lines are loaded, so let's see what we've got out there. Good evening. Uh, on the first time caller line, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman uh, in Las Vegas. Where are you? I'm in Oceanside. Oceanside, California. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, Mr. Freeman. I have yes. a question. Sure. <clears throat> um, you know, the civilian sector is really, really going after the UFOs, crop circles, animal mutations, and abductions. Uh, why is it that the, uh, the government part of this whole thing, uh, especially the Air Force, you know, they had their program for investigating this stuff. Why have they totally shut down and you never hear anything about what the government is doing? 
I'll hang up and listen. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's recognize that the Air Force Project Blue Book was an unwitting and perhaps very unwitting cover operation for much of its existence. It was officially closed down in 1969 as a result of a memo from an Air Force General, Carol Bolander. And in Bolander's memo, there's a very provocative statement, and this quote will come with anybody who sends that self-addressed envelope. You'll get the exact quote. He said, reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with Joint Army-Navy Air Force Publication 146, or Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. <laughs> he repeated that two paragraphs later. He said, if we quote Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report UFO sightings, but as previously noted, reports which could affect national security are made will continue to be made uh, in accordance with established procedures, those two documents. When you get those two documents, you find that Blue Book wasn't even on the distribution list for them. So the Air Force good data on UFOs never was uh, part of the Blue Book scene and never was made public. And people, again, tend to forget that we have a huge organization, the Air Defense Command, that's gone through various names, but North American Air Defense Command, Aerospace Defense Command. Anyway, all their data about uncorrelated targets is born classified. They don't put out weekly reports on those. They don't say how many times they scrambled jets. That data's always been classified. So the reason we don't hear about what the government is doing is because what they're doing about flying saucers is classified. And some of it, well, in a Canadian document that was top secret at the time it was written, been declassified, I think, by mistake, 1950. They said flying saucers the uh, most classified subject in the United States, even more so than the H-bomb. So there's an enormous difference between public reports of things in the sky or landings or whatever and the reports that could affect national security. You have, for example, flights down the runway at a SAC base where nuclear weapons are stored. I would say they could affect national security. You betcha. What, uh, what Mr. Friedman, does your government uh, in Canada... Well, I'm Dude. an American, so it's, I, I got two governments. Well, all right, but you're living there, so I suppose technically it's, it's your government in a way. What is Canada doing since you're there? Uh, is it, uh, does it treat all this identically uh, to the United States? No, not quite. Uh, on uh, several different levels, there are significant differences. One, it is part of the Joint Army-Navy Air Force Publication 146. The Aerospace Defense Command is a joint Canadian-American project. Canada is a bigger country physically than the United States, and it used to be thought if the Russians were going to attack, they'd be attacking across the top, so the dew line and all that early warning stuff. Uh, and so they're part of that on a classified level. They do something that isn't done in the United States. The National Research Council collects reports of UFOs. Uh, unfortunately, they knew nothing with them other than label them as media or non-media, and they're only interested in the media. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff, in other words, in the official files that nobody looks at. Uh, there isn't quite the same sense of official ridicule. I just got uh, a letter in response to a Freedom of Information request for some Air Force office. They responded sending along a copy of a 1987 release, which was just a, a dupe of what they put out when Blue Book was closed in 69, saying the same outrageous things that were said then. Uh, one of them, they said out of 12,000 some uh, sightings, only 700 remained unidentified. Now, suppose you tried 12,000 drugs to find a cure for AIDS. If you found 700 that worked, would you say only 700, therefore there are no cures for AIDS? I mean, no, it, it, it is really, uh, and it, it's exposing the, the intent uh, in the, in the end statement in the report, there's no question about it. Um, Ms. Friedman, one other subject, Linda Howe, who you're very familiar with, uh, looks very carefully at crop circles and the crop circle phenomenon as well as some other things. What do you think of this crop circle business? Any comment? Uh, yeah, uh, it's an exciting, intriguing mystery. The question is how much of a connection there is with flying saucers. I resist putting all the mysteries in the same box and shaking them up. Uh, I don't know what's causing them. I would like to know. I think we tend to lose sight because of the beauty and majesty and frequency of the crop circle reports 
of the fact that there are more than 4,000 physical trace cases directly associated with flying saucers from 65 countries. These are cases where people see a saucer on or near the ground, and after it leaves, one finds the equivalent of burned circles, burned marks, uh, swirled vegetation, etc. Nothing nearly as exotic as a crop circle. And in 24%, something over a 1,000 of these cases, beings uh, are seen. So these are really the close encounters of the second kind, not the crop circles. Mm -hmm. The crop circles are an intriguing mystery, which may indeed be produced, but I think by aliens, but they could be produced by our own intelligence services. I, I often think of the scenario, you know, there are a lot of reports, and Linda has mentioned some of them, about lights, small lights circling around the crop circle formation. Yes. And I, I keep thinking that, gee, I'll bet the aliens sent them down to figure out, what are these idiot earthlings doing now? <laughs> All right. Wild card line three. Good evening. You're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Hello. Hello. Where are you, sir? I'm in Las Vegas. All right. Um, I just need to turn down my radio. Turn it off, actually. Okay, it's off. All right, go ahead. Uh, my question to Mr. Friedman, has he heard of any um, pilots that have suffered a psychosis from testing uh, that new technology? All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, let, let's separate the question. Uh, certainly there are loads of pilots who have had UFO sightings. Dr. Richard Haynes, who is retired from NASA Ames Research Lab up in the Bay, San Francisco area, has collected more than 3,500 cases of pilot sightings. So there's lots of them, and some of them very good, multiple witness, long duration, electromagnetic effects, compasses swirling, you know, the whole business. Any physical effects? No, uh, that's what I, I'm trying to think about. Other than the psychological problem, uh, well, I'll give you an example. A pilot told me that uh, he had a sighting when he was flying an airplane, uh, a helicopter, rather, in Vietnam. It circled around their helicopter several times, quite spectacular, and he reported it. And then the big shot uh, high-ranking officer comes to him a couple days later and said, you didn't see anything the other day, did you? Yes, I did. I reported it. You didn't hear me. You didn't see anything the other day, did you? And they go back and forth, and finally he gets the picture. You like flying? Yes, sir. You didn't see anything, did you? Now, and, of course, he finally said no. Right. Psychological trauma from that. But in terms of physiological effects directly associated with observing a flying saucer, not that I'm aware of offhand, a bright light, but I wouldn't call those. And here is a famous Iranian jet case uh, where all the uh, offensive systems went off on the F-4 aircraft, American plane, the Iranian pilot chasing a UFO not far from Tehran back in the 70s. And I can imagine if all your systems go off, all the electrical systems, uh, there's a strong <laughs> fear, they call it. I'm, I'm sure there would be. Yeah, but in terms of, uh, you know, just directly because of seeing the saucer, I don't know of it. All right. Line one, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman in Las Vegas. Good evening. Yes, good evening, Art. Good evening, Mr. Friedman. Hi. Um, I just, I think what that last gentleman was uh, referring to was on a show that was on this last week called The X-Files. I didn't see it. We don't get it up here, unfortunately. Uh, well, what, what they're saying is with, uh, with art flying faster, that the people that fly that are supposed to have ill effect to them. That's apparently the case they had made. Um, well, that's an interesting thought, but I don't know of any evidence for that. And I don't know how you'd find it either. <laughs> Um, may I ask, are you familiar with a document called, um, I don't even know if it's a document, it's copyrighted 1989, and it's called The Secret Government, The Origin, Identity, and Purpose of MJ-12, and it was written by a gentleman named Milton William Cooper. Yeah, I would disagree with calling him a gentleman, but yes. <laughs> that was my second question, because um, he apparently he, he has uh, references to you in the document. Yeah, I know. And uh, he, This is under the category of here we go again. Well, uh, the, the kicker here is Mr. Cooper uh, it tells a, a great story. He's apparently a very good speaker, an evangelical type. I mean, powerful speaker, and I, I don't deny, I'm, I'm not knocking speakers since I'm one myself. But uh, in his book, Behold the Bell Horse, uh, I read over the sections dealing with me, and, uh, for example, I am accused of being a CIA employee. 
And I will categorically state that I have never worked for, with, uh, associated with the CIA or any other government agency, except when I was in college for two weeks in 1952, I worked for the post office, delivering mail in Linden, New Jersey. All right, caller, thank you. Yes, but if you were a CIA employer, uh, Mr. Friedman... Uh, employee, yeah, I know, I couldn't say that. Well, that's right. He, made, he even misquotes, Cooper even misquotes me greatly about what I said about nuclear airplanes. He has me saying it was the size of a basketball and produced hydrogen, and the ones I worked on were certainly much larger than that and didn't produce hydrogen, and I never said that. Mr. Cooper has claimed he was on the briefing team for the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, which is an interesting claim considering that he was a hydraulics mechanic in the Air Force, switched to the Navy, was an E-6, which is not a high rating, has no college background. To say that the Navy in the 70s couldn't find anybody uh, with a better background than that to be part of the briefing team is unimaginable. I gave him a list of names of the uh, commander in the sink pack, or whatever it's called, uh, commanders, except uh, I sort of mixed them up in order, and he couldn't even pick out the name of the one who was in charge at the time he claims he was there. Uh, Mr. Friedman, if uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat can shake hands, shouldn't there come a time when all of you UFO uh, investigators get together for the cause and uh, try and reconcile your information and, uh, and try to do that? Some, some kind of summit or something? Well, I... I you know, there ought to be some rules of the game. I agree with that. And there have been people who have disagreed that not only George and I, but both Arab and Rick, and then Rick and Long Beach actually taught a course before it was an appropriate for your show, but really UFO abduction experiences were uh, like near death experiences or like the birth experience, really the other end of that system. And, uh, uh, Al and I strongly disagreed about that. We never said bad words about each other. All right. While we're on the subject of George, I have him on the line, uh, Mr. Friedman. Uh, George, you're on the line with Stan Friedman. Okay. Hi, George. Uh, George, turn your radio off. Gotcha. You would, and go ahead. You're both on the line. Stan, um, uh, some of the differences we have uh, are for the benefit of your, uh, your listeners. Uh, Stan had uh, regaled us with how much he had checked into Bob Lazar's background. What he did not tell you is that uh, uh, basically he had followed up research that we had already done. The fact that there were no records at, at uh, MIT or Caltech or Los Alamos uh, regarding Bob was the starting point of this mystery. I mean, I had already checked that stuff out basically when Stan got involved in it. Stan has had uh, a very definite opinion about Bob basically from the beginning, and I think he, he uh, expressed it fairly well to your listeners earlier when he, he said Bob is not a nuclear physicist, which uh, the central question to me is not whether Bob has been in a professional organization of uh, physicists or um, uh, national academic uh, organizations or whatever. The central question to me is always, did Bob work on flying saucers or not? Uh, the question for me boiled down to, did he work on classified projects at Los Alamos? Because if that were true, it's at least conceivable he could have been brought into classified projects elsewhere. Um, uh, concerning the lab, uh, the Los Alamos National Lab, Stan, and, and I have it in writing from him, has said, well, Bob may have worked at the Mason facility at Los Alamos, and there are no classified projects that have ever been conducted at Mason. That is simply not true. Uh, the lab has said uh, in writing to me that there are classified projects there. What's more, I have four people who worked with Bob at the lab who said that he was, in fact, working on classified projects. As a technician, George? Uh, as a technician uh, slash physicist, uh, I, I don't really think that the labels matter so much as, as, the, uh, as the, the question of whether he, or not he could have been taken from those kind of programs into additional classified programs. Now... Well, if he worked there on classified projects, he had to have some sort of a security clearance. The plain and simple fact is there are no records of him having a classified security clearance anywhere. Uh, even Stan, in writing, had said if Bob were at the lab, even working for Kirkmeyer, he would have had to have a clearance. Every government agency that I have contacted, and there have been several over the years, have denied having any records on, on Bob. In fact, one person that Stan has... Uh, contacted himself in regard to Bob's bankruptcy, uh, either Stan or some of the people who are working with Stan, confirmed for Stan that Bob was, in fact, working on classified projects. Now, uh, some people showed up uh, in Los Alamos 
uh, with people that uh, asking questions of people that Lazar knew. The questions began with this. We're looking for dirt on Bob Lazar. That's sort of a pejorative beginning for an investigation. I, I don't know why that's connected with me. As a matter of fact, I got some feedback that indicated somebody was blaming that on me, and it had nothing to do with me. Well, let me put it this way, Stan, is that uh, in the communications that you and I have had, especially concerning the bankruptcy, which uh, which I think, you know, uh, sometimes you go too far, uh, not, not necessarily you, but the investigators, in the sense of how much you can invade a person's privacy, as Art was uh, uh, alluding to earlier, because a person has had a bankruptcy doesn't necessarily mean well, he's George, a, a I, bad I person. One of the people that was contacted concerning Bob's bankruptcy, one of his major creditors that was listed on the bankruptcy, uh, was a guy who had very bad opinions about Bob and who said bad things about him. But one of the things that this same person said was, even though Bob owed him money, was that, yeah, I remember he worked on classified projects. My question is, where are Bob's records concerning that security clearance? Because the lab denies having them. All these government agencies deny having them. A second point. Uh, you, uh, you well, let, let me ask something. That, well, well, let, let me go on for just a second. Concerning his high school records, you, you called this high school, and, and I thought it was very interesting the comments that they gave to you because if they gave them to you, they were clearly violating all kinds of privacy statutes. I called them after you did. They categorically denied giving you or anyone else the information that you have claimed to have got from them. Uh, and, and if they did, they broke the law. I've asked Bob to go ahead and request his high school record. Good. He has done that. All right. Both of you, hold on just one second. We'll be right back. You're listening to Area 2000 at the moment. George Knapp and Stanton Friedman. We'll be right back. <laughs> From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. Area 2000 continuing on a Sunday evening. I'm Art Bell. With me on the telephone, George Knapp and Stanton Friedman. And you're both back on the air again. Um, in addition, Stan, to the high school thing, which they categorically deny telling you or anyone else what you have claimed, um, and... and uh, I'm going to get that in writing from him. Uh, one of the other points that you raised, you, you had uh, gone to Los Alamos, gave a lecture, and you told me in a letter that someone had come up to you out of the crowd and said that Bob Lazar was a con man. Well, I know who that person is. I've contacted him. I've talked to him. And the way they tell the story is they came out of the crowd and were talking to you about Bob sort of after your, your uh, lecture, and they said that their version of the story is they said, well, you must believe that Bob's a con man, to which you responded, yeah, that's a good term. Not their term, your term. But the way you uh, communicated it to me is someone comes out of the uh, uh, audience and says Bob is a con man. Uh, my point is, goes back to what I had said in, in my earlier part of this broadcast is we have uh, disagreements about Bob. That's fine as long as the, uh, the disagreements are based on uh, uh, honest research and honest uh, differences of opinion. Well, my observation for both of you is that you both conclude that nobody can find his records. Uh, the difference seems to be in, in your conclusion about why. Well, the, the question I have here, if Bob has degrees from MIT and Caltech, where is there any evidence of that at all? My and question. if he doesn't, then that means he's intentionally, I guess is the word, misrepresenting his background. Well, None of that means there aren't saucers out at Area 51, and I've never said that there weren't out there. I don't know whether there are or aren't. But why should it be up to me to prove that he has degrees from two of the most prestigious universities in the country, and why would anybody accept the notion that they can go, that the government can wipe out his... Um, his yearbook pictures, his memory of what went on there, any indication that he was there. I'll put it this way again. I think the central question is not whether Bob went to a school or not, if he is lying about his educational background. And, and I have admitted, Stan, even in your presence and in public appearances, that I, I find this to be the weakest part of Bob's story. I've never caught him in a, in a lie. I've never caught him in an inconsistency. But I have been bothered by the lack of documentation on that. But Bob would not be the first person who has exaggerated his educational background uh, in whatever field. 
the question to me is not whether he went to Caltech or MIT. The question is not whether he, what he did or what classified project he worked on at Los Alamos. The question to me is, did he work on flying saucers? And if he worked on classified projects at Los Alamos, which at least four people who work there now have told me is a fact, it is conceivable to me that he could have been taken into other kinds of classified projects here in Nevada. Um, and that's the central question. Not whether he's a real physicist, not whether he, what school he went to, did he work on this program? The, the, the fact is that what Bob's story tells us is confirmed by many, many other witnesses uh, who I have interviewed over the years uh, who are still talking to me, in fact. Uh, the story is consistent. The facts are consistent. That is the central question, not whether what school he went to. But, George, his credibility is the central question, it seems. Well, it's a central question to you. Well, it's a major part of the story simply because there have been over the years so many other people who mix truth and fiction. I know, and you should be intimately familiar with them, Stan. Uh, I, I will raise the name of Gerald Anderson, the primary yeah. new witness in your book, Crash at Corona, uh, a person who you based uh, a great deal of your, your book on concerning the Roswell crash and who turns out to be basically bogus. Uh, not quite, George. That's a long story, uh, and I don't know whether you've seen the papers I've written about, uh, in effect, the crash without Gerald Anderson, and it wasn't the crash of Corona. I mean, well, okay, that's the title of the book, but it's the other crash that he was concerned with. I gave you a plug there, by the way. I understood. <laughs> Appreciate the plug. I, I wish only the publisher was alive and well in so many books. All right, well, to the both of you, I say again, wouldn't it be valuable somehow to get some of the, get some of this scrapping uh, out of the way between uh, researchers for the, the sake of the, uh, the whole subject. Uh, I agree, Art, as well. And, and Stan and I, and I have gone around on this a little bit. Uh, I, we haven't talked in a little while. Uh, I think it's generally healthy. I don't think it's healthy when there is uh, deception or uh, uh, not really a, a fair shake given in the research. Now, maybe Stan is not responsible for some of the things that I'm talking about, but I know that some of the people who are asking questions about Lazar are reporting directly to him. Uh, they've represented themselves as uh, as Bob's friends. Um, you know, one one guy showed up at uh, Bob's high school, so I'm his buddy. I'm trying to get his records to help him. The high school kicked him out, which is what they should have done. Uh, they refused to give out information about Bob's high school records to him, and I seriously doubt that they gave him the stand. How about it, Stan? Have you had people out uh, knocking on doors for you? Oh, I have not. Now, I will add something that I had wanted to talk to George for the last two weeks about was to get him to get Bob to write uh, the high school for his record. That's been done. I, I'm, I'm delighted. That's what I wanted to ask you about two weeks ago, George. <laughs> All right. Well, let's leave it there. And uh, and thank you, George, for calling in. I wanted to get some more of that on the air. Go ahead. Talk to you later. All right. Take care, George. So there you go, Stan. Again, it seems as though both of you agree that the records um, are missing, you simply come to different conclusions about uh, uh, about what it means. Uh, let's keep moving. Wild Card Line 3, you're on the air in Las Vegas with Stanton Friedman. Good evening. Uh, yes, good. Uh, I hope you can clear this up. Uh, in the 60s on um, television, I heard an ad lib conversation between Ed McMahon and Johnny Carson. And he, uh, Ed McMahon, said he was stationed at that base and that he was in a bus going on leave with all the other fellows, and they came upon uh, this confusion, and I've forgotten whether he said he saw uh, what had taken place. I'm sure he didn't say that. What, what base was this? Then it was yes. And uh, that uh, the lights and the traffic jam and so on, and the next day, he didn't get out of the bus, the next day he and his friends went back to take pictures, and they were taking pictures of this giant crater, and I don't believe they mentioned anything about, this is so long ago, uh, that they mentioned anything about uh, debris, but the, uh, the military came and took the film away from them. Now, he wasn't joking. And it was just a conversation between uh, between guests coming on, 
And uh, he just was shaking his head and said, I don't know what was going on. And uh, Now, did he use the term flying saucer or UFO? He, he, they were talking about that subject. And I understand that in the 60s, that's the first I'd ever heard of such a thing. And they were talking about uh, flying saucers, apparently. I've forgotten how the whole thing started even. It was so long ago. But he did say, yes, I was... I was stationed there, and we came upon this in the bus and so on. Hmm. And then they went back the next day, and there was a giant crater in, in the earth. Tony, where are you, ma'am? I'm in Palm Springs. Palm Springs. All right, uh, thank you. Any, any, uh... Well, there's no report of a crater associated with either the Corona or the Plains of St. Uh, Augustine uh, uh, crashes. No crater. As a matter of fact, one of the things that mystified, George mentioned, um, Jesse Marcel, Jr., who spoke at the uh, Springfield uh, conference. Uh, Jesse's a medical doctor, a pilot, served on military aircraft accident investigative teams. His description of the wreckage is very important because he himself was shot down, as a matter of fact. And he's familiar with wreckage. But uh, one of the things that mystified his father, who was the intelligence officer for the only atomic bombing group in the world at the time, when he came across all this wreckage that led to it by the rancher out near Corona, was that there wasn't a crater. Here's this stuff strewn across an area three quarters of a mile long and a few hundred yards wide, and there's no crater, so it had to be some kind of an airborne explosion of some sort, uh, but no crater. Hmm. I mean, no crater at the other place. That's odd. Well, I don't know what that story refers to. <laughs> well, maybe she caught that on the Carson show on satellite, uh, you know, and she, uh, during one of the commercial breaks, they made a comment. Uh, she may have caught it that okay. way. Line two, good evening, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Yes, uh, Mr. Friedman uh, claims that the MJ-12 documents are authentic, but you know, articles published in the Skeptical Inquirer magazine uh, claim that the MJ-12 documents... Hardly, hardly. Uh, I have responded to those articles. Anybody... Uh, who sends for a free list of materials of one of the documents on there is a 108-page report. Uh, as a matter of fact, I even collected $1,000 from the man who wrote the two articles in the Skeptical Inquirer about MJ-12 for proving him wrong about uh, the type on one of the Majestic 12 documents. For our readers' uh, information, uh, in 1984, December, uh, a man received a roll of film on which were two sets of eight negatives each uh, of a top secret magic, M-A-J-I-C, not G, uh, eyes only document, a briefing for President-elect Eisenhower, uh, dated 18 November 1952, so he was a president-elect, that was before he was inaugurated, after he was elected, uh, which had claimed that the government established in 1947, uh, President Truman established a group called Operation Majestic 12. Uh, to deal with the crashed flying saucers and uh, recovered near Roswell, New Mexico. And it listed the members of the group, and uh, it's a whole long, involved story, which is discussed. Uh, so you claim that um, the alleged memorandum from President Truman to Secretary of Defense Forrestal of September 1947 yes. Was not typed on a typewriter model that didn't exist in 1947. That's right. And I also pointed out that the uh, the date on there, one of those obscure little details, September 24th, 1947. Period is period after the date, and the the word September is slightly lower than the numbers. The numbers are higher, if you will, uh, and was clearly they were clearly done in a different typewriter from the date, and that typeface matches that on a memo from one of the people who were mentioned in the memo, uh, Dr. Vannevar Bush, who was the top scientific person in the country during World War II and for some time afterward. Uh, he was over the atomic bomb project, for example. Well, what uh, about the alleged signature of Harry Truman on the 47 what about document it? that uh, as, um, as shows, as shown to be an uh, exact duplicate of well, one that's very found on another one of Truman's papers, which is an impossibility because no two signatures of an individual are ever exactly Well, the same. as a matter of fact, even that quote, which is given in the article uh, from a book by a man named Osborne on question documents, which is listed as 1978, it was actually written before 1910, uh, and was dealing with trace forgeries, which were a major problem before we had Xerox machines. 
Uh, even the quote two lines later says, that book says, that you can have identical signatures. And Truman certainly wrote his name a lot uh, after the 48 election, which he won to some people's great surprise. He wrote thank you notes, and he wrote a letter to his sister saying that he was signing about 500 an hour. Now, nobody has established that there are no other pairs of signatures that are identical. The, the expert, Osborne, that you can get identical si uh, signatures, but not consecutively. So, you know, the, there is no substance to those articles. They're dealt with at considerable length in several of my papers. And as I say, I got paid a thousand dollars for proving the skeptic wrong about the types on the. Um, the third document, the Cutler Twining Memo. So it's easy to be a debunker. There are three basic rules. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. And if you can't attack the data, attack the people. And this works extremely well in all fields. You don't need to know anything. Well, how do you explain that the uh, dates used on the 1952 Eisenhower briefing document are written in this strange and mistaken style that William Moore used in his own correspondence. Well, the, the right. notion... we'll have to hold it there. Thank you. Go ahead and respond to that. Yeah, uh, you know, the date format in the briefing is indeed a little unusual. 18 November, comma, 1952. It's the comma that bothers some people. I have found that identical format used by two directors of the CIA, and they're members of MJ-12, uh, and around the same time frame. Uh, it's not that unusual a date format. Uh, All right. All right. Let's hold it there, then, Stan. We've got a first-time first caller here. Uh, where are you calling from, please? Uh, I'm calling from Berkeley. Uh, right. Well, you're on the air, and do you want an address? Is that it? Uh, can I stay off the air? Uh, no, you're on the air, and you have no choice. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you're going to have to be on the air, or I'm going to have to disconnect. Um, yeah, well, I do have a couple of questions. Well, then, uh, you're on the air. Go ahead and ask them. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, sir. You're on the air. Um, well, I don't know if it has anything to do with UFOs or not. Um, you wanted an address is the note I got. Is that correct? Yes, that's where I like. What, 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 you want an address for my guest? Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, go ahead, Stan. Give it out again. Okay, send a self-addressed stamped envelope for free information to Stan Friedman, Post Office Box 958, Holton, H-O-U-L-T-O-N, Maine, M-E, 04730. And a phone number, 506-457-0200. Uh, all right, we've got it. Good. Let's keep moving. Uh, line three, good evening. You're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Uh, good evening. I have a couple of questions concerning the previous topics on the show. One's a UFO question, one physics. Uh, I'd like to receive your opinion sure. of your opinion of uh, um, the um, Pope's diary story and of Al Felix. I'm, gl oh, I'm glad you asked about that. Uh, let's start with the... Uh, I, I sent the... Uh, I faxed to, uh, to use, Dan, the uh, Pope's predictions for 2000. Yeah, uh, I read the story with interest, obviously, because if it's a legitimate story, it's very important. Uh, it's pretty dynamic stuff, to say the least, as yes, you know. Indeed. Yes, uh, I at best put it in my gray basket. Uh, the world isn't black or white, in my viewpoint. It's maybe, most of the time, it's gray. And... Uh, I was struck that the tone of many parts of the article reflected that what I see in the um, old Weekly World News, where we have authorities say it was 100% authentic, but they didn't mention the authorities. Well, did you see the face in Mars picture from the Weekly? Yeah, yeah, there's a good example. How about uh, <laughs> Hillary Clinton holding an alien baby, too? Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So, uh, it's with that authoritative sense, and I have trouble, you know, cleaning woman finding the Pope's diary in a little used room at the Vatican, and, you know, I, I want something much more than that. Because right, but you're... other parts of that, you know, forget the alien invaders routine. Yeah, you're following up on this, aren't you? You sent it to the Vatican. I've got a guy who was going to the Vatican, a scientist, an outstanding scientist, as a matter of fact, and was interested in UFOs, and so I'm hoping... Uh, that he will get a chance to check it out. There is a name given in it. I forget. Um, Giuseppe 
D'Angelo, something like that. Something like that. And uh, we're going to check on that uh, as the first place to start. Yeah. All right, good. Well, we'll look for a follow-up to that. And I forgot, I've now forgotten the second part of his question. Um, I've forgotten it, too. Well, that makes two of us. Uh, well, maybe it'll occur to me here. Wild Card Line 3, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Where are you, sir? I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco. Turn your radio off, please. I did. All right, good. Go right ahead. I'd like to ask, is it Professor Friedman? No, Mr. Mr. Friedman. Uh, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, mathematically, when you consider everything, that it's inevitable that, that there are extraterrestrials in the area. But if theoretically, it seems to me that these people would have a vested interest in, in uh, traveling in shrinking time. In other words, they have, in order to be here, it makes sense that they would have to be living in the future. I don't understand that. Why do you say that? Be uh, because theoretically you can't go past. I, I don't understand past. that. Uh huh? I don't understand that. If you're coming from 37 light years away and you're capable of going close to the speed of light, it doesn't take that long to get here. But all you can do is shrink time down to a minute fraction. But still, any amount of time, by the nature of time, they still have to be in the future. I, I, I don't understand that at all. I don't either. Uh, I, I can't get any physics around that one. All right. Thank you, caller, for the try. Anyway, line three, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman in Las Vegas. Hi. Hey. Um, I recently, one of my friends told me really vaguely about a case called Guardian, and well, I was wondering yeah, if you could embellish on that some. All right. Guardian. Yeah, there's, there's a strange situation in uh, Ontario, Canada, where there were witnesses that came forth uh, about a sighting, or at least we, a, a videotape came forward with all kinds of strange, um, what do I call it, conspirational kind of paperwork. And then a witness was found whose description of a saucer coming down visible from their farm out in the rural area matched this videotape. Uh, and the the confusion is that, you know, the tape was sent anonymously and the name, guy's name used, or the person's name, I don't know if it was man or woman, uh, was Guardian. And so uh, Unsolved Mysteries and one of the other um, news magazine sort of shows showed the footage. Uh, I've talked to uh, one of the major researchers, Dr. Bruce McAbee, an optical uh, physicist. And, and a guest on my show a couple of weeks ago. And I consider Bruce one of the top researchers in the world, frankly, and a man of complete integrity. And he's very impressed with the footage and how difficult it would be to fake it. And nobody, I haven't heard anybody uh, say that they were impressed with the, the Guardian material. So we've got this strange situation of interesting footage and lousy stories. <laughs> All right, well, glad to get your comment. On the first time, Caroline, uh, you're on the air with Stan Friedman. Good evening. Good evening. Where are you, sir? I'm calling from Palm Springs. All right, turn your radio off. Yes, I will. Just a second. Thank you. Everybody remember to do that. We have a delay system right, here. Right, right. I understand. All right. I, I, I wanted to ask him about men in black. Yeah. He, these are people who uh, appear to those who have had UFO experiences, uh, perhaps uh, the day after or a few hours after. Sometimes they... Uh, wear Air Force uniforms, sometimes they simply are in black suits. And do they, does he believe they exist, and who are they? All right, we've heard much about the men in black, Mr. Friedman. What do you know about them? Oh, I, I, I had a, a men in black experience. I, I think the, the notion has been way overstated by a man named John Keel, who uh, made a big deal about men in black experiences. But in all my years of listening to people tell me about their sightings, and I've been interested for 30, what, 35 years and lecturing for 26, so I hear a lot of stories. Uh, I think I've had two legitimate men in black stories, and I don't know who these guys are. My story, which some people would play up, up into something big, I was at a conference in Oklahoma City. Uh, people heard me the first day of Saturday. They called where I was staying, asked if they could take me out to lunch the next day. I said, fine. They show up in a big black Cadillac, and they were all wearing black suits. And we had a very pleasant lunch, and it turns out they always rent black Cadillacs. They always wear black suits, and they took me back, and nothing happened of any strangeness at all. 
uh, other than somebody might have made a lot of imagination about that story. So I don't rate it high on the list of the significant aspects of the problem. All right, very good. Time is short. Line one, you're on the air in Las Vegas with Stanton Friedman, who's up in Canada. Good evening. Uh, hi, good, uh, good evening, Mr. Friedman. Hi. Um, in your capacity as an engineer of physicist, and uh, putting aside your differences as far as uh, problems and how the person is, yeah. I wonder if you could comment on his uh, explanation about element 115 and uh, its use as an energy source for producing extremely strong gravity fields. Now, interesting theoretical construct. I have no reason for saying anybody here on this planet has ever handled any 115. We've certainly never made any. We Earthlings. Uh, uh, most of the story really comes out of a Scientific American article back several years ago uh, where it is talked about the existence of stable elements with very high atomic numbers. And uh, there's been some changes in ideas about that since. So... Uh, it's one of those things that uses a lot of fancy language, but again, I've never found any physicist who says that he, he buys the notion. In, in my gray basket at best, I guess. I would. All right. The, your gray basket must be very full. Uh, it's overloaded. <laughs> I see. All right. Uh, good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Eugene, Oregon. All right. Uh, uh, turn your radio off, sir, and go ahead. Turn the radio off, sir. Uh, Are we going to get it off? <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Yes, uh, very quickly, Mr. Friedman. Uh, by the way, I've, I've met some of the people that you've spoken about at some of the various meetings. And I'm calling particularly about the uh, moon and breath. Are you familiar with the way back to his book in 1956? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, we well, knew too much about flying yeah. saucers for the listeners that haven't heard of it. Would you speak momentarily about that, sir? All right, thank you. Just as I said earlier, I, I don't consider this an important part of the story, that some people have been threatened, sometimes by phonies, uh, people trying to get information. There are some UFO investigators, as George and Knapp and I would certainly agree, who uh, resort to all kinds of uh, tactics, uh, intimidation or otherwise. But uh, I, I can't make a big deal out of the uh, they knew too much. And uh, there, there's several been several other articles that dealt with this sort of thing, but uh, Gray was a great collector, not so much an investigator. All right. Line two, good evening. You're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Right, how are you doing? I'm fine. Uh, I've got a question for Mr. Friedman. Uh, Bravo, sorry, there is a tape out by a company here, and they want quite a bit of money for a video. It was on one of your uh, shows art last year. Right. Uh, the Bob Lazar story. Uh, it's quite expensive, and I'm kind of a skeptic on it. Can you elaborate on that? Is it worth getting, or is it a lot of hearsay? Oh, boy. Or I'll listen off the air. All right. Uh, have you seen it, first of all? Yes, I have seen it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually, I kind of enjoyed parts of it because Bob comes across well. He's not holier than thou. He's not uh, an elitist. He doesn't talk down to people. Uh, Actually, he's he's very he's very retiring in in a lot of ways. He's uh, and I appreciate that. I mean, I like to communicate in terms people can understand, not to try to sell myself as somebody who can use ten dollar words. So I appreciate all that. Uh, on the other hand, I must say that I didn't find the tape uh, from my putting on my physics hat as opposed to my ufological hat. Uh, I didn't find his explanation for how the thing works very convincing. The gravity amplifiers. Uh, the yeah, using element 115. That's right, the folding of space, which is one of the same things you mentioned a little earlier. Yeah, and also that uh, all you got to do is accelerate protons. Well, that's a big deal, not a little deal. And he said that things weren't connected, which I couldn't make any sense out of. So, uh, again, it's, it's a gray basket. There's no way to verify that. Mm-hmm. Um, All right, we've hardly got any time left, and too many people who want to talk to you. Uh, very quickly, line three, you're on the air with Stanton Friedman. Uh, your opinion of Al Bielek, and I'll just listen. All right, thank you. Well, that was, that, 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 that was it. Yes. Yeah. Very quickly, because we're about out of time. Al Bielek. I've listened to Al Bielek. I do not think he was reborn as a different person than that he got a Ph.D. from Harvard as Cameron in 1939. I think it's a phony baloney story. You don't think? I don't think. Well, it is, you know, we've just made enough time. We could go on with this, uh, obviously, for hours, but we can't. So I'm going to thank you as a guest, and uh, you've been a great one. I've got to say that. It's been very controversial, and I've enjoyed it very much. My pleasure. So hopefully someday you'll come back, and uh, we'll do it again. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Would you like the opportunity to be on the air with uh, Bob Lazar? Sure. I agree to it. 
to meet him four years ago. He wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we can get that out. Scott Friedman, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, I'm afraid everybody that is it. The clock is the clock. We've got to go. We'll be back once again next Sunday evening at 8 o'clock with more Area 2000. 8 to 10 o'clock right here. I'm Art Bell. Good evening. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000. A program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. Welcome to Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. And it is going to be a very serious program this morning. It is, of course, every week. But this week, uh, in addition to George, who is back, George Knapp, our roving journalist, uh, and Linda Howe, who's got a special guest herself, we'll be having uh, Bud Hopkins as our guest. And most of you should know Bud, uh, Missing Time, Intruders, uh, two bestseller uh, list books to his credit, and a whole lot more. So, uh, without any further wait, let's get started, shall we? To, I guess first, uh, George Knapp, who's back after being on an airplane last week, lost in airspace someplace or another. Good evening, uh, George. Welcome. Good evening, Art, and good evening, listeners. A lot of stuff to cover tonight. First of all, my apologies for not being with you last week, but I was winging my way back from an important UFO conference held in Connecticut at the time. Yeah, I get a chance to attend about a dozen of these events each year, and uh, at these things, you often hear speculation or predictions about big events, you know, something major is about to happen, that sort of thing. For the most part, as you know, our such predictions fall flat. No alien landings, no government announcements, no end of the world kind of thing. But at this one, and, and in others I've attended recently, I've heard more and more pessimism from researchers whom I respect than ever before. I mean, solid, well-connected people are quite frankly, scared, visibly, physically upset by something that they feel is about to happen. A few of these researchers have been told things, but are unwilling to talk about it even in private conversations. Among those who work on this topic full-time, uh, I think the feeling is almost universal that we're, we're all in for some sort of a major jolt, and it's more than just kind of an end of the millennium retrospection. It's a real and, and palpable perception based on informed sources in some cases, gut instinct, and the fact that the people I'm talking about work with the, this material every day. George, when? Well, that, that's a good question, you know, because we've all heard these sort of predictions before, and it doesn't seem like they ever come true, but I, I've never felt it quite like this, as I said, almost universal among the people who, um, whom, whom I greatly respect. And I think Linda and, and Bud would certainly have uh, probably better insight on that than I. It could be soon, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. It, it's... Uh, I know Linda has heard the same sort of rumblings and has similar perceptions, and I'd really like to, to hear her thoughts on whether she's getting this same sort of feedback, and, and Bud uh, absolutely has the same sort of thing, uh, possibly from the abductees themselves. What could the big event be? I, I think much of the current attention that I heard back there is focused on an astronomical event slated for next July. Several asteroid chunks, you heard this, are going to slam into the planet Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is a, a big planet. That's, that's an understatement.
but these are also major league asteroids, and they're sort of uh, almost in, in synchronicity. Even mainstream scientists say this is going to be a spectacular celestial event. Could it possibly affect Earth, considering the vast distances between them and us? Uh, that would seem remote, but a lot of people are wondering if something is afoot. One of those is Richard Hoagland, known for his groundbreaking work about the so-called face on Mars. I had some lengthy conversations with Hoagland at this kinetic conference. He is imbued with the same sense of foreboding about the future, especially as it relates to this pending Jupiter event. Now, Hoagland has extensive sources, as you know, within NASA. He isn't at all reluctant, though, in saying that something truly nasty is in the works. We'll see. Okay, but it's, it, it is all foreboding. In other words, this could not be a good event. Everybody's concerned. Oh, that, that's pretty much. I mean, Colin Andrews, the crop circle researcher who has probably the most uh, optimistic view on the whole alien-human interaction, even he feels that, that, that something big is coming. Uh, it, it's uh, saying it's universal. It, it's unanimous. I mean, I, I don't know any of these major researchers who don't feel the same thing that they're getting for from uh, different sources. Well, we've got several major researchers this morning on, on this program, so we'll ask. Good, I hope you do. Of more immediate interest is Richard Hoagland's information about this ill-fated Mars observer. Now, he, he's the guy that did the groundbreaking work on this. Uh, he has all kinds of sources within NASA, and he is convinced the loss of this craft was not accidental, which a lot of us suspect, that there was some sort of a hidden purpose behind the mission, which is certainly possible and that the observer, he says, is going to spring back to life after the first of the year. That's his prediction. Hmm. Uh, it's a long, complicated explanation about why it's going to happen, but if it does, uh, you'll know where you heard it from Hoagland. And uh, I understand Linda has a guest who may be able to shed light on this as well. That's right. On the subject of Mars and predictions, remember the predictions by these former government psychics. We talked about them a couple times on the program about this big event that was supposed to happen in August in New Mexico. Well, although nothing of the sort materialized, the folks who made this prediction now say the Mars Observer incident was directly related to their predicted event and that the New Mexico part of the story has been delayed by five or six weeks. Uh, the, the chief remote viewer who used to work for the military, a guy named Ed Dames, predicts that a very high authority, whom he says is higher than President Clinton, not a whole lot of those going around, will make an announcement of some sort in the near future. Again, listener caution is advised when evaluating the credibility of predictions like this, but we will certainly keep you posted. Uh, the two-month-long Las Vegas Library UFO lecture series concluded last night with a talk from researcher Bill Moore, who has done a lot of good work on Roswell and MJ-12. We don't have the final crowd counts, but the library folks are elated with the public response to the series. Nearly every event drew a full house, and the district has already decided to do it again next year. I had two chances this week to address uh, some of these library audiences, and for the most part, the questions were intelligent, the discussion was healthy. It, it's apparent that people are really hungry for credible information on this topic, and I think your show, Art, is evidence of that. Uh, I want to give congratulations to the library people uh, for having the courage to put on a program like this, because you know how much skepticism there is in the local media, and luckily they didn't get bashed too badly. You know, George, I wonder if the general public, and maybe we'll find out this morning, has the same building sense of something imminent. I sure, I sure feel that, you know, traveling around the country and, and doing stories and going to conferences, I really do feel it. And, and some of you have to chalk up the general paranoia, and, and uh, you know, we've heard these predictions, as I mentioned, over and over again, but uh, there's a building sense that um, I try to resist it as a journalist. You don't want to get into that, <laughs> uh, that sort of a framework, but... Uh, you hear it again and again and again, and it sort of uh, plays with your mind. Do you, do you think you have that same feeling, or do you think you're being infected uh, by those who say they have it? Uh, I, I think the, the, the latter is the idea, is that uh, I don't have that sense, but uh, I'm getting it after hearing it again and again <laughs> from yes. people whom I greatly respect. Right. Uh, a few weeks ago, we hinted on this program that we might have some definitive evidence concerning the Bob Lazar Area 51 alien technology story. Well, this week that evidence was made public for the first time during this library lecture, and, and this will mark the first time it's been broadcast anywhere. In a nutshell, this is it, Art. A few months ago, a company in California purchased some photos taken by a Soviet satellite in the summer of 1988. This is just a little bit before Bob Lazar started working, allegedly started working at S4 Papoose. Right. Photos in question were targeted at Groom and Papoose Lakes uh, here in Nevada. Bob Lazar said... He saw flying saucers, alien technology, stored and tested at Papu's Lake, right. a story which no one will confirm and which, as you know, a lot of people refuse to believe. Well, this photo 
as amazing as it might sound, apparently caught a large metallic disc-shaped craft flying above Papu's Lake. Oh, my. They've seen this thing. Uh, some former NASA imagery specialists have seen it. They have analyzed it. It is a big, fat flying saucer on film above the area where Lazar said they were being flown. Wow. Now, now that this, really does earn a wow. Do you have a copy of it, George? I, I do. You I do. do? And uh, it, it'll blow you away. I, I, would li- I would like to see that, George. I'd be glad to show it to you. I would really like to see that. Now, some additional blow-ups are being processed, which allegedly, and I say that only because I haven't seen this part of it myself, they show roads which lead into the hills that are adjacent to Papoose, where, where Bob said the hangars were, which stored the... Uh... There is no question about the geography? Oh, n- none at all. I'm, none at all. George, is there any chance you can get this published in, in the local paper or better? Well, I, I don't own the photos. I've been shown them. I've been allowed to talk to it, but I, I don't own them. I think there's some uh, uh, some um, corporate interest. There. There, there, as you know, Art, there's a movie company that wants to do some stuff on Bob, and they're the ones that forked over the money because this is an expensive proposition to come up with the photos and to get them analyzed. Boy, that's that's really serious. Uh, when you said evidence, you weren't kidding. Uh, you say you've had this analyzed? Well, they have had this analyzed by some former NASA people, and they are as mystified as anyone. They say what it appears to be is a, is a flying saucer. Additional blow-ups, as I said, are being processed, and they allegedly show roads which lead into these hills adjacent to Papoos and buses parked outside the area where Bob said he worked. Now, the reason this is really important is I have two congressional sources who have been up to that area and who have flown over Papoos in the last couple of months. Uh, specifically looking for evidence of any kind of programs or hangars or anything else. There's nothing there. There is absolutely nothing there right now. Hmm. And they've been told that there was nothing there in the past. Well, these photos, I think, will clearly demonstrate that there was something there before and that uh, there has been some sort of a cover-up. And I hope someone in Congress gets mad at it because someone clearly is lying. I, I have a couple of other items, but I think it's probably more important to get on to your guest tonight because concerning him... He was also at this Connecticut event that I attended last week, and uh, I tell you, this is a guy you can't get enough of. I've heard Bud probably ten times. I've interviewed him. We've had numerous private conversations. I think he is probably the single most important figure in ufology today, a really good and honest man. I can't wait to hear it. All right. It's uh, It's been wonderful, George, and somehow or another, I would very much like to get to see those. Uh, are you going to get copies made yourself? Well, I don't have I don't have the permission to do that. I certainly would have permission to show them to you, Art, uh, because I, I think uh, it's important for you. All right, I will contact you. Okay. Thank you, George. That's George Knapp, our roving journalist, and this morning he had some pretty serious news. Uh, and once again, what he just revealed was that there are Soviet photos, and this is big news, folks. Soviet photos taken of the Groom Lake, Papus, uh a lake area, precisely where Bob Lazar said there were discs, purporting to show that there is, in fact, a disc in the photo. And uh, uh, the buses and the roads leading in and out and the facility itself that is not there now, that would be a very, very serious piece of evidence. George Knapp. Now, to um, Denver, Colorado, or Boulder, Colorado, I guess, more accurately, and Linda Howe this evening, and yet another glimpse into yet another reality, and her guest this morning, Dan Drayson. So let's go to Boulder, Colorado, and say good evening, folks. All right. uh, hi. Hi. I think one of the unusual features about tonight is that neither you nor George nor I had a chance to talk today about what we were going to discuss tonight, and yet earlier this afternoon I was in a place where uh, some of the astronomers now meeting at the University of Colorado on a planetary conference were, Mm -hmm. and I talked with two of them, one from Poland and one from France, and the issue, one of the issues was this event next summer in which a a comet-like body followed by asteroids is supposed to uh, plunge into Jupiter. And I ask them, as astronomers, what they are expecting the consequence of this event to be, and their unanimous response was, well, there will be nothing in the solar system because Jupiter is so huge, and they used the analogy that it would be like uh, throwing something into a huge feather pillow, as they said, and it will absorb whatever this is that's coming. 
Uh, that is the astronomer point of view today in Boulder at this large uh, planetary conference. Whether or not there is any other information about this event next summer, uh, I don't know. But obviously we are coming up against a phenomenon that is real. It is physical. It was reported in science this week. It's been reported in uh, various national news media. So between now and uh, the middle of next summer, we can at least begin to gain more information about it. And how, how big? Do you have any idea how large these objects are? No. The only description that I have heard is a comet-like body that is preceding a series of 17 or 19 asteroid-like, uh, which would be rocky bodies. Uh, each one uh, would be directed into uh, the gaseous uh, planet of Jupiter. Whether anything like this has happened before, I don't know. Maybe no one knows for sure. But at least in terms of the scientists meeting here uh, today, uh, there is no reason they are interested. They will be trying to monitor what happens. They are, uh, from just the conversation this afternoon, though, they're not expecting there to be any impact on the Earth, and they said that with some strength. George talked about a strong sense of foreboding. Uh, that seems either to be connected to that or separate from it. But he's getting it, he said, from just about everybody. Are you getting that same sense, Linda? I would not say foreboding as much as a sense from uh, some of the abductees I know and other uh, research colleagues. Um, I think everybody has a sense that something major is going to happen mm -hmm. uh, in the next uh, possible year. I don't know the details. I know that some of the abductees uh, are talking about having a sense of something major happening, but whether or not it is going to be of uh, some kind of a global uh, catastrophic impact nature, which uh, the Hoagland hypothesis would present, or it means that there may possibly be the beginning of the opening of this uh, very difficult story that we are not alone in the universe, that there are other intelligences and we may be finally on the brink of uh, encountering some of these intelligences in another way. All right, Linda, before we get to your guest, and I, I, I do want to ask you about what George said. Did you hear what he said about the Soviet photos of Papoose, uh, Papoose Lake and the, the disc that he's got on, uh, on a, yeah, I guess, in a photograph? Right, and uh, about the only thing one can say anymore is that with um, the kind of virtual reality that is capable on computers these days, it is so hard to know what the source of photographs are. People, unfortunately, can concoct many things and pass them off for money or fame or whatever. Sure. Say that they are X, Y, or Z. The issue here, and George may have that, is that there needs to be some kind of substantial proof about what the source of the photograph is, how legitimate it is, and right now, until there's more information forthcoming, it sounds like this is a uh, very sensational uh, and dramatic-looking photograph, and I hope that we will learn more about its source and the details. And this whole issue of other intelligences involved with our planet brings me to the subject that a friend of mine uh, in Boulder has been involved with uh, the research of the unusual Martian features uh, for the last decade. He has worked with Richard Hoagland, the author and investigator of many of the anomalies on Mars, including that enormous mile-long, 1,500-foot high face feature. And he uh, was the editor of a book that has been out for a couple of years, beautiful, called The Martian Enigmas by Mark Carlotto, who specializes in digital imaging uh, and has been doing a lot of the photograph work on the NASA frame. And for people who may not be aware, just very briefly, uh, in the end of the 70s, we had an orbiter that took two frames that showed a very unusual, uh, what people more conservatively call an unusual Martian feature. And it looks like an enormous face, and there were other odd features around it. Richard Hoagland and others have speculated that this is the uh, archaeological vestiges of what was once upon a time a civilization on Mars. With me is Dan Drayson, who has edited this book with Mark Carlotto, has worked with Richard Hoagland, and has been involved with this whole issue. Is there any hard evidence to support the speculation that somebody somewhere is still receiving secret imaging from the Mars 
orbiter, or is it really dead in space, either orbiting, completely turned off around Mars, or has it gone sailing off into space? And I'd like to introduce Dan Drayson, and we'll start off with the whole issue of is there any evidence to support the speculation that there are secret signals coming from the Mars Observer? Dan, good evening. Good evening. How, how do you do? Just fine. Well, tell us what you can about the Explorer. We're all curious about it. Well, um, nobody that I know of has any um, definitive evidence, at least none that they're willing to make public at this point in time. But the circumstantial evidence is quite intriguing, uh, and the timing is quite intriguing. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Stan McDaniel, a uh, professor at Sonoma State University in California who recently uh, released a paper known now as the McDaniel Report, um, which has made a, a quite a few waves both within NASA and um, uh, around the whole Mars investigation. Um, McDaniel's report essentially takes NASA to task um, very firmly for the uh, false statements they've made to the public and to Congress over the past uh, 15 or so years with regard to the, uh, to the Martian investigation. Um, it also uh, dissects the, uh, uh, the game plan for Mars Observer. So in other words, it, it tries to lay out a pattern of, um, uh, of, of lies or deception over many years, not just with regard to this latest thing, but over many years. Right. Uh, essentially, uh, in a nutshell, uh, NASA has claimed over the years to have photographs which disconfirm the existence of the Martian face and these other objects. Uh, they, have, they have claimed time and time again, and they have said this both uh, uh, publicly and in private correspondence uh, with uh, members of the public and members of Congress, they have claimed that this photograph exists although they have never named this photograph. Each of the Viking photographs were numbered. Uh, they've, never, they've never produced this photograph that they claim to have for 15 years hmm. and uh, recently have a, as good as admitted that it doesn't exist. Um, further, they have also, NASA have also claimed over the years to have exhaustively studied uh, these objects and that the results of these exhaustive investigations have been that uh, the, the, the top experts in the field consider these things to be nothing more than illusions and tricks of light and shadow. Well, as it turns out, there were no such investigations. That these, uh, uh, the verdict that these were, were uh, illusions were basically the, the personal opinions of a very few NASA geologists. That's a little puzzling. On the one hand, they're saying they don't exist. On the other hand, they're saying we investigated them and they're nothing. Right. So there's something there. Well, of course there's something there. <laughs> there there's, there's, uh, uh, it, it's been a bit of a shell game, actually. And uh, I, I, one, of, one of my personal interests is in the whole psychology of belief, disbelief, propaganda, debunkery, and so forth. And I found this entire case to be a goldmine, sort of a textbook case of, uh, in, in a way, people living in different worlds. You've got the independent investigation team, uh, Dick Hoagland, and, and uh, going way back to 1979, Vince DiPietro, Greg Molinar, then um, Mark Carlotto, Errol Torr, and myself, and, and several others. Um, we, we, have, uh, we have watched this thing develop from a, what was essentially a, a subjective impression of a face way back in the, in the 70s when these photos first came in uh, into quite a, a detailed and elaborate um, series of analyses of these, of these pictures. Um, mathematical, fractal, cultural, uh, these photographs. And there's more than two, by the way. There's probably a half dozen in, in total that, that are, uh, are, are in, in question here. Um, and this is an investigation which NASA basically does not acknowledge ever took place. Hmm. Uh, there, the, the, the amount of energy expended uh, in, in propaganda in place of science uh, has been enormous here. Probably the best account of the history of this whole affair is in this document known as the McDaniel Report. Um, one of the um, interesting things about the history of this report is that NASA received a copy of it. Uh, probably a day and a half before the apparent loss of Mars Observer. And uh, this particular edition of the report contained um, a bit of an expose on NASA's strategy. Uh, you see, Mars Observer was supposed to have gone into orbit, undergone its proper orbital adjustments and technical checkouts, and then started photography sometime in November or December of this year. That, that was the Explorer, wasn't it? Mars Observer. 
Oh, okay. That's what uh, Art went out on August 21st and lost signal and set in all this speculation about whether or not the signal was really lost or if it is out in space somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, What the McDaniel Report pointed out was that NASA had recently published their um, a revised edition of their of their protocols, which um, provided a week and a half, an unexplained week and a half to two weeks of time during which Mars Observer could have photographed these areas on Mars, uh, sent back the photos, and then perhaps political decisions could have been made about what to do about them. So you're suggesting then that they got some early pictures before the orbital maneuvers, they found something shocking, and did something to the observer. Uh, we're suggesting that they already know what's there, mm-hmm. and that um, Mars Observer would have allowed them to get a much, much closer look than we've had the opportunity to have in the past, and that they wanted to have the first glimpse to themselves, so to speak, and then decide what to do about it. And um, this report, which um, made public for the first time NASA's uh, apparent strategy, was received by NASA uh, on the, I believe, on the 20th and on the 21st, the spacecraft was lost immediately after receiving its uh, program instructions for orbital insertion. Now, the Dan, what do you think is there that is so shocking that they couldn't tell us about it? <laughs> well, I, I can tell you what my own opinion is after being involved in this study for for over 10 years now. Um, I think that um, we have. In fact, I'm going to uh, I'm going to quote Stan McDaniel on this. Um, from from the back page of his report, and he says, <clears throat> whether the objects on Mars turn out to be alien artifacts or simply the most stupendous constellation of geological coincidences in history, eventually the human race must face these questions. <laughs> when you really, really look into this material, not just superficially, uh, but in depth, so then if we... The history of the investigation... It's okay, so Dan, if we... we layer can... upon layer upon layer... Of, of confirming evidence. All right, so if we presume then that these are, as he suspects they might be, evidence of an alien race, then we have to imagine that NASA has concluded we would be so disturbed by that information that we'd all go crazy and wouldn't be able to handle it, and so they're keeping it secret. Is that a probable motivation? Certainly a possible motivation. We know, for example, that in 1960, a report entitled Proposed Studies on the Implication of implications of peaceful space activities for human affairs uh, was delivered to the chairman of NASA's Committee on Long-Range Studies. It was prepared under contract. And uh, the report outlines the need to investigate the possible social consequences of any discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence and uh, also to consider whether such a discovery should be kept from the public in order to avoid political change, uh, possible devastating effects on uh, scientists, uh, due to the discoveries that many of their own most uh, cherished theories could be at risk and so forth. Uh, now, this, this does not, certainly does not uh, concur with scientific method as I learned it and as most of us understand it. But All right. we uh, also know that, that, uh, that science and politics are very much interwoven All right. in the real world. Dan, stand by just one moment, please. I've got to do a quick station identification. We'll be uh, right back to Linda Howe and Dan Drayson. You're listening to Area 2000. Jackie Gons Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. I'm Art Bell. We're running a little late. Uh, uh, Devon Buda Hopkins, we'll get to him shortly. I've got Linda Howe and Dan Drayson in Boulder, Colorado. The subject is the Mars Observer mission, what might be on Mars, and back to them. Uh, folks, you're back on the air once again. Uh- the issue here was what possibly could be the motivation for a policy of government silence and all this, and is it just to prevent public panic, or is it to keep the social, financial, and other status quo in place? And if that is the reason, how are we going to move on with getting on to the fact that we're not alone in the universe? And here's Dan. Well, that's a, that's a, a rather uh, large question. <laughs> Uh, I, I sort of I view this whole process. I, I tend to take a long view of the whole process. I mean, we have we live in a world that's, that's balanced on the edge of great change, and particularly great changes of perspective in terms of our own self-image. Who are we in the universe? Do we 
did we evolve as sort of freakish creations on this on this isolated rock, you know, or are we part of a, a much larger network of life? And uh, this is uh, this has implications in terms of our history. Uh, we're beginning to suspect, or some of us are, that that uh, someone stole our history. Where's our real history? Why has this been kept from us? Uh, people like Zechariah Sitchin and others are, are uncovering uh, some very provocative evidence that um, perhaps uh, the the uh, the general belief that we're alone in the universe uh, is is perhaps a was perhaps a purposeful thing, and that the many human institutions down through the centuries have been have evolved um, and had as their purpose um, keeping us quarantined in a sense. And there are various uh, opinions and perspectives on on whether this is a good or a bad thing or just what happened. Or mm-hmm. um, uh, and I, I find this whole field fascinating, and I find the uh, my own process of, of, of discovery and, and uh, self-questioning to be really rich. The, the only other uh, question I have with reference to the observer is, if they had a pretty good idea of what was there and that they didn't want us to see it, why spend the billion dollars and launch it in the first place? I'm not sure they had any choice. And I, I'm also not sure that the forces within NASA and other institutions are all that monolithic. Uh, my impression is uh, and this is this is reinforced uh, by by having been exposed to many points of view in this in this field um, that there are varying points of view within within our institutions and within government, and that there are those who who want the truth revealed, those who do not want the truth revealed, and many people in the middle, and that what's going on now is a, is a process where, whereby all this is being sorted out, and will obviously be shaken out in the next few years because the dam is going to break sooner or later. Good enough, Dan. It's certainly been good uh, speaking with you. And uh, Linda, yes. do you have anything more for us uh, this evening? I, I'm uh, eager for you to transition on to Bud, who clearly is dealing with another aspect of this whole issue of are we involved with another intelligence on this planet, and what would the motive be for the UFO abduction syndrome and all of this? All right, then to Bud we will go, and I thank both you and Dan for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Happy you next Sunday. Both of you take care. Uh, Dan Grayson and uh, Linda Howe and her glimpse into another reality. And now, very quickly, because we're short on time already, Bud Hopkins uh, probably is, as George advertised, uh, I would say the leading ufologist uh, right now um, in the nation. UFO investigator, author of Intruders, author of Missing Time, and he had his own sighting back uh, a long, very long time ago in 1964, and that got him started, and that got him started investigating, and then finally uh, himself writing. He founded the Intruders Foundation, a not-for-profit organization devoted to research and public education concerning UFO abduction phenomenon. He has been a guest just about everywhere, including this program previously, but today's show, Good Morning America, Joan Rivers, Nightline, Oprah Winfrey. Um, he's been everywhere, 2020, Larry King, Jenny Jones, Night Watch, Unsolved Mysteries, um, PM Magazine, Current Affair, Swedish Philbin, I could go on with this design forever. And um, instead, I'm just going to go directly all the way to New York and Bud Hopkins. Bud Hopkins, good evening. Good evening, guys. Oh, we've got a good one. Excellent. Uh, glad to have you. The audience needs to know a little history. I was supposed to connect with you down in Texas. Right. Uh, but uh, we got all turned around, and uh, you, you got the wrong day, and then we got the wrong time. And, but here you are, back in New York. Yeah. yeah. All right. You've been able to listen to quite a bit uh, this evening. Any reaction to what you've heard so far? Well, I'll start first with what George was saying about uh, the sense of uh, foreboding that many investigators have. Exactly. And uh, <clears throat> I will... Uh, and what I have to say and my feelings about this, the first point about it is that uh, after uh, having conducted uh, this investigation that we did through the Broker organization, uh, a, a poll looking into how uh, percentage of the people we think have had yet their abduction experiences, and we found this uh, a step number of people who seem to have had these experiences. Uh, at the time, we came up with a, uh, a rough guess of one in every 50 Americans. I higher than that. Now, what that means, of course, is that whatever is going on in Mars, right here and now on this planet, right in Nevada and uh, Nebraska and New York City and whatnot, uh, there are abductions taking place as we speak. 
the numbers would uh, imply that uh, that it has to be that frequent. So something absolutely enormous is going on on this planet. And the point is, in terms of the foreboding that uh, people feel, a sense of something about to happen, um, rather than there being necessarily some uh, single solitary event, what's been happening is that more and more and more people are coming to realize that this crazy stuff is actually going on. People are having these experiences. And the ep- is amassing itself, so uh, really this can't be kept uh, under wraps any for much longer. Mm. Um, when, do you think? Uh, 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 I guess we're talking about uh, an astrological event in July, next July, this coming next July. Yeah. Well, I was talking about the astrological event, uh, which may or may not have much of an effect on us. Uh, I'm talking about the, the very fact that the evidence, as it comes together, supporting uh, the idea of uh, an alien intelligence within our world and affecting our lives in a very profound way, abducting people from childhood on uh, for some kind of ongoing genetic experiment, which implies uh, the production of, of uh, some sort of hybrid life form between them and us. Uh, this is so incredibly widespread that it's simply, uh, it, the days are numbered, <laughs> really, um, uh, in which we're going to be able to keep this thing secret. Uh, how how would you think, Bud, that it would break open? If that magic moment comes and all of this builds to some kind of climax, how would you think it might come? Well, it can come in, in many different ways. I'm working on a case, and have been for quite some time, in which uh, a very important political figure uh, oh. witnessed uh, an abduction of someone floating 12 stories up in midair with three aliens, Oh. Uh, underneath a UFO right in New York City uh, at around 3.30 in the morning back in 1989. Now, I can just say mm-hmm. that if this figure, this political figure, uh, were to come forward and, and state for the public record what he's seen, uh, it would have the same effect as if, to make a rough analogy, uh, let's say Robert McNamara, the former uh, Secretary of Defense, came forward and announced officially that uh, as Secretary of Defense he did see... Uh, uh, alien bodies and uh, alien captured craft and so forth, crashed UFOs. Is it somebody that big? Uh, yes, yes. And that's all I'm going to say about his identity. But the point is, uh, <laughs> if this were to happen, I mean, that would just be one way in which it could be made public. Another way, of course, is if we had uh, other important figures. You see, this is so widespread that there have to be enormous numbers of uh, uh, military and government scientific individuals uh, who uh, are operating under some kind of vow of secrecy right now. They have to be because uh, you can't keep something this large, this secret for this long. And if we're a crack that occurred in the uh, in the circuit of control, a crack that occurred at any point when information could come tumbling out if people decided to come forward with what they know. There have been isolated cases. Um, George has been looking into the whole situation, of course, with uh, uh, Bob and Saul and so forth, but there have been many, many other people who have come forward little by little, people around the Wild West and so forth. And what if some of the three or four generals will suddenly try to talk to us and announce that they can't live with themselves any longer and they want to announce this to the public? That could happen, that sort of thing, any day. Mm-hmm. Um, in your work with the Dutch are you getting any sense from abductees and from stories, or is there anything you can tell us that would uh, also... Well, I'll just say one thing. Now, this uh, slightly humorous note. Maybe we need a little humor at this point. Um, but um, if there's any universal law op- operating here, it's Murphy's Law, because <laughs> things seem to go wrong with alien abductions, too. Uh, the uh, meaning of this, I think, has to do with the fact that there are so many these events taking place, that mistakes are bound to occur. And there also seems to be something uh, a sort of frantic about the alien activity as if they're speeding things up. Uh, I get reports very often from abductees implying that this hybrid program really isn't working properly. It isn't doing what they, uh, they're not totally successful with it. And uh, it's as if time is limited for them or something of that sort. So there's a kind of frantic nature. But uh, on the humor part of it, for instance, I was just working with a woman who uh, uh, had gone to bed wearing uh, uh, a T-shirt and some underpants, and when she woke up in the morning, she was wearing the T-shirt, some memory of an event during the night having been taken out of the house and an abduction. 
she was not wearing underpants, but in fact on the bed table next to her were some other woman's underpants, not hers. Holy mackerel. Uh, I had the same exact thing that happened to a woman in Florida. I went to bed wearing, <laughs> again, some kind of nightshirt and underpants and woke up uh, with Alfred and uh, there were some other woman's uh, underwear in, in the house. A woman in Ohio went to bed wearing her nightgown and woke up with a man's green T-shirt on. Uh, clothes disappear. Uh, it, uh, one woman woke up with another woman's earrings on the table next to her. This sort of thing. Uh, but, 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 when you regress these people, and I assume that you did, yes. uh, how could you resist? Yes. What did you, what did you find out? Well, that the person was taken into a ship, uh, uh, undressed. There was a... Uh, uh, you know, a series of physical examinations and so forth, and often this whole presentation scene where they're shown a small, strange child, they have to hold her, one of the various kinds of things that seem to happen in a very routine way, and then the person is taken back, and they, they're often mistakes, the person is put in the wrong bed, or the person is put her up, the feet are up on the pillow, and they're headed to the foot of the bed, or they're on the couch downstairs, and in one case, the person, the people, uh, one man is driving a car, uh, and he went to a UFO, and they uh, 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 see themselves. The difference is that they have switched positions. The different man is driving the car. They have no recollection of how that happened. In other words, people are put down in the wrong place or, or with the wrong clothes or whatever it is, uh, suggesting that there's a kind of undue haste uh, operating here. But it does, of course, give a, a very specific kind of physical evidence to these events. He's not out of body experience. These are, these are out of the house experiences, uh, as we like to say. But the uh, the alien haste, I think, uh, signals something in a strange way. It signals that they're working too hard, too fast, against some kind of deadline. Would be the, the deduction we could make, and my, those all may be wrong deductions. But. All right, here's a question for you, Bud. Uh, during these abductions, um, have there ever been cases where? The person abducted is with several other people that they're able to uh, then describe to you, or is it uh, a person always singly abducted without uh, another human being ever being? Oh, in, no, the, in many, many cases, uh, people are abducted in groups. I have two cases where there's seven people abducted simultaneously, uh, all remembering the same story. Uh, John Carpenter just gave a lecture at the conference I spoke at in Houston uh, yesterday. Okay, are these people, though, Bud, who, who don't know each other well, it, otherwise? In these cases, uh, these are families or people who do want to know one another. But one wonderful case that, well, I'm working on two right now. We're trying to locate uh, people. We have names, and, and we have a name in one case and a physical uh, description in another case of a stranger who was abducted along with the person I was working with were trying to locate uh, these strangers. But there is a wonderful case where a woman in, uh, in uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Boston, in the Boston area, was abducted, remembered an old lady with her uh, in the craft, actually had a conversation with the old lady, and the old lady managed to tell her her name and where she was from, uh, although all of this was forgotten until hypnotic regression was entered into. Wow. The woman in Boston uh, then remembered the, the, the old lady's name and her hometown, and uh, although they, this was an event that had happened seven years earlier, uh, the town was a very small town in one of the Dakotas, as I remember. Uh, it, the uh, town clerk was contacted. In fact, such a woman had lived there and had died. Uh, uh. The, uh, unfortunately, was not available. But there were some very interesting stories about the uh, from her surviving sister about a very strange adventure that her, her sister had had, uh, which was very terrifying to her. But the very fact that uh, the woman in Boston was able to describe, get the name right, get the town right, and get the uh, particular description even of the kinds of clothes she wore and the fact that she was an artist because she had been able to tell the Boston woman that's in the craft, I think uh, it goes a long way to establishing the reality. It does, Bud, and if you ever got two credible people in separate locations, both still alive, you would have something that just might be the key that opens up the whole business. Now, see, that's one of the other interesting things, Art. There are so many areas where uh, the evidence is, is just coming forward, uh, not in little dribbles, but it's coming in, in, in quite a rush. In the uh, conference that I just attended and spoke at in Houston, uh, a young woman in the Houston area who is uh, in, the, in the medical field um, 
I presented an x-ray of a man who had uh, actually uh, uh, tried to commit suicide, and uh, the x-ray was done just routinely. He shot himself in the head, and the x-ray was taken for medical purposes uh, to locate the bullet and so forth. Uh, the man is still living, uh, although in evidently pretty terrible shape, and has been moved to a hospital in, tech, in uh, Mexico. He was a Mexican. But uh, this x-ray showed a very unusual thing. There is an absolutely clear-cut spring-like object, which is evidently in the uh, sinus cavity right uh, behind it near the pituitary gland. Wow. A totally foreign object. A spring-like object? Spring-like object. It looks like, uh, you know, the kind of spring you have in a ballpoint pen? Sure. It looks like that, although it's much smaller, but it's, uh, uh, it's a very distinct metallic object. And, of course, we don't know anything about what that is, but nobody is supposed to have something like that next to the pituitary gland. No. The suggestion w is, of course, that we may have now another X-ray uh, of an implant. This man is lingering uh, from his suicide attempt with a bullet in his head, and uh, the woman there in... Uh, Houston is investigating this further and hoping that uh, it's a horrible thing to say, but if the man doesn't survive, that an autopsy could be done and this object could be recovered. Have they managed to attain that? In other words, if he passes away, will they be able to do it? Oh, that's something that I leave to the medical people there. The, the problem are a lot of these things are not as easy to do just because of the proprieties involved and the ethics involved, but this is something that uh, I mean, this just turned up in a, in a completely accidental way. And uh, therefore, and, and I should point out that, that uh, head x-rays are not typically done. In other words, uh, doctors do not like to routinely prescribe right. uh, a full head x-ray. So uh, it isn't as if we have literally uh, millions of x-rays of heads the way we do of, of the rest of the body and, and the teeth and so forth. Uh, so the fact that this was done because of the suicide attempt uh, and the the bullet lodged in the skull, we, uh, <laughs> they had to actually turn up what seems to be an implant. So here we are again. They, uh, when we talk about these breakthroughs, they, they are coming left, right, and center. And uh, as I say, the, the evidence is simply accumulating in, in, at such a rapid rate that uh, society is going to have to get itself together and decide, you know, we're going to have to decide how to affect this transition into a, a period where we are dealing quite consciously with the existence of a non-human intelligence. How about the number of abductions? You'd be the one to know, Bud. Uh, I'm sure you get reports oh. left and right. Uh, yeah, I pick up at least two new cases every single day, and uh, I would guess that we have in the United States, it's, well, it's many, many millions. Uh, it, we, we might be dealing with five million abductions. Uh, if I, if I can I have a second? I'd like to read you something. I just read this letter today. Um, I received from a woman, and this is just so typical, and I thought it would be interesting to, for people to understand what uh, would suggest uh, an abduction. This is a woman um, who's 35, describing about an event that happened when she was 11 or 12. She said, my room had wooden louvered shutters at the bottom half of the windows. I always felt very exposed at night in my room and used to dress and undress in the bathroom. I lay awake now sometimes trying to force myself to remember more of this incident, but my mind won't let me. She wants to know why it bothers her after 23 years. I find that I cannot stand to see an exposed window at night and even make sure the mini blinds are all angled up so no light could shine down through them. She said she was asleep in bed at the age of 11 or 12 and awoke to see light coming down uh, through the shutters. Uh, the light was most strong in the window directly above my head, but I could see it coming through another window too. It was dark outside. Uh, she said, I thought I heard what with voices barely buzzing at my hearing threshold. I was completely unable to move. Uh, total paralysis. This could not have been from intense fear, I suppose, but I remember not being able to move my head, my arms, legs. I could barely breathe. I remember desperately wanting to be able to run into my dad and mom's bedroom, but being unable to do so. I had the worst feeling of deep dread. Sometimes, even now when I'm trying to remember, I still get a sense of this numbing dread. I can feel my heart rate and respiration increase and my muscles even get rigid with stress. I have a brief picture of silhouetted heads bobbing around in my room. I don't know where that image comes from, and it may be completely unrelated. I then remember being outside my house when it was barely getting light outside by an oak tree near my room. It's hard to piece this all together. At any rate, she just goes on to say at one point uh, that... Uh, she knows the difference between fantasy and reality and so forth, but she has this incredible fear. 
she said she watched the TV special uh, featuring your friend who was abducted and had a an implant. And I must admit that I had a strong reaction to the program. I tremble and I had to keep my teeth from chattering. Gee. Now, when you hear something like this, you know that this woman is suffering from a very real trauma. These are the effects that one uh, runs into with post-traumatic stress disorder. And she's 35 years old and desperate to find out more about this event at the age of 11. She has other problems, too. These are the sorts of things that if any of our listeners uh, recognize these in their own lives, um, that I would suggest that they get in touch with us. I don't know if we talked about this before, Bud, but, uh, you know, that was so traumatic that it forces me to again ask, how many of these people that have had experiences, don't you wonder, didn't make it through it with their sanity? Uh, uh, you know, might be, end up in might be in mental institutions today. Well, I have a case where uh, I have uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, two cases, actually, where uh, after the fact, in one case, the uh, son of this particular person, uh, the son happens to be a psychiatrist. In the other case, it was the wife of the particular person uh, wrote to me, and uh, I've worked with them and so forth. Uh, but each one described uh, the death, the suicide, of uh, in the first case the father, in the other case the husband, uh, after a particularly terrifying, ev evidently a terrifying UFO experience. So there have been deaths. There have been people who have not made it. Uh, now this woman, uh, uh, who incidentally, I just happened to get her letter when I came back uh, from my Houston trip, and I did phone her because I'm going to be speaking at a conference in Gulf Breeze, Florida, next week, and she lives in Florida, so I'm going to try to work with her. So uh, you, you literally got this letter tonight? Yep. Okay. I read it maybe a half an hour ago. But the point is, uh, uh, she uh, it seems very sane. But, uh, she went into her background. Her It's a very, very intelligent, clearly written letter, as many of these letters are. These are not people who are in any sense strange. These are people who are suffering from a very real trauma, a series of traumas. How much help can you give these people? Well, uh, the first uh, thing that can be done, of course, once you get <clears throat> to know the, pe the, the individual and, and feel that he or she is, is stable and that there is a kind of safety net at home, that the person has uh, friends they can talk to or, or uh, relatives or a therapist or whatever, um, and so they're not totally alone, and you undertake the idea of hypnotic regression the, the, to look back into the experiences. There is a process that I think is a little bit like working a splinter out of the out of the flesh, uh, working the memories out, which might be very painful to uh, extricate. But once they're out, uh, once the splinter is out, uh, the, the flesh can heal. The person feels a lot better because, first of all, uh, the self-doubt disappears. That, that uh, gnawing thing, I must be crazy, there's something the matter with me, sure. how can I possibly uh, have had this happen? And, of course, the saddest thing about this is that as children, very often uh, the child will run to mother or dad or, and say that there's a little men in the room I, you know I couldn't move and so on and we'll be told you just had a bad dream go right back in there and go back to sleep of course so uh, once the child as now an adult is looking into this uh, and can ventilate a lot of the fear and a lot of the anger uh, which is virtually <laughs> inevitable uh, and can have that sense that there's nothing the matter with them they're perfectly normal it's just that uh, uh, they've acted uh, in a strange way because they've had these terrible fears. Uh, the fear that uh, this woman can't go by an open window and it's got to close the at night and has to get the blinds down uh, at the age of 35 with the whole family. That's I'm, really more like a phobia at this point. Isn't oh, it? well, the phobia is, that's one of the most fascinating things, Art, of the way uh, phobias can often be explained uh, away when, uh, and, and can actually be lessened when the person realizes as is often the case, the phobia is connected with the UFO experience. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, actress, Mayor Whittingham, call, who was in the film Intruders, uh, called me and had me talk to a, a man she knew um, who thought he might have had these experiences. He had a terrible phobia of sharks when we discussed that. And I said, well, <clears throat> I imagine, uh, trying to do a little leading, I said, I imagine you must, when you're afraid of sharks, you must think of that great big mouth with all those teeth. He said, no, no, I never think of that. I said, well, what do you think of when you think of sharks as being so scary? He said, it's their eyes and something about their skin. Well, their eyes, of course, sharks' eyes are just dead cold. Yeah, they? but but the point is, he realized the gray skin and the haunting eyes and the coldness 
uh, what he began thinking about it. Oh, I see. Associated with the alien. I understand. Was nothing to do with teeth. Never right. even thought about that. A good place to stop, Bud. We've uh, got a nine o'clock newscast, and we'll be right back with you. Okay. So stay right there. Bud Hopkins is my guest, and we will be opening the telephone lines. So stand by for that. You're listening to Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. Good evening and welcome back to Area 2000. Bud Hopkins is my guest this evening. I want to remind everybody a couple of uh, station keeping items here. The Bigelow Foundation is the one that makes all this possible. If you have questions, if you have a story, if you have somebody you would like to talk to about an experience in one of the areas that we discussed, please contact Angela Thompson, who is the research coordinator for the Bigelow Foundation during the business week um, between 9 and 5 at area code 702-456-1606. 702-456-1606. One six zero six Angela Thompson, and uh, let me also give you the telephone numbers if you would like to speak. A rare opportunity to speak to Bud Hopkins in the metropolitan area of Las Vegas. Our number is three eight three eight two five five three eight three eighty two fifty five. If you're calling from out of state, please note one of these numbers uh, toll free. It's one eight hundred three three eight Eight two five five one eight hundred three three eight eighty two fifty five. The wild card direct dial lines are area code seven zero two three eight five seven two one four seventy two fourteen. Let them ring until they're answered. And finally, if you have never called at all, no matter where you are, we have a special line for you. Area code seven zero two three eight five seven two one. Three. Repeating that number, area code 702-385-7213. Now back to Bud Hopkins. Bud, are you still there? Yes, I am. Good. Uh, we'll get phone calls here uh, in a moment. And how long are we going to go? Um, oh, we've got uh, about 53 minutes or so well, to go. I, I couldn't remember. I, I thought it was a one-hour show, but I couldn't remember. No, I, we're a two-hour show. Oh, great. And even that's not enough many times. Yeah, I know. Um... Anything else? Uh, you know what I wanted to ask you, Bud? Uh, what is your current area of fascination? In other words, uh, as you move through uh, investigating these abductions, mm -hmm. what is the most fruitful area, the best area, do you think, of research? But uh, what are you concentrating on right well, now? Uh, I'm going to be giving a workshop uh, on Saturday in Gulf Breeze on um, how parents can handle uh, the issue of uh, their children being abducted. So children. Yeah, that's a very important thing. And I have, of course, a projective test that I've developed. I have a wonderful videotape which was sent to me by a man who used the test on his daughter and videotaped the six-year-old. It's extremely moving. Hmm. Can you give a sense of, of how you would do that or what, kind, what, what do you mean by a test? Yeah. Uh, well, this is my projective test. The basic idea is if a child feels that, I mean, if parents feel a child has had or is having abduction experiences, and that would mean that the child is uh, terrified, doesn't want to sleep in his or her room, and talks about um, monsters in the room with huge eyes, as the child then described as maybe being taken outside, perhaps the parents find the child outside, physical marks, cuts, and uh, these scoop marks and so forth on the child's body, uh, all the sorts of things that would lead uh, virtually anybody who knows about this the patterns to uh, suspect the abduction. Uh, I developed this test, and uh, it's partly to uh, help the child uh, feel freer to talk about the experience. What the test is, and I present it in the framework of a game uh, of fun. I, if, when I do it, I play with the child first, and we fool around. And this is a child anywhere between two and a half and, let's say, ten. Uh, and then I say, now this is a game, and see if you know who or what these people are. And I have ten uh, cards with coloring book style drawings of heads on each one on each card, and they go this way: Santa Claus, a Batman, Batman uh, a clown, a policeman, a little girl, a Ninja Turtle, and an alien head. Then uh, a uh, a little boy, a witch, and a skeleton head. 
Oh. So uh, the first thing, of course, is to see what the child, how the child reacts when they get to the alien head. And uh, most amazing things happen. Uh, this little girl on the videotape, who at the age of six, as soon as she sees the head, just bursts into tears, hides her face in her father's uh, arms, uh, uh, said she's terrified that's the man from her dreams. She, she doesn't want to look at it. Uh, it's, this whole thing progresses. At one point, she, she asked her father, where did you get that? Meaning mm. the picture of the alien. Uh, she, uh, her father has a, a quite a, a bit of time trying to get her to talk about what her dreams are, but uh, with she calls them dreams, of course, with this figure. And she said they come in and they take her out and put her in their car and take her away. And he said, what kind of car is it? And she said, it doesn't have any wheels. Oh, boy. And she is in tears throughout this whole thing, totally terrified of looking at this thing. Um, I have had... Uh, Would you likely follow something like that up? In other words, uh, after seeing that on a videotape, for example, would you then call the parents? And... Uh, well, I, yeah, the, I I'm in, have been in touch with, with uh, the parents, uh, but, of course, this is a test that is mostly administered by uh, a therapist uh, that I have provided a copy of the test to, a number of people have them. I mean, there must be at least a hundred of these out now. Uh, it's extremely effective. Now, the second part of the test is I'll ask the child to divide them into two piles, the, the good guys and the bad guys. And so uh, once they do that, you can ask them, because the alien inevitably ends up in the bad pile, um, why, why do you like this one in the good pile? And then you turn to the alien pile and ask why you don't like that. And... Uh, uh, in this case, with a little girl, she couldn't even look at the picture. She kept turning it over and saying she just couldn't look at it, and, and, and she'd cry and so forth and so, so on. And the third part of the test is I'll ask the child to make up a story. I'll tell them I really love stories, and I bet you can make up a good story, a silly story, or a, a scary story, or a funny story. And I pick out the Ninja Turtle or whatever they liked, and we start with the story there, and then I take out the alien picture and uh, have them make up a story. And, of course, that, again, is a wonderful way to elicit uh, real events and uh, it gives you uh, a lot of insight into how to then go about helping the child cope with these experiences. Wow. All right, there is a full bank of lines that would like to speak with you, Bud, so why don't we do it? Okay. All right. On our first-time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Yes, I'm calling from Nye County. Nye County. All right. Turn your radio off, please, sir. The radio off, please? Off. Thank you. Uh, go right ahead. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm calling from Nye County, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm presently 35 years old, and uh, I walked out when I was 17 years old. You walked out of what? Uh, are you familiar with the uh, book Strangers Among Us? Oh, yeah, the walk-in things? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I became a, uh, a walk-in when I was 17 years old, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I unfortunately have a difficult time uh, trying to uh, assert myself. Uh, it seems to me that uh, our country, uh, I, uh, I know about MJ-12 and the activities going on. Uh, it, it seems that there's a problem with our government. That they don't seem to want to help us. And uh, I hope to see that, uh, that someday that that changes. <laughs> well, we certainly are working to... Uh hope that the government can change its policy about ridiculing uh, people who have had UFO experiences. Uh, the official government policy comes down in its practical implications to one very simple idea. Anyone who says they've had ex uh, abduction experiences or sightings for that matter uh, are either lying, uh, desperately mistaken, or uh, uh, somehow psychologically deluded. And this is, of course, a terrible thing. And I. I thank you for your comments, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but even if I, let's say I were a business person or somebody with a with pretty good uh, career underway and I had an abduction experience, frankly, but I don't know that I'd relate it to anybody. Well, I, uh, I advise people I work with, uh, abductees, not to go public. Uh, because there are there are hidden risks. Uh, as an example, one woman desperately wrote to me that uh, uh, she had gotten herself, in, after exploring her experiences, she had gotten herself involved in a, a divorce uh, and a messy divorce with her husband. Exactly. And he was trying to get custody of the children on the grounds that she was insane because she believed she had been abducted by a UFO. 
Did he win? Uh, I don't think he won. Uh, I, I had never met this person, uh, you know, at all. It was just a thing through letters. But you, one would never imagine, you know, in the middle of a relatively uh, going marriage that something like that could happen. And then you can see that the husband could use even something like this in such a vicious way against his wife. Of course. Uh, there are all kinds of problems, and I've only had maybe 12 people or so of all the people I've worked with, uh, maybe pro probably in the area of almost 500 people, I've probably had only about 12 willing to come forward and use their full names and describe their their uh, accounts. And I think that this is uh, the interesting thing and, and the, 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 in a way the terrible thing. Even though uh, those of us who have been looking into this uh, uh, for a long time, uh, Linda and George and, of course, many of the other guests you've had on the program, uh, we're, in essence, very much winning the war, uh, the war against uh, the, the skeptics who refuse to look at this, who refuse to think about it, who admit its possibility. We're winning the war, but in the meantime, the one battle that they have won is that they have managed to create such a climate of ridicule that witnesses are afraid to come forward and uh, state their names, give their names and their positions, and tell what happened to them. I wonder what that might mean in terms of how many have not come forward, but versus those that have. Oh, well, there's only a tiny, tiny percentage of those that come forward. That would be my tiny guess. Percentage. Wild Card Line 3, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, yes, sir. I want to ask Bud a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going back now more than 50 years when I was about seven years old, mm -hmm. and there was a phenomenon that happened then that was uh, followed by some strange things later on, but basically what it was, I was I, I remember I was alone in the living room. I was about six or seven, and it was there was a Christmas tree with, pre with presents around it, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a memory that, that's persisted all my life. A, a ball of light came in the window. Mm -hmm. Must have been about the size of a volleyball or basketball. Right. Came in the window, went around the living room. I washed it and went back out again. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I've asked myself, did this really happen? Mm -hmm. And there's there's nothing to say that it that it didn't. You know, yeah. it seems it seems to be a very very extremely vivid uh, recollection. You know. Well, now, the two situations here. You could have had uh, an experience which we tend to associate with uh, UFO uh, experiences, conceivably even abductions, but there's also the phenomenon known as ball lightning. Uh, do, do you know anything about what was the weather was doing at the time or whether this thing made any noise? You no, know, it, it, was, it, it was completely silent, uh -huh. uh, and it was, it was completely round uh -huh. and glowing. Uh, and... and uh, uh, I, I thought at first that it had come in a, it had entered in a broken part of the window. Uh huh. But when I when I looked later on, uh, the the window was solid. Uh huh. You know. What, it, what uh, caller? What was the weather at the time outside? Do you know? Uh, I I I don't recall, but it was it was not in a place where you'd expect that. It was in a. It, it was in a place called Holly Drive in a, in a canyon near Hollywood. Mm -hmm. and, and it was not a place where one would expect that kind of phenomenon to happen. Well, those, those are the only two alternatives I can think of, of for what you've just described. And if, it's, uh, if you associate with other experiences that uh, might relate to the, uh, uh, the abduction phenomenon, then I would suggest looking into them. Uh, well, the, uh, there, there, but, of there, course, if it's a sort of just an isolated event... Uh, uh, it, it, there, there was there was uh, two other distinct events. So I'll be extremely brief. One was one was as if time stopped. Mm -hmm. it, it was I was walking in the desert and it, and it was as if something had shifted. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to put it into words very well, but it it's as if something had shifted and, and something strange had happened. And it was it was it was like a, a frisson, like a chill all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And you look back and you say, what the heck was that? Mm -hmm. And and and. Uh, Another one was a, a extremely bright uh, flashing light, and this was only about oh five or six years ago, uh, where I had thought uh, I I was laying in bed and everything was extremely quiet. That's uh, it was like the other phenomenon, the uh, complete lack of sound. Yeah. And and an extremely bright bright flash that filled the room. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I remember waiting because I thought there was going to be an explosion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I it, it, it repeated itself in about ten minutes, and I, I walked out and back, and and uh, I didn't hear a sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything seemed normal, but uh, it, you know, I, I, I don't particularly connect it with anything. I, I, I feel that I shouldn't really try to. Uh, right. Interpret it in any way. And so, well, uh, all right, you said you walked out uh, the back? Or yeah, looked I out the back? I walked out and back. I, was you, I let you get and dressed. And, and, and the, the, the one thing that I remember distinctly was that, uh, and this is a, a, a recollection later on, that there was a complete lack of sound. I didn't yeah. hear anything. Well, no, uh, no animals, no birds, no planes, or anything. That's, that's uh, also something that's commonly reported. Well, I would say if all of this leaves you uh, pretty uneasy, then it's probably worth looking into. And by that, he probably means uh, finding somebody who can help you out with uh, being regressed. And well, I, I, I don't. I, I'm not really that uncomfortable with it. I, well, you know, then, I, I just, you yeah, know, it's not something that's ever particularly frightened me. All right, caller. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, that, but it seems to happen though, multiple times to people, not just once, but mul- multiple times. Begins in childhood. It's as if the person is a kind of a as it were, a tagged animal, and on it goes. Uh, and uh, the person is picked up many, many times um, in their childhood. Now, this is just a very interesting thing that, again, this is something I found out tonight in one of my cases, but I have several cases where, as small children, um, people remember having been abducted, and at the end of the abduction, having been given a small uh, object, almost like a reward, and in one case, with uh, one little boy, it was a kind of uh, uh, rather rare um, um, a geode-like uh, a mineral formation, very strange, uh, that there's actually something that is available and, and sold in stores and sell uh, minerals and crystals and so forth. Uh, this little boy uh, had a collection of three or four, and finally when his mother found them, uh, he told her that the little men gave them to him uh, if he was good. And uh, this is a little boy at the time, six years old. He had no access to a store where he could have bought these things. Uh, the mother gave them to me on the ground. She didn't even want them in the house with her. She was very upset by them. But I just picked up another case where a little girl, again, I mean, she's now an adult, but she remembered being given, th- every time something happened, three marbles, and they had strange inscriptions on them, little uh, raised characters, and she loved to hold these, and they were very frightening to her, but very somehow appealing at the same time. Um... Uh, there are so many sub-patterns within the abduction phenomenon, but uh, this would suggest, again, their uh, knowledge of how to control children by rewards and, you know, I suppose the carrot and the stick together. Okay, again, uh, speaking now for the person who might be out there and have had these experiences, and the phones are all lit up, so I assume many have, but, you know, vague feelings of unease or even a fairly serious uneasiness with events that have occurred in your life are you are you fairly sure that a person would be better off exploring them and finding out what they are, or could it be that when you found out it was something really kind of on the negative side, an abduction or multiple abduction experiences, it might be more of a negative? Well, um, you see, every case uh, involves a very distinct human being who has had some kind of experience. And as in any other of life's problems, uh, everyone is different in how they respond to to, uh, a, a, let's say, a buried trauma or whatever. Don't you and there are times when you don't, uh, it doesn't seem to be a good idea to pursue it, and there are times when you feel like, again, it's worth uh, working out the splinter. So. All right, as a researcher, do you make that judgment? As you hear the story, are there, are there times, Bud, where you think it better not to tell them? Yes. I, I, well, I try to make the decision with that person. In other words, we do this as a kind of a joint process. I understand. This is why uh, I try to do a, a very solid, long interview before I do any kind of uh, regressive hypnosis, uh, there are just too many things to consider. And we have a little um, kit which is mailed out. It's, a, it's an eight-page uh, brochure, really, about when to do this and when not to, um, to look into your experiences. And this is available, again, through the Intruders Foundation, through IF. And uh, how do they get hold of it? Is well, it... they can write to uh, just the letters IF, and it's... Uh, Box 30233. 30233. Right. New York, New York. And the zip is 111. 100, 
one one. Okay. And uh, we will send this out uh, free of charge to anybody who uh, feels that they've had this experience and wants some information about whether or not they should look into it. That's great. Uh, that's IF, which stands for the Trudor's Foundation. Box 30233, New York, New York, 10011. Right. All right, good. Uh, line one, good evening. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Yes, uh, the last time I spoke to uh, Mr. Hopkins on this program, he said it was preposterous to think that uh, people who claim to be abducted by aliens were actually victims of government mind control. Uh, but consider the fact that for years the government has had a technology that can use microwaves to uh, uh, place people in a hypnotic trance from a remote distance and then project any kind of image or thought into their minds. Uh, so someone could be zapped from a van uh, sitting on their street without uh, without uh, noticing anything unusual before that. And so I think that... Uh, Anyone who understands the UFO movement will realize that it's part of the New Age movement, which is working to create a, an occult world religion, which would be very useful to a world government in controlling the public by superstition and religion. So what do you think? Well, I suppose uh, uh, what you say is possible. I think it's, again, I would have to say I think it's preposterous, but I think it's possible. All right, again. All right, thank you. Uh, he's determined to think that it's uh, government uh, control. We have two very situations of UFOs connected with uh, abductions, so uh, with these experiences. All right. On the first uh, Wild Card Line 3, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins in Las Vegas. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this uh, subject is it all about just people who have been... Uh, I could or can it be about a, a one that had lead on the ground and the person went over to investigate after his left? Well, no, that's right. I'm interested in all kinds of things. Tell me your experience. Okay, out in the desert in 1959, we were on a motorcycle run. We was laying out a run, mm -hmm. and there was two of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ran out, of, his chain broke, and I was pulling him, and it got dark, real dark, no moon. And... Uh, uh, all, he was lighting uh, bushes of fire so we could run to one bush to the next, and I was riding him. We left his behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, a light came down out of the sky, and uh, and I saw him running, and I looked up, and I took off running. Mm -hmm. And this uh, this uh, round object lit on uh, landed on the ground, and we could hear it pinking around on the ground. We were hiding in an outcropping of rocks. Mm -hmm. And after... This object left, we mm -hmm. stayed behind the rocks until it grew light. Mm -hmm. And it was one cold night, and it was about 30 miles away from Ed for Edwards Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we went over there to investigate, and both our motorcycles were standing side by side mm -hmm. with a clutch lever to brake lever. So they had picked his up and put it next to mine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, did you see how they did that? If you were watching, no, it, we didn't. We were we were hiding and behind the outcrop in the rocks. No, you didn't, we you didn't uh, kind of peek out to see what they were doing. No, no, we were afraid to put our head up because we didn't know if they had some sort of yeah gun. We didn't know what they were doing. Well, let, me, let me ask you one question: have you, Did you ever have dreams about that after that? Uh, no, uh, in fact, I haven't. But we uh, we've been keeping in touch. But what happened? See, we called. He called. I was afraid. We told all our buddies the next day at yeah. the motorcycle meeting that we didn't want to put the run there. But we had taken this this thing left such it melted all the all the sand into glass. Uh -huh. This thing was so hot, and uh, in the daylight it cooled off, and we took a bunch of chunks of this stuff. Well, he got all involved, my buddy, and uh, he. Called the uh, Air Force uh -huh. and told them where it was. Well, the Air Force annexed this place, stripped it to the ground, and we uh, he tried and tried and tried. But I told him, just keep your mouth shut, boy, because you're not going to get nowhere. Did he save any of that uh, method? Uh, he, he, uh, I had a chunk, and he came to me about two months ago and asked for a chunk of it. I had a little chunk of it left with some things for us, but actually. Uh, it looks like pepper-fried wood melted into this place. Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Caller, caller, hold it, hold it. Uh, Bob, would you like to uh, solicit yeah. something here? I was thinking, yeah, if uh,
if he could leave his phone number off the you know off the air, he put him on hold. I'd uh, you could talk to him tomorrow. Uh, you willing to do that, caller? Information. Sure, I'm willing. You are. All right. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you both on hold, do a station identification, get the number, and we'll be right back. All right. Okay. All right. Both of you stand by, and we're going to do a uh, quick station identification here. Gons Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. All right, we got that done. Good evening, everybody. You're listening to Area 2000. My guest is Bud Hopkins, and we just uh, made a trans uh, transaction there, and we got the number, and Bud Hopkins now has it. Back now to Bud Hopkins. Bud, are you there? I am. All right. I'll be interested in uh, in the follow-up on that one. Anytime there is physical evidence, uh, it's pretty exciting. Makes a difference. Is that something that... If, what would you do if you got hold of that, if you managed to get hold of a piece of that? What would you do with it? Well, I have a uh, an abductee who happens to be <clears throat> a top-flight chemist who works in an extraordinarily well-equipped... Uh, uh, commercial laboratory, mm -hmm. and uh, I send I will send material to him and see what he has to say about it. Get it analyzed. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, line two. Good evening. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins in Las Vegas. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much for taking my call. Great program. Glad you're enjoying it. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just have a question for uh, Mr. Hopkins. Mm -hmm. um, when these people say that they have been uh, quote astral projecting unquote. Uh, have any uh, of these people been able to describe any, like, Martian uh, terrain or uh, Jovian atmosphere or anything that's remotely scientifically uh, able to uh, be uh, confirmed? Well, first of all, uh, I, I haven't used the term astral projection, and it's not a term that I uh, feel uh, is applicable to the UFO experience. This is the UFO experience, the abduction experience is... Uh, is quite physical. It, uh, the person is taken out of wherever they were. All right, so it's not an out-of-body experience. No, it's not. A, it's an out-of-the-house experience. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, but they're taking it. <clears throat> excuse me, into a craft, and the experience uh, generally, <clears throat> pardon me, takes place completely inside a kind of closed space. Uh, it, it, people describe it as being like a doctor's office or a lab or something, extremely clean and so forth. Now, in terms of uh, 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 there are some reports of people who feel that they have seen other worlds uh, in within this experience. We don't know whether that's actually true or whether, the, whether imagery is being shown to them. There are many cases where it would seem an abductee is, is shown some kind of situation, imagery, uh, some kind of disaster or whatnot, uh, which we think is uh, kind of an alien projective test to see if people... Uh, how people react emotionally, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, the astral projection issue, is is not really applicable here. All right, uh, let's keep moving. On the first time, uh, caller line, you would have been on the air. Good evening, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? Riverside County, Mr. Bell. Yes, go right ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Hopkins, if I could ask you a question about, mm -hmm. well, it's not exactly missing time. I have had experiences during the night when I've had too much water to drink, mm -hmm. and I have to go potty. Mm -hmm. I always check my watch just to see what time it is. Mm -hmm. For the heck of it. All right, sometimes it says 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay, I go back to bed. Mm -hmm. Next time I get up, look at my watch, like an hour or two later, mm -hmm. it's 1 o'clock. The second hand's still moving. There's nothing wrong with the watch. It is not missing time. What on earth is it? It has happened many, many times. <laughs> well, again, uh, from this distance, it's very hard to know exactly uh, what's going on. I'd, we'd have to sit and talk about other kinds of experiences and other things you might have noticed. Uh, does this ever happen to your watch during the day? No. Um, no, no, not during the day at all. I have uh, seen UFOs, and I've had witnesses with me when it mm -hmm. has occurred. Uh, I have those, uh, like, pop marks, one on my 
uh, in front of my cat, one on my ankle. When I was a child in Texas, we were visiting, and the doctor didn't know where it came from, and it just oozed and oozed until finally it took like six months to heal. Oh, that's unusual. And left these uh, embedded scars in mm -hmm. my uh, cat and on my one ankle that looks just like these scars you speak of, the scoop marks. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have these experiences at night, uh, is there any uh, sense that you have dreams connected with them? No, images? no. And I have never remembered anything like abduction. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have, like I said, I have seen UFOs, and I've sat there and watched them for mm -hmm. as long as five minutes on one, uh, about three minutes with uh, uh, the girl down at the market, mm -hmm. <laughs> the box girl. Uh, we've watched right across the street. Um, I really don't know what's happening. It's gone on throughout the years. Mm -hmm. uh, just odd things that have occurred since I was a child. But this one thing has got me puzzled because oh. you talk of missing time. Mm -hmm. This is like time doesn't go anywhere. Now, I, if, if I assume if you got out of bed and to go to the bathroom and it's, and it's 1 o'clock, that when you come back to the bathroom, you probably look at the clock again, right? Yes, correct. And a it's couple a, hours later. You know, I'm, I don't just get right out of bed again at 1 o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. It's usually like a couple hours later, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at my watch, and here it still says 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was just here at 1 o'clock. Do you have a digital clock in the house? In no, the this is my watch. Mm -hmm. Well, it might be interesting to put another clock in there and see if okay. the other clock is doing the same thing. It's a clock. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, hmm? Yeah, really, really a good idea. Uh, two clocks. Hmm? Is have, have you ever tried something like this before? Have you heard a similar story to that? Um, <clears throat> well, we, we, there are a lot of anomalies around clocks for some reason <laughs> uh, in these cases. Uh, I... Uh, recently uh, was aware that there was a an abduction in a uh, in someone's apartment and uh, the uh, clocks in the bedroom were flashing uh, as if they had you know been on electricity had failed right and yet there was no power outage in the uh, in the rest of the house and none of the other clocks were doing no no power outage anywhere around uh, in the neighborhood just this, just the bedroom from which the person was evidently taken. Uh, this sort of thing happens frequently. There's no way that one can imagine that uh, electricity could be interrupted on uh, just certain outlets in one room uh, when those outlets are connected to a circuit that uh, uh, con continues into another room with no interruption of service. Absolutely. But is there any indication that the time that people spend away from wherever the area from where, which they've been abducted. Mm -hmm. Is that is it linear time, or is is there some indication that uh, for an apparent large amount of time spent in the abduction, hardly any time has passed? Well, uh, there are a very few cases like that. We do hear of that occasionally, but it's generally <clears throat> uh, what we get is a very literal kind of situation. The person is gone for two hours, say, and, and generally has... Um, a range of memory that approaches uh, when we take normal memory and put it together with what uh, comes out under hypnosis, you generally begin to account, it would seem, for the time, for the full amount of time they were gone. Uh, but uh, we do have a few cases where someone, there was a very famous South American case, uh, I believe it, the case was Bibi Dura, but uh, um, um, uh, <coughs> what's the deal from his, um, uh, his detachment of, of infantry? Had encamped, and uh, he was gone for something like 20 minutes and came back and he had a five days growth of beard and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sense was that an enormous amount of time had gone by. Uh, we, there are, are very few stories of this nature, uh, which uh, are, of course, very interesting and very puzzling, but they're very far from the norm. Okay. Uh, a lot of people want to talk to you, Bud. Uh, good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Uh, good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Ready. Redding, California. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, I, I'm a first-time caller. I'm a second-time listener. Mm -hmm. I was in Ely, Nevada on April 17th of 87. Um, I was in a place that was, a, was working for Nevada Department of Forestry uh, out of the prison system. Um, uh -huh. <clears throat> I was out in the desert. It was a clear day. And to this day, I don't know how, if I'll cry when I tell you this, but there was something that was about 100 yards away from me in the desert, and it was making no noise at all, and it was flying at a slow rate of speed. It was a light tan color, 
with, like, tiger stripes going across it. It made no noise at all. It mm. stopped. It sat there. And then took off again. And I just shook. I didn't know what I'd seen to this day. My father's been listening to you for a long time. And he told me maybe I should call you and, and ask what it was that i seen. Because it's bothered me since. Yeah. And, uh, How, in what ways did it bother you? Just, um, you were, every you just were curious or you felt kind of upset by it? Well, yeah. Because... I, I never really gave UFOs a thought until I seen this. Uh-huh. Um, when I had told the camp and some of the guards there, they told me not to say anything. And um, later that the next day, there was these huge planes, like the ones that carry all the Army troops. Mm -hmm. They fly. They flew in formation three in a row, back and forth across the desert, and they were flying low enough and slow enough to where I was standing on a hilltop with some friends of mine and we could see into the cockpits and you could see all the way through and there was nobody in the cockpits flying these planes. <laughs> yeah. And it's well, really that's a, a very interesting uh, it, story. We do get situations like that. Did the planes make a tremendous roaring noise? After they left, yeah. yeah. They didn't when they were right above they made no noise. But after they got like a hundred yards away, then there was a, a loud rumbling noise. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I uh, seen made no noise and it was only it was only so far away. Mm -hmm. I probably could have ran to it, uh -huh. but we were only allowed to go only so far out of the boundary. Right. But t tell me one thing. It, it, have you dreamed about this afterwards? Oh, yes. And what happens in the dream? I just wake up, and I'm sweating everywhere, and I don't understand why. I know I had a problem when I was there afterwards. We, we lived, uh, like, 27 to a mobile home. And uh -huh. You're not allowed outside the mobile home uh -huh. any time at night. And I found myself out in the middle of the yard. Uh -huh. Well, and I woke up and I was there, and I got so scared because I knew I was not supposed to be out there. Yeah. And I well, I think that uh, I think this should be looked into. Um, and um, again, if you if, uh, if you have that address uh, that we gave, uh, write to me and tell me uh, where when you do. Um, what's the closest big city to where you are uh, in well, I'm California? Redding, California, and that's well. You, I, I'll get it on the uh, uh, on the atlas and then okay, see who we can refer you to. And I think you ought to look into it. I think it'd be very important and helpful to you. I've seen out there, but I was told again not to say anything. I wasn't even supposed to mention anything to anybody else. Mm -hmm. All right, Carlo, thank you, and uh, please contact Bud. You want to give that address one more time? It'll stay. okay. It's just to write to me at S yes, S yes, box three zero two three three. New York, New York, 10011. All right, uh, very good. Let's keep moving, but we're out there. These are busy phones. Line three, you're on the air with Ben Hopkins in Las Vegas. Yeah, our Texas Bob, San Jose, California. San Jose. How are you doing? Fine. Um, just a real quick comment. McDonald's paper, uh, McDaniel's paper referred to by Dreesen defines a very pragmatic methodology with which to prove or disprove Hoagland's Mars structures hypothesis. And it's kind of pertinent here. McDaniels also, in the same paper, compares NASA's ignorance to the Catholic Church's condemnation of Copernicus's astronomy and mathematics. And it kind of goes hand in hand with some of the things that the people, or Mr. Hopkins certainly is having experiences with that are being denied by the government. Now, I have two questions mm -hmm. for you, Mr. Hopkins, and then I'll take them off the air. Yeah. With reference to your paper, uh, Ethical Implications of UFO Abduction Phenomena, mm -hmm. Um, and Lear's public statements of alien farming human and animal body parts for sustenance. How do you see his story? And my second question is, why would someone of your stature bother to acknowledge someone as inconsequential as Philip Class? And I'll take my answers off the air. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I, I uh, appreciate the sentiment there. First of all, uh, John Lear is a man I've known a long time, and... and uh, I feel a, a genuine affection uh, to John, although I must say I do not feel that the evidence has ever uh, surfaced that would support the aliens uh, using us as food, so to speak. Uh, that that uh, Those issues, I think, just simply uh, have gotten blown up out of rumors or whatever. I've worked with so many abductees for so many years. It's now 18 years. I've never run into this event, this kind of thing, ever. Uh, so it, it's not an issue that I think I think uh, John's um, worries here are, let's say, vastly overblown. Um, 
the um, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that that paper that I'd written, uh, which was published in IUR years ago, called "What They're Doing to Us." But I still feel that that's a uh, an important paper, and I think it states my my feelings pretty much down to the present time. Although I wrote that thing uh, six or seven years ago, but uh, in terms of uh, answering uh, nameless uh, uh, people like uh, I think you mentioned a nameless person a minute ago, <laughs> uh, the reason I, I, I you know. My feeling is that is that uh, people like this particular individual should simply be frozen out of the dialogue, unless a man is going to be first of all truthful, and he's not truthful. Uh, he has, he has deliberately lied, uh, and also unless someone is going to be a gentleman and treat people as human beings uh, with uh, uh, rights and so forth. And if one's going to try to be a journalist, uh, which he doesn't try to do. Uh, for instance, he wrote an entire book attacking about seven or eight people, me very centrally, without interviewing any of us, uh, because obviously it's a terrible thing to get facts in the way of your opinions. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, if 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 you're if, if that's the kind of person you are, from the point of view of serious uh, serious investigators in this, um, I think you're absolutely right. We shouldn't pay any attention to them. And I want to make one very simple point here. Uh, what you were saying about uh, uh, the an analogy with, of course, the Copernican Revolution. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, I feel I'm the open person when it comes to belief systems, and it is the skeptic uh, in the traditional scientific sense of, of at least of the UFOs, people like Carl Sagan, uh, who have the very narrow, rigid belief system. Because when somebody tells me, uh, an event that, uh, such as the one we've just heard from the, the man's report about the desert and so forth, I have three options, uh, that the man is a liar, that the man uh, uh, just totally made it up. The second one is that he's deluded and somehow didn't happen, but he thinks it did. Or the third is he's telling me the truth, it really happened. Uh, I have three options, uh, and I lean very strongly to the third in the case of what he was saying because of the genuine emotion I was picking up in his voice. But uh, the true believers, uh, these uh, people with very radical, narrow beliefs, such as the professional scientists of the, um, like Carl Sagan, who I must say is a very nice man personally, but has this narrow range, he's only limited to the first two options. He can't, he doesn't have the breadth to accept the possibility of the third. And uh, therefore, his belief system is a narrower belief system, obviously. All right. Than yours or mine. Sure. Uh, Wild Card Line 3, good evening. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins, who's in New York. Where are you? Oh, hi, Art. This is uh, Dave. Um, I'm located in Mohawk Valley uh, between Quincy and Portola. Okay. And uh, in reference to the last caller where he said uh, something about uh, these humans are being used for human food, and uh, in reference to that, I did uh, catch the interview many times with the... Uh, John Lear, and uh, he did not ever mention about them being used for human few. Uh, what you did reference to is, uh, like, enzymes and stuff like that, so I did kind of take reference to that. I think the uh, the previous caller had its information wrong. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Oh. Line one, good evening. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins in Las Vegas. How you doing, Art? Fine. Um, I've read a, I have a piece of information I read. I don't know if you're familiar with this by Milton William Cooper on the MJ-12. And I was going to ask a question. Um, it tells about, um, this was a, uh, a man of um, our, uh, sorry, Art. All right, well, he left the line, whoever he was. Good evening. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins in Las Vegas. Hey, right, sir. Hello? Yeah. Yep. Yes, hello. Okay, well, you know, listening on the, all, the, all the waiting for the phone, I got disrupted here. Uh how, how are you, Bud Hawkins? Fine. Yeah. How, okay, now, I, I, I've, I've kind of been with you for the last 18 years or so, but you kind of feel like the aliens are some type of evil type of force, but have have you been much, uh, just like Earth, there's good and there's bad. There's been a war on in heaven for quite some time. Have you been aware? Well, I just want to say, I, I'm not uh, getting into disputes as to whether aliens are, uh, you know, gods or devils, which is, a kind of theological framework people try to stuff them into. They're neither one, and... Uh, sure, they're one or the other, yes. Oh, no, they, they are, are yeah. 
Well, we have a different theological well, point of view, and I think it's probably going to be fruitless to continue this. Okay, no, no, I will we'll just have to agree to disagree, I'm afraid. Oh, sure, okay, surely, but you've been doing good work and and, and trying to find out what, what exactly what's going on, because it's uh, it's been like a cosmic water gate against our United Friends of Space, surely, that the Earth is being healed by their uh, presence. Is the Hubby Telescope. The white star that's coming from the, the Mars, the Mars mission. Now this is getting down to Earth, right? You can see that Richard Hogan is Rick. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm there, yeah. Well, the United Nations, are you aware of the 1992, February 27th, at the United Nations, the Richard Hogan's presentation that he done at the Hartford Library? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You are aware of that? Yeah. Okay, now, now you're aware of that, and you still are, 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 well, why cannot everybody on on a, that wants to know the truth? I mean, this Mars mission, it was the most important event, and once again, the 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 government in control of the planet, whether they're Russians or Americans or Chinese or whatnot, silly mortals, right? You all right, all right, Colin. That? Thank you. Uh, we're going to hold it there. But I want to ask you about. Uh, how you deal with people who um, bring up the religious connection? How you deal uh, with the whole subject of religion as it mixes in with this? It's, uh, of course, uh, a, a very difficult situation. And I found myself once uh, uh, dealing with a, uh, a young girl, uh, 13, who was uh, had been abducted the night before along with her mother and her sister. They had identical experiences. They remembered the whole thing uh, in great detail the next morning. And the 13-year-old was a born-again Christian who wanted to be a missionary and so forth and was in tears uh, and absolutely terrified by what had happened and uh, felt that her religion had been challenged. Right. And she prayed to God to save her when she was on the table. These experiments were being done and uh, to her. And um, I, I found myself in a position of trying to defend her faith by saying that, of course, at the time of Copernicus, uh, the word, the belief was that if if this was to be understood that the earth was not the center of the universe, then that meant all of religion was over with. And I said, of course, uh, that belief has been accepted, that we're not the center of the universe, and religion is thriving. And I also pointed out that there must have been other times in her life when she prayed uh, and her prayers were not answered, and that if that has ever happened to her, then she would have to realize that maybe this is um, there's some theological reasons for all this that's happened, and that perhaps... Uh, her theolo uh, the theologians and her religion will make sense sometime, somehow of the presence of another life form, which is different from ours. Uh, I think that uh, the, the religious people of the world uh, are just going to have to face this and try to reconcile this new information with their religious beliefs. Hmm. Okay. Um, good evening. You're on the air with uh, Bud Hopkins in Las Vegas. Bud's in New York. Where are you, please? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. Go ahead, sir. Uh, do you ever share information from abductees with government officials? Do I? Yeah. Uh, well, let's put it this way, not knowingly, uh, in the sense that I don't have any uh, uh, government officials knocking on my door asking for information, but I would say that what I'm doing this very moment as you and I are speaking is sharing information I should certainly hope with government agents because I hope there's somebody listening in to get a little bit of enlightenment on this subject uh, who works for the government. I was giving uh, a talk uh, just recently in in, um, in Connecticut, and a woman came over and said, "There are several uh, government agents in the audience." And I said, "Good. I wish there were uh, 50 of them in the audience. They need to hear what I have to say." So, so why, uh, why do they need to hear what you say when they should have most of the information? Uh, well, because obviously not everybody in the government, probably only a very very tiny few in the government. Uh, it, it, which is my guess on this, uh, because need to know is the way these things operate, uh, really know what's going on, and the rest are quite confused. And uh, people in the government who don't know about uh, the reality of this uh, could be of use in helping the government, uh, help push the government towards a greater attitude of openness. So you're saying it's like all top secret information that doesn't, get, uh, doesn't go down to lower levels? Oh, well, yeah. listen... You can have a CIA operative, I'm sure. From, I've read enough about how this works. You can have a CIA operative who knows everything that's going on in Cuba and not a darn thing that's going on in Poland because no one is going to tell him because he doesn't have a need to know what's going on in Poland. He's just as ignorant 
everything is in little compartments. Right, absolutely. That's the way the intelligence community works. And I'm certain that uh, with the UFO material, it has been very highly restricted to just very, very narrow ranges. Otherwise, we'd have more people coming forward. Okay. Uh, thank you for your raising the point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, caller. Um, and I guess that is true, isn't it? Uh, and so, do you get a lot of interest? Uh, have you ever had government people walk up to you, Bud, and and ask you questions about this? Well, as I say, not in any uh, formal, official way. Lord knows. Uh, you know, I suppose uh, the government probably some branch thereof knows quite a lot about what I do. <laughs> uh, um, that I'm not aware of. But uh, I have had uh, a NASA scientist come to me uh, as an abductee uh, on a personal, private level, asking to have the experience, the personal experiences looked into uh, through regressive hypnosis. I had a full colonel in the Army who has a, quite an important job and extremely high clearance as an abductee. I worked with him, and on it goes. So uh, uh, there, there's absolutely no reason to think with the phenomenon as widespread as it, uh, as it is that... Uh, there aren't people in the Senate and, uh, Lord knows, perhaps the Cabinet, the Supreme Court, other people who are also abductees. Will you ever make uh, public this person you talked about earlier, a, a political-type person, will that ever become public? Well, my, my uh, profound hope is that he comes forward himself. Are you urging him to do that? Yes, I am. You are. And uh, he, he uh, is very aware of, uh, of the... Uh, Implications. The implications of the situation, absolutely, yes. Sure. Uh, line two, thanks for waiting so long. Uh, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hi, Art. Hi. Hi there. Hi, Bud. I talked to you one, one time, Bud, when you were here at the library, mm -hmm. and I didn't get the chance to finish my story because the lady came up about her child, which seemed very significant, and I backed off. But did you ever hear about the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation up in Busby, the whole tribe seeing the flying saucers? Well, I, I, it's possible I've heard about it, and, and it doesn't register right now. I hear about so many things, so many cases. I mean, yes. I know there have been uh, uh, many such reports in, in other areas, but uh, do you have something to, to yes. tell us about that particular About case? 1970. It's going to have to be yes. fast, ma'am. Pardon me? I'm sorry, it's going to have to be fast. We're running out of time. Uh, two years later, I went up and was doing business in Bursi, and the Indians all called me about, uh, that, you know, they went out on their cars to sit and watch the parachute drop mm -hmm. over that area, and they had great big B-29s and everything running out there with the Ma'am, we're never going to finish this story if you don't hurry. They saw three uh, three flying saucers over every one of the airplanes. The whole tribe of uh, tribe saw them. Mm -hmm. It was about 1970. Oh. All right. Thank you very oh, much for relating that. Thank much. Sorry we didn't have more time, but we don't have more time. Yep. Um, it has been, again, wonderful, and I'm sure we'll connect again, but um, I will uh, try and get your address out one more time here. It's if I F box. 30233 three, New York, New York, 10011. And, uh, Bud, anything in particular that you want to hear about? Well, again, if, if people feel that they may have had this sort of experience, uh, abduction experiences, and it's causing them a little anxiety and trouble, uh, they would like to uh, get some information about whether or not they should explore it and how to go about it, uh, those are the people I'd like to hear All about. right, it's been, a, as always, Bud, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Take care. That's it for Area 2000 this week. Good morning. Good evening. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000.
This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Area 2000. Good evening. I'm Art Bell. It's going to be kind of a fun night tonight. We're going to have our uh, usual report from Angela Thompson, and we're going to reverse order this evening because our guest for the entire evening is going to be George Knapp. And I've very much been looking forward to this. Uh, he, of course, uh, provides us with a regular report at the beginning of most of the Area 2000 shows. He's been investigating the UFO phenomenon now for years and actually is considered to be one of the... Uh, uh, in, in fact, I guess he is considered to be the leading journalist who's been looking into the UFO phenomenon. So, I wish you, I bid you all a good evening on behalf of the Bigelow Foundation. And let's go all the way to Philadelphia for a glimpse at yet another reality. Here from Philadelphia is Linda Howe. Good evening, Linda. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, tonight I thought what I'd do... Uh would be to give you an update on animal mutilations before you uh, go into the whole uh, interview with George, it could be fun. Um, I have a very interesting mutilation update from a place called Vendor, Arkansas, which is about 50 miles southeast of Eureka Springs. On Wednesday, September 1, about a month and a half ago, cattle farmer Mark Ewing checked all his cows, and they were well, including one of his three-year-old pregnant cows. The next day, on September 2, Ewing and as usual, to feed the herd, and the cows ran away from him as if spooked by something that he could not see. And that night, there was a huge thunderstorm, and Mr. Ewing's daughter, Kathy Royce, who lived about 400 yards from her father's farmhouse, said that she heard a very strange sound, like the roar of an ocean in that storm. Then, on Saturday morning, September 4th, Mr. Ewing found 20 feet of his electrical wire missing from the fence that he kept around his cattle in the cattle pasture. While trying to find the missing wire, he could see that his pregnant two-year-old cow was lying in an odd manner with her right leg folded under her and her left leg sticking straight out, he said, as if something dropped her straight down in her tracks. Mr. Ewing had six dogs with him, that ran ahead to the cow before he got there, and they began sniffing her body. Suddenly, all six dogs began barking and yelping as if frightened by something Mr. Ewing could not see. All six dogs ran from the cow back to the house 200 yards away and remained agitated for the next three days. And I thought of the chariots in southern England when I was there in August that I reported earlier in Area 2000 where he had two uh, steer mutilations and uh, a couple of days uh, in and around those mutilations, his cows went into a panic and stampeded against him and scared the English farmer. Mr. Ewing said that before he could get to the cow with the, do the dogs running past him, that he felt suddenly like he should not go to where the animal lay, and he turned around and he went back home without investigating the child and said he didn't really understand his own actions. And it took him about three and a half hours to decide that he had to go and look at the cow. So about 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the evening on Saturday, September 4th, he did go and he was shocked at what he found. The first thing that he noticed was that the unborn calf, a portion of its face, was protruding an inch or so from out of the vagina and but he could see that the cow and the calf were both dead. Uh, there was a very similar case in Alabama earlier this year in January where the uh, Fife Police Department and others investigated a cow that was dead and mutilated. The udder had been removed, and the calf was also part partially out of the vaginal opening and also dead and mutilated. Mm. Well, 
Mr. Ewing, when he further checked to see the typical, the jaw had been stripped on the left side, um, and the, there was a hole, a strange small hole underneath the vaginal opening. And he called the uh, sheriff's office, and the deputy came out and made his report. And when the deputy got there the next morning on Sunday, the deputy wrote in his report that he was looking at cuts with sharp instruments on an animal in which the hole underneath the vaginal opening had, was a square. And Mr. Ewing was surprised that it had changed shape from the night before because it had been round and smaller, and when the deputy came, it was square and larger. And they discovered that the calf was now completely removed, and yet they could find no evidence of the embryo sac, uh, the umbilical cord, the calf, there was no uh, fluid, there was nothing, and the uh, pregnant cow was now, her stomach was flat abnormally so. The deputy officially listed this as cut with a sharp instrument, cuts that were smooth, and the deputy noted that there was an absence of blood in these excisions. Now, they did check for bullets or stab wounds. They did not find any, and while they were looking, they discovered that the tongue was removed in the throat, but that the eyes and the ears were completely in place. There were no signs of struggle around the cow, even though the ground was damp from the rain. There, it was as if the animal had simply dropped in her tracks. One interesting thing that happened after they had found this animal was that Mr. Ewing's uh, son-in-law, Mr. Royce, who lives nearby, a few nights later had, was uh, coming home and saw an, a huge, unidentified, he said, ball of light that was lighting up the entire side of a mountain near their home. Uh, from it, he could see two beams of light coming from the huge ball of light as if they were searchlight searching the ground from approximately treetop level. Uh, the son-in-law said that the light, uh, he saw it around 1 a.m. on September 19th, and that he watched it for at least 10 to 15 minutes, but no one else in his family was there to see this large light with these beams coming out of it. Uh, investigators in that Arkansas area have now checked with other neighbors to see if anyone has had any other mutilation reports or heard or saw anything unusual that first week or two in September. And so far, no one has outside of the uh, son-in-law and then Mr. Ewing's uh, mutilation case. But subsequent to this, there has been now a report, apparently, of a dog mutilation in that area, and the investigators are trying to see if they can get some photographs. And uh, I bring this up uh, for any of the listeners in your own local areas who may have heard about any unusual happenings with animals. I would appreciate uh, being notified either through our cell in Area 2000 or directly to my address, because... This is the kind of phenomenon that you don't hear about in national news. In this case, this very unusual story that has so many facets to it would not have reached me or anyone if one reporter in a very small newspaper did a, a two or three lines about the fact that Mr. Ewing had lost this cow. And then uh, when the case was investigated, it turns out that it has all of these highly strange facets to it. So this is the only way we can keep up with this strange phenomenon. Aren't Linda, um, you know, if you push aside the UFO connection for just a moment with all of these mutilations and you simply try to consider what terrestrial phenomenon or motive or persons might be doing this, uh, what, what are you able to produce in, in terms of ideas about what might be doing this if it's not UFO related? Well, this goes back to the documentary I did 14 years ago, A Strange Harvest, in which I uh, uh, talked with law enforcement about all sorts of things, ranging from the satanic cult hypothesis uh, to the possibility of the government carrying on some kind of an environmental uh, contamination experiment. Exactly. Do any of those stand up? No, they have never stood up. Uh, when you get down to 
the fact that in the pathology examinations of tissues on now over 30 animals that we've been able to look at under a microscope and you find that the hemoglobin has been cooked at the excision site, you know automatically you're separating out the cases from disease and from predator. And when it comes to the issue of satanic cults, why would a satanic cult, and even how would they have the resources to carry on a global, this is a worldwide phenomenon, for uh, 30 years at least, going back to the 60s, um, being able to get in and out of sandy uh, sandbars and snow and wet ground without leaving a track and leave these animals in the strange, bizarre fashion that I've just described that happened in Arkansas in September and do so with some kind of equipment that could excise tissue with high heat. The uh, smallest portable lasers that it worth go about 500 pounds and these are the team of people that set up and they demand uh, large electrical generators on the size of the table and the world. All right, that point's well made. Suppose you go the other way then, Linda. In what percentage of the animal mutilation cases is there a connection to some uh, unidentified uh, object? So right from the very beginning of that horse in southern Colorado that made the newspapers globally as uh, Snippy the horse, when in fact it was a female horse named Lady, um, the reporter got the name wrong and the sex wrong at the time, but uh, there had been so many sightings of strange lights, round discs, small, stubby wings, things that people said looked like little tiny airplanes zooming around in the San Luis Valley of Southern Colorado, but they didn't know what they were, that when this horse was found, stripped of flesh from the neck up, and no tracks around it in the dusty uh, Southern Colorado ground in September of 67, and that the closest tracks to the horse's body were about 100 yards away where the horse itself, it could, you could see that the hooves had gone prancing around in some kind of a frantic circle. And there was uh, evidence of heat on one of the bushes near this horse's body. Everything was highly strange, never explained, and the headlines themselves said, quote unquote, did a UFO zap this horse in Colorado? So right from the beginning, there was an association with odd things in the sky and these uh, strange uh, animal deaths. And throughout the decades, there has always been some kind of a connection to orange lights or bizarre lights or uh, what a lot of people have said look like the searchlights from helicopters coming down in pastures where they later found mutilated animals. Hmm. All right. Fascinating. Fascinating. So there is a better connection to the UFO phenomenon than there is to the possibility of some terrestrial something or another. So when I began uh, as a, a TV reporter uh, working on this story 14 years ago and doing a documentary about it, I uh, first my I was not thinking in terms of the UFO phenomenon or anything that was non-terrestrial at the time, I began with the idea that I was getting into some kind of an environmental contamination story. So that, in other words, it is not something that you tried from the beginning to connect, but no, rather, rather a connection that you found. No, I had no association with any of this high strangeness material at all in my life. I was uh, focused entirely in science and medicine and environmental issues, which I thought this was one issue. But it was the interviews with the sheriffs and the deputies and the fellow journalists and the few veterinarians who would talk with me off the record who told me off the record all of their encounters with these bizarre, strange lights. Um, that so, so then, Linda, this is actually how you came to this topic in the first place. That's right, which, as okay. an environmental story. I see. That lends a lot of credibility to it. Well, that's well, some story, Linda, and... Uh, and when we talk on, uh, again, I think on November 7th, I can go into that in more depth for you, but um, I was um, a journalist working in science, medicine, the environment long before I did A Strange Harvest. And A Strange Harvest uh, was a documentary that I did 14 years ago, and since then I have done many other uh, documentaries and done many other investigations on issues that are related to all kinds of other subjects. But I think that these phenomena of animal mutilations and human abductions, the crop circle phenomenon, uh, all of this that I'm calling glimpses of other realities 
are something that we should be paying a great deal more attention to because the implications for our planet could be something uh, in the future that we have underestimated. Well, I'm sure glad we've got you out there looking into this. Well, I'm trying. All right, Linda, thank you. Keep up the good work. Yep, and uh, talk to you next Sunday. Take care. Yeah. Uh, that's Linda Howe and her glimpse into another reality. And isn't that something? I never realized uh, that Linda came to her present uh, field of interest and its relationship to UFOs through other scientific research. And as I said that, I think that lends more credibility to what she's doing. All right, onward. George Knapp is an award-winning investigative reporter whose previous documentaries on the UFO topic are considered to be among the best ever produced. His UFO investigations have been honored by UPI, that's United Press International, Associated Press, and the Fund for UFO Research. In 1989, Knapp first broadcast allegations by controversial physicist Bob Lazar concerning secret programs in the Nevada desert. Those allegations attracted worldwide attention. Knapp earned a master's degree in communications from the University of the Pacific, where he also taught public speaking and coached the debate team. He's taught communications and journalism at other colleges, including the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Cal Poly, Loyola University, and UNLV. Currently, George is senior vice president at Altamira Communications in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, where... Um, he is producing a multi-part comprehensive UFO documentary series, including research obtained from his March 1993 fact-finding trip to Russia. You all know him. He does a report here weekly, and it's high time that we had him as a guest. And yes, you will be able to ask George questions uh, uh, very shortly. So uh, let us go, and strangely enough, I had to come from Pahrump, Nevada, to Las Vegas to do the program. George has gone from Las Vegas to where he's spending, uh, I guess, the night in Pahrump, Nevada. <laughs> so to Pahrump, Nevada, and George Knapp. Hi, George. Hey, Art. How you doing? Fine. It is kind of a cross we've made here. It's kind of weird, yeah, but it's a real nice out here. Oh, it's beautiful in Pahrump. And as a matter of fact, keep your eyes open out there. Oh, I know. I, I've heard some very prominent uh, uh, broadcast personalities have seen some interesting things out here. It's so it has been reported. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, where to start with you, George? I think since we've got you for a greater period of time, let's find out a little bit about your history. I know that you were a very traditional, and I guess still are, a uh, journalist. You worked for uh, Las Vegas Television. Give us a little idea of where your career has been. Well, uh, it's, it's jumped all over the map before I got into journalism. As you mentioned, I did some teaching and debate coaching and things of that nature. Ended up in Las Vegas almost in a whim and, and weaseled my way into television and into news. Uh, traditional, that would be a good way to describe my, my approach to news. I mean, I did all the stories that, that investigative reporters do, worked a lot on organized crime stuff, a lot of uh, political corruption and political coverage, the legislature, uh, all of those sorts of things. So I was very much grounded in the, the basics of journalism and had never really given any thought to UFOs until 1977. Um, I, George, I had always thought of you as the heir apparent here in Las Vegas to reporting on mob activities. Oh, well, sure, because my, uh, my mentor, in essence, was a guy named Ned Day. Sure. Who, uh, you know, he, he taught me uh, a lot of what I know and taught me the, the basics about the, the ethics of journalism and and I learned a lot from him, and it was coincidental is that uh, because Ned was not interested in UFOs is why I did get interested. In 1980, no, yeah, 87, a guy named John Lear came walking into the TV station, and uh, John had been an important source of Ned's on a story about stealth technology. Ned, who, uh, Ned broke that story uh, before any other reporter in the country had it, and I think John was uh, uh, partially responsible for the information that, that led to the story. Well, John came into the station with uh, the MJ-12 documents and a pile of other UFO-related material and was trying to sell Ned on getting interested in it. Uh, Ned was having no parts of it. I, of course, was eavesdropping, as always, and uh, as John was heading out the door... Said, just one moment. <laughs> yeah, I suppose... Uh... I, I suppose that's how it happened. So you stopped him and said, wait a minute, I want to look at that stuff. Exactly. Sure, let me take a look at this stuff. And I, I think, you know, I have the same kind of uh, attitude that most people have about UFOs in those days. I mean, it's interesting, but uh, show me something. Uh, the MJ-12 documents were intriguing at that point. I didn't know if they were real or not. The other material that John opened up to me 
was even more interesting. And I'll, I'll have to say this at this point, that uh, John and I part ways on a, a great number of issues and, uh, and controversies in the UFO area. He believes a lot of stuff that I don't necessarily think is supportable, but uh, um, he was definitely instrumental in getting me going into the field and opened up his files, and, and for that reason, I guess I'll owe him a debt of gratitude. Anyway, it didn't take very long, uh, it didn't take long at all uh, to realize after reviewing some of the material that was available, some of the books, some of the documents, some of the really credible people who were out there working on it, that there really is a body of information uh, concerning UFOs and the alien presence, of alien for one lack of a better term, to indicate that it's real. And uh, I just couldn't believe after seeing some of the material that other mainstream journalists had not taken a fair and serious look at the topic. I have a very good copy at home of UFOs, the best evidence, and I it certainly is, uh, without a doubt, I think, the best thing ever produced uh, in the area, and so I guess your interest then, while you were still there in television, local television, culminated in that, didn't it? Sure did. It started with uh, having John come on this little public affairs program I did called On the Record. Uh, it's a show that, you know, you have a, a politician one week and somebody trying to sell a book the next week, and sure. basically no one watches it. You know, it's a very, it's a small dedicated audience. Well, John came on, and all of a sudden, my phone started lighting up. I had him on again, and, and uh, the, the public response was incredible. People were obviously hungry for this sort of information, and uh, it, it occurred to me that, that this seems to touch something with the public pulse, and the more I did on it, the more response I got from the public, mm -hmm. which also made it curious to me why mainstream, other mainstream journalists would not take a fair look at it, because after all, ratings uh, are part of the business. Oh, there's no question about it. But but you're also right. It really touches something in the public, and this is something I've observed uh, doing shows on it over the years, George. It, there is a, there is more interest in this than I think the average person can imagine. Uh, surely the anchors who laugh it off as the final story generally in a newscast if there's something to be said, I don't think they understand how much real interest, significant interest, mainstream interest there is out there. Oh, well, they wouldn't unless they did something serious on it because, uh, you know, I travel around all over the world and, and there is an innate sense among regular people everywhere that this is real. Now, they don't fully understand what it is, but they know something's going on. Something's going on with the planet. There's some kind of other intelligence that's interacting with us. It's almost a subconscious kind of an understanding. And uh, people in the in the in the, eye, the public eye, the, the news anchors who scoff, uh, they're going to have to get the message sooner or later because it's real, it's out there, and, and regular people all over the world know it. How much dam yeah. How much damage, George, uh, was there to your mainstream journalistic career, in your opinion, when you began doing this? Certainly, prior to just prior to, and definitely after Best Evidence. Uh, your name became connected with the UFO phenomenon, and uh, and how did that affect uh, your your career? Well, I guess uh, there was quite a bit of damage uh, in one sense. It, it damaged me with my colleagues, who uh, and I've talked to Linda Howe about this before as well. Uh, you know, you can do all the stories in the world about organized crime and corruption and things like that, and win this award and get this person fired and, and do whatever. But when you when you tackle something like this, suddenly you're not the same person anymore, and it's hard to figure out why. Uh, with my colleagues, uh, I, I think uh, uh, there was a lot of damage. But uh, with the people that counted, the viewing audience, the general public, uh, it was it was a big plus. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, snide comments made in the newspapers here in Las Vegas. Those are still going on. If I know. I can do a couple of editorial cartoons. They're very funny, and that's much part of the territory. And I don't mind it. Uh, some of the shots have been really nasty. Uh, the the RJ has been able to the grand and bola of tonight's technology in one small thing. So I've done a series of plays about the alien abduction. I'm uh, very careful to say, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to get true, but it's true to be true. You're listening to Area 2000. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. 
Good evening from Las Vegas. We will, in a bit, have the lines open. You'll be able to ask George Knapp a question. He's uh, a man who has, uh, in a way, sacrificed a mainstream career to begin looking into something that all of you, I know, find fascinating, the world of UFOs. And uh, toward that end, George, are you still there? Certainly. Good. Um, with all of the investigation you've done from then when you began until now, um, are you, and I ask everybody this, are you convinced, absolutely convinced, that we are being visited? Yes. I, I would have to say yes. I don't, uh, I don't understand the, the cosmic implications of it. Uh, I think Linda has a much better grasp on that. There are certainly people who have a, have, are much deeper thinkers than I am in terms of what these beings are, where they're from, or why they could be here, but there, there definitely is an interaction, there's an intelligence. I don't understand the big picture. Uh, as a reporter, I'm more interested in the government's response to the phenomenon than the phenomenon itself, uh, but it, in my mind, is definitely real. In your mind, George, is it benign or malevolent? I would have to say benign, perhaps even... Uh, the, the technology demonstrated is, is too powerful. If, if, they, if it was going to be benevolent, uh, they could certainly help us. If they were going to be malevolent, they could certainly hurt us. And it, it doesn't appear that they've been willing to do either. Uh, they seem to be, whatever it is, they seem to be more interested in helping themselves to something that we have that they need. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the best nutshell I can put it in. All right. Let's back up a little bit. Really, you're the fellow who broke the whole Lazar business. Bob Lazar has been a hot topic and still is. His story, um, you've had a lot of time to digest it, plenty of time to talk to Bob Lazar and look into his story. What have you concluded? Well, I think Bob is telling the truth. Now, whether that is absolute truth, that the, everything that he said he saw is real and true and out there, I don't know. I mean, even Bob will, will admit that, uh, that there were some games played with his mind by these people that that the folks who are running this program are, are experts in disinformation, that they may have ulterior motives in dealing with it. But I know that the story that Bob told me the first time I met him is the same story he's telling today. A lot of it checks out. Now, there are gaps. There's no question about it, things which cannot be documented. There are things in his story which do not make sense. But there are there is too much information, too much circumstantial, too much corroborative information about what he has said that checks out to simply dismiss it. I, I guess the, the fun thing, the cool thing to say in UFO circles these days is that it's all some sort of a disinformation plot, and a lot of people believe that Bob is part of that plot. I can tell you flat out, categorically, that that is not the case. Uh, Bob may have been used to some extent, uh, but uh, I, I believe that he is telling the truth about what he saw out there. Um, that's, that's basically the bottom line. Uh, how are the publications, the various UFO publications, treating the Lazar story? Poorly. Uh, in general, it's uh, like I said, it, it, it got cool to say it's all disinformation. There was one very prominent uh, UFO publication that sent, sent some uh, people out to the Rachel get-together a couple of months ago, and the article generally focused on Bob, the fact that he drove up in a Corvette and that he was wearing a white turtleneck and he had his latest female flame on his arm and he, and he uh, had a Hollywood hairdo. Those sorts of things. Of course, the mainstream press has been even nastier. They, you know, it's amazing to me. After we did our stories, the, the series in, in 1989, uh, everyone took pot shots at it, but but none of the other media here in Nevada were willing to send a reporter 80 miles up the road to check this stuff out. Now, this is a heck of a big story. It's a heck of a big story if it's true. It's it's a very interesting story if it's not true. That just plain doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, especially the RJ, which has been the most uh, vehement critic about this stuff. The first time I ever heard or read the rumors about alien technology at Area 51, it was reported just as, as that, a rumor in an RJ story about the, uh, the military land seizure around Groom Lake. Uh, it's interesting to me that they, they felt it was uh, sufficiently interesting to, to throw it into a story that there's a rumor about alien technology, but weren't, didn't find it sufficiently interesting to actually assign a reporter to it to check it out. Well, that just doesn't make sense. As you know, I live out there where you are at the moment, and uh, I have my own little sighting, fairly serious sighting, George, and uh, the newspaper in front about a printed story the week after I had my sighting talking about a classified C-130 mission. I couldn't believe it. A C-130 is insulting this 
gigantic triangular thing floated slowly and silently above me, and they try to tell me it's a C-130. Um, is that typical? It certainly is. I remember uh, the, the story about the, the, the flight of a Japan Airlines flight, flight between uh, Japan and Alaska. These pilots watched this gigantic walnut-shaped object twice the size of a battleship follow their plane. Right. This thing was picked up on, on uh, airborne radar. It was picked up on ground radar. The pilots themselves saw this thing and followed them for a long period of time. They later denied the radar, didn't they? Well, I think so, but uh, there are all kinds of pressures can be brought to bear on it. They, so they tried to say that it was planet Venus right off the bat before the... <laughs> oh, excuse me, Jupiter. Jupiter? Planet Jupiter, twice the size of a battleship. Well, that's insulting to the pilots, you know. That's insulting to anyone's common sense that Jupiter does not look like a giant flying walnut. That kind of stuff goes on all the time. Yeah, I, after I read this article in the paper um, that a lady was kind enough to send me, uh, send me, I, I just was flat angry. I, my whole face flushed. I was so angry I couldn't believe. It. Whoever is on the other side is very good. You know, I subscribe to something. There's a, a little bulletin called the Secrecy and Government Bulletin that comes out. It's published by the Federation of American Scientists, and they don't deal with the UFO topic so much, but they do deal with all kinds of government secrecy issues. And one of the things their most recent issue dealt with was this. again, if you would, please, about a picture that you had possession of for a while here. Let me set it up this way, is that Bob Lazar, for those who don't know, uh, had said that he worked at an area on the uh, designated S4 on the Papoose Dry Lake Bed, which is just a few miles south of the Groom Dry Lake Bed. He said that there were hangars built into the side of a mountain adjacent to, the, to this uh, dry lake bed, that inside these hangars were alien saucers, discs one of which he saw fly. Nine of them. Are Nine of them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Bob is a, a pretty bright guy. He says that the physics involved in the propulsion system is not of Earth origin. And uh, uh, it's been uh, one heck of a struggle to try to prove that what Bob is saying is true. And I can tell you this. Two people that I know uh, with high-level security clearances have been to the Papoose area in the last three months. And uh, both say that they flew over this area, there are no hangars, there are no saucers, there are no indications there has ever been anything there, if what Bob is saying is true. Is, is that still restricted airspace? Uh, it is restricted airspace, that, uh, the whole area, Area 51, Groom Lake, Papoose, very highly restricted. So they, they, took, they took their chances then? Yeah, they, the Nellis pilots refer to it as the box, because if you fly into that area, your butt is in trouble. Anyway, uh, it's been difficult to prove that there was anything ever going on there. One of my sources who was out there was told there had never been any programs at Papoose, and in fact that the, the dry lake bed was still so contaminated from radioactive tests years ago that nothing could go on there, which is just an absolute pack of baloney. Hmm. Uh, there aren't that many hot spots still out at, at, the, at the Nevada test site, and, and I now have documentation to prove that. Anyway, um, a company in California associated with a, a movie studio that wants to produce a uh, a story about Bob Lazar's life and experiences at Papoose sprung for Soviet satellite photos. And they went back to 1988, bought this photo uh, at a fairly exorbitant price uh, to zero in on, on the Papoose Lake area to see what they could see. Uh, the photo that I was shown shows uh, it's, it's a flying saucer art. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. It's a big, fat flying saucer caught in the air flying over Papoose Lake. That is being analyzed by some folks who formerly worked for NASA. Yep. I am told that additional analysis is being done on the photos. Additional photos are trying to be obtained, and that uh, not only this disk is caught in the air, but that there are roads leading into the area where Bob Lazar said hangars were, that black buses are parked outside, and what it would suggest is Bob was telling the truth, and uh, somebody has destroyed the hangars, moved the equipment, and tried to cover it up. George. I've uh, heard a lot about photographic analysis. I've had some experts say that in this day of uh, digital technology, just about anything can be faked. How, how well do you suppose are they going to be able to nail down the authenticity of this uh, photograph? Well, the people who, who I've been told are working on this are just about as good as you get. 
And uh, and if it's a fake, they should be able to tell it because again, there's a company that bought the photos. It's other people, independent people, and I, I'll see. If so I... so the origin of the photos uh, is is well known. They're they're Russian, and I guess the Russians sell just about anything these days. That's exactly right, and I suspect that if the photos had been touched up and somebody wanted to prove that, it's a very simple matter because I know the date of the uh, uh, of the, the photo was taken. And uh, anybody could go to the Russians if they want to pony up the bucks and, and get their own copy and see if it was if it was phony. Uh, it's interesting to note also, Art, that... Do you know the satellite that took them? Because that might be another way to confirm, George. Uh, you could literally, uh, if you have the name of the satellite, the Russian satellite that took the photograph, you could look at orbital tracks and determine that on that day and that time it was in that area. It is known to the people who bought the photo. I don't know it offhand, but yes, it is known. So that's, that would be another good way to check. It's interesting also that the, the Russians were taking taking regular photos of that area out there on an ongoing basis before any before May of 1989. They'd do one a month, two a month, something like that. After May of 1989, all of a sudden, the Russians started taking photos like crazy. Now, along with the photos, they will give you a list of all the photos that they have, uh, all the times and dates of when they took took snapshots of that area. And before May of 1989, they'd take one or two here and there. After May of 1989, they were taking them basically every day. It's what happened in May of 1989 is that was Bob Lazar's first appearance on KLAS TV. Uh, it could be a coincidence. Maybe not. Maybe they saw that technology flying about and threw up their hands and said, that's it, we quit. Oh, well, could be. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Bob had suggested that, uh, that, that the Russians were in on that program at one point that uh, some kind of a discovery was made at some point, that at least that's what he was told, and the Russians were booted out. So, wow. I thought it was Well, of course, we had uh, Ronald Reagan back at that point saying that we were going to share Star Wars technology with him. Do you recall? I certainly do. Uh, that was his vision for it. There are a lot of interesting connections to the Star Wars uh, program. Bob had Bob said he had been told that the money was being funneled out of that program in order to, uh, to fund the software research. I learned a lot about, in Russia, about a connection with the Star Wars uh, program over there as well. We can get into that perhaps a little bit later. All right. What about the whole aspect of government cover-up? You, you say you're sure they are here. Um, that means, uh, surely, that our government knows perhaps they're playing about with some of the technology. I can imagine that which I saw out there could have used that sort of technology. I can't imagine what else would have done it. At any rate, so the government knows... They've been keeping it secret all this time. This is a standard government cover-up question, George. How can they keep it secret? Well, it's, uh, as Linda Howe has said to me in, in interviews, you know, it's, uh, you have to have a context in which to, to view this story. People talk, documents leak, books are written. But unless you have the proper context to evaluate it, it doesn't mean anything in a person's day-to-day -day life. This is a non-secret secret. I mean, enough people have talked about it. There's enough information out there. Uh, for example, a journalist like myself who, who wants to take the time to look at it uh, can't help but come away persuaded that this is really going on, that there really is a cover-up. Yeah, but isn't it a little like the Kennedy conspiracy in the sense that there actually is so much that's been said about it, so much, that if the truth suddenly came out, if George Knapp had the truth in his hand and he came out and had a big press conference and told the world, it would be just one more theory on the pile of theories. It would be lost. That's, that's exactly true, and you know, when we did the documentary, the, the best evidence, and the, the series actually that led to the documentary, it, it sort of brought things home for the, the local audience in a way that I don't think, like, for example, a national expose could do. People see this stuff on television all the time. They see the X-Files, they see Unsolved Mysteries, right. and they tend to, I think, equate some of this, these kinds of revelations with the movie of the week. Well, that's very interesting, and then go back to, to wait up for Letterman or something. <laughs> the fact that they saw this on local news with personalities and reporters involved who were who uh, were known to them, who had been in their, their living rooms and that they knew lived among them, sort of made a difference. And that I, I think that had a lot to deal with, with the why that program had such an impact here. You know, that program, George, should have been national. Uh, did you make any attempt, or did anybody ever approach you about that? I had uh, several inquiries from producers that wanted to go national. I talked to CBS for, for a while. They they had seen the Lazar material, were were astounded. They that they were in our conversation that they didn't know whether to give it to 60 Minutes or the Evening News, and then nothing happened. Uh, huh. Nothing happened. I, I know that uh, there have been a lot of inquiries from the, the tabloid type shows 
I was going to suggest Fox. It, it seems to me that's something they might like. Oh, well, yeah, it, it's entirely possible. I, I think a lot of the, the material in that is, is, I don't want to say passe, it's still interesting, but uh, as so much has gone under the bridge since then, and, and so much has changed, and, and so much new information has come to light. That All right, that brings us to the new information, and I know that you're working on something very serious right now. What are you doing? Well, we are, uh, I work for the company called Altamira, and uh, and they've basically given me the green light to produce what I hope will be the most comprehensive series of these UFO documentaries ever, ever done. I mean, soup to nuts, uh, beginning with a, an overview of the whole phenomenon, all the different aspects of it, uh, zeroing in on the, on the cover-up issue in a, in a more comprehensive way than's ever been done anywhere. Abductions would be its own separate topic, the crop circles, the whole ball of wax, all in one big series. How long will it be? Well, I'm, I've outlined ten programs already. Um, each, how, how, how long is each, each one? Approximately an hour to an hour and a half. Oh, this is significant. We are, uh, we are currently editing the third of those programs, and, uh, and I think uh, it's about the best stuff I've ever done on this topic and maybe on anything. Cause it's, it's, important, it's important to put it in a, in a, in a format that, that people will take seriously. Uh, we poke fun at it, at it, some of the aspects of it as well, and I think that's that's only natural. Uh, I'm really really jazzed about this. We've been working really hard. We've been traveling all over, uh, have interviews with basically all of the knowledgeable people in this field. Uh, to try to se- separate the wheat from the chaff. We're leaving out some of the crazies, the zanies, the conspiracy buffs, and the zealots, mm-hmm. and getting down to the heart of the matter. What are your intentions uh, for this series? Where would you like to see it? Uh, well, we're, we're looking at going directly to home video. We're going to uh, market it on television, and as well as through a couple of other venues, but mainly through television. Uh, we're, we're constructing the programs in a way that if... There was broadcast interest, and there already has been some. Uh, it, it wouldn't be hard to, to put it into that sort of a format. Uh, but mainly it's to go directly into the home, because I think it's the kind of thing that people should have in their home. Uh, it's that important. It, it shouldn't be the kind of thing that you switch the channel and then you don't think about it anymore. And then the things are so packed, uh, like your show, Art. I mean, it's so packed, you gotta got to listen to it more than once. Before sure. You sit off. All right, let's cover a few aspects of this larger phenomenon. One that I, w- I know that you know a lot about and I want to ask you about is remote viewing. Uh, almost everybody that I talk to keeps touching on this remote viewing thing. And I know that you've investigated this a little bit. It's a little off topic, but I want my audience to understand what remote viewing is and what you know about it. Well, I guess we, uh, we would have called it basically psychic research years ago. All of a sudden, the remote viewing term started coming into... Uh, popular use uh, a few years ago. Uh, my own interest in it was really piqued with the trip to Russia. Uh, you know, I've, like I said, I'm more of a nuts and bolts guy. Show me a document, show me a witness, that sure. sort of thing. Show me sure. a craft, and, and try to stay away from more of the esoteric topics, channeling, automatic writing, those things, because I didn't always see the direct connection to UFOs until this Russia trip. We dealt with a general over there uh, who who reports directly to the Russian equivalent of Colin Powell. Mm-hmm. His boss is the number one guy in the Russian Ministry of Defense. And he runs a program that, uh, for want of a better term, it deals with remote viewing. He prefers the term enhanced human potential. Uh, it's kind of a roundabout way be- until it gets hooked up to UFOs, but he, in essence, teaches regular people and says everyone has disability uh, to some extent, teaches regular people to tap into a universal conscience. Uh, call it the force if you want, if you're a fan of George Lucas. But <laughs> by tapping into this thing, you you get into contact with, uh, he claims, and his disciples claim on a regular basis, some sort of alien intelligence. You also enhance your own intelligence and human abilities. I saw training films used by the Russian Ministry of Defense, by the Russian military, by Russia's KGB and police agencies in which these techniques are applied, and it'll just knock your socks off. For example, they have uh, they would take some Navy cadets down into the bottom of a ship. They'd leave them there for a couple of days, no windows, bring them up to a map room, and then say, locate all the targets located within 50 miles of here, and they would do it with 70% accuracy. Wow. We'd take Air Force cadets, put them in a plane, fly them over these fields where targets are camouflaged, and say, find the targets and tell us what's under the camouflage. 
they would uh, put them in a, a room and have them target practice with, with handguns, things of that nature, turn off all the lights, and then let them still be getting the target. Okay, I, I had no idea, George, that there was a connection to uh, an alien intelligence at all. I'd never heard that with remote viewing. Oh, that's, that's what they're saying. That's what the Russians say, and, uh, in that uh, as part of this, this enhanced human conscious capability, you tap into this universal consciousness that other beings are tapped into as well. Now, some of it gets very, very strange, and, and I have trouble in dealing with some of it, uh, but I had to keep reminding myself just who I am dealing with here. This is a top, top Russian general who reports directly to the top of their military. They take it seriously. They're training their troops and officers with these techniques. And, uh, and it was just flat amazing. Now, we have a program like that as well that is not as far along. I know this because the man who, in essence, oversees his budget is a friend of mine and, and is an important contact of mine. Uh, he's also somebody that's very interested in UFOs. The remote viewers that we have employed by the United States government working on Pentagon programs have also encountered alien uh, beings that have had communication with alien beings and other kinds of entities as well. They have uh, also had the same kind of enhanced human capabilities where they can project their consciousness around the world and speak with the people's files and get free brains and check the first sources. That's incredible, dude. You know what? This ability that some people seem to have uh, isn't very hard for me to believe. Right? I've never had a lot of that. I've always thought the brain has more capacity than we, uh, we know about. But now this connection that this one does is absolutely incredible. And I wonder if it might be true that the condition that you put yourself in to, to be able to remotely view is the same condition that opens you to the possibility of this contact. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, I know there is a physical regimen involved in this. Uh, they, they want to get the Russians, at least, don't want their, their subjects to eat meat. But uh, apparently, huh. once you get involved in this training, you don't want to eat meat anyway. There's no alcohol, no cigarettes, no drugs of any sort can be consumed. Uh, but I guess after you're into it for a while, you don't want to do any of that stuff anyway. I know that uh, the difference between the American program and the Russian program is the Americans are dealing with people who already had demonstrated psychic ability, whereas the Russians specifically went out and found average people who had no such experiences, or at least none they'd ever demonstrated before. In essence, they want to prove that it's possible for everyone to do it. And I'll tell you this, when we got back from Russia, I told my friend in Washington about my Russian contacts. He knew that the program existed but had no access to it. We set up a, uh, uh, set up a meeting between uh, Washington and the friends in Moscow, and now they have reached an agreement to have joint research on this program. Um, so that the Russians can share with us what we know, and we can share with them what we, uh, what uh, you got there. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I, I note that the Russians, uh, since the end of communism, have gone kind of bonkers on this kind of thing. And I think on their, just before their evening newscast every night, they have a faith healer that comes on. Did you see a lot of that kind of thing? Uh, is there much of it going on as has been reported? Well, there is a lot of it, um, but you've got to realize what they're coming out of. You know, some of the the, uh, the ultimate debunkers over here in America have already been setting themselves up so they can dismiss anything that comes out of Russia by saying, well, those Russians are crazy, they're all into they're all the psychic stuff and ghosts, and you can't believe anything. They say you, you believe them less than you believe the Americans. What believe. do you have to say about the Amazing Randy? He, you know, the, is that his name, the Amazing Randy or whatever he is? Um, he, uh, he's a deeper person. Actually went to Russia and uh, debunked a, butter, a bunch of Russians uh, who were claiming a remote viewing capability. And uh, uh, I think it was one Russian who claimed that he could raise the blood pressure or heartbeat uh, of an individual or change that individual's brain waves. And uh, and as I watched that, I thought, you know, it is pretty simple to debunk it. It's easier to debunk it seems to me than to do almost anything else. Well, that's true, uh, and it's, it's, it's sad, like I said, that these people would be blanketly dismissing anything that might come out of Russia before they even know what it is, but that's exactly what they're doing. It's, it's too bad that they have stolen the word skeptics and skepticism, because it, it means a lot, something much different from, from how it's been twisted. It's not that just you don't believe. Um, they refuse to believe, and it doesn't matter what evidence you can show them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and All right.
right, let me quickly, we don't have a lot of time before the top of the hour. I want to jump to abductions because a lot of the guests that I've had on the program have said, you know, we know the UFOs are there. There are so many reports that it's almost not even interesting unless one, you know, wants to land on the White House lawn or something. Otherwise, I think they say, it's established. They're here. What we're now interested in are these abductions, and they are probably the best thing to look at for proof. Would you agree with that? Oh, I think that's where the phenomenon is heading. You know, in dealing with people like Bud Hopkins and Linda and Dr. John Mack of Harvard, it see, that seems to be where it is heading. It, it seems like this other intelligence, whatever it is, wherever it's from, keeps raising the stakes. It used to be just lights in the sky, and then it was craft, and then craft that landed, and then humanoid-like features, and, right. and all of a sudden we started having interaction reported on sporadic basis, like Betty and Barney Hill. Now the stakes have been up. This is happening to a lot of people. A lot of people who are not making this stuff up. A lot of people who, who really are physically missing, uh, who have physical uh, indications that something really happened to them, whose, whose wives are messed up by uh, by what happens to them, and, and who tell their stories at great personal risk. I really do believe that that is where the phenomenon is heading. It's not our choice. It's the choice of whoever's on the other side calling the shot. Um, you produced the document for 12 Best Evidence. Now, in 1993... If you had to say what you thought the best evidence was, which you can do, what would you think? What is the best evidence right now? Let me think about it. Come back to that question. Let me think about it. All right, because I know you've looked at an awful lot of that here. I'm going to have to think about it before I boil it down. I wonder, for example, if if, if it's your current baby, these pictures of the discs uh, at the... I don't know, uh, because um, until I get my own independent uh, evaluation of the pictures, I, I would be reluctant to say that. I, I hope that that yeah. turns out to be, but I suspect that, as, as you suggested when we first started talking about these, is that uh, with such incredible technology these days to to do this and that with graphics and com computer technology, that right. uh, I'm not sure any picture of any nature would convince people. That All right. Um, hypnotic regression as a tool. I think it's very valuable. Uh, a couple of points that Bud always makes is, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the, uh, the cases he deals with, these people remember this information without hypnotic regression. Obviously, there have been abuses uh, over the years, but I've sat in on a couple of these sessions. Uh, John Carpenter came out to Nevada at our behest uh, several months ago and uh, did some work with a Nevada family that's been going through absolute hell with uh, some kind of an alien presence for a long time. Yeah. I watched his technique. And uh, although the critics will say that hip hypnotists, hypnotherapists lead the witnesses to certain conclusions, right. it is completely the opposite of what Carpenter did. He would, for example, use questions about uh, assuming that it, it's a disc-shaped craft. He would ask the people, look around in the corners, tell me what you see in the corners as they're, as they're under hypnosis. Well, uh, that the genuine confabulation uh, incident, if somebody was making this stuff up in their head, they would make something up that they would see in the corner. Uh, the, the UFO abductee who is in a disc-shaped craft gets a puzzled look on their face, looks around, and can't see any corners. That sort of a thing. Every step that he took, at least in the sessions that I sat in, led the witnesses away from the standard scenario of an abduction as opposed to leading them toward it. And I suppose the mainstream journalist in you um, looks very carefully for exactly that sort of thing. Well, absolutely. You don't want to be part of a story that's going to turn out to be bogus and blow up in your face. I mean, the, the key is for people like you and Linda and, and others is, is personal credibility. Exactly. Once you blow it, it's gone. That's a fact. George, uh, we're up to a newscast here at the top of the hour, so relax for five minutes. We'll come back and open the lines, all right? Okay. All right, stay right there. If you want to start stacking up on the lines for George Knapp, this will be your opportunity. We'll get the numbers out uh, as soon as we come back from the news. This is Area 2000. Good evening. Welcome back to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. My guest is George Knapp. Most of you know him. Those that don't will soon. He is a journalist. He's a reporter on this program on a weekly basis. And he's respected throughout the entire UFO community. If you would like to speak with George Knapp, this is going to be your opportunity. Let me give you the relevant telephone numbers. In the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, the magic number is 3 
1-800-283-8255. Outside the state, toll free. It's 1-800-338-8255. One eight hundred three three eight eighty two fifty five. Then we have the wild card lines at area code seven zero two three eight five seven two one four seventy two fourteen. And then finally, first time callers at area code seven zero two three eight five seven two one three seventy two thirteen. And now back to George Knapp. George, good. Uh, one last area, and then we'll take phone calls. And uh, the last area I want to cover with you uh, is crop circles. Um, how much connection, I asked Linda, of course, about this with respect to crop circles and uh, uh, the animal mutilations. We might as well try and cover both. There seems to be more of a connection to the UFOs than not. Uh, is that an opinion you share, or what is your thinking in this area? Uh, yes, it is an opinion I share. I mean, there's far too many witnesses who have seen anomalous uh, aerial phenomena uh, in association with the formation of these things. In addition, the, the kinds of changes that are occurring in the plants and in the soil are things that I'm not quite sure we have the technology to do. Um, uh, I also know from speaking with other researchers who are far more involved with this this uh, topic than I am, in, at least in, as far as crop circles go, that there is intense government intelligence agency interest in this subject. Uh, sev several of these researchers have been approached, uh, have been offered bribes, have been threatened, in essence, by people who want to be able to control the flow of information about the crop circles. It seems like whatever intelligence is behind this uh, phenomenon is is sending a message that can't be easily brushed away by by government intelligence agencies. They're trying to send a message. I don't think we understand exactly what it is yet. Perhaps it's at some sort of a subconscious level that, that can't be uh, swept away like a document can or a witness can. Uh, it, it'd be like trying to sweep away the crap nebula. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's been a long time since I think you've been directly in contact with the public. Are you ready? Sure. All right, let's do it. Lots of calls. Wild card line three. Good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. You're on the air. Go ahead. Uh, George, when I was a kid driving back from Florida, in Georgia... There's something wrong with your phone line, sir. It's got a big hum on it. Oh, that, that's better. Better now? Yeah, that's better. Go ahead again, please. Driving back from Florida... In Georgia, we stopped in a gas station and went to sleep. We woke up, there was a light, like daylight all around, so we jumped up and we got, you know, we just got out of there. Now, going back to New York, we almost got killed twice. Once we're going up on the Jersey Turnpike, for no apparent reason, we were on the side going up when cars were coming down. And we switched, I don't know how we switched over, how we even got there. And then coming in from Arizona one time with me, my wife, and my children with two cars, they just went dead at the same point. And in the background on the mountains, we see some, you know, strange-shaped objects, and no other cars came by. You know, it's a, it's a funny situation. I just can't understand it. Well, it sounds very familiar with uh, a lot of the cases that people like Bud Hopkins have been digging up. Uh, what you are describing sounds very close to a missing time experience where one minute you're somewhere and the next minute... You're somewhere else. Uh, a lot of times these happen in cars where, where people uh, suddenly find themselves at their destination either really late or, or really early and don't remember how they got there. Uh, also, what you're describing is you know more than one experience, which, uh, as we're learning more about this phenomenon, seems to be how it goes. It's not chance encounters that people have. People are followed. Families are followed, often for generations, uh, by whatever intelligence we're dealing with. Um, I... Uh, I sympathize with uh, the, the weirdness of your experience. Uh, the only consolation I can give you is that there are a lot of other people who have gone through the same thing. Oh, well, I mean, it really don't bother me what happens. You know, I'm starting to think about this new world order and all. Uh-huh. You know, I think that, you know, I'm starting to think that maybe they, you know, they're trying to change our mind in order for these people to take over the universe and do a whole lot of time because they got plenty of time that don't mean nothing. It may not happen. All now. right, sir, where, where are you calling from? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. All right, thank you. George, um, you know, there are a number of UFO researchers, and I won't name them, who seem to have almost branched out from the UFO phenomenon, perhaps through the cover-up aspect of it, into the New World Order business. Um, 
Why are they making that connection? Well, I'll put it this way. I, I try to keep an open mind on just about everything. I don't want to, to, to shut something out just because it sounds weird. Um, why they make the connection in a lot of cases is because they're profiteers or because they're uh, right-wing fanatics, full types who are trying to draw attention to themselves, mm -hmm. or they have a religious agenda that they want to pursue, or they just want attention. Um, I have seen no compelling evidence uh, of any kind of a new world order threat. I'm open to it if someone's got it. Um, you know, the, the uh, Trilateralists and the Council of Foreign Relations and the Bilderbergers and the Illuminati and the Jason Society, and you've got any number of, of conspiracy theories. Uh, some, at least a few of these uh, uh, researchers have tried to tile them into, you know, the mother of all conspiracy theories, and they're all involved with the aliens. Uh, I, I, I just don't see a compelling case for that. Now, there may be some other political agenda that's going on. I certainly believe that there is corrupt uh, collaboration between certain governments on a UFO cover-up, uh, but I don't see any spot to, to have the, the New World Order, the One World Government to put us all in concentration camps, or, and I certainly just don't see any evidence that we've got secret treaties with aliens. There may have been communication at some point. I, I find that entirely possible, but uh, aliens, if that's what you want to call them, don't need our permission, for example, to go ahead and abduct people because we couldn't stop them if they wanted to. All right. As some people have surmised. All right. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp uh, from Jackie Gong's Plaza Hotel. Where are you calling from? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. Okay, go ahead. How can you get a non-believer to become a believer? <laughs> well, that, that's a tough one. I, I think it has to be a, a, a relatively slow process. You don't try to uh, convert them like you would convert uh, someone religiously. You just show them some of the best information. I, I would start with there's a couple of books. Any of the books by Jacques Vallée, uh, Timothy Good's book, Above Top Secret, is a good place to start, and let them delve into it themselves. I mean, people have to reach this conclusion on their own. I think most people would reach the same conclusion that I've reached uh, if they take the time to do it, but it's not something that happens overnight. By the way, where does your career go from here? When you're finished uh, producing this long series that you're now doing, what do you, uh, what do you see ahead for George Knapp? That's a, that's a good question, Art, and it's a scary question, and I'm not quite sure. I mean, I'd like to, uh, you know, I'd like to see this out to, until the, the uh, final resolution to this question is, uh, is reached. Um, whether or not that's going to happen in my lifetime, I don't know. It could happen next week, and then I'd be looking for something else to do. But I, uh, um, I have a lot of different kinds of interests. This just happens to be the dominant interest at the moment. Understood. I, uh, I frequently ask my guests this, and I will ask it of you because it's such a good question. If you had conclusive and controvertible evidence that they are here and you could prove it, I mean, you just could go on television and lay it out and prove it, would you do it? I don't think there's any question I would do it. I mean, I have had those, soul, those same kind of soul-searching uh, uh, sessions. I've had those conversations with other researchers. I've actually gone back and forth on it occasionally because you realize that the world is going to be very different. There are going to be profound effects. I'm not sure people would panic in the street, but... Uh, there would be some who would panic. There would be profound economic effects. Um, it would have a dramatic impact on the world as we know it. But it goes back to Ned Day, Art. You know, what, uh, what Ned Day had taught me, he said, the journalist credo, the ethical imperative is get the story, get it right, and tell it no matter who it helps or who it hurts. When journalists start em uh, employing self-censorship, then they're not doing what they're, they're paid to do. But are there not, George, occasionally... Times, I mean, if you had this evidence and the government came to you uh, and said, look, we know you're about to blow this, but l listen, here are the reasons why you shouldn't, and laid out some, no doubt, national security ma uh, matters, uh, or, or laid out several studies to you that would show that psychologically the American public would not be ready for it and it would cause great social disruption. Um, would it, would it stop you? I guess it would. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say absolutely because there are a few absolutes in life. I guess that they would have to take it off. They don't have a whole heck of a lot of credibility with me or with a lot of other people to begin with. It would have to be an awfully persuasive case. And, uh, I would not say absolutely that I would not go along with it, though, no. All right. Uh, line one, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Uh, yes, this is very interesting tonight. Um, a couple of things. With uh, abductions that are going on, it reminds me of uh, what we do with uh, research. 
uh, with, uh, with animal research. And uh, In what sense? In what sense? Well, the same way as I was watching a thing on the television the other day where they were uh, working with uh, gorillas and stuff like this and with blinds and uh, going in and taking samples and doing stuff like this. And it might be the same way that they're just doing uh, zoological research on us as another entity. But the, the other part was you were talking about remote viewing. What, right. what do you know about this uh, guy by the name of Al Beely that was talking about a lot of the same things that you're talking about? Oh, yes. Uh, all right, sir. Thank you. Al Beelick and the Philadelphia Experience. No, I know of Al Beelick. I've come close to meeting him a couple of times. I, I don't know, uh, you know, a great deal about the Philadelphia Experiment or the Montauk Project. I, I just tangential information. Uh, uh, I think it's an interesting topic, and it certainly has a, a UFO connection. But uh, if you're asking me, is Al Bielek a, a credible guy? Uh, I have no indication of otherwise. Uh, whether or not the Montauk Project is real or the Philadelphia Experiment really happened, I, I really would be reluctant to say. As far as the abduction question, the comparison to animal research, that's a fair comparison because what a lot of the abductees are reporting is, you know, the taking of physical samples, uh, scoops of flesh, sperm, and ovum samples, and that's the sort of thing that we do with uh, less intelligent species. But uh, after speaking to folks like David Jacobs and Bud Hopkins and John Mack, it, it seems to be uh, something else that they're looking for. Uh, some sort of an interaction uh, with uh, our species, something that we have that they can't duplicate in the laboratory, and a lot of people, John Carpenter included, have suggested it has something to do with the human soul. Mm. Uh, that, uh, the, uh, you know, the abductees, a lot of them that are reporting having hybrid... George, that's something that John, John Lear has been talking about for some time. Is the soul? Yeah. Yes, yes. I think uh, John has picked up uh, tidbits here and there from, from uh, Bob Lazar and others, and uh, maybe has gone his own way with it, but the, the, the discussion of the interest in the soul is, is not only new with John, it's uh, Whitley Strieber had suggested that he felt the visitors were, were interested in the soul. Dr. John Mack has, has said something similar, that the, we have something that, that they need and they want some sort of an ongoing relationship, perhaps even they're, they're hoping that if we're going to kill ourselves, blow ourselves up, or poison our planet, that something human or humanoid, human-like, will survive. Um, George, um, we touched on Al Bielik, and that's a kind of an almost a time travel story. And I've always, it's been a personal fascination for me, the possibility of time travel. A, is anybody working on time travel that you know of? I am right now uh, reading a fascinating book by a guy named Mark Davenport. It's called Visitors from Time, The Secrets of the UFOs, in which this guy analyzes UFO sightings, UFO phenomenon, uh, over the years, and uh, it's a very persuasive case that the technology being uh, exhibited by these these craft is a time travel technology as opposed to a, just a, what we would call a propulsion system. That's also fairly consistent with what Bob Lazar has said, that uh, that part of the research that was going on out there was dealing with time travel. Um, All right, I, I interviewed uh, John Lear not long ago, and Bob Lazar also came on the program, on my syndicated program, and... Um, a lot of people seem to think, or there is a rumor going about, that Bob Lazar might be working on some sort of time travel apparatus. And I asked Bob, and he said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, Bob, if you were, would you tell me? And he paused for a long moment and said, no. <laughs> what, what well, that's you... typical classic Bob. Um, <laughs> I uh, talked to Bob on a fairly regular basis, and uh, I, I think I probably would have caught some wind of if he was working on a time uh, machine of some sort. I, I think he may have learned enough to where he might be able to work on something like that in the future. Learned enough, in other words, from his experiences at S4. But, but uh, to my knowledge, he's not doing that now. This book, anyway, by Mark Davenport, it's it's uh, really a persuasive case that what uh, the technology being exhibited is is time travel. And um, um, he might be an interesting guest. That's a good idea. Well, maybe Angela Thompson and I can try to set that up. All right, mention it to Angela, please. Um, Good evening on the uh, Wild Card Line 2, I guess it is. You're on the air with George Knapp. Yes, good evening, uh, um, Good evening, Mr. Knapp. Good evening. Uh, I w I'm very reluctant to undergo a hypnosis, but I had an occurrence uh, which uh, has uh, terminated recurring dreams, and I would willingly undergo it to see uh, what, uh, if my interpretation was right. 
Was there ever, uh, time will not permit my relating the entire thing, was there ever a colony here on earth in the accounts that you have listened to upon occasion which was abandoned and there are descendants on the earth here and now of that original colony from uh, alien to, uh, extraterrestrials and that they are now uh, returning and warning a certain people of a coming catastrophe. Have you heard that at any time? I, I've heard it again and again and again. Um, but I am relieved to hear that. Bud Hopkins refers to these kinds of uh, apocalyptic visions as alien editorials. Uh, he's not entirely convinced that, uh, that, that what the aliens are describing, or in, in many cases graphically illustrating to the abductees, is actually going to happen, as opposed to they're trying to give us a message that you better clean up your act. Uh, as, as for the, uh, the ancient civilization, of course I've heard it. I wish I could answer your question about whether it's true or not, because it would answer a lot of the things well, that are still in my head. Uh, I just uh, don't know. I experience the atmosphere is now hostile to them, and uh, they'll be suited when they come back, but nothing like the cosmonaut or an astronaut or an underwater or anything like that. Well, you know what, we're, what we've been hearing, and I think what I discussed last week, Art, is that uh, again and again there seems to be some kind of a growing sense of urgency as I travel around the country and speaking not only to researchers but just members of the general public. Uh, abductees are getting messages. Regular people have got a, a, a real uneasy sense that, that something is happening. Clearly there are changes occurring in our, in our planet. Uh, the crop circles, people like Colin Andrews who are doing research on that, uh, feel that, uh, that whatever that some, Something or another, thank when you. When I wanted further information, he, I assumed it was male, uh, that was communicating with me, only the visor across the eyes, only a very narrow from temple to temple, seemed to be an energy emanating from them, that there was no time he had to communicate with others, and that was it. I'll hang up and let you, uh, listen to you. Thank uh, you. All right, thank you. Uh, that something, George, is imminent. Do you have that feeling, too? Do you have any sense of uh, something around well, the It's hard to separate it because, I, again, I try to be the, the blank slate and listen to what people say and, and try to separate the uh, truth from fiction, uh, but I keep hearing it over and over again from people whose opinions I really respect. So whether or not I feel it myself or whether I've just heard it so many times, um, I don't know. I, I'm reluctant to give too much credence to these predictions because, as, as you and I have spoken many times, our you, know, you hear them over and over again, and it just doesn't seem like any of them come true. But what about the proposition, George, that they're getting us ready for this information? That all these programs on television and they're abundant these days about this sort of thing are preparing us mentally? Oh, I, I find that completely credible. I, I don't know. The human mind is tra trained to, to look for uh, uh, patterns in these sorts of things. Uh, certainly over the last 40 years, our attitudes about aliens have changed a lot. Our attitudes about space travel have changed a lot. What we think is, is possible in terms of getting elsewhere. And, uh, and uh, certainly, you know, uh, the movies that used to show aliens here to eat us have changed. Now they're, they're ETs, our space brethren. We've got mainstream shows uh, uh, on television now that, that, uh, that clearly take the subject seriously. Anyone who's got a television has been exposed to this stuff again and again. I, I think if it is a program of conditioning, it, it has worked. And if it is not, it, it has the same effect. All right, let's keep going. Uh, from Jackie Gones Plaza Hotel, you're on the air with George Knapp. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Rock, California. All right, go right ahead. Large, um, on In Search of, I was watching the crop circle section, and they said that they caught one being made. I think somebody should look into that. They said that they were researching the tape. Well, I know that there have been a couple of uh, couple of times when they have uh, seen these odd aerial things flying over the, the, the circles, uh, whether or not they've seen one actually made. I haven't seen that tape. I know I've seen yeah. a video of Yeah, look into the, the crop circle segment that they have in search of, and at the, toward the end there they say that they caught one being made and that uh, they're analyzing the film, the film footage. Did they suggest what, what had made it? And no, they didn't suggest because they didn't want to say anything until they knew for sure. Um, also, Art, you were asking earlier about what UFOs and the New World Government had in common. Yes. Um, well, this is just a theory. I don't know for sure, but um, su uh, supposedly um, a lot of people believe that, that uh, Christ came from, uh, since the Virgin Mary, uh, was, they think she was implanted and by an alien. And since the New World Government is supposed to be just before the recoming of Christ. So I think there's something there. All right. All right. I appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. 
So there is a connection, I suppose. And also, George, that kind of talk, that kind of discussion brings on a lot of anger. Boy, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you have some uh, religious folk out there and they hear that, they just boil right over and generally you get it on the air and believe me, I've had it. Oh, well, some do, you know, but I, and I've i dealt with a lot of religious folks uh, over the years, religious leaders. In fact, earlier this year I went to Nashville, Tennessee to help produce a, a, a series on UFOs, and I realized this is the Bible Belt here. I better find out where I, I might stand That's right. in terms of a, a, a nasty public reaction. So one of the first people I sought out was one of the uh, primary leaders in the Baptist community in Nashville, and I laid it out to him. What if this is real? What if these aliens have been messing with us for a long time? And, and his attitude was remar was refreshing in its simplicity. He said, well, if they're out there, you know, God created them too, and we have a message to give to them. In other words, he was ready to start converting them and having them sit in the pews uh, <laughs> next Sunday. Well, presumably, though, if they are the ones who created us and God created them, that wouldn't be necessary. Oh, that, I guess that's true. I also spoke to some Mormon, some folks in the Mormon community here in Nevada. Now, the Mormons are very conservative, as you know. Uh, the the re alien reality, they have no problem with it. In fact, m much of their teaching suggests that we came from other planets. Mm -hmm. We were, in essence, seated here. So uh, I think the, the idea that people would panic, that religions would crumble, uh, is probably exaggerated just on the basis of those kinds of conversations. I know, but I'll tell you right now, George, if the saucer came down and they walked out, and they weren't in front of the White House or some other relatively safe area, somebody would fill them for a lead. <laughs> well, there's no doubt about that, because it's happened enough times already where people have shot at them, thrown rocks. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, line two, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Uh, good evening, Oz and George. Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say this, that uh, Al Selig, in my opinion, is a total fraud, and he has created his own fantasy. Now, to the question. George, have you ever considered, or have you been approached, uh, to make a documentary on the Billy Meyer conduct case, and what is your opinion about the Meyer case? Uh, I have never been approached to make a documentary on it. I did include a segment on the Billy Meyer case in, in the original UFOs, the best evidence. Um, I, I'm intrigued by the case. I think uh, I look at some of the, the photos uh, that, that occurred at the latter stages of Meyer's experiences, and they look completely phony. I look at some of the photos that were taken in the beginning, some photos that are supported by multiple independent witnesses who said that they saw these things too, and I'm very intrigued. Uh, I suspect uh, it's like a lot of other UFO cases. Billy Meyer might have been onto something, was getting some genuine information, had some genuine contact, started drawing attention, and drew the attention of intelligence agencies or others who wanted to discredit him. Uh, we heard over and over again this story about a, a, a model that was found in a barn. I don't know that anyone has actually ever seen that model, but you hear that story over and over again. Well, those are the defectors from the group, and how can a one um, man create all those four or five different variations of UFOs plus he had, in those days, 8 millimeter footage? I mean, the man is honest. Of course, uh, the mud's going to fly in the UFO researchers' face when the time comes because the million kill in case is not going to go away and eventually a worldwide distribution of this information will come forward. All right, sir, thank you. Uh, so that is a, a case you find intriguing, George. I do. I, I find it intriguing. Like I said, I think somebody got to him or infiltrated his camp. He had all kinds of people that were living with him and staying with him and acting like his disciples after a while. The attention may have gone to his head for a while. Uh, it's like anything else in this field, Art. Everything is controversial. There's, sure. there's almost nothing that even ufologists can agree on. You know, the Gulf Breeze case, tremendous photographs, a lot of uh, corroborative evidence. No, 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 no question about it. George, hold on just one sec while I ID. You're listening to Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. My guest, George Knapp. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening. We're going right back to it. There's one local line that just popped open. That's it. That's all that's available. That number, of course, 383-8255-8255. George, good. All right, back to a lot of people here, George. Uh, Wildcard Line 2, you're on the air with George Knapp. Good evening. Hello. This is Minerva. Minerva, where are you? Uh, Eureka, California. Eureka, all right. I'd like to give you uh, some information about a different kind of uh, time traveling. This is mental time traveling. There's a new book uh, published last year uh, about Nostradamus predictions, which is quite good. It's written by Maurice Lascasse, C-A-S-S-E. 
1995. It's called Nostradamus, The Voice That Echoes Through Time. And he says, uh, the third Antichrist is Saddam Hussein. And uh, he pinpoints a particular time that's of future interest, and that is uh, March and April of 1996. And I'm an amateur study of, of uh, astrology, so I looked that up, and it is very interesting. <laughs> all right. So a different kind of time. It's not all that different, really, because these uh, um, there have been a number of things done on time travel that can actually be achieved with the mind. And uh, it, again, is a fascinating area for me. George, uh, do you have any comment on that? Oh, it's just a little out of my area. Like I said, I try to keep an open mind about all of it, but it's just not something I've delved into to any extent. All right. Out of line three, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Hello? Hello. Yeah, Art? Yes. Hey, Art, uh, I had uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I just went and saw Al Bielik, and I spoke with him personally, and I feel like that your last caller there that... Uh, you think he's fantasized it? Well, yeah, he's got a good story, but uh, he won't look you in the eye. You know, so. Well, I, you know, no, no, I don't know if that's fair. I, I listened to the man for several hours. I don't know whether you heard the show I did with him or not. Uh, but he was pretty convincing, uh, pretty credible. I, I don't know what he's like in person. That's, what, that's why I had the problem. In other words, it was credible. Everything. That yeah, he, but there are people, you know, who... I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not the last say so on anything, but... The other thing I want to talk to you about is that I saw something two years ago down at the Salton Sea, and it was uh, right where they had their uh, bombing area down there. And it, we were out camping out there for about four or five days, and at nighttime we saw these two objects go through the sky so slowly, and there was no there was no uh, sound of an engine or anything. And we could see, like, a lights on them. It appeared like there were some kind of windows or something, and... Uh, you know, I, I saw it first, and I pointed it out to these other friends that were camping, and we watched this thing for about 15 minutes, and uh, and they, there was just two of them, and they just went slowly across the sky, and they were close enough where we you, there was no wind, so we should have been able to hear their engines or something. <laughs> and I thought that maybe that was something like what you saw. But it I sound, was, sounds, I, I, that's why I chuckled. It sounded a little like what I saw. Yeah, and uh, that's the only experience I've ever had with anything like that. But uh, it's got a great show tonight. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, there's just another report. There are so many of them, George. Uh, I wonder really, too, how many there are. Uh, we hear, you know, people call a program like this uh, where nobody's going to laugh at them. Um, but uh, I, I would think that the great majority of UFO reports or even abductions or experiences of that sort would be not reported. I, I think the figure is 9 out of 10. It's an interesting uh, dichotomy. Uh, that uh, even ufologists will admit that 9 out of 10 UFO sightings are probably misidentifications of, of explainable phenomenon. But it's also true that 9 out of 10 UFOs are never reported at all. And the, the simple fact is that there's no one to report them to. Of course, UFO organizations will take those reports, but the vast majority of, of people, even here in America, are not part of those organizations who wouldn't know how to contact one if they wanted to. Police agencies don't take the reports. The Air Force claims that it stopped in 1969 taking reports, so uh, you can call your airport and they'll, they'll keep you on the line to find out if you're a nut, but they don't take down the information, so it's just, in essence, most of that information mm -hmm. is lost forever. All right, onward. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from St. Louis. St. Louis, Missouri. I am? Yes, sir. I was wondering how the uh, Democrats, referring back to the election, <laughs> how they got away with it. I'll tell you what, you're, I know what you're doing. You're listening to my syndicated uh, program in St. Louis, aren't you? I am. All right. Um, we are doing a different program on the air right now. What, what would that be? We'll be back. Uh, we're doing a program on UFOs. And uh, we'll be back uh, on the syndicated show live on Tuesday morning early. All right. All right? UFOs. Right. I have nothing to contribute on that topic. Well, in that case, good hearing from St. Louis anyway. Right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Line one, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Yes, I was um, wondering if you could give me some information on, number one, Project Blue Book, exactly what it is, how it pertains to the government, and number two... What it was. What it was? No, I'm sorry, I didn't know they closed it. Oh, yes. And number two, it's a case called something like the Mothman Prophecies. I think Keel reported on it. George, do you know about that? 
I do a little bit. Uh, the first question, Blue Book, was uh, the name of the, the third official, at least publicly known study launched by the U.S. military into the UFO mystery. Although study is uh, probably not a good term to use for Blue Book, in essence, and everyone associated with it, including its first director, said that it was little more than a public relations exercise aimed at d dismissing or explaining away UFO sightings. The first two projects which preceded Blue Book, Project Sign and Project Grudge, were a little bit different. Project Sign was conducted in total secrecy. It concluded that the UFOs were real and probably extraterrestrial. That, uh, that recommendation was rejected by the head of the Air Force. Project Grudge then uh, concluded UFOs weren't worth studying. That was followed by Project Blue Book. In 1969, Project Blue Book ended uh, when the uh, military, in essence, announced that because of studies it had done, uh, there appeared to be no threat from UFOs and that further study would be a waste of time. We also know for a fact, because of the Air Force's own internal documents, that there were there is an ongoing study that uh, was even underway at the time of Project Blue Book. Any cases involving national security, like UFOs over ICBM bases, went somewhere else. That somewhere else is, uh, is still unknown to us, uh, but it's probably still going on in that way. Uh, as for the Mothman prophecies, I haven't read it. There's a guy named John Keel who wrote it. It's about uh, some incredible experiences. I I'm trying to remember the town, but uh, it's a town back east, Virginia, West Virginia, somewhere like that, that was basically inundated with UFO sightings, with uh, strange aerial phenomenon, with people reporting seeing humanoid-type figures with wings flying around. Uh, as I said, I have not read it. It certainly is well known in, in UFO circles, but uh, that's about all I know about it. How's that, Colin? All right, thank you. And let's oh. hope Douglas Adams wasn't right about all that. All right, <laughs> thank you. And uh, good evening. Out of state, you're on the air from Jackie Gons Plaza Hotel with George Knapp. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Riverside, California. Good evening, uh, Mr. Bell and uh, Mr. Knapp. Good evening. I want to uh, just say uh, thank you for having a show like this. Uh, I think uh, more information should be brought out to, to the general public. And I have a question uh, for Mr. Knapp. Uh, in all my readings and study... Uh, that I've done on this subject. Uh, I probably started uh, on the Betty and Barney Hill uh, situation, or, or uh, not abduction, but uh, back in the 50s, and uh, worked my way uh, recently through uh, about 25, 30 books in the last two years. However, the question is uh, getting back to the human spirit and uh, uh, the soul. Uh, what I've gathered uh, is that uh, we've asked a lot of abductees that. The, one of the things we admire about the human race is our individuality. Uh, could you comment on that, uh, Mr. Neff? All right, yes, it's a good question. George, uh, do these aliens have some sort of collective mentality? It seems like it, and what's been described by the various witnesses, it's almost like a hive mentality. Uh, I'm not sure that, you know, the, the aliens, what we perceive to be aliens, what's most commonly uh, uh, reported in America, at least, as the aliens are, are the real aliens. Uh, it's just the bug-eyed, big-headed grays that, that are reported most often. Right. Uh, almost in a lot of ways seem to be androids or uh, some kind of uh, machines uh, that are directed by other intelligences, often humanoid-type intelligences that, that look just like us. Um, Perhaps uh, a race of android-type creatures left in the area to keep track or to do the dirty work, to go down and collect the samples and have these interactions. But the fact that they were, uh, there was a question about the being able to figure out how these are interacting with the ground, they're using it for them. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, 
You reported on that on the day Israel and the PLO signed their papers, a star of David appeared in a field. Has any testing of the grain been done on that particular formation? Uh, not to my knowledge, and, and that's my fault for not following it up. Uh, I'll make a note of that now and, and try to have some information on it for next week. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. That could have been so easily man-made, but it would be interesting if it wasn't. Um, and does anyone that you know of published a comprehensive list of UFO-related conferences and events? I know we have one uh, coming up in San Francisco and then one in April in Los Angeles. Uh, several publications. Uh, the MUFON UFO Journal uh, keeps up with uh, not only the conferences, always has a monthly list of them, but uh, as well as uh, pretty serious, uh, incredible research that's going on in the field. UFO Magazine, published out of L.A., uh, always keeps up with that stuff. They're very credible as well. Um, uh, there's a, a service called the UFO uh, News Clipping Service that not only lists a lot of conferences, but also gives you news uh, from around the world relating to UFOs and, and other related topics, uh, but from newspapers all over the world reported in the mainstream press. I'd recommend any of those. Where are they located? Um, what? I don't have the addresses here, but okay, perhaps, just... Art, you tell me, how do we arrange to get this lady this address? Well, uh, we might bring it to the program next week. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. All right, ma'am? Uh, yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just make a couple of notes, uh, George, and we'll try to get that information out next week. All right. Uh, good evening. You're on the air uh, with George Knapp in Las Vegas. Hey, hello there. Hi. Where are you from, sir? Uh, well, um... I'm from the source, but I'm from Mount Shasta here right this moment. All right. Uh, I'd like to talk to George if uh, he's aware of the disappearing, sure he's aware of the disappearing Mars Observer craft. Sure. Oh, yes. Are you aware of the sudden misoperation of NASA's photograph re-equipment when he landed on the moon? Uh, that doesn't ring a bell. All right, but but your first uh, uh, question, sir, is a good one. And George, what do you hear? Everything is buzzing with rumors and um, thoughts and attempts to turn the, the Mars Explorer back on and all the rest of it. What do you hear about that? Is it your judgment that it's a simple malfunction? That's true, or is it some sort of cover-up? Uh, uh, it, it's a mixed bag, Art. Uh, I I tried to call Richard Hoagland today uh, because he seems to be tuned into this as much or if not more than anyone, and was unable to get a hold of him to get the latest on that. He has some very high-level sources within NASA, and I think I mentioned last week, he is convinced that this thing is going to turn itself back on in January or February, that it's still out there, that it's sending mm -hmm. back pictures. Uh, the other side of the coin, you've got people like Ed Dames, the guy who had predicted this big event in New Mexico that we've talked about several times, who has uh, just received an issue of the New Mexico MUFON news had an extensive interview with Dames who said that whatever happened up there to the Mars Observer was direct, directly related to the event that he predicted was going to happen that has now been delayed, that the Martians or whoever is living up there were directly involved.
throwing a little bit of, it, of money to answer the fundamental questions of where where we are in the universe, whether or not we're alone, I mean, which even somebody like Carl Sagan would admit is uh, the most fundamental question of our time, and which would, which would be uh, the biggest scientific discovery in human history, if, if contact were ever made. It's a small price to pay for such like, big possible returns, and, and I'm really bothered by it. Well, if all this comes to be true, and uh, you're still part of it when it comes down, George, maybe that'll be worth some gigantic uh, um, reward and money. I don't, I don't know about that. I just know it'll be a chance to raise some holy hell with the people. Uh, get online, too. Good evening. You're on the air with George. Yeah. Uh, hi, how are you doing? Fine. Uh, another great show. You've got to get this thing a little longer if you can. You know what I mean? <laughs> Huh? Yeah, we'll do what we can. Sir. You know, I was very really upset that the uh, Super Collider was canceled. I think that's a great uh, slap in the face to any future we have as far as... Well, the Super Collider is uh, canceled. Uh, you just heard uh, George talk about the SETI program going down the drain, and I think they're cutting back on the space station uh, bit by bit. There's got to be some reason for that that they're, that they're not telling us. Uh, I think it's just uh, pinheadedness. I mean, it's pinheadedness taking to the pinnacle. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, we are going through tough times. It, it, we do have a deficit to deal with. Uh, people don't want to pay higher taxes, but uh, this yeah, is but drop in the could, bucket stuff. So We're talking about it's so easy for the government to cut twenty million to Bosnia or something. You know, uh, I, I don't even want to get into that. I, oh, just I think know. it's important to have fundamental scientific research going on. That's the way I feel. Yeah. We, so, Art. Um, Oh, man. Uh, what was I going to say? I don't know, sir. You're, um, oh, John Lear always says that we're 30 years ahead of where we are. I firmly believe that. I'm, I'll listen off the air. Uh, I'd like George Knapp's opinion on that. All right, thank you. That uh, that we're actually at least uh, 30 years ahead scientifically of where we apparently seem to be, George. Well, uh, as I alluded to earlier in the program, John, um, John has a lot of... Uh, Opinions which I do not share, and, and I've seen no indication that that is the case. I, I'm, although, I, you, although you admit that we may possess technology that could have been shared by aliens that we don't know about, right? Sure, but I suspect that if we do have that technology, that 30 years is, is far from an accurate figure. Okay. Uh, Wild Card Line 2, good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Good evening. George, I was wondering if you ever heard of a book called Matrix 2? Yes. You have. What do you, how accurate is it, do you think? Well, again, that's uh, put together by some people here in Nevada uh, that I had some brief contact with. I, I, um, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's a it's a big book. And, it's very um, very lengthy. Yes. Uh, I I think it's like a lot of other things in the UFO field that there is uh, it's a mixture of stuff that can be supported and and stuff that's a lot of speculation. And it's important for the reader to know the difference between the two. I, it's, I can't tell you page for page what what's true and what's not because I don't know. I have access to all that information, but. Uh, well, was there a place called Paradox out in, in Nevada? Uh, not that I know of. Not you know of. And w what about the uh, various the Syrian males and Syrian females and the Orion group? Well, I, I, again, that gets a little far afield from, from what I know to be supportable. Um, it's just a, it's a, such a crazy field, and people can print what they want, and, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to prove that it is either accurate or inaccurate. And uh, a lot of folks are in this field to make money. A lot of them are into it for disinformation purposes. A lot of them just want attention. Do you and, think uh, that, buyer beware. Do you think this thing could have a lot of di that disinformation in it? I, I don't, I'm not sure I want to give it that label. I, I know that the guy who puts this stuff out, he's an interesting man who has, has uh, extensive military contacts. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. All right. Thank you, caller. And uh, good evening. Line three. Hello there. Uh, kid on line three. You're on the air with George Knapp. Okay. Um, I have a little quote here for you. Uh, there is no proof. There are no authorities, whatever. No president, academy, court of law, Congress, or Senate on this earth has the power or the knowledge to decide what will be the knowledge of tomorrow. That was Wilhelm Reich. But, uh, you were talking about um, a case of evidence for extraterrestrials. Um, I think a lot of people have to get an idea of perspective of their place in our universe uh, by sheer numbers. Uh, for example, uh, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, 
um, is a, just a couple hundred thousand light years in diameter. And um, we're in a, what they call a local group of galaxies, which is 300 million light years in diameter. Now, outside of this local group of galaxies, which is about 20 galaxies, um, it, there's a, a big void of space. But then you come across these galaxy clusters, which are clusters of the galaxies, like the Virgo cluster. That has a thousand galaxies in it. All right, you're, you're doing a call second to us. Where are you headed here? Well, where I'm heading here is this. Well, at one time, people believed that the, the Earth was flat. And there's probably a good case. You probably still prove today that the Earth was flat because uh, actually you can't actually see the evidence of the world not being flat. Yes, you can. Well, you can, but you can, you can, there's always a counter argument for the world being. Well, not one that makes sense. I mean, we have spacecraft that clearly show us the world is not flat. Yeah, that's true, but still, when you, when you think about the perspective in the shape of a sphere, and if you put it on a flat uh, screen, it looks round, but actually that's flat. But, uh, no, get, get away from that. Um, I think what happens is, is people lose, lose their perspective of our place in the universe by sheer numbers, because all we are on Earth is just a, a, it's not even the, the, the focus of the uh, solar system here, the, uh, the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy is on the suburbs of our local group, and we're, uh, our sun is in the suburbs of the Milky Way galaxy. So by sheer numbers, just, there, there has to be trillions and trillions and trillions of stars out there. Uh, so by sheer numbers alone, the evidence is overwhelming. And do you think that our, our, uh, the, the, the galactic void, do you think that there's like an area that you come to towards, say like you have all these, other uh, galaxy clusters. You think there's a, a, a finite, you know, in other words, once you step out of the realm of these galaxy clusters, and any that there's an end to, to like, the universe. All right, thank you. <laughs> that was a long trip to get there. In other words, George, uh, is there an end to it all? Sounds like a question my son asks. Oh, yeah, and, uh, and I'm sure you were as pleased to get that question as I am. I, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> well, you're the guest. You answer. To put it this way, is that uh, it's often it's the cliche you hear the most of, uh, in, in UFO circles is there's so many planets, so many galaxies, there has to be life out there, which is a good point, and it's people like that. Wildcard Line 2, you're on the air with George Knapp. Howard and uh, George. Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm right here in Las Vegas. All right, go ahead. And, uh, uh, George, I, I don't know if you still live here. I know you did in the past. And uh, I have a number of questions, but I'll limit it to one this week. Uh, uh, George, have you been on, I think it's Highway 93 on the way towards Searchlight from Vegas? And they've got this, I, I believe it's called an ELF, Extremely Low Frequency Transmitter set up antenna system that yes. uh, communicates with uh, submarines. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my question concerns this. Uh, UFO sightings, uh, light, and uh, uh, always seems to be the common denominator. Of course, you know, for visible to sight something, you, you've got to have light. Have you ever investigated or heard anything about why that ELF uh, station, you've probably seen it when it was strobing at night over, you know, like a mile long. Why? 
why those probes were there on uh, a system that's really uh, designed to communicate with submarines underwater, you know, some thousands of miles away. That's really my question. What, what's, uh, what's the light factor? Why this big stroke thing? All right. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, I know something about the ELF transmitter, George, but I didn't know anything about a, a light frequency stroke. Uh, I, I've seen them out there. In fact, I've seen something similar up to Area 51. I've got three or four videos that people have captured of, of something weird, like a strobe effect, flipping around. Some of them are white, some of them are red. I don't know the connection. I, I've had the same thought. You know, the basic question I have is why that facility is out there in the first place. It's a strange place to, to have uh, something that's, you know, keeping in contact with submarines out in the middle of the desert. But, uh, if you have some information on that, I'd like to hear it. No, there's, I know that the main ELF transmitter, I think, is up in the in the upper Midwest somewhere, isn't it? Uh, that's, that's unknown to me. Okay, yes, it is. It's miles and miles of underground uh, transmission line. Line, uh, line three, you're going to be about our last caller uh, this evening. Good evening. You're on the air with George Knapp. Well, good evening. Yes, sir. Good evening. Oh, I'm glad you're there. I tuned in a little late, and uh, I heard George talking about when he was uh, back in the Midwest, and he wanted to uh, get his bearings straight on what the local uh, opinion might be, you know, regarding their religion and everything. And I'm not here to preach or anything else, but uh, I would just think it would be a mighty dangerous thing to uh, have a world without religion. Indeed. Just something to think about. All right. Thank you. Um, I guess it would be, wouldn't it? Uh, really? I can't argue with that, and I don't think anything that we're talking about is inconsistent with religion. I think a lot of what the aliens or these visitors have communicated to uh, to abductees and others they've communicated with uh, is that they uh, their own religious beliefs are not all that consist inconsistent. With all right, George, we're out of time. Okay. We're out of time. I have no choice. I wish we could go on for hours, but we can't. You've been a wonderful guest. I'm going to have you back as a guest. I'm here. All right. All right. George, thank you. George Knapp, our guest, that's it. Area 2000 is over because there's no more time. Remember, if you have something that uh, you want to investigate it, you have comments on the show, you're welcome to make them to the Bigelow Foundation. Angela Thompson is your contact. Angela Thompson, area code 702-456-1606. Back next Sunday at about the same time. Good morning, everybody. Make that good evening. Take care. See you next week. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects. UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. On Halloween... Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. Uh, this week, George Knapp is traveling someplace or another and will not be with us. We'll catch up with George Knapp last week. Of course, we had two full hours of George last week. And by the way, that was a very, very popular program. An awful lot of people have called me about that uh, particular program, and we'll have George back on again. But this week, he's traveling. However, with a glimpse into another reality, we do have with us... Uh, from, I'm guessing, the San Francisco Bay Area this evening, Linda Howe. And so let us begin with Linda, and good evening, Linda. Hi, yes, Art, I am in San Francisco. Um, I have been uh, one of the speakers at a conference here this weekend, and with me is a colleague, Michael Lindemann, who is head of the 2020 group in California, a futurist who is interested in the, the various trends sociologically, politically, and economically of the future, and one of the subjects that he thinks plays an important role in what may be coming is the implica implication of the UFO phenomenon. And I thought it would be interesting tonight to discuss with him a question that all of us are provoked by, and that is, why would the government of the United States have a policy of silence about the UFO, UFO phenomenon for at least 50 years? 
if the alleged uh, testimonies of people in military and government are true, that we have been essentially covering up crash disks and alien bodies since the 1940s. So I would like to introduce Michael Lindemann, who has a background in theology and in psychology, and who is now uh, working on future trends to discuss this issue of a uh, policy of silence, and here is Michael Lindemann. All right. Thank you, Linda. Hello, this is Michael Lindemann. Michael, good evening. I'm Art Bell, and this is a program called Area 2000. Uh, you're with a group called the 2020, was it a foundation? 2020 group is a private research organization, Art, uh, and basically we're studying forces that shape the future. And that includes a wide variety of forces, but um, as, a, as a futurist over the last four years, I've looked a great deal at the UFO controversy and have come to the conclusion that uh, it is perhaps uh, one of the largest and certainly one of the least recognized forces that will impinge upon our future, that is causing the human future to evolve in an unexpected direction. Wow, that's quite a conclusion. Uh, no, I'm pretty firm on that. <laughs> um, what do you, okay, uh, what do you base that on? Well, uh, I, I base that on a great many things, Art, but if we go back to uh, the question that, uh, that Linda posed, uh, I think that what we see in the ongoing policy of government secrecy is a premonition that the reality of an alien presence uh, on planet Earth would have profound and largely unpredictable social consequences. Uh, I think it's the uh, recognition of that likelihood, which is probably something they've thought about since at least the early 50s, if not earlier than that, uh, that probably provokes uh, the secrecy to this day. And what they're seeing today is that they can no longer contain the secret in the way they used to. Uh, the the, the, the so-called UFO cover-up has actually evolved through several stages, and today we see basically that the containment policy of secrecy is completely breached. It's not working at all anymore. So instead we have um, a kind of a nuanced, uh, quasi-disclosure policy, which is actually very far from telling the truth, but it's a holding action. It's a, it, you might say it's a damage control operation. To um, uh, w where do you see quasi-disclosure? That was the term you used. Where, where is there that? In programs like mine, I'm speaking now of the government. Well, uh, no, I don't, yeah, I don't think your, uh, no, your program, I'm sure, is an effort to, you know, to bring forward good, strong information uh, as credibly as possible. Um, well, yes, but we are part of the disclosure... The disclosure apparatus. Ab absolutely. <laughs> so one of the things that comes up, and I think it's something that troubles many good, solid uh, uh, ufologists, uh, Linda Howe and I have discussed this, I've discussed it with other colleagues as well, is are, are, are we giving comfort to the enemy, in effect? Are we doing what they want us to do anyway? And in a certain sense, we may be. Because in a certain sense, we're... We're creating a, uh, a kind of a, a pillow for the general public to fall into. This is very alarming stuff we talk about here. Uh, it, it certainly is. So then when you say quasi-disclosure, uh, what exactly do you mean? Uh, who is disclosing some anything officially? Well, um, it's very difficult to be certain of that, but it, it, I, I consider it a matter of, of rather considerable curiosity, for example, that after 31 years of dead silence, suddenly a great many Roswell people were willing to talk. I'm not saying there's any conspiracy around that, but it's very interesting to me. No, it is true, and a lot more about Roswell is suddenly uh, coming forward. Right, and then there's the, the, the curious uh, disclosure of MJ-12. Now, MJ-12 came out of nowhere. Uh, no one has yet claimed a responsibility for it, and yet I would say the evidence is piling up that MJ-12 is actually a hoax, but it's a very important hoax, okay? I'm still open to the possibility that it's real, but frankly, it's about a 95% hoax there. And the idea that it would come forward in a way that is extremely difficult to penetrate, that no one would claim would lay claim to it, and that despite the likelihood it's a hoax, it is so carefully constructed that it has all the appearance of a genuine document, that has a signature on it of disinformation, very high level. Hmm. Someone is trying to perpetrate a conversation in our culture about this material. Someone wants to nuance or spin the public understanding of this information. And I think MJ-12 is a very good example of that. Um, any other uh, current examples that you'd cite? In other words, the pathway being prepared, that, that sort of thing? Well, uh, 
It's unclear again where or whether there's a plan. But one thing's for sure. The amount of alien imagery in our culture is skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it in all different venues. We see it in the straight press. We see it on television, all kinds of specials, both fictional and documentary. We see it to an, a mind-boggling degree in advertising. Um, there's a whole, in fact, a very strong undercurrent of abduction themes uh, in all kinds, everything from television sitcoms to advertising for all kinds of different products, whether you're talking about hamburgers, telephones, airplanes, or anything else, we're seeing these, this, this undercurrent of, of, of thematic material about abduction. This, to me, is absolutely extraordinary. I search my... I search my soul asking the question, is there any, is, is this really uh, a strong hook for selling, you know, hamburgers or Hondas? And I say to myself, I don't know about that, but I do know this. Uh, today, uh, and this is something that I show every single time I give a public talk, I, I throw up on the screen a, a cartoon. It's a Ziggy cartoon, you know, that little kind of doughboy funny guy. Sure. Okay, Ziggy is driving along the street. It's after dark. There's a billboard. And on the billboard, there is a flying saucer, very clear, a line-drawn flying saucer. And under it, uh, a couple of lines come down that look like probably what you'd say, a beam of light. And in the beam of light, five or six little stick figures kind of floating upwards, okay? Uh -huh. Well, that's a pretty clear symbol. You know what it means. <laughs> I know what it means. Underneath, it says three words. Next five miles. <laughs> now, check it out. I use that. I believe that that is a Rorschach test of our culture, okay? I believe that that is a symbolic test of a social experiment that has been wildly successful. You know why? Every single time I throw that up, I do it without a comment. I just put it on the screen. Well, of course, what happens is what you did. People crack up. And then I say to them, now check it out. Why do you get this joke? Why does this mean something? Well, because our culture has been, as you point out, inundated with this kind of material. Exactly. Now, what is the real consequence of this? The real consequence of it is that people have gotten so used to the idea that abduction is real that this extraordinarily bizarre abstraction in this cartoon doesn't phase them anymore. And that, to me, is a monumental event. What does the 2020 group do in trying to predict the future? Do you look at social trends? Um, what generally do you study whatever the subject would be, UFOs or anything else, how do you approach trying to formulate what might be the future? Well, of course, I use a wide variety of sources. Um, I use uh, research that is conducted by other people. I use news as it is reported in the straight press, both television and print. I use uh, my own uh, field work, um, and I uh, you know, have to compare notes constantly with uh, the work of other people. It's, it, it really, futurism is an inexact science, mm -hmm. and we don't predict the future. What we do is we look at trends and try to determine their strength, try to determine their direction. And we say, if we understand this trend, can we, can we project its likely outcome? So then, uh, with regard to the UFOs and all of uh, what you've been describing so far this morning, you would, you would take this then to be a very strong trend? Very strong trend. Yes. Mm. Um, do you draw any conclusions? In other words, is this preparatory work? And if so, do you draw any conclusions about when? No, I don't draw any conclusions about when. And I'll tell you why. Because as far as I can tell, there remains no political advantage at all to coming clean on this subject. I think that the uh, whole process is being pushed primarily by the alien intelligence, which remains utterly inscrutable. We have no idea what these guys are up to. We don't know who they are, where they're from, or what, they're, or what they want. But I do think that if there is an acceleration underway, and I have a sense there is, but I can't prove that, the acceleration is being driven entirely by the humans. The human side has been foot dragging as hard as ever. The problem is they're actually caught in a rock and hard place. And that's a big, huge political problem. But the hard place is that they've been lying about it for 45 years. Okay? Now, people are very tired of being reminded that the government's lying to them. It happens time and time again. I happen to think the lies that have been told about the UFO phenomenon do not, by and large, represent bad people doing something bad. I think these people were scared. I think they did what they thought they had to do. I think they formed very hard decisions around very hard information. 
I think it really freaked them out. But I also think today they're stuck with the very nasty fallout of the problem. What do you think the, the logic was uh, as they sat around deciding that this information had to be kept from the public? What train of logic do you think they used in deciding that? Uh, I believe there are at least five or six different reasons which all are kind of interlocking. <clears throat> Reason number one certainly was that in 1947, if not sooner, in fact, probably during World War II, when they had the Foo Fighters phenomenon, which was very strong, and then the ghost rockets over Scandinavia and other places right after the war, mm -hmm. so especially in 1947, just after we had uh, invented the atomic bomb, we had Joseph Stalin on the scene, we had new, uh, new technologies that just rocked the radar and so forth, I mean, we had entered a new era, and suddenly we got flying saucers literally littering the sky, but also littering the ground outside Roswell, New Mexico, and other places, and suddenly we've got a very real question. Are we being invaded from space? Militarily speaking, that was absolutely the question of the day. Sure. And military was on high alert. So, first of all, okay, here's a problem. Just defeated the worst, you know, character in history. We just invented the atomic bomb. Not on your life. <laughs> And we, if we've got aliens, is there anything we can do about them? Doesn't look like it. They're flying circles around everything we've got. Who are these guys? Where are they from? What do they want? Those three questions still bother us today, but they were really trouble with back then. So that's problem number one. we got an invasion. Can't tell the people. What can we tell them? Yep, we're being invaded from space. Can't do a thing about it. Sorry. Very bad political problem there. Yeah, I suppose. Secondly, the second reason was that they thought that even if we didn't have, uh, even if we didn't have aliens from space, that we did have was... We had a, a vast proliferation of stories of flying saucers, and they were really worried that it would cause public panic and pandemonium no matter what. And so the CIA by 1952 was recommending to President Eisenhower that they institute a policy, official policy of debunking. And the reason was not that they thought the aliens were actually a national security risk. In fact, by 1952, they had actually lowered their estimation of the risk involved in the aliens themselves because the aliens were not showing overt hostility. But they did think that public interest in the subject was a terrible problem. And so they actually said, we've got to get people to stop thinking about this. And how they did it was a, was a, uh, a combination of denial and ridicule. Now, the third reason for secrecy, without a doubt, was they really thought they might have a secret weapon on their hands here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, for example, if, if some very deep inside group knew that we had recovered alien wreckage from Roswell, I happen to think we did, many others do too, so some inside group knows about this, and they're looking at an alien spacecraft. They're looking at alien technology on board, and they think to themselves, wait a minute, isn't this what we want? Don't we want the ultimate edge? Is this the ultimate edge? Have we got something here that no one else has got, no one else can get for a thousand years? Is this it? Is this the Pandora's box? And are we going to keep that secret? You bet your life we're going to keep that secret. Sure. So so I'm saying that there are a number of reasons. We could try it out a few more, but you get the picture? I do, um, and I want to talk to you about the public panic aspect of it. Now, with uh, what's been going on in modern society, people like you talking to people like our audience, um, has the public panic aspect of it, should there be um, a revelation about all this, has that changed? Would the public still panic? Is it uh, well, in your view, that they would be told, or now or should it be kept as deep and dark as ever i think we have to try our best to be to become more open to this possibility i think the real danger is sudden revelation of something totally unexpected people don't handle that well never have all right i ask just about every researcher this and you sound like you'd be a good candidate if you had incontrovertible evidence uh, that you could go on television and uh, trot out and suddenly it would all be open, out in the open. Would you, would you, would you, would you do it? It would depend on the nature of the evidence. If the evidence were the kind that had the, had the overt appearance of something extremely hostile or extremely scary, I would be, I would have a lot of second thoughts about it, but I would want to move in the direction of revealing it as fast as possible. I would, knowing that I had the smoking gun in my hands, I would do everything in my power to bring people along fast to where they could actually grasp it at a later date. Now, if it were not very scary, very hostile kind of material, I would say, yes, let's bring it out. I would. And I think that there has been enough change, enough evolution of human 
human awareness that we could probably get away with it. But whenever it happens, it's risky. I don't see any time in the foreseeable future when it wouldn't be risky, but it becomes increasingly untenable to, to stall for more time. Risky for the American public, risky for the aliens, risky for our government that would be seen to be lying uh, for many years, or risky to all of them? Well, uh, I, I cannot speak at all for the, for the aliens' position, but I can speak to the idea that uh, uh, the, the government that has tried so hard to keep this under wraps has always perceived grave political risk in saying anything really legitimate about this. I don't think those risks are substantially changed, although I think, as I said, with the containment of, of, of the secrecy absolutely breached, there, there's a lot of effort to bring people along. The risk is that people won't handle it well or that it will precipitate unpredictable changes. This confronts so many of our basic belief structures. We don't know what alien technology will do to our science. We just don't know. We certainly don't know what revelations of alien activity on this planet are going to do to our religious structures. And I have a feeling it's going to do something pretty horrendous. Not necessarily bad, but in the, long, but in the short run it's going to look like a lot of cherished belief systems are being assaulted by something you know, uh, akin to... <laughs> well, that would produce violence. Could produce violence. Would produce violence. I'm convinced of it. I speak with people on this program every week and on related subjects on other programs. And I'm telling you right now, if Jesus Christ came back, somebody would fill him full of lead. Uh, people wouldn't already be thrown into an insane asylum. And uh, people just don't handle that kind of thing well, Michael. Uh, when you challenge their belief systems, the usual response is anger. I agree with you. I think that that right there, you put your finger on the risk. And that is why I say there is no time in the foreseeable future when we're going to be able to eliminate the risk. But we also cannot eliminate the fact that this is happening. And so what I feel we have to do is bring people along as fast as we can with the strongest, most credible, most balanced material we can find and bring them along to where there will not be a huge surprise. Because sooner or later, this is going to be in our face. We don't have a choice about that. We only, we're only stalling for time right now. Well... My guest this morning, uh, following you, Michael, is Don Berliner, who wrote uh, Crash at Corona. Huh? So it should be an opportunity to look into what seemed to begin it all and is cited today as the best evidence, I suppose, that we're being visited. Uh, do you, do, by the way, do you agree with that, with all the new uh, information coming out about... Uh, uh, the crash uh, in New Mexico is that about the best evidence? Oh, when we, when I, whenever I give a talk, I, uh, I tell my audiences that I, I feel it is basically uh, fundamentally important that they uh, pick up, you know, one or another of the major Roswell books, and there have been several good ones lately, including the one that Don and uh, Stan Friedman wrote, and just learn the basic chronology. It is the most important single case we have. I think it's also important to recognize that it's not the only case, that there are many, many other strong corroborating cases. But Roswell sets the tone in so many ways because it has so many quality witnesses. It has all of the features, all of the claims for the basic UFO phenomena are there. The technology, the recovery, the bodies, the witnesses, and the cover-up, all in one huge, beautifully packaged picture. And if we had no other case but that case, we would have enough uh, to build something pretty strong. Hmm. Fascinating. And fascinating uh, getting all this from your perspective as somebody who looks at trends and uh, toward the future. And you see all of this uh, increasing toward some, toward what, Michael? Toward, toward a revelation uh, eventually? And, and how do you picture it coming? Will somebody come out with the President of the United States trot out with a big primetime evening news address and uh, tell the American people the truth suddenly, or how do you think it might occur? Oh, as, as I think I've already tried to, to intimate. I don't really think there's any political advantage in just trotting out the truth. I think that remains. Well, the government uh, usually trots out the truth when they have to. In other words, when, when somebody else is about to reveal something or it's going to break in the Washington Post or who knows what, they try to get out ahead of it. Well... Indeed, and I think they've, as I say, in some instances, with MJ-12 as, as a striking example, they have been trotting out pieces of quasi-truth. The problem is this is a very complicated subject at best. It's highly ambiguous. They can trot out a lot of stuff that ain't true, but that looks pretty interesting. And uh, so I, 
it's going to be difficult for anyone to know precisely when they're hearing the truth. Well, that's it. Short of, say, the president announcing something, Don, I've thought about this many times. If you consider the Kennedy assassination, right, which has a million theories, just like the UFO business does, um, if, if Don Berliner or anybody else came out with yet uh, an, another, uh, you would purport it to be the truth, and you would have a film, and you would have trajectories showing how the bullet went and all the rest of it, it would be, Don, when all was said and done, still just one more theory thrown onto the pile. And even if it were the absolute truth, it would be lost in the shuffle. It could be lost in the shuffle, that is correct. Obviously, if it came from the lips of the President or the Secretary of Defense or somebody like that, it would be all kinds of additional weight. Um, but I think what we have right now is a growing national conversation with having your show, literally hundreds, maybe thousands of other venues that are cropping up around the country, and mostly in local markets, that are that are bringing out this material. Uh, we've got more credible research being put out in print and in television work than ever before, by far. And so what we see here is a sort of a building momentum of information which helps the entire situation along. I, I think I have a personal concern that... Um, that people need to be brought into this gently uh, because none of us handle this kind of surprise very well. You've made that point yourself, and, and you're absolutely right. So, again, we can't just, you know, we can't just pitch it to them and expect them to, to take it lying down. It's not going to happen that way. But bringing them along is very important. All right, uh, Don, we're wo woefully short on time here, running over, but you would make a really good guest, and I would like to suggest to Angela, uh, Angela Thompson, that she uh, she contact you at the uh, uh, from the foundation and perhaps think of you as a guest. You'd make a, a good uh, full evening guest. Well, thank you very much. I'd be very happy to do that. All right, Michael, um, we've got a scoot, and you may want to put Linda on one more time, but please uh, let's follow up on that. I'd like to have you as a guest. All right, I will. Uh, I will uh, see to it that we get that information to you. And here's Linda. All right, thank you, Michael. Linda. All right. Hi, hi, Linda. Boy, he'd make a great guest. Well, I think so, too. I've always thought that. Uh, Michael and I have had long and complex discussions for the last four years on a lot of these issues. And next uh, Sunday, I believe, um, I'm on uh, the docket for you to lob questions to me about right. some of these facts and eyewitnesses that uh, are global and are supporting the um, what we circumstantial evidence that something else is involved with our planet. And the, uh, I think this current interview that you've just done with uh, Michael Lindemann uh, underscores the difficulty that uh, the government has in getting this out and that some of us who are writing and producing television shows may in the long run be the people who are helping them tell the story that they can't tell easily. Okay, Linda, um, I will look forward to speaking with you as everybody else will. Uh, next week as a guest, and um, and I want to thank you for being here this morning and bringing Michael Lindemann. He was really uh, fascinating. Right. Well, thanks, and uh, I know that Don Berliner also has uh, deep knowledge about the Roswell incident, so uh, got speed on that interview. All right. Linda, thank you. Okay. Thanks for here, and uh, just one moment, Don Berliner. Jackie Gons Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. You're listening to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. And now Don Berliner, a staff writer uh, for the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Uh, between 1965 and 8, a member of the Executive Committee and National Board of the Fund for UFO Research since 1987. He wrote, um, or co-wrote, I guess, or wrote, uh, Crash at Corona, published by Paragon House in 1992. He is a full-time self-employed aviation and science writer since 1969, with 20 books, hundreds of magazine articles published on American and European aviation history, um, sporting aviation space, and science. 
And uh, Don Berliner comes to us from Alexandria, Virginia. So to the state of Virginia we go. Mr. Berliner, uh, good evening. Uh, good evening to you, Art. Uh, welcome to the program. I um, This is all the information that I have on you, but I, I guess you wrote Crash at Corona, correct? Yeah. Uh, Stan Friedman did the investigation, and I wrote the book. And you wrote the book. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Uh, let, let's. I guess let's begin there, if we can, Don. It is, by so many people that I've had on this program, considered to be, without a doubt, the best evidence, and there's a lot of new information coming forth now. What what would you say about it, uh, having written that book? Well, certainly the the case is the most thoroughly investigated, and it's the most thoroughly supported. More impressive witnesses who were involved in a variety of aspects of the case than in any other case, anything remotely comparable. Uh, it's not the perfect case. There is no such thing, I suppose. Uh, if we had a body or if we had a big pile of, of wreckage, uh, I guess that would make it perfect. But short of that, uh, it's as close as we have gotten so far to what we've all been chasing after for a very long time. Um, let me just uh, diverge for a moment. Uh, you heard, I'm sure, uh, Michael Lindemann. Hmm? And he works on trends and where we're headed with this whole thing. Uh, I wonder if you generally concur with uh, what what he had to say regarding the public's um, eventual knowing or knowledge of everything that's going on. Uh, in general, yeah, I agree with some parts of what he said, disagree with other parts, but uh, eventually this has to come out, uh, whether it comes out by government voluntarily releasing the information or whether the government's forced into doing it or whether it comes out as a result of some major change in alien behavior. Uh, that's anybody's guess. But uh, You are convinced the government does know and is covering all this up? Close to 100% convinced, yeah. Uh, as close as is needed to keep going in this. What's what's done it for you? Is it uh, writing the book on Corona? Oh no, it's I've been in the game for quite a while. Uh, I go back to the mid '60s with NICAP. Uh, prior to that, uh, I worked on newspapers and covered UFO stories. Uh, oh, back in the early '50s, I'm trying to. That, that's a long time. Uh, trying to get this clear in my own mind. Uh, I was involved in uh, investigating reports and tracking this, that, and the other. So it's come gradually. Okay, you've studied UFO history, particularly 1944 to 1952, I guess. How do you compare that period of time with, uh, with today or with the last few years? Oh, very, very different. Uh, in the early days the late 40s, early 50s. Most sighting reports involved daylight observations uh, where the witness or witnesses were able to produce considerable information on shape, color, detail, maneuvers, that sort of thing. Today we get by and large uh, funny lights in the night sky which are next to worthless. the subject was frequently on the front page of the paper. Uh, this is not the case anymore. Uh, in fact, sightings are, are a minor part of it anymore. Uh, the focus uh, seems to have moved toward ab- the abduction phenomenon. Yeah, oh, very definitely. Very definitely. Uh, and uh, an- another big change is that uh, there's considerable interest among scientifically trained people. Uh, in the case of abduction, uh, interest in the mental, mental health community, psychologists, psychiatrists, etc. Uh, by, by the way, uh, while we're on that subject, and I'll try and dig it out, there is a, a Associated Press report this morning on exactly that topic, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I might have done with it. I'll try and locate it, but it's out this morning showing that people who have 
seen uh, UFOs and have been tested are psychologically no more impaired than anybody else. You should say, I like to say. Uh, I'll see what I can do. Okay. Uh, but back to this idea of comparing the early days with today. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see much in the way of similarity, frankly. Uh, there was far more public interest in the subject many, many years ago. And they say it was on the, on the front pages, it was on the radio, uh, on television, when television became common. Uh, today, most of the coverage we see is unfortunately under the, the heading of entertainment. Uh, because there is not all that much breaking news on the subject. Uh, gradual trends, gradual development. But hardly any spectacular sightings that uh, produce news coverage, that warrant news coverage. And so with abductions, they're so complicated and they are so emotional and so personal that they're very difficult to cover. Uh, and so the public wasn't aware of the kind of detail that they and so, uh, All right, let's let's go backwards. You, you wrote the book, uh, Crash Corona. Um, tell me a little bit about that crash. What impresses you so much and everybody else about it? And what's what's new uh, uh, in terms of people coming forward? What impresses me is the witnesses. Uh, after all, this is how you have in, in the great majority of UFO incidents, whether they're conventional sightings or crashes and retrievals or whatever. Uh, neither you nor I was there when it happened, so all we have is the testimony of people who claim to have been there and seen something very unusual. In the case of the crash near Corona, New Mexico in 47, it's the number of witnesses, the caliber of those witnesses, the behavior of the witnesses. All right, how many were there? Witnesses? Yes. Oh, boy, I don't... <laughs> Oh, over a dozen first-hand witnesses and more than that many second-hand witnesses. Uh, claim, I've heard claims of hundreds, uh, four, five, six hundred. Uh, I, I don't believe anything of the sort. Uh, and you don't need that many. Uh, we've had that many witnesses to UFO sightings, and it really didn't make a whole lot of difference. But how, how much did the witnesses actually see when we say... Witnesses, are we talking about people who saw uh, the, the, the crash itself, saw the pieces on the ground, saw the alien bodies that some people have talked about? What kind of witness testimony are we talking about? We're talking about people who saw and handled wreckage and can describe it in detail. We're talking about people who say they were involved in SGIs, or in cleaning it up, loading it on military aircraft, uh, being uh, members of, the, of crews that flew this stuff out from Roswell Army Airfield, uh, including pilots of the, the transport airplanes, uh, people who were involved in the cover-up, uh, people who claimed to have seen uh, the remains uh, at other bases. Uh, well, that's about what we asked about, wasn't it? That's the way to well, that's why you can write a book about it. You know, stuff writing a little magazine article about it. There never has been since uh, Roswell an incident of similar seriousness, has it? There have been a lot of rumors. Uh, Lynn Stringfield from Cincinnati, Ohio, is the, the keeper of the archives of, of that sort of thing, and he's got dozens of reports from people who talk about other crashes. However, with the exception of the crash near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1965, uh, I'm not aware that any of the others has been investigated to any great extent or has been substantiated. Uh, they remain very interesting rumors. Uh, it's quite possible that if people put the same kind of effort into one of those additional cases that we put into the New Mexico business, uh, it would rate right up there with it, but it hasn't been done to my knowledge. And so this, 
this particular thing in 1947 pretty much stands alone in, in its detail and believability and strangeness. All right, how much of it, of that story of, of Roswell, do you buy? For example, do you buy the fact that there were bodies? Yeah, yeah. We, we've gotten testimony from enough people who claim to have seen them, who describe them the same way, uh, and who had reason to be where they were. The whole thing seems perfectly logical. Uh, yeah, uh, I I accept these stories. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, shoot myself if they were proven wrong, uh -huh. but uh, by and large, they, I find them acceptable. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have any idea where those bodies are? Certainly they've been preserved one way or the other. Where are they? I haven't the faintest idea. There have been lots of stories over the years of bodies being seen in storage at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Correct. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're still there, assuming they, they were there. Uh, it shouldn't be all that difficult to move them at night. And so... Um, all right. How much evidence is there that what crashed uh, in New Mexico was not some sort of secret government something or another... Uh, but, but indeed, something secret, something that uh, they then transported, but something other than alien. Well, you have to look at the possibilities, and, and that's very important. Uh, you can't just accept this because it's so darn colorful and exciting. Uh, you have to challenge the assumption that uh, aliens were involved. And so you've got to look at what, it, what else it might have been. All right, when you challenge it... Um, how well does uh, does the alien uh, theory hold up? Uh, far better than any of the others. Uh, in other words, in other words, if you just start picking away at the details that I'm sure even you chronicled uh, in Crash at Corona, and start picking away and picking away, how how many things can you dismiss from a debunker's point of view? Uh, complicated question. Uh, the alternative explanations that I'm aware of concern balloons, airplanes, and rockets. Uh, none of these things was made of materials that remotely resemble what people said was found on the sheep ranch near Corona. Uh, not a slight difference, a great difference. Plus, and there was always a possibility that some advanced aircraft or weapon of some sort uh, was made of some new type of material, but it also would have included conventional materials and parts, uh, rivets, bolts, nuts, screws, whatever. Right. Nothing of the sort has ever been reported among the wreckage that was found. All right. Was, I have also heard rumors, Don, that there is existing in private hands pieces of wreckage. Have you heard that? Oh, sure. Uh, I'd be surprised if that weren't the case. We keep trying to follow up on leads, and as yet have gotten nowhere, but uh, there are uh, lots of stories. And let's face it, it fits in with human nature. If I had been one of the GIs assigned to help clean up the sheep ranch after the crash, I certainly would have tried to pocket something. Uh, if I had been clever enough, I might have gotten away with it. And that would be somewhere today. Uh, we've heard from a number of people who have reasonable stories about seeing scraps of material long after the crash. But as yet, we haven't found any. All right, I promised you this story. This cleared the wire literally a couple of hours ago. I thought you might find it interesting along with the audience. A new study says people who think they've seen a UFO or space alien are no crazier than the rest of us. Researchers found that UFO reporters scored no worse than others on tests of psychological, health, intelligence, and fantasy proneness. Study co-author Patricia Cross of Carleton University in Ottawa says they appeared to be, quote, very normal, end quote. Cross reports the work in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology. 
The finding does not mean these people actually spotted a UFO or space alien. Cross thinks many misrepresented unfamiliar sites or experiences and were influenced by a prior belief in visits by space aliens. But she says the findings contradict the idea that these people have wild imaginations and are easily swayed into believing the unbelievable. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we're done, maybe you could fax that, uh, copy that to me. Um, yes. I would be glad to. Do I, I don't know if I have your fax number here or not. I don't think so. Okay, I'll give it to you off the air. All right. Um, uh, so, so there you are. And I must tell you, Don, and maybe you can... Maybe you can comment on this. I had my own sighting. I'm 48 years old. Never saw a thing like it in my life, Don. One night on the way home from work, um, my wife, uh, on a very lonely country road, I live about 65 miles west of Las Vegas, as we were approaching home or near home, she said, what the hell is that? And looked over my shoulder. I was driving. I said, I don't know. And I stopped the car, turned off the engine, totally quiet. You could only hear crickets uh, uh, Don, uh, a quarter of a mile away. That tells you how quiet it was. Oh, yeah. Here comes this <laughs> this gigantic, triangular, um, very dark shape about 150 feet above me, not high at all, uh, with lights on, um, uh, white lights on two sides and a strobing red light on the front of the triangle. It was uh, close enough to me, there was a moon out, that I could see it. Perfectly, I could actually make out the mass, the black mass of this thing. And it was going slowly, could not have been supported in aerodynamic flight at that speed. I would describe it as floating. Floated just almost uh, uh, directly over my car and kept going out across the valley. It was totally silent, not even the sound of rushing air, and could not have been flying as we understand flying. And uh, it was big, 100 maybe 150 feet uh, from one one edge of the triangle to the other. It was monstrous. I've never seen anything like it in my life, Don. We live close to Area 51. Uh, uh, we're just one valley over, so it might have been government uh, experimental, but I'll guarantee it's technology that I don't, I'm not aware of. Yeah, it certainly doesn't fit anything I know about the science of uh, aerodynamics, uh, but we got a lot of reports from that general area of quite peculiar flying things. Well, if it is ours, A, I'm glad we have it, very glad. B, it, it's technology that hasn't even been hinted at because this thing was large and quiet. And uh, I'm, I'm telling you, Don, um, I've, I've never seen anything like it in my life, and I don't expect to ever again, but it was quite an experience. I can imagine. And uh, my wife saw it as well. So... There you have it. We have something, or they have something. Uh, what do you know about our technology? Since you write about aviation, hmm? what do we have? <laughs> I don't know how we would make one of those, frankly. Uh, but just because I don't know doesn't mean that uh, the people in charge of making things like that don't know. Uh, after all, the most advanced airplanes that are generally known to the public are Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird spy plane, which has been retired right. and is 25, 28-year-old technology, and uh, Lockheed Stealth Fighter, uh, which has been around for quite a few years. So uh, we have to have more advanced types of aircraft. Uh, and, uh, I don't know what we've learned in the past couple of decades that uh, has been kept secret. Uh, well, is it your view that we are privy to some alien technology? I don't know. Uh, I am. I don't see any evidence of it. Uh, I will not as, go so far as to assume that this strange thing you saw was not developed by uh, one of the aerospace companies strictly on its own. Uh, They've done some pretty good work over the years. Uh, it might be the result of uh, acquired technology, but uh, without some evidence, uh, I won't uh, go that far. Well, what did, you know, if, if there was a crash at Corona, 
Uh, what did we learn from that, do you suppose? Uh, in other words, we must have had the pieces and parts and bodies and this and that, so presumably we'd try to reverse engineer or learn whatever we could learn from it. Oh, sure. And people have been looking at... They've been looking at major advances in technology whose origins are a bit misty and could have come from that. Obviously, uh, nobody's going to include on his patent application that uh, he started with a, a chunk of alien spacecraft. And so he's got to cover it up with some kind of a cute story. Uh, but you can never cover up anything completely. And so there are a number of things being looked at uh, as possibly having come out of the wreckage. Uh, relatively simple things. When you get into really high-tech stuff, you're over my head. And uh, it would take somebody with real scientific knowledge uh, to, to look at that. But consider something like Velcro. Yes. It appeared not long after the crash. Now, it's credited to a Swiss who said he was walking his dog in the woods and noticed how the burrs clung to, to his trousers and the dog's coat, and he invented Velcro. That may be true. <laughs> Darn. Uh, and it may not be true, uh, because a number of the reports of people who claim to have seen the body say that their uniforms were held together without common devices, buttons, uh, zippers, etc. Uh, it's a possibility that deserves to be looked at, and it is being looked at. Really? So, uh, so, so Velcro could actually be technology from elsewhere? Could be. Huh. Not saying it is. I don't want the listeners. I understand. I, I, I never considered that. It's uh, I don't know where the the uh, patent payments would go, but uh, maybe the aliens had bank accounts there. <laughs> uh, anyway, another possibility is the transistor. Oh yes, uh, certainly, the transistor marked uh, a, a change in our whole uh, science in our, our whole future and uh, has allowed almost all of the advances since. Oh, we'd still be playing around with radios having vacuum tubes uh, if it weren't for the transistor and, and what it led to. And there is reason to be suspicious of, of the development of the transistor. Why? Uh, semiconductor technology, why? Uh, you well, According to a history of Bell Labs, and that's where the transistor supposedly was invented, uh -huh. it appeared rather suddenly. Uh, I've seen it, seen a reference in one oh, encyclopedia of science, I forget the exact name of it, uh -huh. where they said the transistor wasn't, didn't say it was invented at Bell Labs, they said it was discovered. Well, you discover something that's already in existence. Uh, you invent something brand new. It's true. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and it, again, like Velcro, it emerged shortly after the crash. Uh, oh, I believe in December 1947, which is just a few months after the, the corona crash. So, it is true. Uh, intriguing. Uh, no proof, uh, and not very solid evidence for that matter, but enough, I think, to warrant uh, investigation. Was the, uh, and this is, I guess, a technical question. You may not be able to answer it, but it's a good one. Was semiconductor technology uh, at that point a logical leap from the place where we were, or is it, in fact, an illogical leap? I don't know. You're over my head there. It's a very good question, though. And uh, I, I don't know that you can answer the same question with regard to Velcro, but certainly with the transistor, it seems to me somebody who's familiar with the uh, technical history, and I know something about it, could tell us whether that's a logical or illogical technological leap. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, good question, and maybe a listener knows something. Perhaps so. Uh, so at, at any rate, uh, given all the evidence that you've studied and all your study, you are absolutely convinced this is real. Well, they say almost 100% convinced. 100% only when I have a piece of the thing in my hand. But uh, short of that, yeah. yeah. 
What, what about a modern uh, a piece of evidence, something a little more modern? What about all the sightings, for example, in Florida? Um, is there anything uh, of modern significance, uh, the abduction phenomenon, somebody you may have talked to um, that would be of great modern significance? What would you cite as the best current evidence? Uh, I think we have to go back to the way we looked at things during the heyday, heyday of daylight sighting. No one sighting meant that much. No one abduction case means that much. It's the great stack of them that, that means something. Uh, any one case can be discounted, I suppose. But when you've got hundreds of them, that all say approximately the same thing, then you've got something of great consequence. Is it your view that all of this uh, is benign or in some way malevolent? Uh, have you made that decision yourself yet? I haven't, no. Uh, I don't see any particular evidence of evil intent. And there again, this is something we used to talk about back in the, the great days of fighting. Uh, there were several cases of pilots, military pilots, being lost on attempted intercepts of yeah. UFOs. Uh, some people took this as proof that uh, they were bad guys. Uh, I never saw it that way. Uh, All right, Don, I'm going to ask you to, to rest, just sit down and rest for five minutes, and we'll do a newscast and come back and open the telephones and let some people talk with you. How's that? <laughs> Don Berliner is my guest. Stay right there, Don. We'll be back. You're listening to Area 2000, an occurrence on Sunday evening each, beginning at 8 o'clock, 8 till 10 o'clock each Sunday. I'm Art Bell. There's more with Don Berliner in a moment. Gons Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening. Welcome back to Area 2000. My name is Art Bell. And I want to remind all of you that uh, what you're listening to is provided by the Bigelow Foundation. And uh, that's a non-trivial matter. They're arranging for all this. They arrange for guests. They sponsor the program with a grant. And that's why we're here. If you'd like to contact the Bigelow Foundation, would like something investigated, or you'd like to make a comment on the program, contact Angela Thompson, please. She's your contact at the Bigelow Foundation. Angela Thompson, area code 702 Four five six one six zero six, and it probably wouldn't hurt just to call and thank them for doing this. That's area code seven zero two four five six one six zero six. If you enjoy the program, my guest is Don Berliner. If you have a comment or a question, here are the uh, relevant telephone numbers in the Las Vegas metropolitan area. The number is three. 8255-383-8255. Out of state, toll free. It's 1-800-338-8255. 1-800-338-8255. Then we have the wild card, direct dial lines. Let them ring until they're answered. Area code 702-385-7214. 7214. And finally, if you have never called at all, the first time caller line at area code 702 385 7213. 7213. Back to our guest now, Don Berliner. Don, are you still there? I am. Are you ready for your public? I guess so. <laughs> uh, one quick question first, Don. You've, uh, you've written uh, Crash at Corona. What might be next for you? Are you working on anything now, or do you plan another? Not working on anything in on UFOs at the moment. But my agent has some 
ideas he's trying to sell. Uh, I'm doing back to doing aviation stuff right now. I see. All right, fine. Well, it makes you uh, well qualified to comment on things that do fly. <laughs> All right, let's see what we've got on the telephone. Well, on our first time caller line, you're on the air with Don Berliner. Good evening. Hello, Art. Uh, Don, uh, my name is Mike. I'm calling from San Luis Obispo, California. And uh, I uh, am kind of playing catch up with a lot of the evidence that's coming out. I've been reading uh, since my own uh, lost time experiences and uh, sightings. And I'd like to ask Don a uh, kind of a critical question. Um, and I'll just ask my question and then let you answer on the air. Okay. Uh, First, uh, is the evidence uh, that you know of substantial enough to suggest that the events described in Whitley Strober's communion or other books are real uh, in the common sense? And what are the scientific theories that make this possible? And uh, could you just comment on the round room experience? All right, let's see what we can do with all that. Okay, uh, as far as... The legitimacy of Whitley Strieber's experiences as described primarily in his first book, Communion. Uh, they fit in pretty well with what hundreds and hundreds of other people have described. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I would assume that uh, this probably did happen to him. Now, most of his writings on the subject are wrapped up in his own philosophy, his own attempts to explain what was going on, and that's strictly Whitley. Uh, but his descriptions of his experiences fit in very neatly with other people's descriptions of their experiences. So either they're all genuine or they're all something else. And so uh, uh, I tend to, uh, to think that he probably experienced uh, what he described, and of course he's far more capable of describing things than the great majority of people. Hmm. Uh, he asked about theories that validate it. Well, I don't think there are any. I think uh, all this stuff is outside our theories, our scientific theories, and that's one of the puzzling and one of the fascinating as aspects of it. This is something very, very new and different. All right, and finally, what in the world is the round room? I've never heard of that. At least two of us. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't know what that is. All right, uh, very good. Line one, good evening. Uh, you're on the air with Don Berliner. Hi, this is Mike in Las Vegas. Hi, Mike. And uh, I'd like to ask you, Art, when you'll be having your guest uh, back on who spoke about the Philadelphia experiment. And secondly, I'd like to ask Don if anyone has ever reported encountering female aliens. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll answer the first question. Al Bielek will be back on. I don't yet know when. Uh, I had him on uh, my syndicated program uh, in the early morning some time ago, and we'll have him on again. Uh, your turn, Don. Uh, female aliens. I'm losing my mind. Uh, female aliens. Have female you aliens, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a few reports of female aliens. Some of the reports indicate that the witness didn't know why he or she considered them female, but was convinced they were female. Uh, but uh, in some cases, they were female-shaped. Uh, other cases, uh, it wasn't clear why they seemed to be female. But uh, that certainly is part of it. Would it be your view, Don, that there are aliens on Earth now? Some people suggest that. Uh, I've never seen any. Uh, you mean this, this idea that they're living among us? And That's right. I guess, That's right. Mm -hmm. How in the world do you tell? Uh, I mean, I've had some odd know. neighbors. <laughs> but, uh, uh, if they were clever enough, we would never be aware of it. And so uh, I think it's a, a very tough question to deal with. Uh, I assume that they are continuing their abduction activities, which means there are probably a number of groups of them uh, landed in various farmers' fields around the country right now. But uh, as far as aliens who look exactly like people, uh -huh. 
uh, you, you've uh, right there. You've eliminated any mechanism for uh, detecting them. That's a very good point. Um, well, good evening. It would have been good evening. Let's see. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner in Las Vegas. Where are you, please? I'm calling from Oceanside, California. Oceanside, yes, sir. Uh, hi, Mr. Berliner. Hi, hi Art. Uh, say, uh, for the most part, whenever I hear people talking about uh, uh, things dealing with uh, aliens and visits from outer space, uh, it's always... When will the uh, government release the information, or how is the government going to do it, uh, and things like that. Uh, how about the possibility of uh, an alien spacecraft just plane coming out of the sky and, and uh, exposing themselves to the, uh, you know, some great uh, set, uh, population center? Coming down at, say, the White House, something like that. Or anywhere. You know, instead of always waiting for the government to... Uh, uh, reveal some uh, uh, knowledge about uh, you know spacecraft. Well, since we don't have any way of encouraging aliens to do that, and it's obviously very much up to them, uh, we just got to sit back and wait for something to happen. Well, it sort of sounds when uh, you know, for the most part, people seem to think that the government is controlling uh, uh, alien access to uh, Earth. No. no, I think that. People feel the government is controlling access to government-held information, but uh, not. To, I don't think the government has a whole lot of control over the aliens. Yeah, I don't well, see evidence of it. So, uh, uh, what do you think of the possibility of, uh, uh, say, instead of relying on the government, what do you think of the possibility of uh, a spacecraft one day? Uh, all right, caller, it's a good question. Let me rephrase it for Don and listen on the air, please, um, Don. Let's try it from this point of view. What do you think might happen if an alien spacecraft actually did come down and just hang above a city where it was obvious, nobody could deny it, everybody covered it, CNN rushed over, there it is, an alien spacecraft. How do you think that our society, the world, would react? Oh, boy. <laughs> By asking that question, you're giving me far more credit than I deserve. Uh, I think some people would insist that it wasn't happening. I think some people would panic, and I think other people uh, would find it a very interesting event, and if it did not appear to be directly threatening to them, probably wouldn't bother the majority of people. <laughs> uh, people become blasé pretty quickly. Uh, well, they do, but I, I think that story would run for a while. Actually, uh, Don, it would be, I suppose, the story uh, of all time, wouldn't it? Uh, well, it depends. If the whole story were that this huge craft hovered over Los Angeles for an hour and let itself be televised, etc., and then flew away, then the implications wouldn't be all that great. Mm. However, it landed on second base during the third game of the World Series, and a bunch of hideous-looking creatures got out. We've got a problem. Well, unless people thought they were playing for the Phillies. Uh, <laughs> but it could be very, very frightening. And so it all depends on what happens, uh, not the mere fact that something significant happens. And so uh, it, the reaction could range all the way from, from near boredom after the first few minutes to utter terror. Utter terror. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, line two, good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner. Don, yeah. the alien tunneling in the earth, do you know or do you have anything? Oh, that, that is a good question. Yes, a lot of people have talked, uh, Don, about alien tunneling and uh, that there are mazes of tunnels that run underground, in some cases from one state to another. What have you heard about that? Nothing uh, that impressed me. Uh, I'd like to see some evidence of it. You know, there are lots of theories, but any theory that isn't backed up by something doesn't carry a whole lot of weight. And so I don't know who these theories come from and if there is anything to support the theory. Yep. I'm not aware of anything. Right, and everybody always wants to know where is all the dirt gone that was taken from these tunnels and all the rest of it. Uh, so you don't, you, that's not one of, one of the things you lead, give a lot of credence to. 
Not at all. All right. Wild card line three, you're on the air with Don Berliner in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from uh, Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, all right. Yes. And um, I have an interesting story about um, sighted aircraft. My great-great-grandfather lived in Healdsburg, California, and he sighted an airship in 1897, and they didn't know what to really call it or how to explain it. And he was afraid to report it to the uh, authorities or newspaper because he was afraid he'd be uh, accused of inventing the machine, and it emitted a very bright light, uh, such as an arc lamp, and it was sighted in San Francisco around the Cal Palace and up and down the west coast, you know, the Pacific coast. And uh, When was this, actually? 1897. Us? And it was reported... I don't have it with me right now. It's in, in my home in Yuba City. I'm Nancy from Yuba City. <laughs> Remember that? Yes, Nancy. The worst place in the whole U.S. to live, Yuba City, is what they say. Anyway... <laughs> um, they, 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 it was uh, sighted at night. I don't know that it was a, a balloon. I don't know why people would be flying a hot air balloon at night. Uh, it was uh, in the newspaper, the Healdsburg Hill Tribune. And I think it was around November and December, those months that they sighted it. And they uh, explained that it preambulated to the sky. Hmm. <laughs> It's really... Don, what... Um, all right, let me take it from there, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, Don, what about UFO um, studies prior to the, the mid-40s? Uh, as you go on back, incidents like the ones, uh, the one that she just described or others, is there a lot of history prior to the mid-40s? Oh, sure. In fact, the first recognized wave of sightings was exactly what Nancy was talking about. There were reports from coast to coast of what became known as the 1897 airships. Hmm. Uh, not all that much similarity to modern UFOs or flying saucers, except that they were just as mysterious. They, a lot of the reports were obviously phony, uh, created by unscrupulous newspaper reporters, but... Uh, uh, it appears that there was also something substantial going on that could not be explained by existing lighter-than-aircraft. There is, is almost no lighter-than-aircraft right. flown in this country. Is, is there enough evidence, in your opinion, to suggest that the UFO phenomenon, as we understand it, has been going on nearly forever, as long as we've been recording events? Or, Well, uh, I, I, I won't go that far. Uh, you go much more than a hundred years back and it's really hard to tell because uh, the reports are very vague hardly any specific bits of information you obviously can't go back and re-interview the witnesses, they're all dead uh, language has changed uh, but there were reports of very peculiar things in the sky uh, 100, 150 years ago before that uh, it gets awfully murky, and uh, it's intriguing, it makes good reading, but it's of no particular scientific value. But certainly starting with the 1897 airship wave, which was from coast to coast, uh, something was going on, uh, something as yet unexplained. An intriguing area of study. Oh yeah, intriguing. It's uh, but of course uh, no uh, uh, no video cameras uh, back then, and uh, much less evidence. So it's difficult, but nevertheless an intriguing area. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Don Berliner. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Uh, this is Bob from Las Vegas. Hi, Bob. And um, uh, I enjoyed uh, the book uh, written by uh, Stanton uh, Friedman and Don Berliner. I thought it was quite well done. Thank you. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the uh, resolution of the question of the main, of where the main crash site is, uh, whether it's uh, somewhere between Corona uh, or, or in the vicinity of Corona or whether it's uh, in the plains of San Augustine, with the credibility of one of the characters in the book, uh, Gerald Anderson, being questioned by uh, several writers 
I'm, I'm also wondering whether there's uh, a disagreement now between you and Stan about uh, uh, adhering to the plains of San Augustine as the main crash site. No, we never considered it the main crash site. Uh, the way we express it in the book and the way we still see it is there probably were two crashes, separate crashes. Mm -hmm. uh, the great amount of evidence and testimony is for the crash in Corona, near Corona, to the east, in the eastern part of New Mexico. The crash in the plains of San Augustine, which is in western New Mexico, uh, the main witness, the main eyewitness, uh, is no longer considered reliable. That's Gerald Anderson. Wasn't there uh, another witness? Uh, yes, that you yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, enough other evidence to make us feel there was a crash there. <clears throat> just that uh, we cannot rely on, on the details provided by Anderson. And so uh, the primary crash, as far as reliability and, and witnesses and such are concerned, uh, is the crash uh, near Corona. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're still looking for more witnesses to the San Augustine crash, but it does appear that there was one. And they probably happened at about the same time and probably were related in some way, whether it was a mid-air collision or what, we don't know. Hmm. But uh, the more substantial event was the one near Corona. I see. Uh, were you able to um, uh, come to any uh, satisfactory conclusion about uh, how or why uh, Mr. Anderson uh, uh, may have uh, given false information, if in fact he did? No, no, you, you never pin those things down, unfortunately. Uh, it's not that we think that none of his information is good, but because of his subsequent behavior, we just can't rely on it. I don't know whether the audience is familiar with that. You may wish to comment on that. Well, uh, Gerald Anderson claimed to have been with a group of relatives when they stumbled across a, an intact craft and three bodies and one live one about 150 miles west of the crash site near Corona at about the same time, early July of 47. And he went into great detail describing the bodies and the behavior of the live one and the, uh, the craft and the damage to it and what it looked like uh, in the damaged area and on and on and on and how the, when the military arrived and what they did. And uh, he may well have been there, but uh, he has done and said some things that bother us. And so uh, I have written a, a special preface to the paperback edition, which may or may not be published now, uh, in which we uh, state this clearly, that uh, we unfortunately can't rely on him anymore. And that's life. This, this does happen. Uh, you never can pin down a single witness. You can never prove that a witness is telling the truth. And so you have to go on your best instincts, and in this case, we were wrong. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, caller. Uh, Don, if I were in the disinformation business, or I wanted to quiet all this down, I think what I would do is I would create, create a very believable UFO incident, something that uh, really seemed solid, and then a little time later, I think I would prove that it was a complete fraud, and most of the public, in their minds anyway, would suddenly go, ah, yeah, see, nothing, nothing to it really. I mean, it would be, it would really be a service to the disinformation folks. Yeah, but it could also be very difficult to prove that it was a fraud. Uh, this is certainly the case with the main MJ-12 document, the Eisenhower briefing paper. Uh, no one has ever proven that it's a hoax, even though a lot of people assume this. Uh, but uh, what is your view? Uh, that it's almost certainly genuine. Uh, it may have been jimmied up. Uh, there may be have been some cutting and pasting involved. Uh, it's certainly incomplete. But uh, either it's genuine or it is so close to the real thing that you could hardly tell the two of them apart. Because it makes sense. It fits what reasonably would have been done. 
And uh, there's no way to prove, at this stage of the game at least, that it's doing, because the few people who would know are not going to talk. Uh, and so far, no one's proven that it's, uh, that it's a hoax. All right. Wild Card Line 3, you're on the air with Don Berliner in Las Vegas. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm going to take this answer off the air. Uh, I uh, heard an interview out of Denver uh, with a uh, forensic investigator, and uh, he said that microscopic examination of the physical scars inflicted on the abductees appear the same geometric exam, uh, uh, geometric design as the crop circles. And two, he cautioned that uh, aliens conduct deliberate misinformation, nothing they say can be trusted, and they wish to discredit all the reports. Now, this fellow, if you know him, uh, was a Mr. Daryl Sims. And uh, uh, just tell me if you know him, then I'll hang up. I don't know him, and I have great okay. question about what he's saying. He says oh. aliens are conducting disinformation. Well, when they, How does he know? This, when they answer, he was one for one, and he's got about 200 people that he's working with, and he's an anesthesiologist, uh, hypnotherapist, or whatever. He's got a mouthful, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, and uh, he's doing a lot with them, and uh, if they ask, people ask questions, say, what are you doing with this, and so on. And oh, well. he can't believe anything they say. Yeah, I'll, I'll go along with that. The the answers that people get are generally nonsense. Totally, yeah. Okay. But whether that's disinformation or not, we have no way of knowing because we don't know how aliens think. All right, ma'am, we're going to have to scoop. Where are you? And the geometric design. Okay. Uh, well, I haven't heard about it. But uh, there's such a wide variety of designs and crop formations that you could find something just about anywhere to, to match one of them. Crop formation. That's a good question. Uh, Don, hang on just one second while I ID the station here. Uh, Don Berliner is my guest. This is Area 2000. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Sunday night and Area 2000. Good evening. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Don Berliner. But from uh, Alexandria, Virginia, he is an aviation science writer. The subject this morning is UFOs. Back to Don Berliner. Don, are you still there? I am. Good. Uh, what about crop circles, Don? Um, uh, Linda Howe and others are looking into both crop circles and animal mutilations. Does all of this in your mind figure into the rest of the phenomenon? I don't see any connection yet between crop circles and UFOs. Well, there are frequent sightings of UFOs in the area of crop circles. Uh, but not very good sightings and, and pretty vague reports, actually. And, of course, there are sightings lots of places where they don't have crop circles. But, uh, I, as I say, I don't see a connection. There, there, there could be coincidence. All right. However, I, I consider the crop formations, since they are much more than circles, to be uh, an independent mystery at this stage. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Certainly not all hoaxes. Uh, right. But what's going on uh, is anybody's guess. Uh, if it's a form of communication, it's a pretty terrible one because nothing's been communicated. Uh, but uh, it, it's very, very intriguing. And All right, what about the animal mutilations? They seem to kind of go together, and uh, they are very specific, Don. There are cuts made with high heat instruments. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, very precise cuts, organs removed, incredible things. We can see no other explanation. Uh, uh, Linda is the expert on that. I'm not. But, again, I don't see much of a problem with UFOs. Again, there have been sightings in the same general area, but not very good sightings, and not sightings that have produced much information, and so uh, until there's better evidence, I, I, will, I can't say that there is a connection, but it's, again, it's a, a fascinating mystery unto itself. It is, indeed. Uh, line three, good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner. Uh, good evening. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know any aliens, but since the 60s, I've seen a lot, an awful lot of strange people that act in strange ways that I would prefer to believe that they're 
aliens and that the human race has uh, uh, degenerated to that point. And I think you're reaching. I think we are degenerating, but I don't know that I'd blame it on the aliens. But you asked a question before about the uh, uh, the uh, research and the uh, discovery of uh, semiconductors. Yes. That was done through hard research. They researched many materials before they came upon the uh, uh, crystal, uh, silica crystal, uh, which uh, has a particular uh, atomic structure which has four holes in it positives and negatives. All right, well, you're suggesting then that the leap to semiconductor technology was logical and well-researched. No, it was uh, come about exactly like Edison came about through much experimentation. Uh, as to uh, transistors, the first I knew of transistors was in 1947 when my cousin, who never finished high school, as a matter of fact, he never attended high school, but he's uh -huh. some sort of an electrical genius, and he built a radio that worked underground in the subway in New York, and he used transistors, which came from Japan at the time. All right. Do you do you have a question for Mr. Berliner? Uh, no, I just really wanted to pull you in on that uh, uh, semiconductor information. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it, and that does help. Uh, I guess maybe it was uh, a logical uh, progression. Well, there there is considerable reason to suspect the origins of the transistor. Why, uh, Don? Give us a little, a few of those. Well, if you would. <laughs> some off-the-record comments by people in the intelligence community, for instance. Oh. Uh, who say that's one of the things that uh, came out of the out of uh, a crash. Uh, you can't go into court with information like that, obviously, but uh, it keeps you investigating. Hmm. So. Uh, um. That brings up another question, Don. Uh, if the government is keeping all of this secret, then surely uh, a lot of uh, government intelligence people don't know about this because other guests that I've had on the program say they give lectures and inevitably some people from the government, even the CIA, will show up for the lectures as interested as anybody else. Sure. Well, highly classified stuff is handled on a need-to-know basis. Uh, there's something like 700,000 people in this country cleared for top secret. You don't tell every one of them everything. Uh, when you're dealing with very sensitive stuff, you limit it to people who need the information in order to do their jobs. It's what's called compartmented information. And so just because some CIA people or some Air Force intelligence people are not in on this doesn't mean that it's not there. And even if they are in on it, they wouldn't be able to say so. <laughs> right, but presumably they wouldn't attend a, a lecture of that sort because they would already know the real stuff. Or well, maybe they want to find out what uh, the private community has learned recently. That's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Good evening on the first time caller line. You're on the air in Las Vegas with Don Berliner. Good evening, Art. Good evening, Don. Hi. Hi. Where are you, sir? I'm right here in Las Vegas. All right. I have a... Uh, a series of two questions here. My first question has uh, two parts. And in contact with aliens, whether it be through uh, direct contact in a civilized or peaceful manner, could this possibly be considered a reference? And uh, second, the second part of that question, in contact with aliens in a uh, traumatic or frightening experience, such as uh, an abduction or a possible biological testing, could they be considered our enemies? And the second question, uh, do all supposed aliens in all uh, documented uh, cases, or uh, reported cases for that matter, look like the traditional big head, big eyes, uh, human-like body, or are there other types uh, that are out there? All right. Those are a couple of good questions. Um, uh, on the matter of their being friends or enemies, uh, they seem to control contact or meetings or communication. Uh, and the feeling that abductees come away with is that they're neither friends nor enemies. They, they treat humans like laboratory animals. Uh, they have no apparent feeling toward them one way or the other. Mm. They're using them for something and uh, sending them back where they came from. Uh, so I don't know that you could call them friends or enemies. Uh, as far as the types, the most common type is a little big-headed gray fellers, but there are other types described. Uh, 
frequently. Uh, some that look pretty much like humans. Some that are kind of halfway between the human types and, and the little gray guys. And occasionally something else, some really weird ones. So uh, what this means, we don't know. They could all come from the same place. They could come from different places. They could all actually be the same. Uh, but the, the witnesses who are certainly not clear of mind when all this is going on could just get odd impressions. Uh, we're dealing with uh, fuzzy information, unfortunately. Huh. Uh, okay, uh, let's see where to uh, here, I guess. Good evening. You're on the air uh, with Don Berliner. Where are you calling from? Uh, Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta. California? Yes. Uh, it's a mighty high place. Uh, it's not as grand as that face on Mars. Uh, what could you say about that, sir? All right, thank you. Uh, the face on Mars, uh, Mr. Berliner, a lot of uh, talk about that. Uh, the NASA... A uh, space probe, as you know, lost. A lot of people suspicious. What do you have to say? Well, the pictures that were sent back years ago are certainly interesting. Uh, Not to NASA, though. They seem to want to try to avoid investigating it further. Well, I think uh, they're afraid of being uh, laughed at, just like most UFO witnesses and most abductees. They're afraid of public negative public reaction. Uh, and, of course, we don't really know what's going on in uh, closed-door meetings at NASA. Uh, but as I say, the, the initial photographs were very intriguing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite unfortunate that the, uh, the Mars Observer uh, quit working. Unfortunate, uh, so then you, you do attribute it to uh, a uh, technical malfunction? Uh, I have no reason not to, and... and Certainly this sort of thing has happened before. Uh, in fact, it, it's becoming uh, frighteningly common right now. Uh, I don't know whether NASA is making a, a plea for more funding or, or they're showing the, the effects of uh, less funding than perhaps they should have gotten. <laughs> but uh, until I have some reason to think that uh, something, there's some monkey business going on, I'm not going to jump to that conclusion. All right. Wildcard Line 3, good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner. Yes, sir. How you doing? Fine. Where are you, sir? Here in Las Vegas. All right. Go ahead. I had two questions. Uh, uh, in the world, there's only two places, or actually two cultures, that uh, created pyramids, the, Egypt the Egyptians and the Aztec Indians out of Mexico. How about Steve Wynn? Oh, Steve Wynn now. <laughs> or rather, the Luxor guy. Yeah, the Luxor guy, right. I'm sorry. And, uh, well, my question would be, uh, supposedly it's been reported that inside the pyramids, especially in Egypt, that there are paintings on the walls or many paintings on the walls of alien spacecraft, little guys coming out and, uh, and, and supposedly communicating with the Egyptians. And my question, I guess, would be, uh, at the time that the Egyptians were supposed, supposedly the most techno technologically advanced uh, culture on the Earth at that time, and I guess I kind of wonder, did that possibly, if that happened, play a part in our uh, traditional technology that we have today. All right. Thank you. Um, the ancient astronauts, I guess. Yeah. Well, again, some very interesting information, uh, some questions that need to be answered, but I think there's been far too great a tendency to jump to conclusions. Uh, the, the works of Eric von Daniken exposed a lot of information that unfortunately were analyzed by the author in a, in a highly unscientific way uh, and so uh, the uh, the questions remain uh, I don't know anything about paintings inside the pyramids of Egypt that's uh, something new to me but uh, there are ancient wall paintings and caves and that sort of thing that can be interpreted as uh, spacecraft and, and aliens and whatnot we have uh, in this area, Don, an area called the Valley of Fire, which I've been to, and there are some uh, drawings on the, on the side of uh, some rock canyon areas there that really do look like, I mean, we're talking about stick people here with what appear to be helmets and all the rest of it. Um, and if, if you were depressed to say what they were, it's a man in a helmet. 
Oh, yeah, there are a lot of things like that that look very much like uh, they could have been ancient man's interpretation of uh, some strange things he'd seen. But uh, how do you check it out? That's the problem. It sure is. No way to get additional information. <laughs> and there is insufficient information contained in these paintings. And so we're stuck, we're stuck. Uh, until somebody comes up with something new. All right. <laughs> Line three, you're on the air in Las Vegas with Don Berliner. Good evening. Uh, hi, I'm in Las Vegas. Yes, sir. Uh, in, in Revelation, it says that the, whenever the false prophet and the Antichrist get together, that they cause fire to flame down from heaven. And by this means, they'll deceive many. Uh, that kind of tells me that they're going to have the ability to maybe have laser beams burn up part of a city or something at will. Uh, but I, I'm looking for deception. And uh, it's not going to, uh, you know, interfere with my faith no matter what they do. And I just was uh, one your opinion on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I won't get into religious matters. Uh, they're too too sticky, and so uh, well people are welcome to interpret religious writings as they wish. <laughs> Don, uh, would it be your view? A lot of people uh, suggest that the aliens, in effect, are our creators. Would you lean toward that view? No, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, but again, where's the evidence of it? Uh, they don't look all that much like us. Uh, and, uh, there are general similarities, yeah. Uh, well, a body, a body. Two uh, arms, two legs, yeah, a head exactly. on top. Exactly. But, uh, there are some major differences, certainly. And so, uh, it's an intriguing possibility. Uh, a lot of people suggest the aliens are here for some sort of genetic uh, renewal or experiment or something that we can, in effect, do something for them or have something they need. Well, certainly the stories we get from abductees point to a great interest on the part of the aliens in the human reproductive process, but interpreting this is pretty tough. Uh, we don't know why they're doing it. Uh, we don't know if the reasons they give are the truth because we've seen enough evidence of them giving ridiculous explanations and obviously incorrect explanations for things. You are to be applauded for not leaping with so many of the rest to conclusions about all this, Don. And, and well, I'll say it. Done that. Uh, in my three or four years working full-time for NICAP back in the 60s, I saw an awful lot of people lose their effectiveness by jumping to conclusions and then losing sight of the difference between theory and fact. Precisely. Um, Wild Card Line 3, good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner. Uh, yes, this is uh, Leota from Tempe, Arizona. Tempe, Arizona. Hi there. Uh, hi. This is mainly a sort of a confirmation for the sighting that you saw. A group uh, called uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrials went down to Mexico. Uh, the first part of February this year. And they were out in the desert about 11.45. They saw this light. They uh, signaled it, and it came closer. And it was your triangle. Try my triangle. Uh-huh. Uh, Don, it's a, it's a strange thing. I had never heard. Oh, to me, they were always saucers or oblong or cigar-shaped. And I'd never heard of a triangle, and then I saw a triangle, and I've received nothing but reports of triangle sightings ever since. It's incredible. Well, a lot of the UFOs seen in Russia a couple of years ago and chased by Soviet, then-Soviet Air Force fighters were described as triangular. So it, it's not that rare, but it's, <laughs> over the years they haven't been common. Uh, it's like buying a new car and then seeing uh, others just like it everywhere. Uh, everybody bought the same thing. Same phenomenon, yes. Uh, anything well, else, ma'am? Hey, ma'am, anything else? No, I just wanted you to know you're not alone. They, uh, this thing was 300 <laughs> feet across. Oh, boy. And when it turned, it, uh, this uh, straight part, uh, you know, the triangle part, there was a bank of lights that went on. Huh. All right, thanks for the report. Bye-bye. Um, all right, bye. 
That's another report. Uh, they're just they're constant, uh, Don. Oh, yeah. These reports just keep coming. And as you have suggested, the number of reports, even if you dismiss some percentage of them, uh, is uh, is very strong evidence when taken in total. Yeah, and especially when you face up to the fact that the great majority of sightings are never reported. We're just getting a, a few percent of the total. I would imagine that percent is slowly rising as acceptance of it all uh, seems greater. Wouldn't you imagine? I don't know that acceptance is any greater. Uh, Gallup polls over the years have shown up roughly about the same percentage of acceptance. Uh, but I, I think people are simply afraid of ridicule. And whether there is ridicule there or not doesn't matter. If they're afraid of it, that's what counts. And now, uh, with no well-known private organizations in the field and no admitted government interest, people don't know how to report sighting. Right. All right, Don, let's keep moving. A lot of people want to talk to you. Uh, good evening uh, on the first time caller line. You're on the air with Don Berliner. Uh, good evening, Don and Art. Hi. You're hard to hear, sir, so you have to... I said good evening, Don and Art. Yes, good evening. Uh, you're a little hard to hear, but go ahead. Okay. What my question is, uh, what what do you believe is the method of attaching equipment or joining material on these ships, since there are no nuts or bolts? That's one question. That's a good one, too. And I said, um, the other one is, uh, what does the government do when they have a new design of an aircraft? The first thing they do along with it. You should know that. You're an aircraft man. And, and if you can't answer that, I'll tell you what it is. Okay. As far, uh, yeah, pardon? As far as joining parts together, uh, I have no idea. The descriptions I've gotten from people who say they handled wreckage suggest that it would be very difficult for us to try to, to make anything out of that kind of material. Uh, no way to drill holes in it, to put rivets through it. Uh, Maybe there's uh, some way to chemically bond it. I don't know. But uh, I've never heard anything about how parts were joined together. Uh, I don't, Don, I don't want to hold any other yeah. colors up, but I'll give you a hint. Yeah, how about uh, optically? I don't know how that would work. It works. Good. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the other question I had is, on, uh, when, if the government builds a, a new aircraft, what happens? They build a similar over on the side of it, right? Uh, frequently. Okay. No, most, most any time when they're building new aircraft. The other question, the other item is that, uh, why aren't you investigators checking on, checking what I have in my own boat? Investigators are still the same way to check it. Yeah, yeah. I think nobody would break that up before. That's it. Yeah, thank you, uh, very much. Uh, John, is that how you classify yourself, by the way? Are you an investigator? Uh, not primarily. I'm a writer uh, and reporter. Uh, I've done some investigating, but uh, I say in the case of the book, uh, Stan Friedman did a great bulk of the investigating, uh, and uh, no, I, I would not describe myself that way. All right. Uh, let's see. Line three. Good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner. Yes, good evening, Art. Hello. Good evening. I just have two uh, questions, and, I, and it's hard to answer it. Uh, first of all, I think, just very briefly, I think uh, this is from Vegas, Las Vegas, obviously, north Las Vegas. But anyway, I think that the uh, UFOs are real, and I think we have been genetically uh, sort of inbreded, dreaded, maybe thousands of years ago, and I don't think that we would be so speeded up in our technology. That's my thought for there. But I want to ask two questions, and I'll let you answer that on the, on the air. Uh, one. We haven't gone back to the moon. They tell us it's too expensive. Now, I've asked this before, but I don't know. We have a big rock out there, and I was wondering, number one, uh, are there some bases, maybe, or some type of alien activity on the moon? And number two, for years, people have, who have seen a UFO, supposedly, they have a blackout, you know, naturally. Like, they see a light, and then they don't, don't remember an hour or two. They're put under hypnosis. Policemen, uh, people that don't have a, maybe emotional instability, and then they, they, they have seen definitely something being examined, you know, and, and, and ugly-looking humanoid type of people. And maybe it's shock, but there's, there's so, so much similarities. I'd like to know what you think of that and the moon question, and uh, let's keep up space research. Thank you. All right, thank you for the call. Okay, as far as the moon is concerned, uh, 
NASA is having enough trouble getting money for its existing programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have plans to go back to the moon. They have plans uh, for permanent installations on the moon to do research. But uh, the big problem is uh, the cost right now. And so Congress is not in the mood for funding elaborate scientific efforts. Uh, they killed the, the superconducting super collider the other day. And so uh, I don't think there's anything uh, more than uh, economic problems to blame there. As far as other bases on the moon, I am not aware of any evidence of this. Uh, the second question was what? I didn't write it down. Uh, I'm, let's see. I, I guess it was just a, I heard the question about science. I may have missed the last question myself, Don. I'm sorry. We're both getting old. Yeah, we're getting old, that's for sure. Uh, good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Don Berliner. Okay, I have two quick questions, and I'll listen on the radio. All right. Um, what, are you the author of the Bermuda Triangle book? I am not. Is that Burr on her, I guess? Or? No, no, no. <laughs> That's Berlitz. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I screwed that one up all together. Okay, second question. We're all getting old. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, earlier, Al Bielik was mentioned, and I wondered if you had done any research or writing about the Philadelphia experiment. I just understood that you said you, you don't, you're not really a researcher, but I wondered what you knew about that. I've, I've never looked into it because I have enough to do just keeping track of all this UFO stuff. Okay, well, I'm sorry about that other question. Oh, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much for the call. Line one, you're on the air with Don Berliner. Uh, good evening. Hi, Art. How you doing? Fine. It's been a question that I've been saving for you, and now um, I'm going to let it loose. Uh... We live very close to Groom Lake, and it's where you live, it's close to the top boat. And uh, if you look out tonight, when you, when you walk your show, look out, and there's a ring around the moon, and those clouds are up pretty high, and there's a beam of light from the Lexer. And also, you must also think that the best way to hide something is in plain sight. I have very been mulling this over, that the light from that Luxor, that whatever candle power it is, I know it's enormous. A signal, sir? Yes. What's a Luxor? The, <laughs> the Luxor is probably the uh, the largest pyramid uh, outside of Egypt, or maybe the largest period, period that's just been built here in Las Vegas. Uh, it is a new hotel casino. It's pre- oh, it's pretty odd, Don. I'll tell you. It's well, I'll tell you, Art. There's a and there's a light that comes right out of the very top of it, uh, Don. A brilliant light um, that goes right up to the clouds. Can you see that in Pahrump, Art? Uh, y- well, barely. Yes, you can see it depending on the conditions. Right. So you think they're hiding uh, uh, some s- something in plain sight? I think I I think so. All right. Well, Don can obviously not have a comment on that. What do you think, Art? Mine is, who the hell knows? <laughs> yeah. You're just like me, but um, come on, it's, who knows, huh? That's it, thank you. Uh, so that echoes your comments, Don. Who knows uh, about these things? Uh, we're very short on time. Good evening. You're on the air with Don Berliner in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? Hello there. No, you're not. They missed it. Line two, you're on the air with Don Berliner. Good evening. Oh. Hello. Oh. Yes, you're on the air, sir. I'm trying to investigate something concerning the uh, uh, caverns in the Grand Canyon that were written about by Smithsonian and the Phoenix Gazette. Have you ever heard of anything with, connected to the Egyptians with that? All right. We're way out of time here, Don. Any, any and way out of our territory. Yeah. So, obviously, then, no comments. I don't know anything about it. All right, uh, Don, it has been a very good interview, um, and I, again, I enjoy your caution on all of these things, and I, I share it. Uh, is there anything you'd like to tell uh, everybody out there? Do you have any con? For example, do you want to be contacted uh, by anybody for any reason? Well, if people want to contact the friends for you, if they're interested in what we're up to and like to participate in any way, uh, they're welcome to write to us uh, at post office box. 277 Mount Rainier, Maryland. That's R A I N I E R, Maryland. 20712. And we'll send you information. 
and go from there. All right. Lots of people left on the lines, uh, but not lots of time. So, Don, I'm going to simply say thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the interview. And I'm not going to have a chance to get your fax number off the air here. Somebody else steps right in, but I will contact you, uh, Don, and get your fax number. I'd be glad to send you this uh, Associated Press story. Okay, if it doesn't run in tomorrow's Washington Post... Uh... It may, because I just heard it on the Associated Press News at 9 o'clock. So, oh, okay. Uh, my guess is it's going to run all over the place. Oh. All right, so if you need it, let me know. I'll give you a call. Don Berliner, thank you. Thank you, Art. There he is, Don Berliner, aviation science writer and uh, yet another guest uh, uh, from the Bigelow Foundation and Area 2000. Good evening. program was sponsored by the Big Low Foundation. I'm Art Bell, and this is going to be an extremely interesting program this morning. George Knapp is back. We've got him. We've got uh, glimpses into other realities. We're into another reality with Linda Howe all the way back in Philadelphia. And then I think you're really going to enjoy this this morning. Walter H. Andrus, Jr., who is the international director of the Mutual UFO Network, Inc., will be with us. So it's going to be quite an evening, and uh, I suppose we ought to go ahead and get started. So here, uh, roving who knows where, our roving journalist, George Knapp, is back. And here he is. George, good evening. Good evening, Art. Good evening, listeners. Uh, the UFO flap over Clear Lake, California, apparently continues, as we have mentioned before in this program, that rash and sighting began this spring, and since then, dozens of witnesses have reported seeing disc-shaped craft, balls of light, and other unexplained aerial phenomena. We've been told this week that videotape of one such craft has been captured, although we have yet to see the tape ourselves. What's more, witnesses are now seeing telltale helicopter traffic, as if the government or someone else is monitoring the UFO situation there. You know, we've heard this sort of thing again and again around the country in places of considerable UFO activity or even animal mutilations. So people start seeing UFOs or the report mutilation cases, and then, bam, these unmarked helicopters start showing up in great numbers. Whoever it is behind it, uh, they seem to have a heck of a lot of helicopters. Uh, another perennial UFO hotspot, Missouri, is experiencing yet another UFO wave. Witnesses near Springfield are reporting the appearance of luminous, silent flying objects, triangular in shape, with red lights on the top. Witnesses near Sparta, Missouri, have seen groups of luminous UFOs flying in a trapezoid formation. And residents of Dade County, Missouri, have been seeing these glowing yellow cylinders flying around, something that's been described as akin to a fat flying sausage. Uh, sightings also continue over Gulf Breeze, Florida. Some fairly impressive photos of disc-shaped craft have been snapped during the past several weeks. These photos have been analyzed and appear to be genuine as far as we can tell that the craft are quite similar to the ones that were seen and photographed by the infamous Ed Walters. A lot of people have doubts about Ed Walters and his photos. In fact, your guest tonight, Walt Andrus, could certainly a address some of those questions. But these pictures uh, would tend to corroborate, corroborate, I think, what Walters has been saying. Uh, a couple of media notes. Uh, a feature film about UFOs is in production and is expected to be released in theaters early next year. The documentary film will be titled Beyond This Earth. 
At least two British TV networks are interested in producing UFO programs, and traditionally, aren't as you probably know, the government regulates the press and press. stayed away from the topic altogether, but in the past week, I've been contacted by two British networks about UFO projects being produced in conjunction with the uh, English researcher and author Timothy Good. Uh, also in the works here in the U.S., at least two syndicated UFO talk shows. One is being produced in New Orleans by renowned abductee Calvin Parker. The other is being put together in Los Angeles, hosted by Don Ecker. He's the research director for UFO Magazine. We don't yet know what markets these programs will be airing in, but both production teams hope for nationwide distribution. Uh, UFO Conference News, a big one scheduled for this month in Las Vegas, beginning November 28th at the Showboat Hotel. It lasts for a full week and features many of the best-known names in UFO research. The conference will also delve into topics not always given much credence in UFO circles, such as channeling. Angela Thompson of the Bigelow Foundation has further details if anyone's interested. And also this month, UFO Conference East will be staged in New York City. The date's November 20th and 21st. Nearly two dozen speakers are scheduled, as well as a, a UFO march on the United Nations in protest of the alleged international UFO cover-up. A lot of people have mixed feelings about such protest actions. They worry it, that it affords the mainstream media yet another chance to poke fun at, at UFO nuts and funny hats carrying funny signs, and that it might denigrate the quality research being conducted. Uh, that's something you might want to discuss with your guest tonight, uh, Walt Andrus. I, I don't think there are many people in the world who know more about UFOs than than he does, and I look forward to hearing the show. How do you feel about it, George? These protests that are going on, there was one at the White House, and now you're saying there's going to be one at the U.N. Is it a good idea? Is it productive or uh, anti? I, I, almost anti. I, I think uh, that, that there are there is interest, as we've discussed before, Art, there is interest among serious people in, in Washington, D.C., for example, in getting to the bottom of the UFO cover-up. There, there is belief among members of Congress that, uh, that it's real, that it's going on, that someone is lying to the public. I think this creates some political problems for people like that, that the, they are supporting sort of an ongoing behind-the-scenes investigation of the matter, and for it to come out now uh, when they don't really have the smoking gun, when they don't really have the, the evidence they need to nail the people who are behind the cover-up, I, I think it uh, it makes it less likely that, that they would, would stick with it. So it's almost hard to even know what to demand when you don't have the evidence. Exactly. All right, George, uh, wonderful. Thank you very much, and we'll look forward to your next report. Okay. All right, take care. That's George Knapp, and uh, with quite a bit of information for us this evening, as a matter of fact. All right, you're listening to Area 2000, coming to you from Las Vegas. It is a weekly event. We're here beginning at 8 o'clock every Sunday evening. Now we're going to go all the way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, somebody that you should know and shouldn't really need any introduction at all, nevertheless, with a glimpse into yet another reality from Philadelphia, here is Linda Howe. Linda, good evening. Hi, Art. Welcome to the program. Well, uh, again, George and I are sort of on a similar track in these news leads. He started off with a discussion about the unidentified helicopters in California, and the unidentified and often silent helicopter has been one of the very confusing aspects of strange phenomena in the past few decades. There have been reports of helicopters silent or noisy and unidentified over pastures where animals have been found mutilated or over the homes of people affected by the UFO abduction syndrome. A strong link between these mysterious helicopters and the animal mutilations began in the 1970s throughout the Midwest and eventually spread to most of the rest of the United States, including Alabama, this winter and past spring that I've reported here on earlier Area 2000 broadcasts. The helicopters can be of several varieties and colors and almost always without identifying marks. A friend and colleague of mine, Tom Adams, in Paris, Texas, has researched the helicopter connections to animal mutilations and human abduction since the 1970s. Tonight, I asked him to update us on his research, and we began our discussion with an example of an eyewitness report that linked a mysterious helicopter to beings that did not look like typical humans. Well, there was one case that occurred uh, in 1976 in Montana uh, in the uh, area of uh, Norris and uh, Madison County, Montana, which again was they had, well, between June and October, had about 22 confirmed mutilations of livestock. 
and again accompanied by numerous reports of helicopters, some unmarked, some jet black, many reported as silent. And during this time, there was a hunter from Bozeman, Montana, who was uh, about 3 p.m. one day hunting in an area near North Montana. And he watched a black helicopter without any discernible markings fly overhead and land behind a hill. So he climbed the hill and saw about seven uh, individuals apparently disembarking from the helicopter. And he began to walk toward them and offer greetings, and he realized suddenly that uh, these men appeared to be Oriental. Uh, he wasn't sure if they were Chinese, Japanese, or whatever. They certainly were not a white male Caucasian. They appeared vaguely Oriental, and they were jabbering in some language that was indecipherable to him. Uh, they had slanted eyes and olive skin. They didn't have uniforms, just the everyday street clothes. And suddenly, as they saw him approaching, uh, they ran back to the helicopter and took off before he could reach them and, and find out who they were. And, uh, and we've also been told that there were similar reports of Oriental appearing helicopter occupants, occupants in England. Uh, you don't have too many accounts of people actually seeing the occupants of these helicopters. And, uh, of course, as you know, and many people already know, that there are, in the history of, of uh, the UFO phenomena, there have been reports of occupants who have been reported as vaguely Oriental. Right. Now, what about the strong association between helicopters in or around the vicinity where people have reported also seeing what would be considered a UFO? Well, one of the primary cases is that of uh, Cash Landrum, Betty Cash, Dickie Landrum, and Colby Landrum, which occurred in December of 1980, north of Houston, Texas, where uh, the three were uh, encountered a, a large diamond-shaped object uh, viewing fire and smoke and, uh, in a rural area. And, of course, as, as many know, they went on to suffer uh, physically from the after effects of this encounter, which apparently included some kind of radiation effect. But while they were viewing this large diamond-shaped object, there were, the report has been, 23 helicopters which appeared around the object, uh, some of which were single-bladed, single-rotor helicopters, others were the big uh, Chinook or uh, flying banana type helicopters. And, of course, uh, again, as is usually the case, all attempts to determine with any finality where the droplets are coming from have uh, met with futility. There are some suggestions, of course. There aren't too many places that would house as many helicopters. And this kind of leads us to the, the possibility that uh, they would be military, because you have to ask uh, who would have the manpower and the facilities and the logistical capabilities of operating a fleet of helicopters outside of the military and be able to do it with impunity. So in that case, it might actually have been some kind of a military operation, either guiding the strange diamond glowing objects in the sky or monitoring its activities. Um, in the context of whether or not all helicopters could be military or terrestrial, there is Sheriff Luzerotto's famous quote uh, from the documentary I did when he said that he and other investigators had become convinced that some of the helicopter activity they were trying to chase was actually, and this was his quote, creatures not from this planet here involved with the animal mutilations and using the helicopter appearance as a camouflage for their own work so that we would not pay attention to them. What is your comment about what uh, Lou Giotto has had to say? Helicopters over the years have been reported as silent. Uh, has led a lot of people to think that perhaps we're not looking at helicopters at all. Maybe they are some kind of non-terrestrial craft in disguise, which, of course, uh, uh, it makes sense that they would be able to move about uh, without being noticed as readily as they would be if they were in their, you know, regular uh, non-terrestrial configuration. But uh, there, to play the devil's advocate, there is a technology which might explain the existence of silent helicopters, the uh, active noise control, where you produce the sound to cancel out an already existing sound. And what you have essentially is you wind up with silence. So the technology is there, but again, the question has to be asked, which Lou DiRoto asked many years ago, uh, how many of these operations can be carried out with such impunity without anyone being caught or captured? And uh, over that, that very fact itself lends, lends, uh, lends some credibility to the idea that there's something a little bit more exotic going on here than just a military operation. And it's been going on for over 30 years in association with what people have described as looking like a helicopter. And I remember when I was working on uh, a strange harvest, the insurance guy in Denver who called me 
and said that he and his mother-in-law uh, saw a what they thought was a low-flying helicopter uh, come over their house uh, west of Denver and suddenly turn into what looked like a square through which they could see the sky and continued to rise vertically upward and changed or metamorphosized into something that looked like a solid round disk. Yeah, that was an interesting story. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of others like that, but, of course, if that one story is, is true, that, again, lends credibility, credibility to the exotic element of this. That it could actually be a camouflage operation in some of these cases of an alien life form using a helicopter shape to confuse us and to keep us from understanding what's going on. Possibly. I also think it's, it's, uh, there may be more than one thing going on here that... Uh, there may indeed be an alien camouflage operation occurring, but also there still may be uh, some kind of military or at least governmental operation where some of these trappers are actually terrestrial. And uh, there are uh, some indications that this may be the okay, case, some indications that there are helicopter boxes that are based on, on certain military reservations. And ours? Yes. In that whole issue of if there were military helicopters involved with both flying over abductees' houses, being in pastures either before or after animal mutilation, would be who are they, how are they monitoring and tracking all of this, and is there any truth to what somebody in the military told me some time back, uh, unofficially and off the record, that there was in fact um, a system of teams that were tracking various frequencies of things that were identified as non-terrestrial uh, with the idea of getting to locations uh, both to monitor and to break up some incident like uh, an abduction or a mutilation. What an incredible mystery this is. Linda. Yes. Uh, if anybody out there listening uh, has any information about any of these uh, aspects of abductions, uh, mutilation or government monitoring of frequencies that might be non-terrestrial in association with these unidentified and strange helicopters, I would certainly like uh, to hear about it, and I know Tom Adams would, too. How do people contact you, Linda, if they have information? Uh, I can be reached at Post Office Box 538, Huntington Valley, spelled H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D is in dog, O-N, Hunting Dunn Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. And if anyone uh, has anything to report, please get in touch with me, and I will also share it with Tom. Good. All right. Well, that's, boy, that's something. I'm very curious myself about these helicopters. Uh, Linda, and I think there's good reason to be curious and try and pin it down because it, it is at least something we can follow toward trying to figure out w what's going on here. It is. Uh, Tom has said this himself many times. If we could literally get to the crux of the strange helicopter phenomenon and understood exactly what it was, which may be very clearly two things, our own military trying to monitor something that is another intelligence and the other intelligence camouflaging itself so they can move around on the planet more easily, we might begin to get closer to understanding what is involved with our planet. And it has these helicopters, or something that looks like helicopters have been reported now since at least 1973. In, they were dozens of reports back then, and they were reported with uh, great regularity this winter and spring in Alabama, and uh, most recently I understand that it's another way of talking to the court in Colorado. Well, we do have to be able to report these stories to someplace so we know what's going on, so I hope I will hear from uh, those of you out there who may have information about this. Good. Linda, we'll look forward to your report next week. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Linda. Linda Howe. In Philadelphia, actually, near Philadelphia. And if you have any reports for her of this nature, please do get in touch with her. That's Linda Howe, Post Office Box 538, Huntingdon, with a D, H-U-N-T-I-N-G-D-O-N, Valley, Pennsylvania. Zip code 19006. And the information is power. 
so she could use some. And if you have reports, we'd very much appreciate it. Walter H. Andrus, Jr. As one of the founding members of MUFON in 1969, Walter H. Andrus, Jr., has been the international director of the Mutual UFO Network, Inc., since 1970, succeeding Dr. Alan Yutke, I believe it is. He served on the staff of Skylook and the MUFON UFO Journal beginning in 1968. Walt is presently the associate editor. He's been editor or co-editor of the annual MUFON UFO Symposium proceedings since 1972. Born in Des Moines, Iowa in 1920, Mr. Andrews graduated from the Central Technical Institute in Kansas City, Missouri in 1940. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Electronics uh, a technician program during World War II, taught in their school. Walt was formerly employed by the Airlines as a station manager. 1949 to 1975, he was employed by Motorola, Inc., in successive capacities as assistant plant manager, manager of quality control, and operations manager in their Quincy, Illinois facility. In 1975, he transferred to the Seguin, Texas plant as a production uh, production manager. After a tenure of nearly 34 years with Motorola, Walt retired at the end of 1982 to devote full time to the management of the Mutual UFO Network. Even though being retired, he continues to provide consulting services to the Motorola Seguin plant. Mr. Andrus has been interested in the UFO phenomenon since August 15, 1948, when he, his wife, and son had a daylight sighting of four UFOs flying in formation over downtown Phoenix, Arizona. An amateur radio operator since 1939, Walt's present call letters are W5VRN, Victor Radio Nancy. In addition to presenting slide illustration lectures in the USA, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, England, Italy, and Mexico. He's appeared on television in the USA, the United Kingdom, and more recently with Oprah Winfrey. Walt is vice chairman of the International Committee for UFO Research and is one of the founding members of the new joint American-Soviet Aerial Anomaly Federation, or JASAAF, organized in 1991 to promote UFO research and cooperation between UFO organizations in the USA similar organizations in the Russian Commonwealth of Independent States. So, all the way from uh, Texas, here is Walter Andrus. Good evening, Walter. Good evening, Art. Uh, good to have you with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, Walt, I, it's hard to know where to start with you. There's so much I can ask. I guess I'm going to begin with the subject of the first two reports, or at least they both touched on it. What have you heard? What reports does MUFON have on this whole black helicopter thing? The black helicopters have been prominent in many cases to uh, identify each and every case of the, of the question. However, we have to study these for the very reason that uh, one of the demonstrations, if it's daytime, um, your Coast Guard helicopters are painted a dark blue. The uh, Air Force uh, may have a, a blue uh, helicopter. The Army is u using camouflage or the olive drab green helicopters. Coast Guard is blue. So this one way of identifying that, yes, these black helicopters have been seen. Uh, we've actually photographed them in daytime. It, they are not... When license numbers been checked with registration, there's nothing registered with the FAA. So the one of the uh, agencies of the U.S. government. Does this won't lead you to believe that um, this whole UFO phenomenon, or at least part of it, or maybe just part of it, uh, is indeed connected with the government? That in some way or another, it is either all a government project, or what do you believe about that? Certainly the helicopters would seem to suggest terrestrial origin and cooperation or knowledge or something. Well, 
we don't blame or even uh, consider that the United States government is uh, responsible for the UFOs that have been sighted uh, for hundreds and thousands of years. We have nothing on the planet Earth that will fly and perform like a UFO. So uh, if our government had them, we would be ahead of everyone on the planet Earth in space travel, but we don't have them, sorry to say. And uh, the helicopters have been seen. Uh, we don't know their purposes entirely, but they're apparently trying to learn what is going on in these different events. All right, well, what I'm, I guess I'm asking, Walt, is since they are helicopters, since helicopters probably are from Earth, unless there's some kind of um, change artists and can change shapes or change our impression of what we're seeing or something, uh, it certainly suggests some sort of at least cooperation then between what you have firmly said is not of terrestrial origin and our government that definitely has some black helicopters. Well, we don't know if there's cooperation. Again, we work with facts. Our, uh, if we are speculating on a subject, we'll all preface the comment accordingly. Okay. But uh, all right. we have to resolve the phenomena, and uh, I think our government would like to know more than they know at present. I agree. Well, we've got to take a brief break for a station identification. I understand you are an amateur radio operator. I am as well, Walt. You should know my call is W6OBB. So, uh, um, uh, welcome to the program as a fellow ham. <laughs> well, thank you, Art. All right, Walt, stand by. We're going to do a quick station identification. We'll be right back with more. You're listening to Area 2000 from Las Vegas. <laughs> From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Once again, good evening. Reminding you that all of this happens, uh, not, uh, uh, not without uh, substantial support. All of this area, and I speak now of the Area 2000 program, happens because the good people at the Bigelow Foundation are there. If you'd like to contact the Bigelow Foundation... Your contact is Angela Thompson. She's a research coordinator there. And you can reach her at area code 702-456-1606. And you might just want to thank them uh, for their support uh, of this program. The original concept was theirs, and uh, it has worked like crazy. Very popular program. Again, area code 702-456-1606. The Bigelow Foundation. Mr. Andrus, uh, welcome back. Well, thank you, Art. All right, we've got uh, clear sailing now to the top of the hour, and I guess there are a whole bunch of things I would like to ask you, but first, there will be a lot of people in the audience, uh, Walt, who have no idea what MUFON is, where it came from, why it is still in, uh, in business, and what you guys do. So tell us about MUFON. <laughs> yeah, we'd be happy to, Art. Uh, MUFON is the acronym for the Mutual UFO Network. We were organized on May 31st, 1969, and we'll be celebrating our 25th uh, anniversary in 1994. Talk about anniversaries. Uh, I my wife and I celebrate our 50th anniversary right there in your building in the beautiful glass dome dining room at the Plaza mm -hmm. Hotel. Well, congratulations. That was uh, a year ago, and we just passed 50 to our 51st. Wow. That's getting off the subject. We did want to tie it in with your location there, KWDM. KDWM. KDWM. There right. you go. There you go. Uh, going back to MUFON, um, we started on May 31st, 1969. The reason was that there was a, uh, a contract issued to the University of Colorado uh, during 1968, extended 1969, by the United States Air Force under the charge to, uh, to determine if UFOs deserve further scientific study. The charge first was going to be the UFOs exist, and no one would take the contract because, as the managers at the University of Colorado pointed out, yes, we, we have UFOs. <laughs> you don't have to determine that, but it's going to change the... Uh, 
And uh, Dr. Edward U. Condon headed up, and he attended, or he did nothing toward uh, investigating. So I don't think he read any of the reports that his uh, committee and team went out and interviewed people. He did go to a kook UFO convention in New York City because he felt anybody believed in UFOs was a kook. <laughs> so uh, his report came out, and they called it a scientific study, but however, it's a little bit different than a conventional scientific study work by in a lab for physics or chemistry. Sure. A class, you'll set up your experiment, uh, conduct your experiment, record the results, and then determine what did I learn. This makes the report that the University of Colorado published quite unique in that the conclusions are in the first chapter. And he probably wrote that before the study was even done and uh, criticized people for teachers for teaching uh, on to study UFO, they should be close to it. Close. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. And this is the first of the Biology of Manhattan Project. He's head of the Bureau of Standards at the University of Colorado. So how do you account for an attitude like that? Well, a, a preconceived opinion. <laughs> and they probably should never hired him, but uh, his people worked real hard at the project, produced a big, thick book, and even in their book, 30% of the cases they treated, they classified them UFOs. So it's quite evident that Dr. Condon didn't take the time to read the work of his own committee. It cost the Air Force about $650,000 uh, to conduct the study, and they came out and made recommendations that they closed Project Blue Book by the United States Air Force. That was probably a good recommendation because People weren't reporting sightings, public were not reporting sightings to the Air Force because of the ridicule that was involved in being told, let's say on 2 o'clock in the afternoon you were watching the planet Venus in the sky, and uh, so people just refused to uh, report them. Well, you've been, you, you've been the collection point, Walt, for uh, sightings for years and years and years and years. Are we getting more sightings? Fewer sightings, what do your statistics tell you? Our statistics show are that uh, we're not getting a lot more sightings, but we're getting higher quality sightings because people are more knowledgeable of the subject. Uh, they, years ago, back in the 50s, uh, a light in the sky was considered a UFO, or something that, that unusual that moved. Well, <laughs> We find that of the raw reports that we get from the public, that 80 to 90 percent can be explained as something mundane after a very, very thorough investigation mm -hmm. that is sending an investigator out to interview the, the witnesses, go to the scene, get the facts, determine if there's any physical evidence, photographs, and so on, and then also try to determine what else could they have seen, uh, just misunderstood what they were observing. It was, of course, a UFO, which simply stands for unidentified flying object. It was unknown to the person reporting it. They are very, very anxious to find out, what did I see? It was confusing. Well, 80 to 9 percent of the reports can be explained as something mundane. One of the items that receives a lot of attention these days, especially we have to have a clear, clear evening across the United States, the space debris coming in puts on a tremendously beautiful show as uh, rocket sh shells and debris burns up in the atmosphere. But it's always going in a straight line. People say, well, it should be coming down. Well, no, it comes in quite flat and burns up slowly in the atmosphere. And even when the last space shuttle passed over in Texas, we got UFO reports at 3.15 in the morning. <laughs> it put on a pretty fair show, but uh, kind of a blue haze around the nose and an orange glow from the rear. But uh, that was what we call an IFO, an identified flying object. Sure. So we're interested in that 10 to 20 percent residue after a thorough investigation that represents what we call the real UFOs. All right. You... As we explain, we call those IFOs or identified flying objects. All right. You uh, must collect pictures, photographs, videotapes, whatever sort of evidence people have. I'm sure they try to get it to you. Do you, do, you have a, do you have big full files of uh, videos and, uh, and pictures, Walt? 
Yes, we have uh, most of us file our documentaries and so on on UFOs, but in each of the individual cases where video is taken, uh, we have those files. What do you consider to be the best evidence, the best picture? Well, this is news people will ask this one question. What is the one case that proves beyond a question of doubt that we have UFOs? Well, the same answer applies to photographs. Uh, photo there isn't any one case that really proves the whole picture. It's a series of cases, multiple cases, where the evidence repeats itself. You have patterns developed. Still, though, Walt, if, if, if I were to ask you, look, go to your files and bring me back the picture, the best picture, the greatest detail, or the one that you like best, what would you bring? Well, we have more pictures right now on the Gulf Breeze, the Ed Walder sightings. Right. Uh, in quantity. They are much superior. We're still getting pictures. We'll have an article in the December issue of our MUFON UFO Journal on the sightings down at uh, Pensacola Beach, Florida. They are daytime sightings. They're not very clear, but there's certainly something on video and also on still cameras. But the pictures Ed Walters took uh, are very, very good, uh, and I have more of those in our file than any other one. You see a lot of publicity on the, what they call the Billy Meyer pictures made in Switzerland. They are beautiful, but they're simply five different models uh, suspended and posed for the benefit of uh, Billy Meyer to photograph them. I see. And they're they're good-looking pictures, but <laughs> I wouldn't pull those to show you because they are not UFOs. What about the uh, the Ed Walters uh, situation in Florida? How do you uh, personally look at that? Uh, are you are you a believer that something really is happening there, or do you tend to believe those who you remember the model that was found and all the rest of that baloney? Um, what do you think about Ed Walters? Well, when I first heard about the pictures, our local committee in in Pensacola, Florida, and Gulf Breeze interviewed Ed. That was on January 7th, uh, 1988. I took off the following week and went down because I wanted to meet Ed personally. Uh, pictures can be faked. We know how it can be done. We know how we could actually simulate the photographs he has. But I wanted to know what is the credibility of the photographer? What kind of person is he? And uh, the credibility of the photographer is even more important than the photograph itself. Uh, is he credible? And I found Ed to be a, a very successful businessman, a builder of the finest homes in uh, the Pensacola Gulf Breeze area. He's won awards from the State Builders Association. He's a businessman, very active in the Chamber of Commerce, the school system. Uh, he has everything going for him as a credible person. And uh, yes, we have uh, confidence in him, and we support uh, his case. So, uh, what have you done? Do you have do you have uh, staff people or anybody that works for your organization that goes actually goes to Florida and uh, tries to get pictures or meets with that or what do you do now? Well, we cover the entire world. We have nearly five thousand members, Art, and we try to cover every county in the United States. And so that when something like this breaks are people around the scene, mm -hmm. and uh, our investigators uh, knew who Ed was before he came, went forward and knew publicly that he had made these pictures, because we were already interviewing other people in the neighborhood in, in Gulf Breeze, Florida, that were having the same similar sightings to what Ed Walters had, even before we he had uh, agreed to a public or a interview with our investigators. I've been down there four times. I said I went down the first time on January 15th in 1988, and then back three times since then. But never, I was, was not fortunate enough to have uh, seen something while I was there. Maybe I should stay up all night each night. <laughs> so I went down to take a look at the pictures. On one trip on March 4th, I went down when he made his first uh, serial picture with a camera that we shipped down from here. Sealed it. It was a little Nimzo 3D camera. That when you take one picture, you get four images from the four different uh, lenses and on 35 millimeter color. And uh, he got an object that has multiple lights on it, very different than 
he had had previously with his old Polaroid. His old Polaroid uh, that he used to show progress on homes he was building for people that were going to move to Florida or they wanted to see how their home was progressing. You can take a, show him how you can use that to take a double exposure, triple, quadruple, mm. anything you like. Just don't pull the film out. It's got manually jet. So as soon as we showed him how, that the camera would do that, he went out and bought a brand new 600 LMS Polaroid, which has a motor eject for the film. The film is packaged in a cart. You probably have one of these cameras yourself. And uh, there's no way you, you can hoax that or take a double came a double exposure. He bought the camera on March uh, 6, 1988, and on March 7, he got his first picture in the backyard of a UFO uh, with that camera. Well, um, let me ask you a question about that. You say with a mechanical eject, there's no way you can double expose, but suppose one simply removed the batteries that operate the mechanism for the mechanical eject or the automatic eject, then you could. Uh... You can't, let's see, you, you can make one picture. You'd, of course, you have to set it up. I've been through his home looking for uh, what room he might have used, if he did, to uh, have a model with a black background. To do a double exposure, um, you'll take the, let's say you take your model against a black background and walk outside right. and shoot again without removing that film. Right. And uh, you have your background. So, uh, but on this, uh, you take your batteries out, but uh, your camera probably wouldn't uh, perform. With the there, there's out. no way to independently disable the mechanical ejection of the... Uh, the Polaroid engineers looked at this, and it, I don't know if they, how much time they spent on it. It took them two and a half months to come back huh. and explain how you could disable the camera, uh, take the film out that it's in a, a pack, you get 10... Uh, shots to a pack, it's in tin foil, and they'd have to go in there and take that out and then replace it and put it back in the camera, but uh, interrupt the camera's uh, stroke. And uh, they say it took them a long time. These are Polaroid engineers that uh, are responsible for servicing the cameras, whereas Ed, he was so shocked he figured that out in one day. <laughs> you can believe that. All right. Um, let, let's approach it from this angle then. Of all the cases that uh, have come to MUFON, I don't know how many people ever ask you this, but I'm going to, what percentage of them does MUFON itself judge to be faked? Fakes? Fakes. Oh, uh, fakes uh, are somewhat rare, and we get them regularly, <laughs> several a year. But uh, fakes... Uh, it takes much work to figure out a fake is, is a real one. Sure. Because you have to be sure what you're doing, what you're saying, and how you arrive at that. Well, I guess I'm asking you more for a judgment, not so much what you've proven, but it, it, with regard to the material you get, what percentage do you think uh, when, the, when you all get it at MUFON, you say, uh-uh, oh, no, this is uh, questionable, or, or, you know, it seems to us like it's fake? Well, you've got to get, you have to separate those uh, arts. When a, a person makes a photograph of something unusual, and we get those, uh, oh, once a week, uh, so they see something on film they can't explain. Now, to them, this could be a UFO. But uh, we have to sit down and figure out what is it on that film that is quite unique and quite different. Uh, some of them are just film defects. Uh, that's one of the items, but that, that's not considered a fake. This person was very sincere. They just developed a film, and here's something they didn't see when they made the picture. Sure. And uh, we have one right now made in uh, the Far East, where you've got a uh, big temple there, daytime picture, a, a group of people going through some uh, religious ceremonies, and running right across the picture, uh, some little red dot zigzagging huh. across the picture. Huh. Um, now, we've got to figure out what in the camera would cause something like that because it's not a UFO. So that person just simply is asking, what do I have here? Sure. And we don't call that a hoax. That's not a fake. Um, no, what I meant by that is things that would almost have to be intentional frauds. No, I wouldn't call it intentional fraud at all. 
Uh, no, not that. Uh, not, 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 is when... Yeah, not that, Ed. I'm talking about things that you would privately, when you look at it, say, ah, baloney. <laughs> That's <fun>. Yes. <laughs> A lot of these pictures are very easy. For instance, on the Polaroids, we found it's simply just on the, uh, in one between the layers of the uh, emulsion on the film. And it makes some, quite a unique little picture. Hmm. But, <laughs> Uh, Ed, there's, uh, th there was a protest um, seeking information at the White House not long ago, and now uh, there's about to be a protest regarding UFOs, we understand, at the United Nations. How do you view these protests? Is it positive or negative? Well, we have not supported the, the one that, that occurred uh, at the uh, White House on July 5th uh, this year, nor are we supporting the one that's going to take place next weekend uh, in New York City, the Dodd Hammarskjöld uh, Park area. Uh, these, uh, they did receive a lot of uh, publicity on the one this past year. The one before, this was the second one, the first one, no publicity whatsoever. Uh, but this isn't the way you can get action uh, from Congress. We have other plans that we're doing things behind the scenes that uh, is can have positive results and get uh, the proper attention. Any idea what the Clinton administration attitude toward all this is? No, we haven't been able to. Bill Clinton has been so busy. Yeah, he has. <laughs> problems since he came into office that uh, when people write to him about UFOs and he'll have an aide simply say, well, uh, we thank you for your interest in the subject and uh, best wishes and they have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what Bill Clinton really thinks. Past presidents we do know, and uh, we'll be able to fill in Bill down one of these days, provided <laughs> to get some of these other problems behind him. Ed, what uh, president, which U.S. president do you think has had the most interest in trying to get into this? Well, George Bush was head of the CIA, the director, and uh, the CIA has been in the UFOs since the 1947-1948 era wrap to the present day. Therefore, he is probably more knowledgeable than any president. Even the president has to have a, a need to know. No, I don't know, Eddie. I don't know, Walt. He was uh, probably out of the loop. Well, he could be. <laughs> I was, that was just a joke. Plus, he asked questions. Yeah, that was just a joke. But, yes, he was. He headed the CIA, and obviously he would have known. Do you think most presidents do know, Walt? No. Uh, for instance, Jimmy Carter made a promise, a campaign promise, that if he was elected, he would release all the UFO information because he'd had a personal sign back when he was a rotary governor down in Georgia before he became the governor of Georgia. Um, Gerald Ford was responsible for uh, getting an investigation started in Congress after the 1966 swamp gas sightings in Michigan. Uh, where his constituents uh, pressured him. Uh, Ronald Reagan didn't talk about his personal UFO size until when he had two months left on his second term. Right. And, of course, he was not going to be, couldn't run for re-election, therefore we didn't hurt him. He even found out about Nancy and her astrology, astrologers and friends. Uh, so which... Reagan, which... on four occasions, mentioned three times to... Uh, that if we, if the Earth was attacked from space, right. we would unite as Russians and Americans to defend ourselves. Now, he made that statement once later on to a uh, AFL labor meeting in Chicago, another time to a group of high school students in Maryland. So uh, he, he could have known more than uh, meets the eye. Jimmy Carter got real excited about UFOs after the motion pictures were made uh, on the weekend, or I should say New Year's 1978, and they were shown uh, between the football games on New Year's Day in this country. Uh, he went to NASA and suggested that we yes, we will if you'll provide the finances. But they took Jimmy Carter aside and Robert Freeze, who headed up the NASA at that time, NASA, um, talked to him like a Dutch uncle, no doubt. Since I heard the Jimmy <laughs> Carter on the uh, Larry King radio program about three months ago, 
when uh, Larry asked him about his personal sighting down in Georgia. And Jimmy Carter promptly recited to him. And one of our members in Virginia called in on the program and said, well, how about your campaign promise to release all the UFO material? And Jimmy says, well, we did. But uh, the Air Force probably said, yes, sir, Mr. President. But before they released it, two lieutenants sat down with big black felt pens and marked out all the names of the witnesses, the dates and places, and just destroyed the whole file, basically, before they released it. They didn't tell Jimmy Carter they'd done this. They said, we released it, and so they had. <laughs> now, so there, you can say, what does the president know? He has to have a need to know. And uh, if he doesn't have a need to know, uh, it probably has been told. We know that Truman could have gotten involved way back in 1947 when he was president, uh, possibly with the, uh, what they call the MJ-12 documents. We're still trying to come to their legit. This was actually a briefing that Harry Truman was having made available to uh, General Dwight Eisenhower when he became president. And it was a report of what they call the MJ-12 committee, 12 distinguished uh, scientists of that day, uh, about six scientists and six military and CIA people that were, each one was MJ-1 through 12. And they re the report covers uh, the Roswell crash and other events that occur had occurred prior to uh, January 1952. This report was uh, sensibly uh, prepared. But we're still trying to determine, is it uh, authentic? It's been a difficult job. A lot of money's been spent trying to uh, check it out by going through uh, archives of Eisenhower, Truman, and others uh, to uh, check out uh, other possibilities and to confirm the format and so on. One of the problems here was a hoax uh, It's probably easier to prove than trying to prove a truism. And that's where we're stumped right at the moment. So uh, we can say if that one is true, then Truman was involved. Um, how many reports do you get? Do the reports come to you there in Texas, uh, uh, Walt, or do they come through regional centers and then get filtered to Texas, or how does the reporting system work? Well, the reporting system works like this. Uh, our investigators at the scene will go out and conduct the investigation, prepare a report, and turn that over to their, well, I'll the, the state section director, if that isn't the person that did the reporting. Then it goes to our state director to screen and determine if it's been filled out properly, that all the details are there. And they, in turn, forward it to a uh, regional director. We have four regional directors, uh, three in the United States and one in Canada. We call him the national director. And from there, uh, if it, he'll go through there and take uh, excerpts from it to be used for a current case log in our monthly magazine, the MUFON UFO Journal. The report will go from the regional director to uh, our uh, deputy director of, of investigation who is Ronald Johnson in Austin, Texas. Uh, he is the final one to receive it. There we put, put in the computer in Austin, Texas. Another chap does that. Then the original file comes to uh, Seguin and we keep, keep the hard file here. We have seven four-door file cabins still full of UFO sighting reports. That's a lot of material, Walt. It has, has, is. has the government ever come to you? No. No. Isn't that something? I would think they would be very, very curious how much you know. Well, they may be listening to this phone conversation right now, but we really don't care. Well, that's right. Uh, but you would think with a collection center uh, of data the way you have, uh, if they're curious how close you guys are to having something. Well, remember, they collected uh, the Project Blue Book and Project Sign. Uh, Project Sign was set up about 1947 after the Kim Arnold sighting and the crash at Roswell. Uh, their report came out and was submitted to Hoyt Vandenberg, who was then chief of staff, that UFOs represent alien spacecraft visiting the planet Earth. Hoyt Denberg says poppycock and had all the reports destroyed <laughs> and he closed down Project Time and set up Project Grudge. When Project Grudge, which the name may imply, 
was to have to explain away all UFO sighting reports. Exactly. And well, that didn't work. <laughs> all right, Walt. <laughs> we, space, then they went to Project Blue Book. <laughs> all right, we're at the end of an hour, Walt, so relax for five minutes. We'll come back, and if you're up for it, we'll take some phone calls. Very good. All right, you're listening to uh, Walt Andrus, Jr., he is director of the international uh, international director of the Mutual UFO Network. More in a moment. Back now to Texas. Walt, are you still there? Yes, sir. Good. Um, Walt, before the program, just before we get to calls here, prior to the program. I told you, um, and my audience is well aware of, a sighting that I had a couple of months ago. How does that stack up with a lot of the other sightings you're hearing about, Walt? Uh, it follows very definitely a pattern that we're seeing here. Uh, the object that you find was triangular in shape. Years ago, that was not common. But with the sightings around the lower Hudson Valley region of New York State, the triangular or boomerang-shaped object uh, became very predominant, and that's what you were saying there. The two white lights on the corner, sometimes they have three lights. Uh, the red strobe light was very unusual, I thought. Uh, that isn't reported near as often. Huh. But the white lights are the sightings in Belgium in 1989 were the big triangle objects with three white lights on the three corners of the triangle. But the fact that it moved very slow or floated, as you pointed out, right. uh, without sound, uh, puts it in the category of a UFO definitely because we don't have any craft that can uh, support itself in the air without the benefits of power of that nature, as we know it, sure. without making a lot of noise. Well, on top of that, it, it no matter uh, what sort of support it had aerodynamically, it was going too slowly. Uh, aside from there being no sound, uh, it was simply going too slowly to have supported itself in flight. Uh, I do guess we're doing some work with sound cancellation, uh, aren't we, Well, Tom mentioned that, but uh, I'm not aware that we have a lot of people as our members that are in the aerospace industry. For instance, one of our deputy directors is John Schuster, our vice president. He's with uh, Greco and Donald Douglas over at the Space Center, and they're not aware of the thing that Tom and mentioned, so I cannot confirm that. Okay. All right. Uh, let's take a few calls. So, uh, Wildcard Line 3, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Anders. Hi. Uh, my name is Mike in San Luis Obispo, uh, California. How are you doing, Walt? Hi, Mike. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you and a real opportunity to ask you a question that uh, involves a little physics. I guess you're an engineer, so you'd uh, be uh, aware of uh, the possibility that the aliens are operating outside Newtonian physical laws. For example, uh, wouldn't faster-than-light travel make the aliens very old? And could you speculate on that? <laughs> All right. uh, other words, some people have made that statement. I used to argue with Dr. Heineck about that. Uh, the assumption is made sometimes that every time a UFO is seen over uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, or Pirate, Nevada, <laughs> uh, that it came from some distant planet, appeared over Las Vegas, and went back. <laughs> they don't do that. They've been here for several hundred years, maybe several thousand years, and they're staying around the planet Earth, they aren't going back and forth, so we don't have to really worry there about the uh, speed of light and how fast they travel. Yes, they do things that uh, are beyond our physical world, that is, they'll pass, somebody pass right through a solid world and take you and bring them right with them through a solid world, through a window. How that's done, we do not know, but we, people have seen it happen. And that certainly isn't our physical world, but they're taking someone like you or me and making it possible for us to do the same thing. That we cannot explain. Okay, Walt, uh, let's keep moving, shall we? On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Walt Andrus, Jr. Where are you calling from, please? Yes, good evening, Art. This is Bruce in Yuma, Arizona. Hi, Bruce. AL7LF. On another hand, that makes three. <laughs> 
Yeah, I just uh, like to pass on over an experience I had when I lived in western Wyoming and then get the comments off the air from our, our guest on what his interpretation would be. But we in uh, Mountain View, Wyoming, just south of Evanston, I lived there back in the mid-70s, and we had a series of cattle mutilations, and it, it was really funny because I'd just kid around with the, the people at work uh, where uh, was employed out there, and one night... I was uh, just about knocked out of bed by, you know, what I swore up and down were helicopters. Uh, dead, you know, 3, 2 in the morning, something like that. And then the next day, my landlord, where I was staying, said, you know, hey, Bruce, you want to come out and see one of these uh, mutilated cows that we had? And uh, sure enough, there it was. But the thing was, was the, the helicopters and the point that... Uh, you know, there's never anything in the news about it, but uh, just word of mouth and, you know, on ship work and like that, it was just all anybody could ever talk about. And we were taking shifts out, you know, watching fields and like that and in the evening. So I just uh, passed that on, and that was probably in 76, 77 in uh, south, southwestern Wyoming. All right. Any comments, Walt? Now, this follows Jeffrey, the work that... Uh, Linda Bowles and Al, you had it on your program earlier. Right. Uh, Colorado had a lot of sightings in the same period, uh, more so than uh, Wyoming, probably because they thought raised more cattle uh, than Colorado and Wyoming. So, uh, Wyoming, uh, the cattle be spread over a wide area, and uh, that's easy to monitor what's going on out there. But the Heavy cattle mutilations and the else you're talking about occurred along the northern New Mexico and southern Colorado hmm. area. There were a, large, a big share of them, but Colorado was well covered at the same time it had some in Wyoming. Well, uh, if we look at the various permutations of uh, uh, the sorts of reports you get, I wonder what you consider to be the more interesting to follow now. You know. And I referred to the sightings, the abductions, the cattle mutilations, the crop circles. I wonder what aspect of the whole UFO phenomenon you think is the most intriguing at the moment. Well, we have to look at what can we learn the most. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to resolve four questions. Uh, but one of the UFOs exists, and the evidence is overwhelming when you have tens of thousands of reports in your computer and in files. Mm -hmm. Two, how are they powered? And this is what our aerospace engineers and aerospace companies would like to know, because the group that can design a craft that will fly like a UFO will be head and shoulders above anyone on the planet Earth in space travel. Mm -hmm. Third, where are they from? Well, we don't know. We can only say that of the nine planets in our solar system, we think there's only one that can sustain life as we know it. We think there's some intelligence here on the planet Earth. Sometimes we even question that. <laughs> and fourth, what can we learn by studying these, shall we say, the pilots of these craft? Because they definitely seem to be far more advanced than our technology on the planet Earth. So uh, that fourth one definitely has the greatest merit, and that is in some of the abduction cases to give us clues what uh, is taking place. I have all your tapes. I haven't played all of them from prior programs on how far Bud Hopkins has carried this or Dave Jacobs in the genetic engineering that's going on with humans and uh, breeding half, half breed children and so on. And I feel that the purpose there is to uh, sustain their species because it looks like they're very frail and uh, weak. They cannot reproduce uh, as we do. It. No genitals. I have heard a lot of reports, Walt, that in encounters, um, they have, they are, in fact, almost always reportedly physically weak. That's true. And that's why uh, I say I speculate that um, by mixing with humans, they're going to be able to build up the uh, physical attributes of the alien in such a way that otherwise they would just pass out. Uh, of existence. It looks like they may be cloned, and when you clone anything, each time uh, you lose a little bit. The creatures have, have very fragile bodies, large heads, 
uh, even uh, their fingers are something split, very, very thin, or no thumb, or a stub. Even their feet or the toes are starting to go together because they don't do a lot of walking and certainly don't have not entered the, the New York Marathon, which was conducted today. <laughs> Uh, so of the four things that MUFON is trying to learn, uh, only one has really been settled, and you have settled it. They do exist. That's right. Very emphatically. All right. Uh, line one, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus, Jr. Good evening. This is Fritz from Los Angeles. Hello there. Although you have been a tremendous force in the UFO research, and you run a very respectable organization, but you also made a very big mistake, and you continue to make the mistake. In the early 80s, you and the late Lorenzen, the founder of APRO, and just about all the major UFO researchers, you threw the baby out with the bathwater. And I'm talking about the Billy Meyer context case. Now, Walter, let me explain this for you in the audience. He mentioned Billy Meyer a little while ago. No, I know. When a planet like ours goes through a cosmic awakening call, a three-way conditioning process by the alien was applied. It's from above, from below, and from within. Now... Transit souls are recycled. That may be sounds maybe metaphysical, but that's the way it is. They are groomed, primed, and conditioned for a planetary surface contact. Now, Billy Meyer was such a transit soul, and, his, and he has his standard job very well for his ability. I know whether this is a thorn in your eye. Time will tell that the Billy Meyer case is real and the photos are real. Comments, uh, Walt? Uh, our investigation today shows that they are simply five different models suspended from the limbs of the tree or bushes and photographed. Whenever we send investigators over to check Billy Meyer out, he won't talk to our investigators. He insists that he can't speak English, but we know better. We've heard him narrate five motion pictures, video pictures, using broken English. So... Uh, well as soon as the investigation started, all the pictures stopped. Walter, I know you're up in age, I know, and I hope you're going to be around with us for a long, long time, but you will see the Billy Meyer case stands solid. All right, well, that's a prediction. Uh, Who are you, sir? Well, his name is Fritz, and he's from Los, Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I knew it was L.A., but I didn't catch the name. Uh-huh, Fritz is the name, and you're going to want to remember it. He's very active in these circles. All right, uh, so you, you think, again, that the Billy Meyer case uh, was just some models hanging from a tree branch. Yes, when you do a photo analysis on these, it shows the model is up real close to the camera. When you do a computer enhancement and break the whole picture down into pixels, if the, if the object is real close to the camera, you get a sharp edge of the pixels around the edge of the object. Sure. If it's at a greater distance where you have diffusion of the uh, dust particles in the air, the uh, edge of the uh, object will be rough in the little pixel breakout. And uh, it shows either being real close to the camera. You, his camera was, was jammed. You cannot adjust the focus. Therefore, if he, he would try to range the object to be at the focal length to get a good picture, if he got too close, it, it was out of focus being too close to the camera because he couldn't adjust the focus. Um, Plus, you said you said that the some of the way right there. Yeah, and you said the photographs uh, stopped uh, the moment the investigation began. Yeah. All right. Uh, good. Well, I think that kind of adds to the credibility of your organization and yourself that you just don't buy everything out of hand. Good evening. Uh, on the first time caller line, you're on the air with Walt Andrews. Hello there. Yes. Yes, sir. You're on the air. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Payette, Idaho. Payette, Idaho. All right. Payette. Right. And I'm K6QT. <laughs> That's another So uh, I've known Walt for many years, and I represent him here in Idaho for MUFON. I see. State director. State director in Idaho. Hello, Walt. Good evening, Bob. Hey, uh, I, I have mostly uh, congratulations for your fine work there, Walt, uh, uh, and Art. I have a question about... Uh, the uh, 50KW that uh, you've got there in uh, Las Vegas, I have a heck of a time uh, reading it here. I wonder if you're on any channel uh, besides uh, 720 
because it's real noisy here. I wonder if you have a directional array there that... Uh... Yes, uh, we are um, directional in the nighttime hours, uh, basically with a pattern that protects WGN in Chicago, which is also on 720, and uh, you're beginning to get on the edges of it, so that accounts for your difficulty in Idaho. Yeah, well, real good there, and... Uh... One other thing there, uh, do you have a post office box or something like that? I'd like to send you a QSL card and also find out. I heard you mention that you get on 75 meters, and I missed the frequency. I wonder... Uh, I do. I'll be on 75 meters uh, tonight at about midnight or maybe 1 o'clock, somewhere in there. Yeah. Very late, and uh, on 38.57. Okay. 38.57. If we have uh, several amateur radio nets within the mutual UFO network. The 40-meter net uh, operates off the East Coast every Saturday morning at uh, 0800 uh, Eastern Time. thing that Bob has tried to start when he's even back when he was on the West Coast, and Arch, you might be able to help too, we need a 75-meter net and a, a 40-meter net uh, to cover the mountain states in California. Uh, because our 40 meter net doesn't get out this far. Well, I'd be glad to talk to you about uh, the possibility of a net on the weekends uh, on 75 meters, if, if that's uh, something you'd like to follow up. So we would. All right. Uh, so there you have the frequency, and if you want to get a hold of me, you can send me materials at uh, in care of KDWN Radio, mm -hmm. and the address is number one Main Street. Very simple address. Number one Main Street. Yep. Las Vegas zip code 89101. All right, got it. USL, old boy. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, good talking to you. And uh, I get uh, it all here, but the signal's pretty noisy, and I'm using a 160-meter delta loop to do that. Uh, my 80-meter zip won't even do it here. All right, well, I'll tell you, uh, we're limited to KWN right now. Eventually, this program, no doubt, is going to syndicate, and maybe we'll get a station there in Idaho. Uh, I listened to you from Bakersfield, and they got a terrific signal in here on 1560. Oh, yes, on the syndicated program. All right. All right, thank you, my friend. Hey, 73. God bless, Seven. fellas. All right, take care. It's, um, Thanksgiving holidays. Greetings to you. <laughs> Uh, I listened to uh, try to see if we could pick up KDWN here, and I was got to hear WGN Chicago. Yeah, there you go. That's what you'd be hearing, I'm sure, in Texas. The Challenger football game was ending. All right, Walt. Uh, line two. Good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Uh, good evening, Art and Walt. Um, the reason that I'm calling is uh, I was out here by Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. Nellis Air Force Base, yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think that certainly. The government knows about this, that UFOs do exist, but my only question is, uh, why won't they disclose it to the public? Is it, I, I asked a few people this question, and uh, they think it would just change the whole order of the world. And, you know. Oh, it's an awfully good question, actually. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Walt, it is a good question. It, it's, uh, I can rephrase it and just say, why the cover-up? Well, the cover-up started in uh, 1947 with the uh, crash of an object near about 70 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, that was about a week and a half after the Kenneth Arnold sighting on June 24, 1947, near Mount Lee in the state of Washington. Uh, the cover-up started with the crash. The uh, report was released to uh, all the newspapers and radio stations and those that had evening papers uh, published it that evening, and the next morning uh, it was rescinded by General Roger Ramey when he said all it was that they recovered was a Robin weather balloon, uh, the radar reflector. So that was a cover-up, uh, and once you start the cover-up, that was 1947. This is 1993, and... Uh, no one in our government is, is willing to come forward and admit that we're lying. We've gone through the uh, Gary Powers U-2 flights over Russia, and they said that we were not doing that until Gary was shot down, and that everybody knew it. We had Watergate, Ron Gate, and uh, our government does try to, does lie to us, or for yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that's more... you like to use. Yeah, it's more apparent than ever now, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so, uh, once that started, uh, yeah, but the they, they, 
they would kill the credibility of our government uh, if they admit that they're lying about something as important as uh, affects every nation on the planet Earth. So, in other words, once the lie began, uh, they really had to maintain it. It's like most lies that you tell. Once you've told it, you've got to remember what you said. That's right. That's the difficulty of telling lies. <laughs> you have to remember so. who you told what to. Right. All right. Um, back to the phones again. And on the first time caller line, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrews. Hi, Walt. Hi, Art. My name is Dennis, and I'm from Santa Cruz, California. Hi, Dennis. Listen to your program. comes in very clearly out there. Good. I have a general question for you. <clears throat> the question for both you and Walter is this. With it's a supposedly crashed alien vehicles, one would think that their technology would be so sophisticated as to avoid crashes as we try to do here. Uh, is it possible that we're actually taking physical action against the aliens, or even more possible, is it possible that there's a conflict amongst aliens that happens to just be in our neighborhood? Could you comment on that? You bet. Uh, Walt, I'll let you try it. Go ahead. Uh, this, we've been told that there are many different uh, alien groups from different places, and it's conceivable that they don't get along, shall we say, the good guys and the bad guys, um, and that uh, they may have destroyed one of their own craft. Uh, they, their technology is certainly far more advanced than we have on the planet Earth, but uh, even in quality control circles, uh, they're not perfect. The one at uh, Roswell, it's conceivably two of them collided uh, during an electrical storm. Uh, the debris was found at Roswell, about 300 yards long, about 100 yards wide, and it grabs all in small pieces, whatever it was, and material there that is not known to any to the planet Earth people. Uh, another craft was supposedly found 130 miles straight west of the St. Augustine Plains at the same time and recovered, and it was only damaged slightly. It had a big nick out of the one edge, and there were four creatures there, two dead, one injured, and one still alive when the uh, Army Air Force people uh, arrived at the scene. We're still working on that one to confirm it. Uh, so if uh, two of them did collide and one landed 130 miles west and the debris of the other one was just torn in shreds um, in Roswell, now that, that could happen. We We've had uh, aircraft crash and run into each other on um, the planet Earth frequently. Well, uh, of all the researchers that are out there, and there are many, uh, many that I have interviewed, um, is there any uh, researcher that you would consider to be, well, I guess there are several questions here. One is, do most of them belong to MUFON, and uh, is there any researcher that you would consider to be doing the best work? Uh, the, the News UFO Network is the world's largest UFO investigative organization. Right. And yet not everybody belongs to it. Uh, there's a smaller group in Chicago called the J. L. Hynek Center for UFO Studies. Uh, some of those people, it's a very small and limited group. Some of them are members of MUFON and some are not. But uh, to name, uh, there are a lot of people doing t tremendously good work in the field. Uh, Dr. Bruce McAbee hit was chairman of the Fund for UFO Research uh, in Mount Rainier, I should say Rainier, Maryland, Mount Rainier. Uh, Richard Hall is now the chairman of that group. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them have done real fine work. Um, it can get, go on and on. Uh, for instance, John Schusler, who is our deputy director, is one of the founding members of MUFON with McDonnell Douglas. With the our director of research for MUFON is the R&D director from McDonnell Douglas in Burbank, California. It's their headquarters. And this goes on and on. We have 202 uh, people on our board of consultants all have doctorates wow. in their individual fields. We have 398 research specialists with master's degrees. So it shows that we have some very competent people. Boy, that it really does. That, that That's extremely impressive. Well, I've got to take a quick break here. At the bottom of the hour, and ID the radio station. Stay right there. Walt Andrus, the international director of MUFON, is with us this evening. If you'd like to ask a question, the telephone numbers are coming up in just a moment. You're listening to Area 2000. From J. 
Jackie Gons Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. This is the largest organization and the head of it that we have with us this evening, and it is a kind of an unusual opportunity for you to ask anything you'd like to know. In the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, 383-8255-8255. If you're calling from outside the state, several ways to get in. The toll-free line at 1-800-338-8255. The wild card direct lines at area code 702-385-7214. And finally, if you have never called the program at all, you're welcome to use the first-time caller line at area code 702-385-7213. Walt, good uh, evening. Are you still there? Yes, sir. All right. We probably should put it at this stage of the game. Uh, we have your address where we can write to get all of Art Bell, <laughs> but your listeners would like to know where they can write to contact the Mutual UFO Network. Or or even call, Walt. Yes, sir. Uh, well, let's give them an address first if they would like to. We need investigators all over the world that can go out and interview people that have a sighting. All right. For instance, uh, uh, Bob from Ted, Idaho, called in, and he is our state director for Idaho. We have a state director for every state. We have representatives in foreign countries, so we cover the planet Earth quite well, but there's still a lot of open places where we need help. Okay. Uh, the address here is either write the Mutual UFO Network or the acronym MUFON, M-U-F-O-N. The address is 103, I'll repeat, 103, Old Town, one word, Old Town, and then Road. The city of Seguin is spelled S-E-G-U-I-N, Seguin, Texas, and our zip code is 78155. We get mail as far away as Russia with this UFO to Dean Texas with the copper zip code. We got it. I guess they know you go by right now. Uh, what about a telephone number? I mean, if somebody were to have a sighting or something really urgent was occurring, is there a way to call? Yeah, so I can call. So you say 210-379-9216. That's number one right now, Art. Okay. Uh, area code 210-379-9216. We have two lines in here, but it'll switch over to either one of them. All right. Excellent. Um, on the first time caller line, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Anders. Hello there. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, let me turn off my radio. Thank you. Yes, we have a delay here. Where are you calling? Mr. Anders, I'm in Sacramento. Sacramento. Uh, and uh, I'm a first time caller. Uh, I listen to your program during the weekdays. Uh, and uh, I have a friend, uh, which Mr. Andrews is probably familiar with, William Frederick Hand Hamilton III. Yes, I know, Bill. I'm his friend, Maxie. And what I'd like to ask you about is the Brian Scott case back in the 70s, if you're familiar with Bill's work on that. Uh, yes. Well, uh, I went through the whole thing with Bill, and uh, I have personal knowledge. Uh, has Bill told you about Jim in Colorado? And the documentation on the case? No. Well, uh, this case, uh, uh, part of the requirement on it was two trips to Tijuana to Bolivia in 1976 and then 1977. And uh, there was a party of 16 people that were witnessed on the second trip, and it was professionally filmed. And they have 5,000 feet of professional color film. Who, who has this, Nancy? Uh, the man that has the proprietary right, named Jim Frazier, uh, they have 400 hours of tape material and 35 rolls of film, color film, that were taken on the second trip. And what is this show? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I've never seen the professional film myself. I've seen some of the slides. A lot of the slides have a, a peculiar vignetting on them. Uh, they had a phenomenon where the battery packs were zapped. And he went to his backups, and the backup battery packs were zapped on the professional camera. And so he used a 35 millimeter, which was mechanical. Uh, but the, the whole uh, case was extremely paranormal, psychokinetic, uh, just wild things that went on that were, you know, defying description. 
And uh, and we've had any lengthy conversation with Bill on this, but it was an extremely well documented case. Uh, I went one time and I had a, a set of prepared questions which I double blinded and, and didn't let Bill see any of. Uh, kept the uh, the folder closed so we had the appointment and we were sitting in the living room. Placed myself well away from anybody else. Uh, had the uh, contactee in a projection state, and then asked began to ask him the first question, and I said in regard to, and he cut me off and said in regard to the sarsen and stones and the transport thereof, the verbatim recital of, of the topical content of the first question having to do with Stonehenge, which is one of the elements in this case. Uh, but I, I'd just like to point out that if, if you're interested in the, the individual's name, I can mail you some information on the individual that has the documentation in Colorado. Well, all right. He's due because I'm not aware of this at all. All right. Please send it along. And uh, well, what about what about connections um, of of this kind? Uh, how does it mix in, or does it mix in, in your estimation, with the UFOs? All these reports uh, of psycho uh, psychokinetic uh, activity of uh, people being contacted mentally, uh, of time travel, of all these other areas that are very mysterious themselves. Do you see connections to the UFO phenomena? Uh, we, we're not blind to periphery material that's going on, but most of our emphasis on, shall we call the nuts and bolts scientific aspects of UFOs because they very definitely are a materialistic craft. Uh, they can land and leave physical evidence. You can go up and tap on them. They're metallic in nature, some of them. So we've somewhat confined ourselves to uh, the craft and the beings as uh, comparable to humans, uh, to some type of aircraft that uh, we would like to duplicate. So you're we spend very little time on yeah, uh, I understand. things that he's mentioning. All right. Uh, that was what I was curious about. Uh, line three, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Well... Uh, a couple of questions, guys. How how you doing, by the way? We're both fine. Good. Uh, number one, it, it sounded like your last answer. You might not be able to help me with this question, but uh, George Knapp, when he was on, he, he spoke about a thing called remote viewing. Oh, yes. Okay. I, I wonder maybe if the, the guest can maybe uh, comment on that, if he knows anything about that. And there was a special on the pyramids, and I guess they speculated they used the heavy, uh, they moved the heavy stones with uh, air generated by sound pressure. Air generated by sound pressure? That's I don't, I don't think we, I don't think we can move stones with that today. No, but, uh, there was a, a special on the pyramids on the networks this week. Mm -hmm. You mean that one of the Sphinx? Yeah. And they, they speculated that uh, the way they manipulated the stones was with, uh, I guess it was sound pressure, the air generated by it. <laughs> well, I think the air factor came in when they were looking uh, deterioration on the face. Uh, from uh, the okay, I got that wrong. And they thought that... Uh, I misunderstood. All right, call it. Thank the you. The lower area, it looked like, it kind of surprised the investigators that you had water erosion that uh, would take the, the feet back or much greater age than was originally considered. But going back to remote viewing, we're going to have a fellow named Ed Deems will speak at a MUFON International Symposium in Austin, Texas, July 8th, 9th, and 10th next year. And uh, he is the uh, president of SciTech, which is a firm that uh, obtains contracts to uh, do uh, studies through remote viewing a group of people that uh, can take a subject or even it's been used trying to read uh, files in Russia, and they've been trying to do the same thing in our confidential files. Uh, but it's a whole field in itself, and our interest there is that we would like to utilize their help if they uh -huh. can develop a high percentage of uh, accuracy and credibility to use some information they provided. So you are interested then in this field, at least yes. from, from that point We're of view. Very definitely. All right. On the first time caller line, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Uh, yes. Uh, 
I'd like to find out. I had heard on an earlier uh, another. Part. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Try the wild card line. Dial 1, area 702-385-7214. It had occurred in November of 92 in Long Island, New York. And I'd like to know what he knows about it. All right, thank you. Uh, November of 92 in Long Island. Know anything about that, Walt? Yes, a fellow named John Ford uh, claims that there was a Christ there, but uh, he, we have his videotape and information he has available, but it certainly doesn't prove anything, and uh, I'm afraid that he's got very, very excited about nothing. <laughs> uh, it actually, uh, it does my heart good, uh, Walt, to hear you when, when it's necessary. Uh, not hesitate to suggest that something is not productive or that that you didn't think much of it. Uh, to me, that adds to your credibility and, and means that you're ob objectively looking at all this. And that must be hard to remain objective all the time. I call myself an objective skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe a... everything people tell me, but if I can check it out from several independent sources that come up with the same information, uh, then uh, we'll accept it. That's one of the problems we're having with the Bob Lazar material there in Las Vegas. Uh -huh. uh, we hope that, and here's where George Knapp has been doing some beautiful work in following this. And there for a while it appeared he was going to get some other people to come forward that work up there and to confirm what Bob said, but so far uh, it hasn't been possible. But, so Bob Lazar is still in the uh, gray basket, and we're still looking at it. Okay. Um, good. Uh, line three. Uh, hold on, please. I'm coming to you out of turn. I think it's line one. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Walt Andrus uh, in particular and uh, about uh, MUFON in general. Uh, if in their research uh, they put uh, a stock in the work of Nikola Tesla and Wilhelm Reich and what uh, kind of a relationship, if any, they have with the uh, International Tesla Society. Take my here. All right, thank you. Uh, Tesla and the Society and any connection to MUFON, Walt? A net at all. Um, it, it's a field all in itself, and they have a, an organization, a society that's worked on Tesla's, study Tesla's work, and it's certainly admirable the things he did in his time because he was far more advanced than others in the field. The Wilhelm Wright... Uh, Rainmakers and his Argon Energy, we take a dim view on that one. Mm -hmm. All right, good evening on the first time caller line with Walt Andrus in Texas. Hello. Hello, you're on there. Yes, uh, I'm calling from Palm Springs, and I have a question for uh, your guest. Uh, abductees have seen markings on uh, the uh, UFOs, and I think it's all the abductees in Europe have seen the same type of markings. That they, look, they look to me, uh, from pictures I've seen of them, as Egyptian-type hieroglyphics. Has any effort been made to uh, to try to translate that? Uh, it might be uh, cool if we could ever come up with uh, an idea of what, what they say. That's a really good question, uh, and that is what they look like, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Yes, that's, uh, that's right. That's my impression. All right, thank you. Uh, Walt, how about it? Has there ever been a, an effort? Dr. Jesse Marcel, uh, j uh, Jr., who saw the debris that was picked up at Roswell and dad brought home and dumped on the kitchen floor for his mother and himself to see, it had symbols, and I, he's drawn them to the best of his knowledge, but, of course, he was only 11 years old at the time, and now... Uh, were in 1993, and then occurred in 47. Um, the letters have been shown uh, and appeared in when abductees been aboard craft, but those have been kept reasonably quiet. Uh, Bud Hopkins has been doing a study on this to uh, use as kind of a, a check measure against different abductees that come up with the same printing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not legible. We haven't no one's figured out what it what they say, but um, when uh, different abductees can draw the same symbol that they've seen aboard a craft, and this has never been published, this is another test factor uh, to determine their credibility. So 
it hasn't gone past that stage right now because... Well, how many of those have there been that is similar reports? Uh, probably about ten that I'm aware of. Ten. Oh, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty the impressive. Way, but has got about five questions that he asked about abductees that when it comes to uh, where they claim they have hybrid children. And uh, he has five test questions there that have never been published. I'm aware of what they are. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is another way of measuring when a lady says, this is how it happened, blah, 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 and spells up the details and that others have given at a prior time. We have to have things like this because once it, uh, it's published in a book, and becomes public domain, anyone can fake it or hoax it and claim this is what they saw aboard the craft. And so the fact that it's not published uh, means that it can be used as a test. Since you are clearly the international organization, Walt, and you get reports from all over the world, uh, it's reasonable to ask you where most of them come from. In other words, do, do we get more reports per capita in the U.S.? or in the Soviet, or what used to be the Soviet Union, or what part of the world seems to lead in sightings, or are they generally spread about? They are spread about. You could, they've had sightings in every nation on the planet Earth, in every country. Uh, the real problem in those is the language barrier. Someone has to translate it into a common language. Uh, the reports, therefore, while we didn't get anything out of China, but now it's opened up, and... Uh, Russia has been very, very open here lately. They've had enough internal problems, but uh, prior to uh, oh, go back 10, 20, 30 years ago, it was difficult to get things out of Russia. So we couldn't say that they have more reports there or less reports because we didn't have access to them. Well, have you caught up, though? Is there any KGB file or file in Russia that has been turned over to you since uh, the decline of communism? Uh, probably the best work has been done by your own George Knapp. Uh, he and his partner went to Russia in March of this year and brought back about 400 reports, which they are in the process of having translated now. So that would probably be the most current we're getting some, but some are quite old uh, in the work of uh, well, early 1957. We got the first book out of Russia that uh, Felix Ziegel, Dr. Ziegel, put together of reports, early reports in the 50s in Russia, and they are identical to what we were reporting in the United States. So by trying to cover up UFOs here, we didn't fit the Russians because they were having the same kind of sighting over there. Right. All right, let's keep moving. Lots of people. Line two, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Andrus. <clears throat> All right, you're hard to hear, so get good and close to your telephone. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Andrews, I'd uh, like to know, uh, does your organization have any follow-up on the uh, face that was pictured on the uh, surface of Mars from the uh, lunar orbiter? Good question. Uh, what about the face on Mars, uh, Walt? Well, those, those pictures were made by the Viking probe in 1976, and they looked very interesting. Uh, we thought maybe we'd have it pinned down once and for all with the new Mars Observer in making photographs this year, but as most of us realize now, apparently they've had technical difficulties, and they are not transmitting pictures back. Yes, do you buy them? If we would have put the thing to bed once and for all, mm -hmm. we'd had good detailed pictures because the cameras aboard the Mars Observer were so superior to what they had in 1976 with the Viking project that uh, we would know once and for all or maybe even see far more detail. Right now, we'll have to wait on free. There, there's a certain percentage of uh, researchers and others interested, Walt, who think that the, um, the high-quality uh, photographic capability is exactly why the Mars Observer sort of uh, mysteriously uh, malfunctioned, and they don't believe it. Um, what does MUFON conclude about that? Well, the jury is still out as far as we're concerned. Uh, I've heard these conspiracies and even... Uh, our friend uh, Richard Hoagland has made some statements that even people at NASA were responsible for the failure right. intentionally. But uh, 
we have too many people in our organization that work at high level at NASA and the aerospace industry that uh, do not uh, concur. Uh huh. You're so level-headed, and uh, you seem to debunk as much as you do confirm, or maybe even a little more debunking. How are we to know, and this is a hard question, Walt, take it with good humor, that you are not, in, in essence, sort of a continuation of Project Blue Book and a disseminator of disinformation yourself? <laughs> uh, you have the right to pose the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> some of us have worked too many uh, hours and years and years and years trying to resolve the greatest... Uh, scientific enigma of the space age uh, to spend our time putting out disinformation. We're trying to sort out the uh, wheat from the chaff, and uh, you can and do it from a scientific viewpoint, such a way that we have something to support it, and we have documentation to support what we're doing. Of course, if that was what you were doing, this is precisely the answer you would give me, right, Walt? <laughs> of <course. laughs> And so that may give you some idea of how it is people feel when they're, when they're uh, constantly accused of that. There actually is no defense. <laughs> uh, line three, good evening. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Yes, good evening. I'm calling from Vegas, Art and, and Mr. Andrus. I just want to ask two questions that hang up and you can answer it. You know, we, oh, let me just say this. We have a telescope above the Earth uh, that's taking pictures of billions of stars, maybe millions of light years away or millions of stars. And we have not heard any reports uh, of them. I wonder, number one, if that is uh, the big telescope that had a malfunction with the, with this glass or whatever or the mirror. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if there, if you suspect that they're hiding some pictures or some uh, of other planets, perhaps, um, uh, or some information with UFOs. I wonder what your guess is on that. Well, I can tell you a little bit. The Hubble has a stigmatism problem, uh, and they're going to have a mission here shortly to fix the Hubble. In effect. You haven't heard anything uh, because of the malfunction, I guess. But my next question, uh, just to, to, to go by, is there was an incident in uh, 1980, believe it or not, in England, I think it was a British base or an American base there, where they recorded sounds of UFOs and lights and everything. I, I don't know if you remember that case. It was recorded on uh, visual, not visual paper, recording, and they say it was quite accurate. Let me know what you think about that, and a way I will zoom away up above. All right, off, right. off with you then, sir. Um, I'm trying to recall. I, I can report on that one. All right. That's what they call the Bentwaters case in 1980. Right. December of 1980 that occurred uh, outside of the combined base of U.S. and uh, England. Um, we have the uh, tape that Wallace Halt, the commander, made at the time. We have his letter, his report to the uh, Minister of Defense, and also that's how they got the letter because our Air Force said they destroyed their copy, but they did release the one from that he wrote to MOD in England because it was a U.S. English base, and so he reported both places. Halt is out of the service now, and that is there. We've talked to several people that were out at the scene, and uh, it looks like a very interesting case, but there's still some conflict. So to some people it would be a solid case. To us, it's still the jury is still out and because there are quite a few discrepancies in the reports. All right. Well, I appreciate that assessment of Bentwater. I've heard Something really happened there, but we want to find out what. <laughs> All right. Um, good evening from Jackie Gons Plaza Hotel. You're on the air with Walt Andrus. Where are you calling from, please? Hello. No, you're not. Line one, you're on the air with Walt Andrus. Good evening. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, Art and Walt. Hello. Uh, well, there, there's a lot of mysteries, I guess, that probably will never be solved, but uh, the indications are pretty strong that uh, that there has been, been uh, space travelers coming by Earth for a long time because when you consider the, I guess there's, there's a, some type of an airport in Chile or in South America that's visible from space. The uh, uh, the monolith on Easter Island and some of the big stones that... <clears throat> okay, we're kind of pressed for time here. Do you have a specific question, sir? Yeah. Uh, is it possible that we could be... Uh, uh, that there could be another dimension out there that we can't quite perceive mm -hmm. 
that uh, there could be some crossover between ours and theirs in some way that uh, uh, that could explain some of these things? All right. Actually, that's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, uh, um, a lot of people have talked about another dimension. Different dimensions that these people may be in. Uh, some say that they're in a parallel dimension to ourselves, traveling right. alongside. Right. Others that uh, they're in reverse and we're passing them. Um, we don't have the answers to that by any means. Uh, that's just one of the hypotheses, but there are many to try to explain our so-called space travelers, our entities or aliens that are visiting on the planet Earth. So you don't dismiss it, and you, you follow, uh, I guess, people who um, are interested in this aspect of it, of other dimensions, or the possibility that it is a parallel universe of some sort. It seems, well, as likely... Uh, frankly, as a scenario that they come from another physical place, you know, in space and time. Yeah, that certainly uh, has uh, merit because we don't claim to know the answers, so you all know. <laughs> no, you really don't. And I think, as I said earlier, that adds to your credibility. We've just got enough time for you to blast out your address one more time quickly. Walt, why don't we do it? Yes. Uh, write to us at the Mutual UFO Network or the acronym MUFON. The address is 103, and then I'll repeat it, 103 Old Town, which is one word, Old Town Road. The city is Seguin, that's spelled S-E-G-U-I-N, Seguin, Texas. Our zip code is 78155, and the phone number here is area code 210-379-9216. Well, Walt, it has been a distinct pleasure to have you on the program, and we're just flat out of time, so I'll just be able to say thank you. Well, thank you, and it's my pleasure to be on uh, Area 2000. Walt Andrus, take care, and um, everybody else take care. Sorry we're out of time. See you next week. <laughs> The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., Area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. Welcome to Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Area 2000 from Las Vegas to the West on KDWN 720. The Talk of the West. I'm Art Bell. And it's going to be quite a program this evening. We've got, as always, uh, George Knapp and uh, with a glimpses into other realities, Linda Howe in Philadelphia, and then all the way from New Jersey, I think you're going to very much enjoy Richard C. Hoagland. And uh, so there's a lot to get to. Let us begin getting to it right away. Um, George, uh, good evening to you. Great to have you back again. minutes ago, the 1993 International UFO Congress kicked off at the Showboat Hotel here in Las Vegas. Former Air Force Colonel Wendell Stevens was fairly an incredible collection of UFO photos. You know, we always hear the skeptics tell us that such photos are always fuzzy, strip, but the Clear and crisp daylight type shots, hard to 
dismiss, whether or not all of them can withstand scientific analysis is something I can't answer. Some could be hoaxes, I suppose, but when you see this entire package, it's, it's very impressive. This conference will last a whole week. There are several extremely interesting speakers on the line. Dr. John Mack of Harvard Medical School was scheduled to speak about the induction phenomenon, as is Dr. David Jacobs of Temple University. Ted Oliphant, uh, the Fife, Alabama police officer, uh, is slated to talk about his two-year investigation of cattle mutilations in North Alabama, uh, activity which has repeatedly been correlated to UFO sightings there and elsewhere. The founder of the first UFO research organization in China is on the schedule, along with a man named George Wingfield, one of the world's best-known crop formation researchers. Uh, two days of the program are dedicated to abduction research, and for what it's worth, there's also a full day of presentations related to channeled information. This is a very controversial area, even within ufology, but it's probably good to keep an open mind, even about topics which might seem to be ridiculous. I mean, science fiction today becomes science tomorrow. Anyway, it's a heck of a lineup, and folks who are interested might want to head down to the showboat sometime this week. We told you last week about multiple witness UFO sightings in the northwest part of the Las Vegas Valley. Now we're getting reports from the Henderson area about large, luminous, triangular craft that reportedly perform these flip-flop and other gymnastic-type maneuvers on a semi-regular basis. And if anyone is listening in the Henderson area, we'd like them to call us and, and let us know what you're seeing out there. Uh, Mexico continues as a UFO hotspot. Several dozen impressive videotapes of unidentified objects have been captured in the last six months. The activity shows no signs of abating. A Mexican organization which calls itself the Vigilantes has been taking out the sky on a round-the-clock basis in the Mexican state of Morelos, as well as in the mountainous region called Tepo Teco, about two, 300 miles outside of Mexico City. Quite a bit of activity reported and recorded. Uh, anyone interested in UFOs who has an original idea about the nature of this phenomenon might be in line to win a thousand bucks. A man named Dr. Alexander Image has offered a prize of a thousand dollars for the best original paper contributing to the understanding of the UFO enigma. Submissions can be critical, empirical, philosophical, speculative, in any of the many disciplines covered by ufology. The deadline is June 30th, 1994. And Angela Thompson of the Bigelow Foundation has further details if anyone's interested in pursuing this prize. Right. Uh, one note for Las Vegas residents, the local MUFON chapter, that's Mutual UFO Network, will meet December 14th at the Las Vegas Library across from Cashman Field. MUFON, as you know, Art, is a pretty solid organization. It's, it's, it's surprising that it doesn't have more support here in Nevada considering the high level of interest there is in UFOs. Such organizations, of course, are, are, are what you make of them, and I'd recommend anyone who wants to get to the bottom of the mystery might want to consider getting involved with MUFON. Finally, don't forget the lunar eclipse tonight, supposed to peak around 10 o'clock, I think, for West Coast viewers uh, right after this program, so uh, our listeners should probably listen to the show, then bundle up and go outside, and uh, I really look forward to hearing Richard Hoagland uh, regarding the Mars Observer and all the stuff we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. George, I am curious. Um, you you kind of hit on something that I'm very curious about, and that is the level of UFO interest here in Nevada versus elsewhere when we are virtually the center of almost all the activity. Well, we're a center of a lot of the activity. I think there's activity all over the country, but uh, I think uh, it has a lot to do with your program and some of the, the TV programs that, that I've been involved with here. I don't think there's a hotter area anywhere in terms of uh, public interest in the topic. I mean, I can't go anywhere uh, without somebody raising, raising the subject. But when it comes to interest in MUFON uh, or some of the other UFO organizations, it's, it's very limited. Well, okay, wonderful to have you, George. I appreciate the update, and uh, I hope somebody else already wins the topic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's George Knapp. Hello, uh, Morgan Journalist. And he kind of keeps us up to date on uh, the very latest of what's going on. All right. Quick switch of gears all the way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Another glimpse into another reality. This is Linda Howe. Linda, uh, good evening. Welcome to the program. Hi, Art. Hi. So when it comes to discussing the bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-bi-b
One of the constant themes in the investigations is an apparent policy of silence and misinformation by the government concerning these people. Recently, I interviewed a beef cattle rancher who talked to me about a recent mutilation on his ranch and his thoughts about why there might be a policy of silence. Art Geyer lives in a grain farming and cattle raising region at the eastern end of South Dakota near a small town called the Smet. In October, he found three of his cattle dead and mutilated. The first two were cows, and the third was a Charley bull about three years old that weighed at least 1,800 pounds. Mr. Geyer knew the bull was alive and well two days before he found the animal on October 24th inside a fence pasture with both of the gates catalogued. As Mr. Geyer approached the dead bull, he could see a complete testicle lying on the ground near the body, cut right out of the scrotum sac. The other testicle was gone too, but was never found. There was no blood in any of these cuts. The penis had been removed, part of the teeth around it had been cut sharply straight across. The rectum was pulled out and the wild blood was found. At the top, the tongue had been cut by two straight cut lines deep into the cow's throat, and one ear had been removed with a cut, and Mr. Geyer said, so it looks like two things here, said Bernard, unquote, which is a cut that has been photographed and described on other mutilated animals for the past 30 years. There were no tracks around the bull, no signs of struggle, and predators would never go to the body of the bull. Mr. Geyer also found odd strips of hair missing and a small hole like a biopsy test. He told me recently in a conversation that until he saw these animals, he had not accepted that there was any reality to the animal in the But now, he's changed his mind, and I'm working up my excerpt from that conversation, in which he also discusses the, what appears to be a policy of violence. And we will begin with his discussion of a very strange missing hair and a strange puncture wound that resembled a biopsy plug on this 1800 pound bull. Yeah, on that bull we found uh, uh, there were two marks on his neck, about six inches long and about four inches of four or five inches apart. And on uh, the one of them, uh, the hill is just rubbed complete there, gone completely. On the second one, uh, it was the hill was some of it was gone, but not like the like the first mark. Like he'd been his neck had been clamped in something or you know. <laughs> and then uh, down further, then there seemed to appear to be uh, like a hole or uh, uh, a break in the skin that went in. Uh, uh, we didn't think it was a bullet hole because it, it would have had to been, you know, from underneath. It, there have been what people refer to as biopsy plugs removed from animals over the past 30 years. They were been about a quarter of an inch wide and about three quarters to an inch deep. Is that similar to what this but one? This would uh, uh, look like it was uh, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than a lead pencil. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's not a quarter inch, but maybe a three-eighth inch hole, and uh, it still appeared like it went in maybe an inch or two. There sure wasn't anything where anything come out on the other side or out, you know, right. anywhere. Like a, like a bullet would have uh, right. probably done. So it is similar to these what have been referred to as biopsy plugs. Um, how much did that go away? Uh, well, it was a three-year-old Charlie bull, and I estimated uh, the, the weight probably around 1,800 pounds. Now, could you or any human easily uh, walk up to, let's say, not you because you knew the bull, but could a stranger walk up to an 1,800 pound bull and easily stop it in its track? They might be able to walk up to it, but, uh, you know, uh, when the fall of the year, uh, the, the bulls a lot of times will kind of separate off from the, from the females from the cows. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're more docile in the, you know, in the fall of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody could probably have walked up, you know, within 10, 15 feet of the bullet that was laying down. But uh, they could 
They can't tranquilize another shooting at a, you know, completely disabled in some way. They, you know, there's no way they can come into that system. Right. Right. It takes a lot of people to... Yeah. Well, and there was no sign of struggle whatsoever in that past. No. Nothing. Well, this is typical of the animal mutilations, and this is why law enforcement long ago started looking up into the sky for an answer as to what was happening to these animals, and that's why I asked those earlier questions about whether there were any helicopter activity or light activity or anything in the sky that anyone reported. So, did you see the bull a day or so before you found it dead and mutilated? Uh, well, I've seen it about two days before, and uh, um, we have two bulls in that, in that particular pasture, we have four of them, and 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 there was no evidence of no signs of being sick or, uh, or anything like that. And this is clearly highly unusual uh, cuts all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And if you, uh, as a rancher, knew that there was some kind of other intelligence from somewhere else in the universe involved with these animal mutilations, what would your reaction be? Right. I guess I wouldn't uh, uh, I'm kind of a, kind of practical, and I, I don't know uh, whether I would uh, believe it unless I've seen it, but I didn't believe there was any cattle mutilations until I've seen my, no, until I've seen that bull either. So, uh, uh, I wouldn't, uh, necessarily, uh, disbelieve, uh, anything, or wouldn't be, uh, it is kind of frightening, but uh, it was, I guess I wouldn't be discouraged or anything I, if, if I didn't know or didn't see something that was... If that were true, and there does seem to be some evidence from eyewitnesses who have seen animals uh, with what they call non-human creatures that were either later found mutilated or disappeared, what would you think about the government's policy of silence? Well, I, I don't know. It would just, I guess, have to indicate to me that they, they uh, that either they are trying to keep a, 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 a secret to keep, you know, from histo not hysteria or from the people or, or maybe uh, uh, if they tried to make contact with them or anything like that, like that uh, they haven't been able to do it and so they're just kept trying to keep it quiet. Do you think that's fair to run for the public? Yeah, I think it would. Uh, but there's other life form that might threaten us or, you know, that might be helpful to us either one. I don't think it's not the people get away from us. And I would like to ask this comment either way. Helpful or other, we should be in on contact with another intelligence on this planet. And that is coming from a uh, rancher who has been in the eastern side of South Dakota remote area for several decades and has seen a lot of animals dead uh, from disease and predator, but he has never seen anything like what happened to these three in October. Yeah, particularly impressive, Linda, was the line, you know, I would not have believed it ever had I not seen it myself. That's right. That's right. Incredible. And in this particular case, we did have the sheriff come. The sheriff uh, said at the site, yeah, there's no question. Uh, something that the knew how to do uh, surgery on this animal was involved. And then the sheriff turned the case over to the state veterinarian and there was apparently no necropsy done and no physical investigation there were some photographs and there was a statement made by the assistant state veterinarian to the rapid city journal newspaper and to another local newspaper 
uh, disregarding, actually, any uh, necropsy or pathology examination, which they did not do, and they simply dismissed it as predators. And this is something that is a puzzle also. We are not examining these animals uh, scientifically, and if we did, perhaps we'd all learn a great deal more about this strange phenomenon. I wonder, Linda, if uh, perhaps the Foundation, as you mentioned, they're not examining these animals. Uh, I wonder if it would be in the interest of the Foundation, probably something you can't answer, to see to it that an examination of that sort is done. We need some answers. Yes, and Dr. Al Schuller, uh, John Al Schuller in Denver, I think he's going to be on Area 2000 in a few weeks. Mm-hmm. He's been working with me since 1989. And as far as the sheriffs and deputies and uh, the general ranching population know that uh, we will do these examinations. We have not uh, charged anyone anything for them, uh, but we need to be contacted. So if anybody does have uh, one of these strange animal deaths, please uh, get in touch with me, and we will try to get uh, some uh, honest pathology there in the animal. All right, and toward that end, I guess you'd better give them a way to do that. Uh, All right. I really do look forward to letters from uh, the listeners of Area 2000. I've been getting some very interesting feedback. And you can reach me, Linda Carroll, at Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, spelled H-U-N-T-I-N-G, B as in dog, O-N, Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. All right, uh, wonderful. Um, Linda, as always, uh, it's been fascinating, and I, I'll look forward to hearing from you next week. Great, Art, and thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's Linda Howe from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And there you've got it. It's still going on. Isn't that fascinating? Absolutely fascinating, and uh, I think she's going down the right road. I think examinations and some sort of understanding of what this is all about. It's high time. All right. Uh, once again, we uh, switch gears, and we've got a fascinating guest this evening, Richard C. Hoagland. Richard C. Hoagland is um, a former science consultant to Walter Cronkite of NBC News, Cable Network, NASA, and author of The Monuments of Mars, which is fabulously uh, popular. At NASA's request, he has now repeatedly presented his continuing Mars findings regarding the uh, Sidonia region of Mars to thousands of NASA engineers and scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center and Lewis Research Center. Hoagland was also a featured speaker on his team's Sidonia investigation at the 1990 Aerospace Education Services Project. That's a conference at the Lewis Research Center designed to train and brief specialists on current NASA projects. In February 1992, he presented his team's results regarding Sidonia in an invited address to delegates and staff at the United Nations. And let's take care of that uh, noise. There we go. Richard C. Hoagland should be a fascinating guest. As you know, the Mars Observer, as best we know, uh, or at least uh, with information given to the public, is still lost in space. So, all the way now to New Jersey and Richard C. Hoagland. Good evening, Richard. Good evening, Art. Welcome to the program. Good to have you. It's nice to be there. Pardon my voice. I seem to have picked up a cold somewhere along the line. I'm sorry to hear that. I'll stay away from the phone. <laughs> okay. Um, Richard, I, though I don't think we've ever connected before, I've been doing programs like this for many years, though not this specific one, and I've heard a lot about you. Um, You've been pretty high profile. I guess I I guess the place to start with you is Mars, and in the you know in the little uh, topic of discussion thing they sent to me, um, you were already prior to launch, and I guess this was written prior to the launch of the Mars Observer. You were already uh, feeling that we weren't necessarily going to get all of the yield of information. Before it ever got started, is that accurate? That is accurate, and there's really nothing to say because NASA was in any planetary mission it had ever sent anywhere was planning not to show us the data, the images that it was going to get from Mars Observer Live. Now there has been 
some confusion about what we mean by lies. Uh, these spacecraft <clears throat> are robots. They're sent out across the solar system. The first mission NASA ever sent anywhere uh, that was successful was the Ranger 7 mission that crash-landed on the moon at about 9.15 on the morning of July 28, 1964. And I was at a small museum in Springfield, Massachusetts, at the end of a telephone line linked to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where about a thousand other reporters and press people and scientists and whatever had gathered to see this mission. And what NASA arranged for the press was live television in the uh, auditorium so the press and the networks could pick up TV Live as this spacecraft, the first sent to the moon that was successful with, it, with a state-of-the-art television system built by RCA, could uh, basically give these images to the entire world, although at that time we didn't have satellites, so it was limited to those people in the auditorium, and then you had to, you know, fly the tape to New York or send it by uh, AT&T long lines or stuff like that, so it was a kind of an arduous process. But NASA, even in the very beginnings, back in the 60s, a few years after it was formed, prided itself on showing us live pictures from other planets and other planetary missions. For the first time in its entire history arc, they had planned and had announced before the launch in September of 1992 that on Mars Observer, for some strange quixotic reason, you know, they were going backward instead of forward. The technology has gotten so good that you basically can see this stuff on a desktop computer, all right? Right. Uh, but, the, but the NASA folks were telling us and giving us all kinds of bizarre, you know, multi-page memos and excuses hmm. why it was going to take Dr. Michael Malin, the, uh, the guy whose camera was flying on the spacecraft, up to six months to generate the pictures. I mean, it was absolutely asinine. And it doesn't take, you know, a rocket scientist to see that it was basically a cover. It was basically designed to prevent the American people from seeing what we have worked so hard to try to validate, and that is the possibility of extraterrestrial ruins on Mars at a place called Sidonia. Boy, that's, that's incredible. Richard, hold just one moment while I ID the station. We'll be uh, right back. Richard Hoagland is my guest, and uh, he, as you know, is the author, or should know, is the author of The Monuments of Mars. And we're going to be talking a lot about that this evening. Stay right there. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Area 2000 on a Sunday evening, of course. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Richard C. Hoagland. And back to it we go. Uh, Richard, um, can you, how much did you know about the capability of, of the observer? Now, um, in terms of the kind of detail uh, and photographs that it could have received, or depending on your point of view, is receiving. I know that we've got a couple series of KH uh, uh, sky satellites that they say can resolve little tiny things on Earth. Right. Did this use that level of technology? Well, close to it. Remember, this is a civilian space agency, so we're not supposed to have access to the, you know, the best and the brightest and the, and the high level of black focal technology. So the camera that no one has built and the sound of the soap was good enough to bring the picture, that is, bring the picture to the animals, to something the size of a coffee table on the Martian surface and a little over 230 miles above the surface in Mars orbit. Now, compare that to the smallest object, the smallest pixel that the Viking images from 17 years ago could resolve, and that was half a football field. And you can see that we've made a gain of between 30 and 50 times in resolution. And the photographs, which should have come back, both of the monuments of Mars and all kinds of other objects on the planet, would have been literally stunning. They would have knocked your socks off, and there would have been no doubt, absolutely zero doubt in the mind of anybody, after looking at these pictures, that we were looking at artificial objects at Sidonia, which, of course, if I may be, you know, uh, uh, given the uh, editorial uh, uh, license here, is why NASA has hid the mission and the spacecraft from us. They did not dare to give us that kind of data because then the fat would be in the fire. Then we'd be arguing over who built them, not where they built. All right. Um, this has always bothered me about this theory, Richard. If 
uh, such is the case. It was a, what, a billion dollar mission, billion dollar spacecraft, something like that. 980 million, but who's going to call over, enough. you know, yeah, close enough. million years, 50 million? All right, if they knew that this was, all this stuff was there, um, why launch in the first place? All right, that's, that, that's a very good question, and let me try to give you an answer from a perspective of 30 years of being a NASA watcher and also a NASA consultant. NASA is, is a unique federal agency art. What people don't understand, and which I hope after tonight they will understand, is that NASA is the weak link in the government cover-up. Because when NASA gets into the, into the act, the act gets into the act. That is the Space Act. NASA was created back in 1958 by an act of Congress which mandates the widest and appropriate dissemination of all the science results. Bottom line is, there's very little in terms of data that NASA can, by law, keep secret. Now, they can keep methods because some of their methods, you know, infringe and lap over into the DOD, the Defense Department. So there are many missions where we don't know how data is acquired. But under law, we should know what data is acquired if it's of, you know, strictly scientific um, objects or scientific inquiries. And unless you admit a priori, that there are ruins on Mars, and that's why you're not going to make the pictures public, there's not a leg, a legal leg that NASA can stand on to keep the pictures secret. They have to lie. And if they lie, it means they're violating federal law, and if they violate federal law, somebody in NASA is going to go to jail if you catch them. All right, minus the evidence that the observer would have or is, again, depending on your point of view, providing, um, what... What is your best evidence, do you suppose, Richard, for the existence of these ruins, the face, all the rest of it? What is our best evidence right now? Let me, let me, let me, let me finish answering the, the, your, your other question, and right. then I'll get to that. Sure. Uh, you asked, why would NASA think they could go there in secret and take pictures? Because no one had ever questioned NASA before. NASA is like, you know, the guys with the white hats, <laughs> you know, the uh, impervious chain mail, until the Challenger disaster, where we tragically lost seven astronauts, and until Hubble, NASA could do no wrong. I mean, I think it's ironic that we're having the show tonight two days from the launch of the challenge of the uh, Endeavour mission. For the Hubble. Going up to fix Hubble, right? NASA has come a long way, baby, since it could do no wrong, since it got us to the moon, you know, it, it, it built, you know, 50-foot-tall heroes. NASA has been living for a long time on a tarnished image. And I say tarnished because when you look behind the mist, you find that there are some very strange things going on. And what I think, personally, now is a speculation, is that NASA thought it could live on the mist, it thought it could go to Mars in secret and pretend it was doing it in public. They never imagined, I really believe, that we would generate the kind of political groundswell, the kind of media observation and critique that would force them basically to decide between an open mission and no mission. And my, my evidence to support that theory is that the, the spacecraft was lost, Mars Observer was lost. It was announced that it was lost on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock Eastern Time on August 21st, all right? Right. That was literally as Dr. Bevan French, who was the Mars Observer Program scientist, and I were getting off ABC's Good Morning America after a coast-to-coast -coast debate where basically French and NASA lost the debate in terms of why not take the pictures of Sidonia and why keep them secret. And it was at 11 o'clock when that program went off after the host and ABC and in essence sided with us that NASA just coincidentally announced to AP, Associated Press, Lee Siegel, there in Los Angeles, that it had lost Mars Observer 12 hours before, sometime on the previous Saturday night. And, of course, you know, I quipped, well, why were they waiting 12 hours? Are they going to wait to notify the next of kin? Because, again, the speculation, it seems pretty clear to those of us in this project, that what they were waiting for was to see how politically their secret mission was going to fly. When it looked obvious to anybody that it was not going to fly, that's when somebody put into position Plan B, and that's when they, in essence, pulled the plug. Still, that had to be, uh, prior to launch, one of the things, if all this is true, that they considered. In other words, option A, option B. But option B, which they apparently, you believe, took, uh, is so incredibly damaging to NASA and their future budgetary uh, 
uh, hopes that I would think they would, would not have done that, rather not launched at all than... All right, all right, suppose this is bigger than NASA. You see, this is where we come full circle. I mean, the fact that I'm doing your show tonight, a program devoted to UFOs and things that go bump in the night, right. should be some measure of how robust this evidence has become. Because if we have ruins on another world, which Mars Observer could have verified for the entire planet Earth's approval and, and uh, you know, approbation, then immediately, once you have demonstrated there are ET ruins on another body in the solar system, all of the problems and all of the potentials of the UFO phenomena come falling out of the government closet. Absolutely. If you can prove there is one wrench, one stone, one, one built artifact anywhere else than on this planet, you have opened the door to a galaxy filled with other life forms, and you have made credible, not true, but at least credible, the idea that somebody out there could come here and, in fact, could be coming here right now. The only way the government can keep that door from being forced open is to forever keep us in the dark and to keep us from ever seeing one picture of a bona fide artifact sitting on another planet and that's why I think the question here is bigger than the fate of NASA. The question is the fate of the 50, 30, 70 years, however long it's been, that we have been given the lie that the human race is, in fact, alone in the universe. All right. Very good, Richard. That, that does describe a motive. Now, now we do get to my other question. How sure are we there are monuments? How sure are we the face is just not some weird geographic... Uh, Circumstance. In other words, what is the evidence that these things are on Mars? Well, if you'd ask me that, let's see, even five years ago, I would have given you a very qualified, very conservative, very, uh, quote, scientific answer. Tonight, I can be much more forthcoming. I have no doubt in my mind. You know, it's 99.999% that they're there, not so much because of the artifacts themselves, but because of what we have discovered because of the artifacts. There's a very important phenomenon in science called the power of specific prediction. The power of a scientific theory is not in terms of proving the theory, but in terms of what the theory predicts that you will find elsewhere than in the theory. And what we have found elsewhere than the theory that there are structures on Mars is a physics which has allowed us to look across the solar system and to see other phenomena operating in the Sun, in Jupiter, in Neptune, and even here on Earth, and to put that into a coherent new physics, which has extraordinary power of prediction, extraordinary power of the prediction of a technology which will evolve from that physics, and in fact already has. And it is for the physics that uh, I was given the International Excellence in Science Award by the Angstrom Foundation this year in a ceremony in Washington two days after uh, NASA announced that it lost the spacecraft, because the physics that comes from the geometry of the monuments of Mars is the powerful predictive side of the fact that there are artifacts. So for us, in this project, and obviously for the Angston people, the discussion has moved light years beyond other artifacts. It now is into what do the artifacts mean, and how can we harness that meaning uh, in other areas of science. All right, give me a sense, if you would, though, um, uh, before I declare it to be so, of how the physics backs up uh, or proves the fact that these are not uh, uh, casual geographic coincidences. What sort of physics do you apply to come to that conclusion? Okay, let me try to do this very briefly and without the pictures. It's very difficult to do this without the pictures. And if people want to see the pictures, we have put out a series of briefing tapes. You mentioned the NASA briefings. You mentioned the UN briefing. Right. These are available on home video. If you want to see, you know, chapter and verse and good, you know, color computer graphics and all of the, the stuff that I'm going to describe, and you want to see it laid out in explicit, exquisite detail, I'd recommend that you get those, those uh, home, home videos. But for those who have not seen the videos, let's try to do this for our pictures. What we have on Mars are a set of structures. The centerpiece of which is a mile long, 1,500 foot high humanoid image. It looks like that. So, that's something that we are for. Not behind it, a very specific and highly repetitive mathematical pattern are a set of other objects pyramids, linear formations, circular formations with multiple tiers. These are arranged in this extremely extraordinary geometry and repetitive geometry 
And it's the repetition that's important, Art, because in repetition there is signal against noise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Those are repetitive. Noise is random. Mm -hmm. um, from this geometry, my colleagues and myself, uh, some of whose names I could give you if you're interested, people like Errol Torin and, and others, were able to decode a set of mathematical constants which are, in, in essence, the fundamental constants of physics all over the universe. And from these constants, we were led to a specific um, uh, kind of geometry called hyperdimensional geometry. That is a geometry that a subgroup of mathematicians for 100 years have been writing papers about and publishing in the mathematical literature. You're going to have to give us, you're, you're going to have to give us a layman's uh, definition of that. Right. Well, hyperdimensions means more than three dimensions. Yes. Four dimensions, five dimensions, six, whatever. Right. These have been considered theoretical up till now. What we've discovered is that some of the mathematical predictions of these higher dimensions predict specific things, specific phenomenon that one might see on real objects like planets if one were to look. And when we looked, lo and behold, Art, we found the stuff that those predicted that we would find. Energy upwellings at specific latitudes, geometric patterns in the clouds circling the poles, excess energy emissions where there should be no energy coming from inside the planets because planets are not stars, they're not supposed to be generating excess energy, things like this. And all of this began with this set of geometry encoded in these objects grouped around the face that I have come to call the Monuments of Mars. Now, if you follow the logic train, it's impossible under any normal position to round up the special position the latitude of the great dark spot on Neptune, which we did in a paper we published in CompuServe two weeks before Voyager 2 arrived at Neptune, predicated on the reality of a set of structures on another planet, unless the structures are real, unless the mathematical logic chain is real, unless the predictions have real power. So that's why I can say with great confidence, backed up by the ancient people, that in fact it's real not only with the reality of structures on Mars, but structures low down to give us a fundamental new view of physics, of how the universe really works. And of course, if you followed any of the discussions over SETI messages, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence over the last 30 or, or more years, this kind of fundamental information about how the universe functions is exactly in the forefront of what anybody from Sagan to Drake to uh, Morrison have been saying a SETI message would contain. The only problem is they were predicting that it would come by means of radio from someplace safely many, many, many light years away, and we found this kind of fundamental information encoded in the geometric layout of a group of structures on a nearby planet known as Mars. Well, Richard, call me dimensionally challenged, if you wish, but I'm still not somehow grasping. In other words, you, you, you have, uh, from these structures, devised some new basis uh, of, um, of, of physics. Sure, it turns out to be very old. We have now discovered two separate groups of scientists here on Earth who have been working with this physics for the last hundred years, Art, and we never knew it. I've, I've mentioned one group. They're called mathematical topologists. Mm -hmm. um, a topologist is, is, is a mathematician who can look at a donut and a cup of coffee and you and me and say they're all the same. So you do not send mathematical topologists to, the, to Dunkin' Donuts to bring back donuts, all right? <laughs> yes. The other group of scientists, it turns out, who have been working or began to work with this identical, higher dimensional uh, reality base for physics were the physicists themselves. Uh, you probably have heard of a guy named James Clerk Maxwell. The name is familiar. Maxwell's yes. equations. Yes. Without Maxwell's equations, you and I would not be having this conversation and none of your listeners out in radio land would be listening to us tonight. Maxwell's equations describe the electromagnetic phenomenon of radio as well as light, as well as ultraviolet, infrared, x-rays, the whole spectrum whereby you and I are having this conversation for your audience this evening. What you do not know, and which many people do not know, is that Maxwell, a hundred years ago, originally wrote his 200-plus equations completely describing electromagnetic theory in four space terms. 
in higher dimensional terms. They were later simplified, I, I, I love that phrase, by a guy named Oliver Heaviside, another physicist, about 20 years later. And we were only given four of the original 200 equations, and those, the four space terms, had been eliminated from the equation. So for the last hundred years, physics has been limping along with a, you know, it's almost like putting dark glasses on and not looking at the real universe. And we've only discovered this in the last couple of months, that Maxwell's original equations were predicated on, founded on, implicitly incorporated higher dimensional four space terms called, for those mathematically inclined in your audience, quaternion. And anybody out there can check in the in the ancient history books, not the modern physics texts, but in the really initial ones of about 100 years ago, and they will discover the truth of the statement. Now, what's interesting to me, given, you know, somewhat of a perspective of paranoia about government cover-ups in terms of UFOs, is that we seem, every time in the last hundred years we were going to get a handle on this physics, we seem to have taken the wrong turn. Now, do we take this wrong turn by accident, or do we take it because there perhaps has been a larger perspective that did not want us to know that physics might apply to more than three dimensions? I don't have an answer for that question, but it's an interesting question to pose because the power of hyperdimensional physics not only gives you, quote, free energy, a term that I'm sure has been discussed on your show more than once, yes. it also gives you control of gravity. And there are a few things flying around in the skies over your head, if not tonight, on other nights that I've heard about, that I believe are part of a secret government project to apply the real Maxwell's equations in a black budgeted program that's been at least 30 to 40 years in the making, and that if you see UFOs in terrestrial skies, there's an even likelihood that they're ours, that we built them using very fundamental, secret, hyperdimensional physics and technology paid for by your and my tax money. All right. Now, believe it or not, that seems reasonable to me, Richard. I've seen recently a UFO. I had my own experience, finally. First one I ever saw in my life. But that aside for a second, when you take this new hyperdimensional physics and you go to a conventional physicist and lay it out for him, what is the usual reaction? Well, it starts out with incredulity, and then you point them to the literature, to Maxwell, to the topologist, and they come back to you and they say, I'm going to have to really think about this. And uh -huh. we have evidence that, you know, this is happening all over the country. There's a, a gentleman I think you're going to have on your show in a couple, three weeks, Dr. Stanley McDaniel. Yes. Who is an epistemologist. He's an ethicist. He's an historian of science, and he is the former chairman of the philosophy department of Sonoma State University. About a year ago, Stan McDaniel called me up, and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a paper on all you guys who've been talking about this Mars stuff. Would you send me some references? Would you send me some things? Thus began a dialogue. A year later, McDaniel produced about a 200-page document, now called the McDaniel Report, which not only went into chapter and verse all our investigation into the monuments of Mars, our methodologies, our measurements, our controls, you know, the background of everybody who was involved in this project, the, uh, the precision of measurement, everything you could think of that would, you know, tend to discredit or validate our approach. But he also went into the tertiary implications, including the physics. It is McDaniel's conclusion that in, in, on the whole, you know, those of us involved in this independent investigation have done some pretty good science, and by contrast, NASA has done no science, and most important is that there is an area of physics here that should be explored and expanded, and it was um, after he reached that conclusion that independently the Angstrom Foundation uh, awarded us the medal this year for the physics associated with the object of Sidonia. I heartily uh, recommend to your audience the time they're going to spend with Dr. McDaniel on your show, because here is a person who has the sweep of science, has the perspective of how science should be done when it works at its best, and who has basically come along as the independent peer review of all of us who've been trying to put some rigor into this very flaky field, and who has basically validated not only our methodologies, but many of our most important conclusions. Richard, um uh, very briefly, without going into all the detail that I've gone into before, I saw 
I live uh, in the Pahrump Valley, which is about 65 miles west of Las Vegas and a valley or so adjacent to Area 51. And uh, one night not long ago, I saw a very large triangular craft that came not more than 150 feet above my stopped automobile in the dead quiet. I, it was a full moon, very much like tonight, uh, without the eclipse part of it. And, uh, and I could see the substance of this craft. It was uh, dead flat black against a lighter sky, and it literally floated at a slow speed, slower than, uh, you, you know, would be able to keep it in aerodynamic flight, and utterly quiet. Since that time, I've had uh, all kinds of people send me information on this kind of a craft and this kind of technology, but it would seem to me that the kind of physics you're talking about uh, would be required to do something like that, because it wasn't flying, Richard. It was floating. Uh, and and is, wouldn't it take that exact sort of technology to achieve that? Precisely. But you see, this is the important part, and this is where we can get into a wonderful discussion about, you know, is it ours or theirs? I believe, and this is, again, is a personal perspective, that an awful lot of the uh, captured UFO, you know, captured alien technology stories coming out of, of uh, Nevada and, and this government are, in fact, deliberate misinformation, disinformation to keep the New York Times from ever taking seriously loudly that this is a privilege that we ourselves have mastered a hundred years ago, and then very quietly suppressed. Everybody is familiar, or at least they should be familiar, with the history of Nikola Tesla. Yes. And you know what I'm going to say. Yes. <laughs> Tesla wanted to harness the energy of the Earth, which is nothing more than another way of saying hyperdimensional physics, mm -hmm. to beam, to broadcast free electric power, essentially power to keep the needle from uh, uh, all over the planet to be picked up by relatively inexpensive receivers on homes and cars and boats and stuff like that. Right. Industrialist J.P. Morgan was backing him in his research until he discovered what Tesla, for whom the 20th century would not exist without Nikola Tesla. Everybody thinks it's Edison and, uh, you know, Westinghouse and all that. It's Tesla that is making the lights, you know, go on in your living room tonight, boys and girls. It's Tesla who gave us, you know, uh, 60 cycle, 120 cycle AC current. It's Tesla who built generators and motors and you know, all kinds of, of inventions that basically gave us the 20th century and whose name has been almost expunged yes. in any modern text. Such is the power of an academic establishment that is twisted or manipulated to forget those to whom it does not want to remember. Tesla, when, when Morgan found out what Tesla was going to do, he literally pulled the plug. And for the rest of his life, Tesla was kind of wandering around this errant genius sitting in hotel rooms giving, you know, back-of-the-envelope interviews to members of the New York Post, but he never, uh, you know, regained or attained any of the stature that he had when he had funding. He became a non-person. All right. Uh, here, here. let me ask this, well, Richard. Talking, it, the bottom it, line is that these technologies, this knowledge, we, we, we have a, a list of areas now where for some reason we've done the wrong thing, Art, instead of the right thing. And I'm beginning to think it's not an accident. I'm beginning to think that for the last hundred years, this planet has been on a forced evolution in a different direction than it should have taken, given that it was a level playing field. But, but Richard... He has not wanted us to have the benefits of this kind of physics and technology, or they wanted it for themselves, and that's what you're seeing flying around over top-secret areas. All right, but Richard, if Tesla, if that is what Tesla had, and they um, had this technology uh, and have it now, why would they utilize it for nothing more than flying some of these little black-budget top-secret aircraft around and playing those sorts of games when the world could have, if, if what you're saying about Tesla is correct, free power and everybody would become very rich and all the rest of it? In other words, why the motive to... to uh, uh, keep the larger uh, applications of this down. Well, speculation? Yes, yeah, sure. Maybe somebody doesn't want everybody to be very rich. Huh. I mean, we fought a war, and we lost a lot of people called Desert Storm to protect oil. Right? Yes, uh, I agree this, with that. I agree. This physics says to me uh, that that was a waste of time and money and, and, and blood and sweat of American men and women. It was, it was pointless. 
We don't need to do that anymore. And that's what's so unconscionable. This is bigger than just, you know, keeping us from knowing they're aliens or keeping us from from understanding why there are monuments on Mars. This is nothing, uh, uh, I believe, than the heart and soul and freedom and destiny of the human species. And unless Americans, you know, who have some heritage of freedom, begin to ask hard questions, begin to ask who has been manipulating their reality yes. for, for what reason and for how long, you know, we, we do not have a future. We have a past. The future is up to other people who have been very carefully shielding us from some very important truths. And the, the paper and the paper trail is in the literature. There's a gentleman named T. Townsend Brown that I'm sure you've discussed on your program. Mm -hmm. A former naval admiral, now dead, back in the 20s. He and a guy named Byfield, who was a, uh, a colleague of Einstein, discovered that if you charge a capacitor to a very high uh, voltage, it exhibits a potential anti-gravity effect. Uh, Brown, which uh, people do not know, and which I can you know tell everybody tonight because this is the area that I'm most intrigued with, went on over the subsequent decades to conduct a long-term series of very fundamental physics experiments which were encoded in a set of field notes of which I have now gained access to some. In those notes, there are observations of what he termed rock electricity that are in exact correspondence to predictions of the hyperdimensional physics we have crafted from decoding the monuments of Mars. Wow. Uh, Richard, Sound. Richard, Sound Richard, Richard, hold on, hold on a sec. We uh, have a top of the hour newscast, which means you've got a five minute break. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about that capacitor charge. That's fascinating. Uh, and a couple of other things. So relax for about five minutes and we'll be right back, all right? Okay. That's Richard C. Hoagland, all the way from New Jersey. Good evening, everybody. You are listening. You're listening to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the very best program of its sort. This is Area 2000. My guest is Richard C. Hoagland, all the way from New Jersey. A lot of fascinating stuff. Back to it now. Richard, uh, good evening. Are you still there? I'm here. Good. Um, you, you mentioned something that really fascinated me, uh, a capacitor charge. Can you tell me any of the technical details at all, how much of a charge you're talking about, what size of a capacitor? Well, these were these remember these were capacitors that were built back in the 20s, and the and the internal design I found because I've done some homework in this area for obvious reasons has changed. You cannot buy capacitors currently that will exhibit these these effects because they're not designed the same way. And that of course raises interesting questions: why not? But the old style capacitors, the kind that Tesla was using, and the kind that uh, Brown was using, and the kind that you could easily build again today if you just knew what you were doing. Uh, when they were charged to 50,000, 100,000 volts, they exhibited what people would think was, in essence, an anti-gravity effect. They tended to move toward the positive pole. Uh, if you turn them upside down, they tend to move toward the positive pole so they would gain weight. So it was not uh, attitude dependent. It appeared to be some effect of charge separation. Uh, apparently, Brown did a lot of efforts to try to get official... Washington interested, he tried to get the Navy interested in funding him, he tried to get private enterprise interested. There were some intriguing uh, kind of what I would call hatchet type papers written by one reviewer in particular who was uh, hired by the uh, Navy to, to, to review his experiment. And when that was done, uh, official interest in, in essence disappeared. But he was never really making public presentations after that. You say you've done some homework in the area. In what manner did the dielectric uh, uh, differ from, from today's capacitor? It wasn't so much the dielectric, it was the geometry. The geometry. And remember, we're dealing with a hyperspatial geometry, so geometry is kind of intriguing to me. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the, the details, I mean, this is obviously not the place to get into the details, but there is going to be a whole conference at Temple University sometime next year on uh, Byfield Brown, and I have been invited to submit a paper, given that we have a physics that seems to be applicable. And if you're really interested, off the air, I can give you the organizer, and you can talk to them directly, and perhaps uh, get them on your show. Boy, I'd, I'd love to. It's fascinating. 
Um, all right. Uh, just a quick switch here. Uh, as you pointed out, we're about to launch the mission to try and fix the Hubble. Uh, it, it looks like a very, uh, and I'm no expert in the area, Richard, but it looks like a very risky uh, mission. I don't know what the chances of, of success are, uh, but I have a number of questions. One, do you agree that it looks like a, a risky mission at a time when NASA, and I've heard a lot of commentators lately suggesting that if they screw up the Hubble fix, NASA's in big, big trouble. So how do you assess this upcoming mission? Well, oh, one of the curious things is that Dan Golden said a few weeks ago that the objective of the Hubble fix was not to fix Hubble, which I think is an amazing statement by the head of NASA to make. <laughs> it's going to require quite a number of spacewalks. Uh, between five and seven. Right. Uh, it's, it's extremely complex. It's, in one sense, it's the, it's the kind of mission for which we have been building uh, the NASA program for the last 30 years. I mean, ultimately... If you're going to do any work in space, if you're going to build space stations, if you're going to go to other planets, you've got to be able to do this stuff. This is something you ought to be able to do. Uh, on, on the other hand, it's kind of strange that we should have had to do it at all, because why was a $2 billion telescope launched with a, with a broken mirror? Right. That's a question that I still have not satisfactorily answered. And the problem for NASA's credibility is that when you begin to find that they're lying to you, in one area, you begin to suspect other areas. Of course. And there's a pattern of deception around the Mars data, which is as wide as the Mississippi and as deep as the flood areas this past summer. <laughs> and that's not me. That's Dr. Uh, McDaniel saying that. What's amazing is that it was 36 hours after the McDaniel report was delivered by couriers to Devin French at NASA headquarters that NASA, uh, NASA lost the spacecraft, Lost Mars Observer. Okay. Now, in this report, McDaniel, again, not Hoagland, but McDaniel, was accusing NASA of about to commit one of the most egregious crimes against the ethics of science in all of scientific history by not taking the pictures of Sidonia, uh, guaranteeing they were going to try to acquire them where the, where the face and the pyramids are located, and then by not making them available live as they were beamed back from the spacecraft. Now, losing the spacecraft very neatly got NASA off the hook, would you not say? Oh, uh, uh, well, yes, I would, at, at a great uh, political price, yes. Although, as you point out, if what you're suggesting is true, then yes, there's, there would be motive, I suppose, to do that. Well, I mean, look, let's not split hairs. There is overwhelming evidence that there has been deep and intense federal interest in the extraterrestrial phenomenology for at least 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have to go very far to find, for instance, the extremely well-documented case of Roswell to know that at least since 1947, yes. some person or persons in this government has been up to their eyebrows in trying to puzzle out what's been going on with a phenomenon that they simply did not feel they could bring themselves to tell the American people about. All right, what is, uh, what is your view with regard to the current status of the observer? What's the reality, do you think? Well, given the model that we proposed at our National Press Club meeting, uh, you may or may not know this, but on August 24th, we had scheduled, that was the day that the spacecraft was supposed to go into orbit, and we had scheduled about a month before a, a press club briefing in Washington at the National Press Club of many of our major researchers associated with the Mars mission, that's the nonprofit uh, research group that I head, as well as uh, friends of the Mars mission, people who are not formally, you know, members of the research, but who are colleagues and advisors and, you know, people like Dr. David Webb, who is a former member of the President's Space Commission under President Reagan, or people like Tom Van Flandern, who was the former head of the Celestial Mechanics Branch at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. I mean, these, are, these people are not flakes. They're substantive people who feel that we should at least have been given an even shot to get the photographs and who were egregiously outraged that on the eve of going into orbit, NASA should, quote, lose the spacecraft under extremely mysterious circumstances. At that press conference, when I was asked, I, I said uh, that I, I had to admit that the circumstances were somewhat suspicious, given that on the record, NASA had refused to guarantee new images and that in McDaniel's terms, they were about to commit this outrageous violation of fundamental science ethics by not taking the pictures and not showing them to the American people. 
Uh, since that statement, we have had four different phone calls from four different sources, three from NASA and one from one of the intelligence agencies through what I call identified third parties. That means someone between me and these people who they know, who I know, but the sources do not know each other. So these are independent confirmations that, in fact, NASA has hidden the mission. It is simply... Uh, you know, converted Mars Observer into a stealth mission, and even as we speak tonight on November 28th, they are in the process of taking extraordinary data from that camera and relaying it back to Earth. Mars Observer is alive and well. The American people and most of NASA, and this is very important, most of NASA simply does not know. And those that do are afraid to stand up and simply call a spade a spade, simply tell anybody what's going on, for some very obvious reasons. Now, but you're saying the data is coming back now. That's what we have been told. Would there not be a way to confirm that fact? In other words, data must be transmitted and... Tra and we're working on it. Okay. I can announce tonight that, you know, on the 24th, I stood up there and I said, if there is a radio telescope facility or facility that would like to assist us in putting a little honesty in the government, yes. now would be the time to come forward. Well, it's taken us several months, but we finally have had what I will term as serious nibbles. And I don't want to be any more specific, because obviously if NASA people who are part of this rogue group, as I have termed it, uh, are listening, and I'm sure they somebody monitors your show. Oh, and, yeah. They would love to know when and how we're going to be listening. And I suppose and if, if they were warned of that, they would shut it down. Exactly, because it's a little like trying to meet somebody in Times Square. Sure, I understand. Now, if you don't arrange the time and the date, you know, you have about as much chance of meeting somebody in Times Square in New York as I have of, you know, winning the, the uh, lottery in New York. <laughs> um, so if they knew we were going to listen, and they knew from more important maybe is where we were going to listen, yes. they would then simply transmit to another receiver and another antenna on the other side of the world, and we wouldn't have a snowball's chance in you know where of hearing them. So we're not going to get into specifics, but I can tell you that a very significant professional effort has apparently uh, been ginned up and is apparently going to be put at our disposal uh, in the very near future. I'm talking, you know, a matter of a couple days because of the suspicions of these people that NASA has not been telling the truth. And again, I want to tell you that four different calls from sources that don't know each other have basically confirmed through people that I know that, in fact, this is what's going on. And when you get four sources, I mean, look, Woodard and Bernstein only had one, right? <laughs> so we're doing them a lot better. Uh, 2020 is following this carefully. And uh, if we get anything, obviously, you know, we would let them and you and everybody else know. Uh, I've talked to some other network people in Washington. The day that I won the Angstrom, I was asked to come for a meeting with a senior network anchor and his entire staff. I was intrigued that he wanted his entire staff to be in on the meeting. And it was only supposed to be a few minutes. It went almost an hour. And he said to me, Dick, he said, I would love... I would love to believe that this could be right, but I can't imagine anybody in this town, meaning Washington, being able to keep a secret. Right. He said, you've got to bring me some kind of proof. The problem there, Art, is that if you're a news person and you live in a world where telling things makes you money, you can't imagine a world where not telling something would make you more money <laughs> or would give you access to something that's even more important in some people's minds than money, and that is power. I mean, can you imagine one of these guys cutting his throat, cutting himself off forever from the data by standing up on NBC and saying, you know, my boss is sure. running a secret mission? End of career. End of career, end of, of livelihood, end of respect by his peers. I can tell you from absolute first-person experience that when I spoke at NASA Lewis, there was some, I'll, I'll just say, irregularities that occurred around my presentation. And if we have time, I'll get into the details, but I don't want to interrupt the flow of the story by telling you them now. All I can say is I was disturbed enough to call a couple of NASA people and basically made uh, protestations I was going to complain all the way up to the director's office. And maybe even outside uh, to a couple of news organizations. 
And I was told flatly by these NASA people, oh, for God's sake, they don't do that. Let's keep it in the family. Well, well I'll tell you something, Richard. I, it's not a little bit like, you know. If I, were the person, least, if I were the person holding all this back, Richard, and you were running around saying the stuff you're saying, I'd find a way to get you shut up. Has anybody tried? I don't think so. I mean, I'm still here. Well, for now, but I mean, this, you know, if, if there's something to what you're saying, you're a very dangerous person. Well, I think there's a lot of very dangerous people. What I see is the dam has got all kinds of cracks and is on the verge of blowing sky high. There are too many things that are falling into place. There's too much convergent information. There's too much good data now out there and, and good people chasing good data. This, this thing, this pretense that there's nothing going on and we're sitting here all by our lonesome and there's nothing on another planet and there's no you know, extraordinary new way of looking at the universe and applying that knowledge to changing, you know, the sad state of affairs on this planet. There is no way that that can be kept in the bottle very much longer. So if I were to disappear tomorrow, all it would be for some is an affirmation that everything I have said has been probably just about the way I've represented it, and there'll be other people willing to pick up the cudgels because they would know at some point they would be vindicated and there might be honor and glory and God knows what that would go along with it. Speculation, Richard. Do you suppose that they're depending on uh, the fact that you remain sort of lost in the noise? Um, I don't think so because, uh, you know, when you're, when you're taken very seriously by, as I said, network people, when you're discussing with the folks on Capitol Hill at the level that we're discussing, uh, what's going on with the spacecraft, when you've got serious radio astronomers giving you giving you multi-million dollar facilities, which we could never hope to build on our own, mm -hmm. you know, to basically catch them in the act. That's a pretty powerful network of, of folks that stand against the relative hand few of those in government who I think have manipulated us on these issues for far too long. Remember, my model is that most of the system is honest. And if that's true, then as the McDaniel Report gets circulated throughout NASA, and we just received a grant to be able to print several thousand copies and distribute them to NASA, to the Hill, to the United Nations, to academia, uh, as, as the truth and the veracity of what McDaniel has meticulously documented in this report works its way through the system, there will be lots of honest people that will look around and begin to wonder just what the hell has been going on and why have I been keeping my head down and not looking at what's been going on? So I don't think that the cover-up is going to obtain much longer. And, in fact, I see evidence that there's a lot of desperation of what's going on. The last thing they should have done is to hit the spacecraft. If they toughed it out, if they had simply tried to stick to their timeline and given us these dumb technical reasons that we knew were dumb but the press didn't, they may have been able to pull it off. But by, you know, pulling the plug, by pretending that a billion-dollar, extraordinarily sophisticated piece of robot hardware 30 years down the line, not at the beginning of the process, but the end of the process, just can, you know, not phone home one evening, they have made an awful lot of people who are not even paying attention suddenly say, wait a minute, there's really something weird here. What is going on? So I don't think we're dealing with 50-foot-tall giants. I think we're dealing with a small group of very scared men and they are men, they're not women, they're men, and they've been at this for a very long time. They've been living in a closed room, they have got very warped blinders on, they don't realize the world has fundamentally changed, and they're living in the past, and that does not make for good policy or wise or intelligent decision making. What is their latest and final proclamation about what they claim occurred? I remember when the news story broke about all this, Richard, they were talking about a uh, defective transistor that they'd had trouble with it on previous missions and all the rest of it. None of that ever added up to me because you, you don't uh, risk a $1 billion mission on something you already know has uh, been trouble in the past. That didn't make sense. Then they talk about the possibility of pressurization and an explosion at that moment. What is it, what's the story they're sticking with at the moment? Well, the actual report is going to come out of the official, you know, what went wrong committee. Uh -huh. Uh, of, um, you know, terming it, uh, in the next couple of three days. Uh, with 30th of uh, November, the state review team that Dan Golan, who's the head of NASA, has appointed, which, by the way, consists primarily of people out of NRL, the Naval Research Laboratory, uh, is going to make its report. 
it has been my prediction in print that what NASA is going to do is to take that report and, quote, apply it. And sometime around January 8th, we will have a miraculous phase. They will find the Mars Observer spacecraft. <laughs> and, the re and the reason that they will find it is because, what you pointed out before, they have, in terms of NASA, they have an agency going down the drain. Oh, yeah, indeed. If the Hubble fix is not anywhere near as successful as it has been billed that it has to be, and you know the press is going to be super critical, and if they, you know, don't tighten down three bolts, they're going to claim that the thing didn't work, uh, they have got to have this spacecraft come back as an example of their brilliant technical prowess. Well, yeah, but what then? That, then all of a sudden we're back to square one and uh, uh, a look at the areas that you've been talking about and the whole thing breaks open, so... Oh, well, yes and no, because if I were then, if I was planning uh, this strategy, and I'll put myself in their shoes for, for a minute, what I would be doing now is taking the pictures that we desperately all need. I would then use the supercomputer facilities of the state of the art uh, remember the big fuss in the, in the geographic of years ago when they moved the uh, Kepler Pyramid about four meters north for cover on the magazine? <laughs> uh, so you're saying they'd give me the pictures. Exactly. Yeah. And they will give them to us as live pictures, and by pretending that it's only a pile of rocks, they will hope fervently that it will all go away. Huh. Now, are yeah. people going to believe it? I don't think so. So it's really up for grabs. If it comes back and they try to do that, I would hope your audience would be at the forefront art of an independent review panel to basically look at the algorithms, to demand that they really be live images, and to scrutinize the procedures and policies uh, that, that McDaniel has, has so forthrightly recommended. Huh. Uh, and you expect this about January 8th, but dependent upon the success of Hubble. Uh, now, the reason that I say January 8th is kind of a cute story, we were predicting January 7th. And the reason it's January 7th is because on December 16th, in a couple, uh, three weeks, the Mars Observer and Mars will go too close to the sun for commanding, for the antennas from the Earth to successfully communicate. Right. Around January 7th, the spacecraft and the planet will clear the other side of the sun and get far enough away so that NASA could resume normal communication. A logical time to try again. I said on a radio show a few uh, a weeks ago that they were going to do this on January 7th, and the following day, one of my sources, remember one of these unnamed sources out of the agency, yeah. called a, a, a personal acquaintance and said, tell Hoagland it's January 8th, not January 7th. <laughs> so it's that specific. Now, whether they're going to stick to that timetable depends on how credible someone thinks that our predictions are and if they want to play into our hands by basically fulfilling the prediction. I am hoping that they continue to think of us as a mosquito, which is what we've been termed in some quarters, and they think as power always thinks that it has every bet ace and that they do bring it back because I have a feeling that there is going to be a rather remarkable surprise in terms of the reaction from the press and public if that, in fact, occurs. Other than that, I'm sorry. We've got to go. Thank you, and good evening. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000.